cold, dark things from within him, and at the same time he missed it. He often reminded himself of Zed's words that it was merely a tool. It was more, too. The sword was a mirror, albeit one bound in magic capable of raining terrible destruction. The sword of truth would annihilate anything before it, flesh or steel, as long as what stood before it was the enemy. Yet it could not harm a friend. Therein lay the paradox of its magic. Evil was defined solely by the perceptions of the person holding the sword, by what he believed to be true. Richard was the true seeker and heir to the power of the sword created by the wizards in the Great War. It should be with him. He should be protecting the sword. A lot of things should be, he told himself. Late in the afternoon, they left the eastern path they were on and took one tending east and south. Richard knew the trail. It would pass through a village in another day and then become a narrow road. Since Nietzsche had deliberately taken the new route, she must have known that too. Near dark, they skirted the north shore of a good-sized lake. A small raft of seagulls floated out near the middle of the rain-swept water. Seagulls weren't common in these parts, but they were not unheard of either. He recalled all the seabirds he had seen when he had been in the old world. The sea had fascinated him. In a cove on the far shore, Richard could just make out two men fishing. On that side of the lake, there was a trail worn to a deep rut over many generations by people coming up to fish from a hamlet to the south. The two men, sitting on a broad, flat rock jutting out into the lake, waved in greeting. It wasn't often one encountered riders out here. Richard and Nietzsche were too far away for the men to make them out. The men probably assumed they were trappers. Nietzsche returned the wave in a casual manner, as if to say, Good luck with the fishing, wish we could join you. They rounded a bend and finally disappeared from the men. Richard wiped his wet hair off his forehead as they rowed along beside the lake, listening to the small waves lapping at the muddy shore. Leaving the lake behind, they cut into the forest as the trail rose on its way across a gentle slope. Nietzsche had put her hood up against the intermittent rain and drizzle purring through the trees. A darkening gloom descended on the woods. Richard didn't want to do anything that would get Kalin killed. The time had finally come when he had to speak. When we come upon someone, what am I to say? I don't suppose you want me telling people you're a sister of the dark outsnatching victims. Or do you wish me to play the part of a mute? Nietzsche gave him a sidelong glance. You will be my husband as far as everyone is concerned, she said without hesitation. I expect you to adhere to that story under all circumstances. For all practical purposes from now on, you are my husband. I am your wife. Richard's fists tightened on the reins. I have a wife. You are not she. I'm not going to pretend you are. Swaying gently in her saddle, Nietzsche seemed indifferent to his words or the emotion behind them. She gazed skyward, taking in the darkening sky. It was too warm down in the lowlands for snow. Through occasional breaks in the low clouds, though, Richard had caught glimpses of wind-swept mountain slopes behind them, cloaked in thick white drifts. Kalin was sure to be dry, warm, and stuck. Do you think you could find us another of those shelter trees, Nietzsche asked, where it would be dry like last night? I'd dearly love to get dry and warm. Between sporadic gaps in the pine trees and through the scramble of bare branches of the alder and ash, Richard surveyed the hillside descending before them. Yes. Good. We need to have a talk. Chapter 25 As Richard dismounted near one of his shelter trees at the edge of a small, slanted open patch of grassy ground, Nietzsche took the reins of his horse. She could feel his smoldering glare on her back as she picketed the horses to the thick branches of an alder heavy with catkins. The horses were hungry and promptly started cropping the wet grass. Without a word, Richard began casting about collecting dead wood from under dense thickets of spruce trees where she supposed it might be a little drier. She watched him not openly but casually, covertly, from the corner of her eye as he went about his chore. He was everything she remembered and more. It was not so much that he was just big physically, but he had a commanding presence that had matured since she had last seen him. Before, she had been tempted at times to think of him as little more than a boy. No more. Now he was a powerful wild stallion trapped in a pen of his own construction. She kept her distance, letting him kick at the walls of that pen. It would bring her no gain to taunt this wild beast. 
taunting him, torturing him in his anguish, was the last thing in the world she wanted. Nietzsche could understand his smoldering anger. It was to be expected. She could plainly see his feelings for the mother confessor and hers for him. The integrity of the walls of his pen consisted of nothing more than the gossamer fence rails of his feelings for her. While Nietzsche sympathized with his pain, she knew that she, of all people, could do nothing to alleviate it. It would take time for his hurt to heal. Over time, the rails of his fence would be replaced by others. Some day he would come to terms with what had to be. Some day he would come to understand the truth of the things she intended to show him. Some day he would come to understand the necessity of what she was doing. It was for the best. At the edge of the clearing, Nietzsche settled herself on a gray slab of granite that by the unique angles of its broken face had once belonged to the ledge poking out from under the deep green of balsam and spruce behind her, but over time had been moved away from it by the inexorable effort of nature, leaving a gap the shape of a jagged lightning bolt between their once mated edges. Nietzsche sat with her back straight, a habit instilled in her from a young age by her mother, and watched Richard going about unsaddling the horses. He let them both eat some oats from canvas nose bags while he collected rocks from the clearing. At first, she couldn't imagine what he was doing. When he took them, along with the wood he had collected in under the boughs of the shelter tree, she realized he must be going to use the rocks to ring a fire pit. He was inside a long time, so she knew he must be working on building a fire out of the wet wood. She could have used her gift to help, had her gift enough power left to light wet wood, it didn't. Richard seemed to be up to the task, though. She had watched him light a fire the night before, starting it in birch bark, shavings, and twigs. Nietzsche had never been one for such outdoor activities. She left him to it and set about the small chore of preparing her horse's cinch strap. The rain had let up for the time being, leaving behind the tingle of a fine mist against her cheeks. As she worked at knotting the loose cords of the heavy twine strap back onto its buckle, she heard little crackling sounds coming from under the tree. The sputtering and popping told her that Richard had gotten the fire going. She heard the clang of a pot on rock, so she reasoned that he was leaving water to boil when the fire got hot enough. Sitting on the slab of granite, Nietzsche quietly worked a tangle out of the cinch strap as he came back out to care for the horses. Free of the nose bags, the horses drank from a pool of water in a depression in the smooth tan ledge. Though Richard wore dark clothes appropriate for the wood, they could not diminish his bearing. His gray-eyed gaze swept over her, taking in what she was doing. He left her to her knot work as he went about his chore of currying the horses. His big hands worked smoothly with a sure touch. She was certain the horses would appreciate having all the caked mud cleaned from their legs. She would, were she they. You said we needed to talk, Richard finally said to her as he stroked the curry comb over the mare's rump, whisking away a last spatter of mud. I presume a talk consists of you dictating the terms of my imprisonment. I imagine you have rules for your captives. By his icy inflection, it sounded as if he had decided to provoke her a little to test her reaction. Nietzsche set the scent strap aside. She met his challenging tone with one of genuine sympathy instead. Just because something has happened to you before, Richard, don't assume that means it will again. Fate does not give birth to the same child over and over. Each is different. This is not like the two times before. Her response, as well as the compassion in her eyes, appeared to have caught him off guard. He stared at her a moment before crouching to replace the curry comb in a pocket in the saddlebag and take out a pick. Two times before... There was no way he could miss her meaning. His blank expression didn't betray what he might be thinking as he lifted the stallion's right forefoot to pick its hoof clean. I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he probed the hoof with his pick, she knew he was probing her as well, wanting to know just how much she knew of those two times and what she thought was different this time. He would surely want to know how she intended to avoid the mistakes of his past captors. Any warrior would. He was not yet ready to accept how fundamentally different this was. Richard worked his way around the big black horse, cleaning its hooves, until he ended at the left forefoot close to her. As he finished and let the stallion's leg down, Nietzsche stood. When he turned around, she was close enough to feel his warm breath on her cheek. He fixed her with his glare, a look that was no longer as unsettling to her as it had been at first. 
She found herself, instead of shrinking back, staring into that penetrating gaze of his, marveling that she had him. She finally had him. It could have been no more wondrous to her had she somehow managed to bottle the moon and stars. You are a prisoner, Nietzsche said. Your anger and resentment are entirely understandable. I would never have expected you to be pleased about this, Richard, but it is not the same as those times before. She gently gripped his throat. He was surprised, but sensed he was in no immediate danger. Before, she said in quiet solace, you had a collar around your neck. Both times. You were at the Palace of the Prophets, where I was taken. She felt him swallow. But the other, she released his throat. I do not use a collar, as did the Sisters of the Light, to control you, to give you pain in order to make you obey or to put you through their ridiculous tests. My purpose is nothing like that. She pulled her cloak forward over her shoulders as she smiled distantly. Remember when you first came to the Palace of the Prophets? Remember the speech you gave? Richard's words were brittle with caution. Not exactly. She was still staring off into the memories. I do. It was the first time I saw you. I remember every word. Richard said nothing, but in his eyes she could see the shadows of his mind working. You were in a rage. Not unlike now. You held out a red leather rod hanging around your neck. Remember, Richard? I guess I did. His suspicious glare broke. A lot has happened since then. I guess I'd put it out of my mind. You said that you had been collared before. You said that the person who had once put that collar around your neck had brought you pain to punish you, to teach you. His posture shifted to stiff wariness. What of it? She focused once more on his gray eyes, eyes that watched her every blink, her every breath, as he weighed her every word. It was all going into some inner calculation, she knew, some inner master analysis of how high was his fence, and if he could jump it. He could not. I always wondered about that, she said, about what you had said about having been in a collar before. Some months back, we captured a woman in red leather, a moored Sith. His color paled just a little. She said she was searching for Lord Rall to protect him. I persuaded her to tell me everything she knew about you. I'm not from Dahara. His voice sounded confident. Nevertheless, she sensed a subterranean torrent of dread. A moored Sith would know next to nothing about me. Nietzsche reached inside her cloak for the thing she had brought with her. She let the small red leather rod roll from her fingers to fall to the ground at his feet. He stiffened. Oh, but she did, Richard. She knew a great deal. She smiled a small smile. Not pleasure nor mockery, but in distant sadness at the memory of that brave woman. She knew Dena. She had been at the People's Palace in Dahara, where you were taken after Dena captured you. She knew all about it. Richard's gaze fell away. On bended knee, he reverently picked the red leather rod off the wet ground. He wiped the thing clean on his pant leg, as if it were priceless. A moored Sith would not tell you anything. He stood and boldly met her gaze. A moored Sith is a product of torture. She would say only enough to make you believe she was cooperating. She would feed you a clever lie to deceive you. She would die before speaking any words to harm her Lord Rall. With one long finger, Nietzsche pulled a sodden strand of blonde hair off her cheek. You underestimate me, Richard. That woman was very brave. I felt great sorrow for her. But there were things I wanted to know. She told it all. She told me everything I wanted to know. Nietzsche could see the rage rising in him, bringing a flush to his cheeks. That was not what she had intended or wanted. She was telling him the truth, but he rejected it, trying to overlay it instead with his own false assumptions. A moment passed, and that truth finally found its way into his eyes. The rage departed reluctantly, replaced by the weight of sadness that made him swallow at his grief for this woman. Nietzsche had expected no less from him. Apparently, Nietzsche whispered, Dena was very talented at torture. I neither need nor want your sympathy. 
But I did feel sympathy, Richard, for what that woman put you through for no purpose but to give pain. That's the worst kind of pain, isn't it? Pain to no benefit, no confession. The pointlessness of it only adds to its torture. That was what you suffered. Nietzsche gestured to the red leather weapon in his fist. This woman did not suffer that kind of pain. I want you to know that. He pressed his lips tight in mistrust as he looked away from her eyes, gazing out at the gathering darkness. You killed her, this moored Sith named Denna, but not before she did unspeakable things to you. So I did. Richard's expression hardened with the implied menace of his words. You threatened the Sisters of the Light because they too collared you. You told them they were not good enough to lick the boots of that woman, Denna, and so they were not. You told the sisters that they thought they held the leash to your collar, but you promised them that they would find that what they held was a bolt of lightning. Don't think for one moment that I don't understand your feelings in this or your resolve. Nietzsche reached out and tapped the center of his chest. But this time, Richard, the collar is around your heart, and it is Kalin who will be forfeit should you make a mistake. His fists at the ends of his rigid arms tightened, Kalin would rather die than have me be a slave at her expense. She begged me to forfeit her life for my freedom. A day may dawn when it becomes necessary for me to honor her request. Nietzsche felt a weary boredom at his threats. People so often resorted to threatening her. That is entirely up to you, Richard. But you make a great mistake if you think I care. She couldn't begin to recall how many times Jagang had made solemn threats on her life or how many of those times his hands had tightened around her throat, choking the life out of her after he had beaten her senseless. Kadar Kadif had at times been no less brutal. She'd lost count of the times she fully expected to die, starting with the time when she was little and the man pulled her into the alley to rob her. But such men were not the only ones who promised her suffering. I cannot tell you the promises the Keeper of the Underworld has made to me in my dreams. Promises of unending suffering. That is my fate. So please, Richard, do not think to frighten me with your petty threats. More savage men than you have made credible promises as to my doom. I long ago accepted my fate and ceased to care. Her arms felt heavy at her sides. She felt empty of feeling. Thoughts of Jagang, of the Keeper, reminded her that her life was meaningless. Only what she had seen in Richard's eyes gave her a hint that there might be something more, something she had yet to discover or understand. What is it you want? Richard demanded. Nietzsche returned her mind to the here and now. I told you. Your part in life now is as my husband. That is the way it is going to be, if you wish Kalin to live. I've told you the truth about all of it. If you come with me and do the simple things I ask, such as assuming the role of my husband, then Kalin will live a long life. I can't say it will be entirely happy, of course, for I know she loves you. How long do you think you can hold me, Nietzsche? In frustration, Richard ran his fingers back through his wet hair. It isn't going to work, whatever it is you want. How long until you tire of this absurd sham? Her eyes narrowed, studying his profound innocence, if not ignorance. My dear boy, I was born into this wretched world 181 years past. You know that. Do you suppose I have not learned a great deal of patience in all that time? Though our bodies may look about the same age, and in many ways I am no older than you, I have lived near to seven of your lifetimes. Do you honestly believe that you would have patience to exceed mine? Do you think me some young foolish girl for you to outwit or outweight? His demeanor cooled. Nietzsche, I... And don't think to make friends with me or win me over. I am not Denna or Verna or Warren, or even Pasha for that matter. I'm not interested in friends. He turned a little and ran a hand over the stallion's shoulder when the horse snorted and stamped a hoof at the smell of the wood smoke curling out from the upper limbs of the shelter tree. I want to know what vile thing you did to that poor woman to make her tell you about Denna. The Mord Sith told me in return for a favor. Frowning his incredulity, he turned to her once more. 
What favor could you possibly do for a moored Sith? I cut her throat. Richard closed his eyes as his head sank with grief for this unknown woman who had died because of him. He clenched her weapon in his fist to his heart. His voice lost its fire. I don't suppose you know her name. It was this, his empathy for others, even others he didn't know, that not only made him the man he was, but shackled him. His concern for others would also be the thing that eventually brought him to understand the virtue in what she was doing. He, too, would then willingly work for the righteous cause of the order. I do, Nietzsche said. Hanya. Hanya. He looked heartsick. I didn't even know her. Richard. With a finger under his chin, Nietzsche gently brought his face up. I want you to know that I did not torture her. I found her being tortured. I was not happy about what I saw. I killed the man who did it. Hanya was beyond any help. I offered her release from her pain, a quick end, if she would tell me about you. I never asked her to betray you in any way that the Order would want. I asked only about your past, about your first captivity. I wanted to understand what you said that first day at the Palace of the Prophets. That's all. Richard didn't look relieved as she had intended. You withheld that quick release, as you call it, until she had given you what you wanted. That makes you a party to her torture. In the gloom, Nietzsche looked away in pain and anguish at the memory of that bloody deed. It had long since lost its ability to make her feel anything more than a ghost of emotions. There were so many needing release from their suffering, so many old and sick, so many wailing children, so many destitute and hopeless and poor. This woman had merely been another of life's victims needing release. It was for the best. Nietzsche had renounced the Creator in order to do his work and sworn her soul to the keeper of the underworld. She had to. Only one as evil as she would fail to feel any fitting feelings, any proper compassion for all the suffering and desperate need. It was grim irony, faithfully serving the needy in such a way. Perhaps you see it that way, Richard, Nietzsche said in a hoarse voice as she stared into the numb nightmare of memories. I did not. Neither did Hanya. Before I cut her throat, she thanked me for what I was about to do. Richard's eyes offered no mercy. And why did you make her tell you about me, about Denna? Nietzsche snugged her cloak tighter on her shoulders. Isn't it obvious? You couldn't possibly make the same mistake Denna made. You aren't the woman she was, Nietzsche. She was tired. The first night he had not slept, she knew. She had felt his eyes on her back. She knew how much he hurt. Turned away from him, she had wept silently, at the hate his eyes held, at the burden of being the one to have to do what was best. The world was such an evil place. Perhaps, Richard, she said in a soft voice, you will someday teach me the difference. She was so very tired. The night before, when he had succumbed to his weariness and turned away from her to sleep, Nietzsche had in turn stayed awake all night, watching him in his sound sleep as she felt the connection of magic to the mother confessor. The connection brought Nietzsche great empathy for her as well. It was all for the best. For now, Nietzsche said, let's get inside out of this foul weather. I'm cold and I'm hungry. We need to get some rest, too. And as I've told you, we have things to discuss first. She couldn't lie to him, she knew. She couldn't tell him everything, of course, but she dared not lie to him in the things she did tell him. The dance had begun. Chapter 26 Richard broke up the sausage Nietzsche gave him from her saddlebag and tossed it in the pot with the simmering rice. The things she had told him kept shouting in his mind as he tried to fit them into their proper order. He didn't know how much of what she had said he dared to believe. He feared it was all true. Nietzsche just didn't seem to need to lie to him, at least not about what she had told him so far. She didn't seem as hostile as he thought she would have to be. If anything, she seemed melancholy perhaps because of what she had done, although he had trouble believing that a confessed sister of the dark would suffer a guilty conscience. It was probably just some bizarre part of her act, some artifice directed toward her ends. He stirred the pot of rice with a stick he'd peeled the bark off of. You said there were things to discuss. He wrapped the stick clean on the edge of the pot. 
I assume that means there are orders you wish to issue. Nietzsche blinked as if he'd caught her thinking about something else. She looked out of place, sitting prim and straight in a wayward pine dressed as she was in her fine black dress. Richard would never before have ever thought of Nietzsche out of doors, much less sitting on the ground. The very idea had always seemed ludicrous to him. Her dress constantly made him think of Kalin, not only because of it being so completely opposite that it evoked the comparison, but also because he so vividly recalled Nietzsche connected to Kalin by that awful rope of magic. That memory twisted him in agony. Orders? Nietzsche folded her hands in her lap and met his gaze. Oh, yes, I have a few requests I wish you to honor. First, you may not use your gift. Not at all. Not in any way. Is that clear? Since, as I recall, you have no love of the gift, this should be neither a burden nor a difficult request for you to follow, especially because there is something you do love which would not survive such a betrayal. Do you understand? Her cold blue eyes conveyed the threat perhaps even better than her words. Richard gave her a single nod, committing himself to what exactly he wasn't entirely sure at the moment. He poured her steaming dinner in a shallow wooden bowl and handed it to her along with a spoon. Nietzsche smiled her thanks. He set the pot on the ground between his legs and took a spoonful of rice, blowing on it until it was cool enough to eat. He watched her from the corner of his eye as she took a dainty taste. Beyond her physical perfection, Nietzsche had a singularly expressive face. She seemed to go cold and blank when she was unhappy or when she meant to convey anger, threat, or displeasure. She didn't really scowl the way other people did when they felt those emotions. Rather, a look of cool detachment descended on her. That look was, in its own way, far more disturbing. It was her impenetrable armor. On the other hand, she was expressively animated when she was pleased or thankful. Even more than that, though, such pleasure or gratitude appeared genuine. He remembered her as aloof, and while she still possessed a noble bearing, to some extent her air of reticence had lifted to reveal an innocent delight to any kindness, or even simple courtesy. Richard still had bread Kara had baked for him. He hated sharing that bread with this evil woman, but it now seemed a childish consideration. He tore off a piece and offered it to Nietzsche. She took it with the reverence do something greater than mere bread. I also expect you to keep no secrets from me, she said after another bite. You would not like me to discover you were doing so. Husbands and wives have no need for secrets. Richard supposed not, but they were hardly husband and wife. Rather than say so, he said instead, You seem to know a lot about how husbands and wives behave. Rather than rising to his bait, she gestured with her bread at her bowl. This is very good, Richard. Very good indeed. What is it you want, Nietzsche? What is the purpose of this absurd pretense? The firelight played across her alabaster face and lent her hair a torrid color it didn't in reality possess. I took you because I need an answer which I believe you will provide. Richard broke a stout branch in two across his knee. You said husbands and wives have no need for secrets. He used half the branch to push the burning wood together before placing the branch atop the fire. Then aren't wives, too, supposed to be honest? Of course. Her hand with the bread lowered. She rested her wrist over her knee. I will be honest with you, too, Richard. Then what's the question? You said you took me because you need an answer you think I can provide. What's the question? Nietzsche stared off again, once more looking anything but the grim captor. She looked as if memories or perhaps fears haunted her. It was somehow more unsettling than the sneer of an armed guard outside the bars of his cage. The rain outside had increased to a dull roar. They'd made camp just in time. Richard couldn't help but remember the cozy times he'd had in wayward pines huddled beside Kalin. At the thought of Kalin, his heart sank. I don't know, Nietzsche finally said. I honestly don't, Richard. I seek something but I will only know it when I find it. After nearly all my 181 years without knowing it existed, I finally saw the first hint of it not long ago. She seemed to be looking through him again to some point beyond. Her voice, too, seemed to be addressed to that distant place her vision beheld. That was when you stood in a collar before all those sisters and defied them. 
Perhaps I will find the answer when I understand what it was I saw that day in that room. It was not just you, but you were its center. Her eyes focused once more on his face. She spoke with gentle assurance. Until then, you will live. I have no intention of harming you. You need fear no torture from me. I'm not like them, that woman, Denna, or the Sisters of the Light, using you for their games. Don't patronize me. You are using me for your own game, no less than they used me for theirs. She shook her head. I want you to know, Richard, that I have nothing but respect for you. I probably have more respect for you than any person you have ever met. That's why I took you. You are a rare person, Richard. I'm a war wizard. You've just never seen one of those before. She spurned the notion with a dismissive flick of her hand. Please don't try to impress me with your power. I'm not in the mood for such silliness. Richard knew it was no idle boast on her part. She was a sorceress of remarkable ability. He doubted he had any hope of outsmarting her knowledge of magic. She was not acting the way he had expected a sister of the dark would act, though. Richard put his anger, hurt, and heartache aside for the moment, knowing he had to face what was rather than putting his hope in wishes, and spoke to Nietzsche in the same gentle fashion she used with him. I don't understand what it is you want of me, Nietzsche. She shrugged in an involuntary gesture of frustration. Neither do I. Until I do, you will do as I ask, and everything will be fine. I will not harm you. Considering the circumstances, do you really expect me to take your word? I'm telling you the truth, Richard. If you were to twist your ankle, I would, like a good wife, put my shoulder under your arm and help you to walk. From now on, I am devoted to you and you to me. He could only blink at how crazy this was. He almost thought she might be mad. Almost. He knew that would be too easy an answer. As Zed always said, nothing was ever easy. And if I choose not to go along with your wishes? Again, she shrugged. Then Kaylin dies. I understand that, but if she dies, then you lose the collar around my heart. She fixed him with cold blue eyes. Your point? Then you couldn't get what you wanted from me. You would have no leverage. I don't have what I want now, so I would be losing nothing. Besides, if you were to do that, then Emperor Jagang would welcome your head as a gift. I would no doubt be showered with gifts and riches. Richard didn't think Nietzsche wanted gifts or riches showered on her. She was a sister of the dark, after all, and he supposed she could manage to be so showered if she really wished it. Even so, he was sure his head would have a price, and she could salvage that much out of it if he proved ungovernable. She might not care for gifts and riches, but if there was one thing she did want, it had to be power. He was pretty sure she could gain a good measure of that should she slay the enemy of the Imperial Order. He bent over the pot between his legs and went back to his dinner and his dark thoughts. Talking to her was useless. They just went around in circles. Richard, she said in a quiet tone, drawing his gaze to her eyes, you think I'm doing this to hurt you or to defeat you because you are the enemy of the Order. I am not. I told you my true reasons. So when you finally find the answer you seek in return for my help, then you will let me go. It was not really meant as a question, but as trenchant incrimination. Go? She stared down into her bowl of rice and sausage, stirring it around as if it might reveal a secret. She looked up. No, Richard, then I will kill you. I see. He hardly thought that was a way to encourage his cooperation in her search, but he didn't say so. And Kalen, After you kill me, I mean. You have my word that if I decide I must kill you, as long as I live, she will too. I have no ill will toward her. He tried to find solace in that much of it. For some reason he believed Nietzsche. Knowing that Kalen would be all right gave him courage. He could endure what was to happen to him, if only she would be all right. It was a price he was willing to pay. So, wife, where are we going? Where is it you're taking me? Nietzsche didn't look at him, but instead used her bread to sop up some of her dinner. She considered his question as she nibbled. Who are you fighting, Richard? Who is your enemy? She took another small bite of her bread. Jagang. Jagang and his imperial order. 
Like an instructor correcting him, Nietzsche slowly shook her head. No, you are wrong. I think perhaps you are in need of answers, too. Games. She was playing foolish games with him. Richard ground his teeth, but held his temper in check. Then who, Nietzsche, who or what am I fighting if it is not Jagang? That is what I hope to show you. She watched his eyes in a way he found unsettling. I am going to take you to the old world, to the heart of the order, to show you what you are fighting, the true nature of what you believe to be your enemy. Richard frowned. Why? Nietzsche smiled. Let's just say it amuses me. You mean we're going back to Tanamura? Back to where you lived all that time as a sister? No. We are going to the heart and soul of the old world, Al Turang, Jagang's homeland. The name means roughly the Creator's Chosen. Richard felt a chill run up his spine. You expect to take me, Richard Rawl, there, into the heart of enemy territory? I hardly doubt we will be living as husband and wife for long. Besides not using your magic, you will not use the name associated with that magic, Rawl, but instead the name you grew up with, Richard Cipher. Without your magic or your name, no one will know you are anyone but a humble man with his wife. That is exactly what you shall be, what we both shall be. Richard sighed. Well, if the enemy should find I'm more, I guess a sister of the dark can exert her influence. No, I can't. Richard's eyes turned up. What do you mean? I can't use my power. Gooseflesh prickled his arms. What? It's devoted to the link with Kalen, to keeping her alive. That is how a maternity spell works. It requires a prodigious amount of power to even establish such a complex spell, much less maintain it. My powers must be invested into the labor of preserving the living link. A maternity spell leaves nothing to spare. I doubt I could make a spark. If we have any trouble, you will have to handle it. Of course I can at any time call upon my ability as a sorceress, but to do so I would have to draw the power from our link. If I do that without her near, Kalen dies. Alarm raced through him. But what if you accidentally... I won't, as long as you take good care of me. Kalen will be safe enough. If, however, I should fall off my horse and break my neck, her neck snaps too. As long as you take good care of me, you are taking good care of her. This is why it's important that we live as husband and wife, so that you can be close at hand, and so that I can guide and help you too. It will be a difficult life with both of us living without our power, just as any other married couple, but I believe this to be necessary if I am to find what I seek from you. Do you understand? He wasn't sure he really did, but he said, yes, anyway. Numb dismay swamped him. He would never have believed this woman would have willingly given up her power for some unspecified knowledge. The very idea of it unleashed cold panic through his veins. Richard couldn't make sense of it. With his mind groping blindly in a world gone insane, he spoke without even considering his words. I'm already married. I'll not sleep with you as your husband. Nietzsche blinked in surprise then let out a dainty titter, covering it with the back of her hand, not in shyness, but at his presumption. Richard felt his ears heating. That is not the way in which I want you, Richard. Richard cleared his throat. Good. In the quiet of the wayward pine, with the rain outside falling in a gentle patter, and the glowing checkered wood hissing softly, Nietzsche's focused, intense, resolute expression turned very cold and very still. But if I should decide I do, Richard... You will comply with that, too. Nietzsche was a beautiful woman, the kind of woman most any man would eagerly accept. It was hardly that, though, that made him believe her. It was the look in her eyes. Never had the vague possibility of the act of sex seemed so vicious. Her voice lost the conversational quality. It went on in a lifeless drone, a thing not human, pronouncing a sentence on his life, a sentence he himself would enforce or Kalen would die. You will act as my husband. You will provide for us as any husband would. You will care for me, and I for you, in the sense of worldly needs. I will mend your shirts and cook your meals and wash your clothes. You will provide us with a living. 
Nietzsche's leaden words slammed into him with the deliberate methodical force of a beating delivered with an iron bar. You will never see Kalin again. You must understand that. But as long as you do as I wish, you will know she lives. In that way, you will be able to show your love for her. Every day she wakes, she will know you are keeping her alive. You have no other way to show her your love. He felt sick to his stomach. He stared off into memories of another place and time. And if I choose to end it, the weight of such madness was so crushing that he earnestly considered it, rather than be your slave, then perhaps that is the form the knowledge I seek will take. Maybe that senseless end will be what I must learn. She brought her first and second fingers together in a snipping motion, simulating the cutting of the umbilical cord of magic that sustained Kalin's life. One last evil convulsion to finally confirm the senselessness of existence. It dawned on Richard that this woman could not be threatened because she was a creature who, he was beginning to understand, welcomed any terrible outcome. Of all there is to me in this world, he whispered in dim agony more to himself and to Kalin than to his implacable captor, there is only one thing that is irreplaceable. Kalin. If I must be a slave in order for Kalin to live, then I shall be a slave. Richard realized Nietzsche was silently studying his face. He met her gaze briefly, then looked away, unable to bear the terrible scrutiny of her beautiful blue eyes while he held the image of Kalin's love in his mind. Whatever you shared with her, whatever happiness, joy, or pleasure will always be yours, Richard. Nietzsche seemed almost to be peering inside him, reading the pages of his past written in his mind. Treasure those memories. They will have to sustain you. You will never see her again, nor she you. That chapter of your life is ended. You both have new lives now. You may as well get used to it, because this is the reality of the situation. The reality of what was. Not the world as he would wish it. He himself had told Kalin that they must act accordingly to the reality of what was and not waste their precious lives wishing for things that could not be. Richard ran his fingertips across his forehead as he tried to hold his voice steady. I hope you don't expect me to learn to be pleased with you. I am the one, Richard, who expects to learn. Fists at his side, Richard shot to his feet. And what is it you wish this knowledge for? he demanded in unrestrained, violent bitterness. Why is it so important to you? As punishment. Richard stared in stunned disbelief. What? I wish to hurt Richard. She smiled distantly. Richard sank back to the ground. Why? he whispered. Nietzsche folded her hands in her lap. Pain, Richard, is all that can reach that cold, dead thing within me that is my life. Pain is the only thing for which I live. He stared numbly at her. He thought about his vision. There was nothing he could do to fight the advance of the Imperial Order. He could think of nothing he could do to fight his fate with this woman. If not for Kalin, he would at that moment have thrown himself into a battle with Nietzsche that would have decided it once and for all. He would have willingly gone to his death fighting this cruel insanity. Except his reason denied him that. He had to live so that Kalin would live. For that and that alone, he had to put one foot in front of the other and march into oblivion. Chapter 27 Kalin yawned as she rubbed her eyes. Squinting, she arched her back and stretched her sore muscles. The terrible, desperate memories swooped in from the sleep-darkened corners of her mind, leaving little chance for any other thoughts to long survive. She was beyond the realm of merciless anguish and crying. She had entered the sovereign dominion of unbridled anger. Her fingers found the cold steel scabbard of his sword lying at her side. It felt alive with icy rage. That, the carving of spirit, and her memories were about all she had of him. There wasn't a lot of firewood, but since they wouldn't be needing much more anyway, Kalin put another stick of what was left into the fire. She squatted, holding her hands close over the top of the feeble flames, hoping to bring feeling to her numb fingers. The wind shifted a little. Pungent smoke billowed up into her face, making her cough. The smoke rolled past her face and followed the rock overhang up and out from their shelter. Kara was gone, so Kalin pushed the little pot of water back onto the fire to warm it for tea for when the Mord Sith returned. Kara was probably visiting their makeshift privy, 
Or maybe she was checking the traps they'd set the night before for rabbits. Kalin didn't hold out any real hope that they would catch a rabbit for their breakfast, not in this weather. They had brought enough provisions in any event. Through slits in the clouds, the crimson light of a cold, crisp dawn penetrated gaps in the snow-crusted limbs of trees to slant in under the rock overhang, casting everything in their little campsite in a blush glow. The two of them had tried without avail to find a wayward pine. The screen of trees, along with a short wall of boughs she and Kara had cut and placed the night before to protect them from the wind as Richard had taught them to do, shielded the secluded spot. With their improvements, it had proven a fit shelter. They had been lucky to find it in the driving snow. Outside, the snow was fairly deep, but in the shelter they had had a relatively dry, if cold, night. Kalin and Kara had huddled together under blankets and their thick wolf fur mantles to keep each other warm. Kalin wondered where Richard was, and if he was cold, too. She hoped not. Probably since he had started out a few days sooner, he had been lucky and had made it down to the lowlands already, avoiding the snow. Kara and Kalin had stayed in their home, as he had asked, for three days. Snow had arrived the morning after he'd left. Kalin had been tempted to wait for a break in the weather before they started out, but she had learned a bitter lesson from Sister Nietzsche. Don't wait. Act. When Richard didn't return, Kalin and Kara had immediately struck out. It was hard going at first. They struggled through the drifts, leading the horses at times, riding them occasionally. They couldn't see very far, and most of the time had to keep the wind from the west at their right shoulder as their only clue as to which direction they faced. It was dangerous traveling over the passes in such conditions. For a time, they feared that they had made a terrible mistake leaving the safety of their house. Through a break in the clouds just before dark the night before, as they were gathering boughs for their shelter, they'd caught a glimpse of the lower hills. They were green and brown, not white. They would be below the snow line before long. Kalin was confident that they were through the worst of it. As she stuffed an arm into a sleeve, pulling another shirt on over the top of the two she was wearing, Kalin heard the crunch of snow underfoot. When she realized it was more than one pair of footsteps, she stood up in a rush. Kara pushed her way through the boughs of the sheltering trees. We have company, she announced in a grim voice. Kalin saw that Kara's fist held her aegeal. A bundled-up squat woman came through the trees, following in Kara's footsteps. Under layers of cloaks, scarves, and other dangling corners of thick cloth, Kalin was surprised to recognize Anne, the old prelate of the Sisters of the Light. Behind Anne came a taller woman. Her scarves pushed back to reveal graying brown hair loose to her shoulders. She had an intense, steady, calculating gaze that had earned her an enduring network of fine wrinkles radiating out from the corners of her deep-set eyes. Her brow was less steady, twitching down several times toward her prominent nose. She looked like a woman who used a switch to teach children. Kalen! Anne rushed forward, seizing Kalen's arms. Oh, my dear, it's so good to see you. She looked back when Kalen glanced up behind her. This is one of my sisters, Alessandra. Alessandra, may I introduce the mother confessor and Richard's wife? The woman stepped forward and smiled. The pleasant grin completely altered her face, instantly erasing the severity of it with open good nature. It was a somewhat disorienting transformation, making her seem like two different people sharing one face. Or, Kalin thought, perhaps one person with two faces. Mother Confessor, it's so good to meet you. Anne has told me all about you and what a wonderful person you are. Her eyes took in the campsite with a quick glance. I'm so happy for you and Richard. Anne's eyes turned left and right, searching. Her gaze snagged on the sword. Where's Richard? Kara wouldn't say a word. She looked up into Kalin's eyes. Dear Creator, she whispered. What's wrong? What's happened? Where's Richard? Kalin finally managed to unclench her teeth. One of your sisters took him. Anne pushed her scarves back off her gray hair and took a hold of Kalin's arm again. The top of Anne's head came up only to Kalin's chest, but she looked at least twice as wide. What are you talking about? What do you mean a sister took him? Which sister? Nietzsche, Kalin growled. Anne pulled back. Nietzsche? Sister Alessandra gasped. Sister Nietzsche? She crossed both hands over her heart. Sister Nietzsche isn't one of Anne's. Nietzsche is a sister of the dark. Oh, I'm well aware of that, Kalin said. We have to get him back, Anne said, at once. He's not safe with her. There's no telling what Nietzsche might... Sister Alessandra's mouth snapped shut. 
The wind carried a sparkling gust into their faces, momentarily whiting out the red dawn. Kalin blinked the snow away. Kara, in her red leather with both a cloak and her heavy fur mantle over top, ignored it. The other two women brushed their heavy woolen mittens across their eyes. Kalin, everything will be all right, Anne said in a reassuring voice. Tell us now what's happened. Tell us everything. Is he hurt? Kalin swallowed against her rising rage. Nietzsche used what she called a maternity spell on me. Anne's mouth fell open. Sister Alessandra gasped again. Are you sure? Anne asked in a careful tone. Are you sure that was what it was? How do you know for sure? She slammed some kind of magic into me. I've never heard of such a spell. And all I know is that it was definitely powerful magic, and she said it was called a maternity spell. She said that it connects us somehow through that magic. Alessandra took a step forward. That doesn't make it a maternity spell. When Kara used her Aegeal on Nietzsche, Kalin said, it dropped me to my knees just the same as if Kara had used the Aegeal on me. Anne and Alessandra shared a silent look. But, but if she were to... Anne stammered. Kalin voiced what Anne was trying to say without saying it. If she were to desire it, Nietzsche could snip that cord of magic and I would die. That was the means by which she captured Richard. She promised I would live if Richard went with her. Richard surrendered himself into slavery to save my life. It can't be, Anne said, touching mitten-covered fingers to her chin. Nietzsche wouldn't know how to use such an unusual spell. She's too young. Besides, such a rare spell requires great power. She must have done something else and just said that it was a maternity spell. Nietzsche couldn't do a maternity spell. Yes, she could, Sister Alessandra said in reluctant disagreement. She has the power and ability. It would only have required someone with the specialized knowledge teaching her. Nietzsche doesn't have any great passion for magic, but she is as able as they come. Lidmilla, Anne whispered to Alessandra in sudden realization. Jagang has Lidmilla. Kalin turned a suspicious glare on Sister Alessandra. And how do you know so much more about Nietzsche's ability than the prelate herself? Sister Alessandra gathered her open cloak back together. Her face lost its warmth and reverted to a scowl, this time, though, with bitterness in the set of her mouth. I brought Nietzsche into the Palace of the Prophets when she was but a child. I was responsible for her upbringing, and I guided her training in the use of her gift. I know her better than anyone. I know her darker powers because I, too, was a sister of the dark. I'm the one who brought her to the Keeper. Kalin could feel herself rocking with the force of her hammering heart. So you, too, are a sister of the dark. Was, Anne said, lifting a cautionary hand before Kalin. The prelate came into Jagang's camp and rescued me. Not just from Jagang, but from the Keeper, too. I once again served the light. The incandescent smile again transformed Alessandra's face. Anne brought me back to the Creator. As far as Kalin was concerned, the claim was not worth the effort of confirmation. How did you find us? Anne ignored the terse question. We must hurry. We must get Richard away from Nietzsche before she delivers him to Jagang. Kalin kept her glare on Alessandra while she answered Anne. She isn't taking him to Jagang. She said she isn't acting on behalf of His Excellency, but on behalf of herself. Those were her words. She said she had removed Jagang's ring from her lip and that she wasn't afraid of him. Did she say why, then, she was taking Richard? Anne asked. Or at least where? Kalin moved her scrutiny back to Anne. She said she was taking him into oblivion. Oblivion, Anne gasped. I asked you a question, Kalin said, anger seeping into her voice. How did you find us? Anne tapped her waist. I have a journey book. I used it to communicate with Verna back with our forces. Verna told me about the messengers coming to see you. That's how I knew where to find you. Lucky I came as soon as I did. We nearly missed you. I can't tell you how happy I am to see you have recovered, Kalin. We were so worried. Kalin saw that Kara, standing behind the two women, still had her Aegeal clenched in her fist. Kalin didn't need an Aegeal. Her confessor's power boiled but an impulse away. She wouldn't again make an error for the sake of caution. The journey book, of course. Then Verna would have told you about Richard's vision that he must not lead our troops against the order. Anne nodded reluctantly, apparently not eager to discuss such a vision. 
Then, a few days ago, Verna sent a message when we were almost here that the Daharans are in quite a state because they suddenly lost their sense of direction to Richard. She said they are still protected from the Dreamwalker by the bond to their Lord Rahl, but they suddenly lost their sense of where he is. Nietzsche cloaked his bond from us, Kara said in a growl. Well, we have to find him, Anne said. We have to get him away from Nietzsche. He's our only chance. Whatever he's thinking, it's nonsense, and we will have to set him straight. But first, we must get him back. He has to lead our forces against the Imperial Order. He is the one named in prophecy. That's why you're here, Kalin whispered to herself. You heard from Verna about his declining to lead the army or even to give orders. You journeyed here in hopes of forcing him to fight. He must, Anne insisted. He must not, Kalin said. He has come to realize that if he leads us into battle, we will lose the cause of liberty for generations to come. He said he came to realize that people don't yet understand freedom and won't fight for it. He must simply prove himself to the people, Anne's scowl reddened. He must prove himself their leader, which he has already begun to do, and they will follow him. Richard says that he has come to understand that it is not he who must prove himself to the people, but the people who must now prove themselves to him. Anne blinked in astonishment. Why, that's nonsense. Is it? Of course it is. The boy was named in prophecy centuries ago. I've been waiting hundreds of years for him to be born in order for him to lead us in this struggle. Really? Then who are you to try to countermand Richard's decision if you are so set on following him? He has come to his decision. If he is the leader you want, then you must abide by his lead and therefore his decision. But this is not what prophecy demands. Richard doesn't believe in prophecy. He believes we make our own destiny. I'm coming to see the grounds of his assertion that the belief in prophecy artificially alters events. It is the misplaced faith in prophecy itself, in some mystical outcome, that harms people's lives. Anne's eyes grew round with dismay and then narrowed. Richard is the one named in prophecy to lead us against the imperial order. This is a struggle for the very existence of magic in this world. Don't you understand that? Richard was born to fight this fight. We have to get him back. This is all your fault, Kalin whispered. What? Anne's frown changed to a tolerant smile. Kalin, what are you talking about? Her voice backslid to genial. You know me. You know our struggle for the survival of freedom of magic. If Richard does not lead us, we have no chance. Kaylin threw her arm out and seized a startled Sister Alessandra by the throat. The woman's eyes went wide. Don't move, Kaylin said through gritted teeth, or I will unleash my confessor's power. Anne held her hands up, imploring. Kaylin, have you lost your mind? Let her be. Calm down. With her other hand, Kaylin pointed down at the fire. The journey book. Throw it in the fire. What? I'm not going to do any such thing. Now, Kaylin said through her clenched teeth, or Sister Alessandra will be mine. When I finish with her, Kara will see to it you throw that journey book in the fire if you have to do so with broken fingers. Anne glanced at the moored Sith towering over her shoulder. Kaylin, I know you're upset and I completely understand, but we're on the same side in this. We love Richard too. We too wish to stop the Imperial Order from taking the whole world. We... We... If it wasn't for you and your sisters, none of this would be happening. This is all your fault. Not your gang's fault. Not the Imperial Order's fault, but yours. Have you lost your... You alone bear responsibility for what is befalling the world. Just as Jagang has his ring through the lips of his slaves, you've had yours through the nose of yours. Richard, you alone bear responsibility for the lives already lost and those yet to be lost in bloody slaughters that will sweep across the land. You, not your gang, are the one who has brought it. Despite the cold, beads of sweat dotted Anne's brow. What in the name of creation are you talking about? Kalen, you know me. I was at your wedding. I have always been on your side. I have only followed the prophecies to help people. You create prophecies. Without your help, they would not have come to pass. They only come about because you have fulfilled them. You pull the ring through Richard's nose. Anne presented a face of calm to the storm of Kalin's rage. Kalin, I can only imagine how you must feel. But now you are truly losing all sense of reason. Am I? 
Am I, prelate? Why does Sister Nietzsche have my husband? Answer me, why? Anne's expression drew tight in a darkening glower. Because she is evil. No. Kalin's grip tightened on Alessandra's throat. It's because of you. Had you not sent Verna into the new world in the first place, ordering her to take Richard back across the barrier into the old world, but the prophecies say the order will rise up to take the world and extinguish magic if we fail to stop them. The prophecies say Richard is the only one to lead us, that Richard is the only one with a chance. And you brought that dead prophecy to life, all by yourself, all because of your faith in bloodless words rather than your own reasoned choices. You're here today not to back the choices of your proclaimed leader, not to reason with him, but to enforce prophecy upon him, to give that ring a tug. Had you not sent Verna to recover Richard, what would have happened, prelate? Why, why, the order... The order? The order would still be trapped back in the old world behind the barrier, wouldn't they? For three thousand years, that wizard-created barrier has stood invincible against the pressure of the order, or those like them, and their wish to swarm up here into the new world, bent on conquest. Because you had Richard captured against his will and ordered him brought back to the old world, all in slavish homage to dead words and dusty old books, he was forced to destroy the barrier. And thus the order now can flood into the new world, into the Midlands, my Midlands, slaughtering my people, taking my husband, all because of you and your meddling. Without you, none of this would be happening. No war, no mounds of butchered people in cities of the new world, no thousands of dead men, women, and children slaughtered at the hands of imperial order thugs, none of it. Because of you and your precious prophecies, the veil was breached and a plague was unleashed on the world. It never would have happened without your actions to save us all from prophecy. I don't even dare to recall all the children I saw suffering and dying from the Black Death because of you. Children who looked up into my eyes and asked if they would be all right, and I had to say yes when I knew they would not survive the night. No one will ever know the tally of the dead. No one is left to remember all the small places wiped out of existence by that plague. Without your meddling, those children would be alive. Their mothers would be smiling to themselves as they watched them play. Their fathers would be teaching them the ways of the world, a world denied them by you for the sake of your faith in prophecy. You say this is a battle for the very existence of magic in this world. Yet your work to fulfill prophecy may have already doomed magic. Without your intervention, the chimes would never have come to be loosed upon the world. Yes, Richard managed to banish them, but what irreversible harm was done. We may have our power back. But during the time the chimes withdrew magic from this world, creatures of magic, things dependent on magic for their very existence, surely died out. Magic requires balance to exist. The balance of magic in this world was disturbed. The irrevocable destruction of magic may have already begun, all because of your slavish service to prophecy. If not for you, prelate, Jagang, the Imperial Order's army, and all your sisters would be back there behind the barrier, and we would be here, safe and at peace. You cast blame everywhere but where it belongs. If freedom, if magic, if the world itself is destroyed, it will all be by your hand, prelate. The low moan of the wind was the only sound, and made the sudden silence all that much more agonizing. Anne stared with tear-filled eyes up at Kalin. Snow sparkled in the rays of a cold dawn. It isn't like that, Kalin. It only seems that way to you in your pain. It is that way, Kalin said with finality. Anne's mouth worked, but this time no words came out. Kalin thrust out her hand, palm up. The journey book. If you think I would not destroy this woman's life, then you don't know the first thing about me. She's one of your sisters, helping to destroy the world in the name of good, or else she is still one of the Keeper's sisters, helping to destroy the world in the name of death. Either way, if you don't give me the journey book, and right now, her life is forfeit. What do you think this will accomplish? Anne whispered in despair. It will be a start at halting your meddling in the lives of the people of the Midlands and the rest of the New World. In my life, in Richard's life, it's the only beginning I can think to make, short of killing you both. You would not like to know how close I am to that alternative. Now, give me the journey book. 
Anne stared down at Kaylin's hand open before her. She blinked at her tears. Finally, she pulled off a woolen mitten and worked the little book out from behind her belt. She paused a moment, reverently gazing at it, but in the end laid it on Kaylin's palm. Dear Creator, Anne whispered, forgive this poor, hurting child of yours for what she is about to do. Kaylin tossed the book in the fire. With ashen faces, Anne and Sister Alessandra stood staring at the book in the hissing flames. Kaylin snatched up Richard's sword. Kara, let's get going. The horses are ready. I was saddling them when these two showed up. Kaylin dumped the hot water to the side while Kara started quickly collecting their belongings. They both stuffed items in the saddlebags. Other gear they slung over their shoulders and carried to the horses to be strapped back on the saddles. Without looking back at Anne or Alessandra, Kaylin swung up into her cold saddle. With a grim Kara at her side, she turned her mount and cantered off into the swirling snow. Chapter 28 as soon as she saw Kaylin and Kara vanish like vengeful spirits into the whiteness, Anne fell to her knees and thrust her hands into the fire to snatch the burning journey book from its funeral pyre in the white-hot coals. Prelate, Alessandra cried, you'll burn yourself. Flinching back from the ferocity of the pain, Anne ignored the gagging stench of burning flesh and thrust her hands again into the wavering heat of the fire. She saw rather than felt that she had the priceless journey book in her fingers. The entire rescue of the burning book took only a second, but through the prism of pain it seemed an eternity. Biting down on her lower lip against the suffering, Anne rolled to the side. Alessandra came running back with her hands full of snow. She threw it on Anne's bloody, blackened fingers, and the journey book clenched in them. She let out a wail of agony when the wet snow contacted the burns. Alessandra fell to Anne's side, taking her hands by the wrists, gasping in tears of fright. Prelate! Oh, Prelate, you shouldn't have. Anne was in a state of shock from the pain. Alessandra's shrill voice seemed a distant drone. Oh, Anne, why didn't you use magic or even a stick? Anne was surprised by the question. In her panic over the priceless journey book burning there in the fire, her mind was filled only with a single thought to get it out before it was too late. Her reckless action, she knew, was precipitated by her bitter anguish over Kaylin's accusations. Hold still, Alessandra admonished through her own tears. Hold still and let me see what I can do about healing you. It will be all right. Just hold still. Anne sat on the snowy ground, dazed by the hurt and by the words still hammering her from inside her head as she let Alessandra work at healing her hands. The sister could not heal her heart. She was wrong, Alessandra said, as if reading Anne's thoughts. She was wrong, prelate. Was she... Anne asked in a numb voice, after the searing pain in her fingers finally began to cease, replaced by the achingly uncomfortable tingling of magic coursing into her flesh, doing its work. Was she, Alessandra? Yes. She doesn't know so much as she thinks. She's a child. She couldn't be a paltry three decades yet. People can't learn to wipe their own noses in that much time. Alessandra was prattling, Anne knew, prattling with her worry over the journey book and with her worry over the anguish caused by Kaylin's words. She's just a foolish child who doesn't know the first thing about anything. There's much more to it, much more. It isn't so simple as she thinks, not so simple at all. Anne wasn't so sure anymore. Everything seemed dead to her. Five hundred years of work. Had it all been a mad task, driven on by selfish desires and a fool's faith? Wouldn't she, in Kaylin's place, have seen it the same way? Endless rows of corpses lay before her in the trial going on in her mind. What was there to say in her defense? She had a thousand answers for the mother confessor's charges, but at that moment they all seemed empty. How could Anne possibly excuse herself to the dead? You're the prelate of the Sisters of the Light, Alessandra rambled on during a pause in her work. She should have been more considerate of who she was talking to, more respectful. She doesn't know everything involved. There's a great deal more to it, a great deal... After all, the Sisters of the Light don't casually choose their prelate. Nor did confessors casually choose their mother confessor. An hour passed, and then another, before Alessandra finally finished the difficult and tedious work of healing Anne's burns. Burns were difficult injuries to heal. It was a tiring experience, being helpless and cold while magic sizzled through her, while Kaylin's words sliced her very soul. 
Anne flexed the aching fingers when Alessandra had finished. A shadow of the burning pain lingered, as she knew it would for a good long time. But they were healed, and she had her hands back. When the matter was weighed, though, she feared she had lost a great deal more of herself than she had recovered. Exhausted and cold, Anne, to Alessandra's worry, lay down beside the hissing remnants of the fire that had so hurt her. At that moment she had no desire to ever rise again. Her years, nearly a thousand of them, seemed to have all caught up with her at once. She missed Nathan terribly right then. The prophet doubtless would have had something wise or foolish to say. Either would have comforted her. Nathan always had something to say. She missed his boastful voice, his kind, childlike, knowing eyes. She missed the touch of his hand. Weeping silently, Anne cried herself to sleep. Her dreams kept the sleep from being either restful or deep. She awoke in late morning to the feel of Alessandra's comforting hand on her shoulder. The sister had added more wood to the fire, so it offered warmth. Are you feeling better, prelate? Anne nodded her lie. Her first thought was for the journey book. She gazed at it lying in the protection of Alessandra's lap. Anne sat up and carefully lifted the blackened book from the sling of Alessandra's dress. Prelate, I'm so worried for you. With a sour wave of her hand, Anne dismissed the concern. While you slept, I've looked at the book, Anne grunted. Looks bad, Alessandra nodded. That's what I thought. I don't think it can be salvaged. Anne used an easy, gentle flow of her Han to hold the pages, little more than ash, together as she carefully turned them. It has endured three thousand years. Were it ordinary paper, it would be beyond help, ended. But this is a thing of magic, Alessandra, forged in the fires of magic by wizards of power not seen in all those three thousand years, until Richard. What can we do? Do you know a way to restore it? Anne shook her head as she inspected the curled, charred journey book. I don't know if it can be restored. I'm just saying that it's a thing of magic. Where there is magic, there is hope. Anne pulled a handkerchief from a pocket deep under the layers of her clothes. Laying the blackened book in the center of the handkerchief, she carefully folded the handkerchief up to hold it together. She wove a spell around it all to protect and preserve it for the time being. I will have to try to find a way to restore it, if I can, if it can even be restored. Alessandra dry-washed her hands. Until then, our eyes with the army are lost. Anne nodded. We won't know if the Imperial Order decides to finally leave their place in the south and move up into the Midlands. I can give no guidance to Verna. Prelate, what do you think will happen if the Order finally decides to attack and Richard isn't there with them? What will they do without the Lord Rawl to lead them? Anne did her best to move the terrible weight of Kalin's words to the side as she considered the immediate situation. Verna is the prelate now, at least as far as the sisters with the army are concerned. She will guide them wisely, and Zed is with them, helping the sisters prepare for battle, should it come. They could have no better counsel than to have a wizard of Zed's experience with them. As first wizard, he has been through great wars before. We will have to place our faith in the Creator that he will watch over them. I can't advise them unless I can restore the journey book. Unless I can do that, I won't even know their situation. You could go there, prelate. Anne brushed snow from the side of her shoulder where she had been lying on the ground as she considered that possibility. The Sisters of the Light think I'm dead. They've put their faith in Verna now as their prelate. It would be a terrible thing to do to Verna and to the rest of the sisters to come back to life in the middle of such trying circumstances. Certainly many would be relieved to have me back, but it also sows the seeds of confusion and doubt. Battle is a very bad time for such seeds to sprout. But they would all be encouraged by your... Anne shook her head. Verna is their leader. Such a thing could forever undermine their trust in her authority. They must not lose their faith in her leadership. I must put the welfare of the Sisters of the Light above all else. I must keep their best interests at heart now. But, Anne, you are the prelate. Anne stared off. What good has that done anyone? Alessandra's eyes turned down. The wind moaned sorrowfully through the trees. Gusts kicked up blue-gray trailers of snow and whipped them along through the campsite. The sunlight had vanished behind somber clouds. Anne wiped her nose on the edge of her icy cloak. Alessandra laid a compassionate hand on Anne's arm. 
You brought me back from the Keeper, back into the light of the Creator. I was in Jagang's hands and treated you terribly when they captured you. Yet you never gave up on me. Who else would have cared? Without you, my soul would be lost for all time. I doubt you could fathom my gratitude for what you did, Prelate. Despite Alessandra's apparent return to the Creator's light, Anne had been fooled by the woman before. Years before, Alessandra had turned to the Keeper, becoming a sister of the dark, and Anne had never known. How could one have faith in a person after such a betrayal? Anne looked up into Alessandra's eyes. I hope so, sister. I pray such is really true. It is, prelate. Anne lifted a hand toward the shrouded sun. And perhaps when I go to the Creator's light in the next world, that one good act will erase the thousands of lives lost because of me? Alessandra looked away, rubbing her arms through the layers of clothes. She turned and put two sticks of wood on the fire. We should have a hot meal. That will make you feel better, prelate. It will make us both feel better. Anne sat on the ground, watching Alessandra prepare her hearty camp soup. Anne doubted that even the pleasant aroma of soup would arouse her appetite. Why do you think Nietzsche took Richard? Alessandra asked as she put dried mushrooms from a pouch into the soup. Anne looked up at Alessandra's puzzled face. I can't imagine except to think that she may be lying, and she is taking him to Jagang. Alessandra broke up dried meat and dropped it into the boiling pot of soup. Why? If she had him, and he was forced to do as she asked, why lie? What would be the purpose? She's a sister devoted to the keeper. Anne lifted her hands and let them flop back into her lap. That's excuse enough to lie, isn't it? Lying is wrong. It's wicked. That's reason enough. Alessandra shook her head in admonition. Prelate, I was a sister of the dark, remember? I know better. That isn't the way it is at all. Do you always tell the truth just because you are devoted to the Creator's light? No. One lies for the Keeper just as you would lie for the Creator, to his ends, if lying is necessary. Why would Nietzsche lie about that? She was in control of the situation and had no need to lie. I can't imagine. Anne had difficulty caring enough to consider the question. Her mind was a morass of hopeless thoughts. It was her fault Richard was in the hands of the enemy, not Nietzsche's. I think she did it for herself. Anne looked up. What do you mean? I think Nietzsche is still looking for something. Looking for something? Whatever do you mean? With a finger, Alessandra brushed a measure of spices into the pot from a waxed paper she'd unfolded. Ever since the first day I took her from her home and brought her to the palace of the prophets, Nietzsche continually grew more detached somehow. She always did whatever she could to help people, but she was always a child who made me feel as if I was inadequate at fulfilling her needs. Such as? Alessandra shook her head. I don't know. She always seemed to me to be looking for something. I thought she needed to find the light of the Creator. I pushed her mercilessly, hoping it would open her eyes to His way and fill her inner need. I allowed her no room to think about anything else. I even kept her away from her family. Her father was a selfish lover of money, and her mother, well, her mother was well-intentioned, but always made me feel uncomfortable. I thought the Creator would fill that private void within Nietzsche. Alessandra hesitated. And then I thought it was the keeper she needed. So you think she took Richard to fill some inner need? How does that make sense? I don't know. Alessandra breathed out heavily in frustration. She stirred the soup as she drizzled in a pinch of salt. Prelate, I think I failed Nietzsche. In what way? I don't know. Perhaps I failed to involve her adequately in the needs of others, gave her too much time to think of herself. She always seemed devoted to the welfare of her fellow man. But maybe I should have rubbed her nose in other people's troubles more, to teach her the Creator's way of virtue through caring more for her fellow man rather than her own selfish wants. Sister, I hardly think that could be it. Once she asked me for an extravagant black dress to wear to her mother's funeral, and, of course, I refused such a profligacy because it was unfitting for a novice needing to learn to put others first. But other than that one time, I never knew Nietzsche to once ask for anything for herself. You did an admirable job with her, Alessandra. Anne recalled that after that, Nietzsche started wearing black dresses. 
I remember that. Alessandra didn't look up. When her father died, I went with her to his funeral. I always felt sorry for taking her away from her family. But I explained to her that she was so talented that she had great potential for helping others and must not waste it. It's always hard to bring young ones to the palace. It's difficult to part a child from loving parents. Some adapt better than others. She told me she understood. Nietzsche was always good that way. She never objected to anything, any duty. Perhaps I assumed too much because she always threw herself into helping others, never once complaining. At her father's funeral, I wanted to help her over her grief. Even though she had that same cool exterior she always had, I knew her. I knew she was hurting inside. I tried to comfort her by telling her not to remember her father like that, but to try to remember him as he was when he was alive. Those are kind words to one in such grief, sister. You offered wise advice. Alessandra glanced up. She was not comforted, prelate. She looked at me with those blue eyes of hers. You remember her blue eyes. Anne nodded. I remember. Well, she looked at me with those piercing blue eyes, like she wanted to hate me, but even that emotion was beyond her. And she said in that lifeless voice of hers that she couldn't remember him as he was when he was alive, because she had never known him when he was alive. Isn't that the strangest thing you've ever heard? Anne sighed. It sounds like Nietzsche. She always was one to say the strangest things at the strangest times. I should have offered her more guidance in her life. I should have taken more interest in her. But there were so many matters needing my attention. No, prelate, that was my job. I failed in it. Somehow I failed Nietzsche. Anne pulled her cloak tighter against a bitter gust of wind. She took the bowl of soup when Alessandra handed it to her. Worse, prelate, I brought her to the shadow of the keeper. Anne looked over the rim of the bowl as she took a sip. She carefully set the steaming bowl in her lap. What's done is done, Alessandra. While Alessandra sipped at her soup, Anne's mind wandered to Kalin's words. They were words spoken in anger and as such were to be forgiven. Or were they to be considered in an honest light? Anne feared to say Kalin's words were wrong. She feared they were true. For centuries, Anne had worked with Nathan and the prophecies trying to avoid the disaster she saw and the ones he pointed out to her. What if Nathan had been pointing out things that were only dead words, as Kalin said? What if he only pointed them out so as to bring about his own escape? After all, what Anne had set in motion with Richard had also resulted in the prophet's escape. What if she had been duped into being the one to bring about all those terrible results? Could that be true? Grief threatened to overwhelm her. She was beginning to greatly fear that she had been so absorbed in what she thought she knew that she had acted on false assumptions. Kalin could be right. The prelate of the Sisters of the Light might be personally responsible for more suffering than any monster born into the world had ever brought about. Alessandra, Anne said in a soft voice after she finished her bowl of soup, we must go and try to find Nathan. It's dangerous for the prophet to be out there in the world that is defenseless against him. Where should we look? Anne shook her head in dismay at the enormity of the task. A man like Nathan does not go unnoticed in the world. I must believe that if we set our minds to it, we could find him. Alessandra watched Anne's face. Well, as you say, it is dangerous for the prophet to be loose in the world. It is indeed. We must find him. It took Verna twenty years to find Richard. So it did, but part of that was by my design. I hid facts from Verna. Then again, Nathan is no doubt hiding facts from us. Nonetheless, we have a responsibility. Verna is with the sisters and with the army. They will do what they can in that capacity. We must go after Nathan. That part of it is up to us. Alessandra set her bowl aside. Prelate, I understand why you believe the prophet must be found. But just as you feel you must find him, I feel I must find Nietzsche. I'm responsible for bringing her to the keeper of the underworld. I may be the only one who can bring her back to the light. I have a unique understanding of that journey of the heart. I fear what will happen to Richard if I don't try to stop Nietzsche. Worse, Alessandra added, I fear what will happen to the world if Richard dies. Kalin is wrong. I believe in what you've worked for all these years. Kalin is making a complex thing sound simple because her heart is broken, but without what you did, she would never even have met Richard. Anne considered Alessandra's words. The seduction of acquittal was undeniable. 
But, Alessandra, we don't have the slightest idea where they went. Nietzsche is as smart as they come. If, as she says, she is acting on her own behalf, she will be clever about not being found. How would you even go about such a search? Nathan is a prophet loose in the world. You remember the trouble he's caused in the past. He could by himself bring about such calamity as the world has never seen. Nathan boasts when he's around people. He will surely leave such traces where he goes. With Nathan, I believe we at least have a chance of success. But hunting for Nietzsche... Alessandra met Anne's gaze with grim resolution. Prelate, if Richard dies, what chance have the rest of us? Anne looked away. What if Alessandra was right? What if Kalin was right? She had to catch Nathan. It was the only way to find out. Alessandra, you don't completely trust me, do you, prelate? Anne met the other woman's eyes, this time with authority. No, Alessandra, I admit that I don't. How can I? You deceived me. You lied to me. You turned your back on the Creator and gave yourself to the Keeper of the Underworld. But I've come back to the light, prelate. Have you? Would not one acting for the Keeper lie for him as you yourself only moments ago suggested? Alessandra's eyes filled with tears. That's why I must try to find Nietzsche, prelate. I must prove that your faith in me was not misplaced. I need to do this to prove myself to you. Or you need to help Nietzsche and the Keeper? I know I'm not worthy of trust. I know that. You said we must find Nathan. But we must also help Richard. Two tasks of the utmost importance, Anne said, and no journey book to call for help. Alessandra wiped at her eyes. Please, prelate, let me help. I'm responsible for Nietzsche going to the Keeper. Let me try to make amends. Let me try to bring her back. I know what the return journey is like. I can help her. Please let me try to save her eternal soul. Anne's gaze sank to the ground. Who was she to question the value of another? What had her life been for? Had she herself been the keeper's best ally? Anne cleared her throat. Sister Alessandra, you are to listen to me, and you are to listen well. I am the prelate of the Sisters of the Light and it is your duty to do as I command. Anne shook a finger at the woman. I'll have no arguments, do you hear? I must go find the prophet before he does something beyond foolish. Richard is of utmost importance to our cause, you know that. I'm getting old and would only slow the search for him and his captor. I want you to go after him. No arguments now. You are to find Richard Rawl and put the fear of the Creator back into our wayward sister Nietzsche. Alessandra threw her arms around Anne, sobbing her thanks. Anne patted the sister's back, feeling miserable about losing a companion, and afraid that she might have lost her faith in everything for which she stood. Alessandra pushed away. Prelate, will you be able to travel alone? Are you sure you're up to this? Bah, I may be old, but I'm not useless. Who do you think came into the center of Jagang's army and rescued you, child? Alessandra smiled through her tears. You did, Prelate all by yourself. No one but you could have done such a thing. I hope I can do half as well for Nietzsche when I find her. You will, sister. You will. May the Creator cradle you in his palm as you go on your journey. Anne knew that they were both going off on difficult journeys that could take years. Hard times lie ahead, Alessandra said. But the Creator has two hands, does he not? One for me and one for you, prelate? Anne couldn't help but smile at such a mental picture. Chapter 29 Come in, Zed grouched to the persistent throat clearing outside his tent. He poured water from the ewer into the dented metal pot that served as his wash basin sitting atop a log round. When he splashed some of the water up onto his face, he gasped aloud. He was astonished that water that cold would still pour. Good morning, Zed. Still gasping, Zed swiped the frigid water from his eyes. He squinted at Warren. Good morning, my boy, Warren blushed. Zed reminded himself he probably shouldn't call someone twice his own age boy. It was Warren's own fault if the boy would just stop looking so young. Zed sighed as he bent to forage for a towel among the litter of maps, dirty plates, rusty dividers, empty mugs, blankets, chicken bones, rope, an egg he'd lost in the middle of a lesson weeks back, and other paraphernalia that seemed to collect over time in the corner of his small field tent. Warren was twisting his purple robes into a small wad at his hip. 
I just came from Verna's tent. Zed halted his search and looked back over his shoulder. Any word? Warren shook his head of curly blonde hair. Sorry, Zed. Well, Zed scoffed, that doesn't mean anything. That old woman has more lives than a cat I once had that was hit by lightning and fell down a well both in the same day. Did I ever tell you about that cat, my boy? Well, yes, you did, actually, Warren smiled. But if you like, I wouldn't mind hearing it again. Zed dismissed the story with a feeble wave as he turned more serious. I'm sure Anne is fine. Verna knows Anne better than I do, but I do know that that old woman is downright hard to harm. Verna said something like that. Warren smiled to himself. Anne always could scowl a thunderstorm back over the horizon. Zed grunted his agreement as he went back to digging through his pile. Tougher than bad meat she is. He tossed two outdated maps over his shoulder. Warren leaned down a little. What is it you're looking for, if you don't mind my asking? My towel, I know I had... Right there, Warren said. Zed looked up. What? Your towel, Warren pointed again. Right there on the back of the chair. Oh. Zed snatched up the wandering towel and dried his dry face. He scowled at Warren. You have the eyes of a burglar. He tossed the towel in the pile with everything else where it belonged. Warren's grin returned. I'll take that as a compliment. Zed cocked his head. Do you hear that? Warren's grin melted away as he joined Zed in listening to the sounds outside. Horses clogged along the hard ground. Men talked as they passed the tent. Others called orders. Fires crackled. Wagons squeaked and gear clanged and rattled. Hear what? Zed's face twisted in vague unease. I don't know. Like maybe a whistle. Warren lifted a thumb over his shoulder. The men whistle now and again to get the attention of their horses and such. Sometimes it's necessary. They all did their best to keep the whistling and other noise down. Whistles, especially, carried in such open terrain. It was hard to miss something the size of the Daharan's encampment, of course, but they moved camp from time to time to keep the enemy from getting too confident about their location. Sound could give away more than they would like. Zed shook his head. Must have been that. Someone's long whistle. But still, Zed, Warren went on. It's long past time when Anne would have sent Verna a message. There were times when I was with Anne that she couldn't send messages. Zed waved an arm expansively. Bags, there was a time when I wouldn't let her use that confounded journey book. The thing gave me the shivers. I don't know why she couldn't just send letters like normal people. His face, he knew, was betraying his concern. Confounded journey books, lazy way of doing things. I got to be first wizard, and I never needed a journey book. She could have lost it. That's what Verna suggested, anyway. Zed held up a finger. That's right. She very well could have. It's small. It could have fallen from her belt, and she didn't notice until she and Alessandra made camp. She'd never find the book in a circumstance like that. He shook the finger. Makes my point, too. You shouldn't depend on little trick things of magic like that. It just makes you lazy. That's what Verna thought, too, about it falling from her belt, I mean. Warren chuckled. Or a cat could even have eaten it. From beneath a furrowed brow, Zed peered at Warren. A cat? What cat? Any cat, Warren cleared his throat. I just meant... Oh, never mind. I never was any good at jokes. Zed's knotted brow lifted. Oh, I see. A cat could have eaten it. Yes, yes, I see. He didn't, but Zed forced a chuckle for the boy's sake. Very good, Warren. Anyway, she probably lost it. It's probably something as simple as that. If that's the case, Zed reasoned, she will likely end up coming here to let us know that she's all right, or at least she will send a letter or messenger or something. Ever more likely, though, she probably had nothing to tell us and simply saw no need to bother with sending a message in her journey book. Warren made a skeptical face. But we haven't had a message from her for nearly a month. Zed waved a hand dismissively. Well, she was way north, up almost to where Richard and Kalen are, last we heard. If she did lose the book and started right out to come here from there, she won't show up for yet another week or two. If she went on to see Richard first, then it will be longer, I imagine. Anne doesn't travel all that fast, you know. I know, Warren said. She is getting up there in years. But that's just another reason why I'm so worried. 
What really worried Zed was the way the journey book went silent, just as Anne was about to reach Richard and Kalin. Zed had been eagerly anticipating hearing that Richard and Kalin were safe, that Kalin was all healed, maybe even that Richard was ready to return. Anne knew how eager they were for word, and would certainly have had something to report. Zed didn't like the coincidence that the journey book went silent right at that time. He didn't like it one bit. The whole thing made him want to scratch as if he'd been bitten by a white mosquito. Now look here, Warren, a month isn't so long not to hear from her. In the past, it's sometimes been weeks and weeks between her messages. It's too early to start getting ourselves all worked up with worry. Besides, we have our own concerns which require our attention. Zed didn't know what they could do even if Anne were in trouble somewhere. They had no idea how to find her. Warren flashed an apologetic smile. You're right, Zed. Zed moved a map and found a half loaf of bread left from the night before. He took a big bite, giving himself an excuse to chew instead of talk. When he talked, he feared he only let out the true level of his worry, not just about Anne, but also about Richard and Kalin. Warren was an able wizard, and smarter than just about anyone Zed had ever met. Zed often had trouble finding something to talk about that Warren hadn't already heard of, or was intimately familiar with. There was something refreshing about sharing knowledge with someone who nodded knowingly at esoteric points of magic that no one else would fathom. Someone who could fill in little gaps in the odd spell or delighted at having his own little gaps filled in by what Zed knew. Warren retained more about prophecy than Zed thought anyone had a right to know in the first place. Warren was a fascinating mix of obstinate old man and callow youth. He was at once set in his ways and at the same time openly, infinitely, innocently curious. The one thing that made Warren fall silent, though, was when they discussed Richard's vision. Warren's face would go blank, and he would sit without comment while others argued over what Richard had said in his letters and if there was any validity to it. Whenever Zed had Warren alone and asked him what he thought, Warren would say only, I follow Richard, he is my friend, and he is the Lord Rawl. Warren would not debate or discuss Richard's instructions to the army, or more specifically, Richard's refusal to give instructions. Richard had given his orders, as far as Warren was concerned, and they were to be swallowed, not chewed. Zed noticed that Warren was twisting his robes again. Zed waved his bread. You look like a wizard with his pants full of itching spells. Do you have something you need to let out, Warren? Warren grinned sheepishly. Am I that obvious? Zed patted the boy on the back. No, Warren, I'm just that good. Warren laughed at Zed's joke. Zed gestured with his bread toward the folding canvas chair. Warren looked behind himself at the chair, but shook his head. Zed figured it must be important if Warren felt he needed to stand to say it. Zed, with winter upon us, do you believe the Imperial Order will attack or wait until spring? Well, now that's always a worry. The not knowing leaves your stomach all in knots. But you've all worked hard. You've all trained and practiced. You'll do just fine, Warren. The sisters, too. Warren didn't seem to be interested in hearing what Zed was saying. He was scratching his temple, waiting his turn to speak. Yes. Well, thank you, Zed. We have been working hard. Um, General Lydon thinks Winter is our best friend right now. He, his Celtish officers, and some of the Daharans believe that Jagang would be foolhardy to start a campaign with Winter just setting in. Kelton isn't all that far north of here. So General Lydon is familiar with the difficulty of winter warfare and the terrain we would fall back to. He's convinced the order is waiting for spring. General Lydon is a good man and may be second in command after General Rybish, Zed said in an even voice as he watched Warren's blue eyes. But I don't agree with him. Warren looked crestfallen. Oh. The general had brought his Celtish division down south a couple of months before to reinforce the Daharan army at General Rybish's request. Regarding Kalin as their queen, since Richard had named her so, the Celtish forces still had an independent streak, even if they were now part of the Daharan Empire, as everyone had taken to calling it. Zed didn't do anything to discourage such talk. It was better for everyone in the New World to be one mighty force than a collection of tribes. As far as Zed was concerned, Richard had clearly had the right instincts in that. A war of this scale would have been ungovernable were the New World not won. 
having everyone think of themselves as part of the Daharan Empire first and foremost, could only help make it so. Zed cleared his throat. But that's just a guess, Warren. I could be wrong. General Leiden is an experienced man and no fool. I could be wrong. But so could Leiden be wrong. I guess that puts you with General Rybish. He's been pacing his tent every night for the last two months, Zed shrugged. Is there something important to you, Warren, that hinges on what the Imperial Order does? Are you waiting for them to make up your mind for you about something? Warren held up his hands as if to ward the very notion. No, no, of course not. It's just that... It's just that it would be a bad time to be thinking about such things is all. But if they were going to lie low for the winter... Warren fussed with his sleeve. That's all I meant. If you thought they were going to wait until spring or something... His voice trailed off. And if they were, then... Warren stared at the ground while he twisted his robes at his stomach into a purple knot. If you think they might decide to move this winter, then it wouldn't be right for me, for us, to be thinking about such things. Zed scratched his chin and changed his approach. Let's say I believe the order is going to sit tight for the winter. Then what might you do in that case? Warren threw his hands up. Zed, will you marry Verna and me? Zed's brow went up as he drew back his head. Bags, my boy! That's a mouthful to swallow first thing in the morning. Warren took two big strides closer. Will you, Zed? I mean, only if you really think the order is going to sit down there in Andereth for the winter. If they are, then, well, then it would be... I mean, we might as well... Do you love Verna, Warren? Of course I do. And does Verna love you? Well, of course she does. Zed shrugged. Then I'll marry the both of you. You will? Oh, Zed, that would be wonderful. Warren turned, reaching one hand toward the tent's opening, lifting his other back toward Zed. Wait, wait there a moment. Well, I was about to flap my arms and fly to the moon, but if you want me to wait... Warren was already out the tent. Zed heard muffled voices coming from outside. Warren came back in, right on Verna's heels. Verna beamed from ear to ear, which Zed found unsettling in its own way, being so unusual. Thank you for offering to marry us, Zed. Thank you. Warren and I wanted you to do the ceremony. I told him you would do it, but Warren wanted to ask you and give you a chance to say no... I can't think of anything more meaningful than being wedded by the first wizard. Zed thought she was a lovely woman, a little fussy about rules and such at times, but well-intentioned. She worked hard. She didn't shy from some of the things Zed had asked of her, and she obviously held Warren in warm regard, as well as respecting him. When? Verna asked. When do you think would be an appropriate time? Zed screwed up his face. Do you two think you can wait until I've had a proper breakfast? They both grinned. We were thinking more along the lines of an evening wedding, Verna said. Maybe we could have a party, with music and dancing, Warren gestured nonchalantly. We were thinking something to make a pleasant break in all the training. A break? How much time do you two think you will be needing away from your duties? Oh, no, Zed. Warren had gone as purple as his robes. We didn't mean we would... I mean, we would still be doing... We would only like... We don't want any time away, Zed, Verna put in, bringing Warren's bashful babbling to an end. We just thought it would be a nice opportunity for everyone to have a well-earned party for an evening. We won't be leaving our posts. Zed put a bony arm around Verna's shoulders. You two can have all the time away you want. We all understand. I'm happy for you both. That's great, Zed, Warren said with a sigh. We really... A red-faced officer burst into the tent without so much as announcing himself. Wizard Zorander! Two sisters charged in right behind him. Prelate! Sister Philippa called. They're coming! Sister Phoebe cried. Both women were white-faced and looked to be on the verge of losing their breakfast. Sister Phoebe was trembling like a wet dog in winter. Zed then saw that Sister Philippa's hair was singed on one side and the shoulder of her dress was blackened. She had been one of those on far watch for the enemy gifted. Now Zed knew what the whistling sound he thought he'd heard was. It was very distant screams. Rolling up from the distance came the note of the secondary waypoint alarm horns. 
Zed felt the faint tingle of magic woven through them, so he knew they were genuine. Outside the tent, the muted sounds of camp life rose into a din of activity. Weapons were being yanked from where they were stacked. Fires hissed as they were doused. Swords were being strapped on. Others were being drawn. Horses whinnied at the sudden racket. Warren seized Sister Philippa's arm and started issuing orders. Get the line coordinated. Don't let them be seen. Keep behind the third ridge. Set the trips close. We need to give the enemy confidence. Cavalry? The woman nodded. Coming in two wings, the officer put in. But they aren't charging yet. They don't want to get out too far ahead of their foot soldiers. Start the first fire behind them, once they're past the blast point, just like we've drilled, Warren told Sister Philippa as she nodded heedfully to his instructions. The intention was to trap any cavalry charge between walls of violent magic. It had to be focused properly to have any hope of piercing the enemy's shields. Prelate! Sister Phoebe said, still panting. You can't imagine the numbers. Dear Creator, it looks like the ground is moving, like the hills are melting men toward us. Verna put a comforting hand to the young sister's shoulder. I know, Phoebe, I know, but we all know what to do. Verna was already ushering the two sisters out and calling for her other aides as yet more officers and returning scouts leaped from horses. A big bearded soldier, sweat running down his face, barged into the tent, gasping for his breath. The whole blasted force, all of them. Cavalry with lances, enough to break their way and then some, another man shouted into the tent from atop a lathered horse, pausing only long enough to deliver the news to Zed before charging off. Archers, Zed asked the two soldiers, still in his tent. The officer with the beard shook his head. Too far to tell, he gulped air. But I'd bet my life they're right behind the pikemen's shields. No doubt, Zed said. When they get close enough, they'll show themselves. Warren grabbed the bearded officer's sleeve and pulled him along behind as he trotted out of the tent. Don't worry. When they show themselves, we'll have something to put out their eyes. The other man ran on to his duties. In an instant, Zed was standing alone in his tent, lit from the outside by early morning winter sun. It was a cold dawn. It would be a bloody day. Outside the tent, the racket exploded into the uproar of practiced pandemonium. Everyone had a job and knew it well. These were mostly battle-tested the Harans. Zed had snuck close and had seen how fearsome the Imperial Order troops looked, but the Daharans were their match in Gristle. For generations, Daharans prided themselves on being the fiercest fighters in existence. For a good part of his life, Zed had battled Daharans who had proven their boasts true. Zed could hear someone shouting, Move! 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 It sounded like General Rybish. Zed dashed to the tent's opening, pausing at the brink of a river of men flowing past in a great churning mass. General Rybish skidded to a halt just outside the tent. Zed, we were right. Zed nodded his disappointment to have surmised the enemy's plans. This was one time he wished he'd been wrong. We're breaking camp, General Rybish said. We've not much time. I have already ordered the advance guard to shift their positions north to cover the supply wagons. Is it all of them or just a jab to test us? It's the whole bloody lot. Dear spirits, Zed whispered. At least he had made what plans for this eventuality as could be made. He had trained the gifted to expect this so they wouldn't be thrown off balance. It would come just as Zed told them it would. That would aid their confidence and give them courage. The day hinged on the gifted. General Rybish swiped his meaty hand across his mouth and jaw as he looked to the south toward an enemy he couldn't yet see. The early sun made his rust-colored hair look red, and the scar that ran from his left temple to his jaw stand out like a streak of frozen white lightning. Our sentries pulled back along with the outer lines, no use in them standing ground since it's the whole imperial order. Zed quickly nodded his agreement. We'll be the magic against magic for you, General. The man had a lusty glint in his grayish-green eye. We're the steel for you, Zed. We'll show them bastards a lot of both today. Just don't show them too much too soon, Zed warned. I'm not about to change our plans now, he said over the sound of the tumult. Good. Zed snatched the arm of a soldier running past. You, I need your help. Pack up my things in there for me, would you, lad? I need to get to the sisters. General Rybish gestured the young soldier into Zed's tent, and the young man leaped to the task. The scouts said they're all staying on this side of the Dron River, just as we hoped. 
Good. We won't have to worry about them flanking us, at least not from the west. Zed swept his gaze over the dissolving camp as the men swiftly set about their jobs. He looked back to the general's weathered face. Just get our men north into those valleys in time, general, so that we can't be surrounded. The gifted will cover your tails. We'll plug up the valleys, don't you worry. The river isn't frozen over yet, is it? General Ribus shook his head. Maybe enough for a rat to skate on, but not the wolf that's after him. That should keep them from crossing, Zed squinted off to the south. I have to go check on Addie and her sisters. May the good spirits be with you, General. They won't need to watch your back. We'll do that. General Rybish caught Zed's arm. There's more than we thought, Zed. Twice the number, at least. If my scouts weren't just stuttering, there may be three times their number. Think you can slow that many down while keeping them focused on trying to sink their teeth into my backside? The plan was to draw the enemy north while staying just out of their reach, close enough to make them salivate, but not close enough to let them get a good bite. Crossing the river at this time of year would be impractical for an army that size. With the river on one side and the mountains on the other, a force the size of the Imperial Order couldn't so easily surround and overwhelm the Daharan Empire troops, who were outnumbered ten or twenty to one. The plan, too, was designed to keep in mind Richard's admonition about not attacking directly into the order. Zed wasn't sure about the validity of Richard's warning, but knew better than to so openly tempt ruin. Hopefully, once they enticed the enemy into that tighter terrain, terrain more defensible, the order would lose some of their advantage, and their advance could be halted. Once the imperial order was stalled, the Daharans could begin working the enemy down to size. The Daharans thought nothing of being outnumbered. It just gave them a better opportunity to prove themselves. Zed stared off, imagining the hillsides darkened with the enemy pouring forth. He was already seeing the lethal powers he would unleash. He knew, too, that in battle things rarely went as planned. Don't you worry, General. Today the Imperial Order is going to begin paying a terrible price for its aggression. The grinning general clapped Zed on the side of the shoulder. Good man. General Rybish charged off, calling for his aides and his horse, collecting a growing crowd of men around him as he went. It had begun. Chapter 30 Arms resting on his thighs, Richard crouched in the belly of the beast. Well, Nietzsche asked from atop her horse. Richard stood beside a rib bone that towered to well over twice his height. He shielded his eyes against the golden sunlight as he briefly scanned the empty horizon behind himself. He looked back to Nietzsche, her hair honeyed by the low sun. I'd say it was a dragon. When her mare began to dance sideways, trying to put distance between itself and the expanse of bones, Nietzsche took the slack out of the reins. Dragon, she repeated in a flat voice. Here and there, dried scraps of meat stuck to the bones. Richard swished a hand at the cloud of flies buzzing around him. The faint stench of decay hung over the sight. As he stepped out of the cage of giant rib bones standing belly up, he gestured toward the head, nestled in a bed of brown grass. There was enough room to walk between the ribs without them touching his shoulders. I recognized the teeth. I had a dragon's tooth once. Nietzsche looked skeptical. Well, whatever it is, if you've seen enough, let's be on our way. Richard brushed his hands clean. The stallion snorted and stepped away from him when he approached. The horse didn't like the smell of death and didn't trust Richard after having been near it. Richard stroked the glossy black neck. Steady boy, he said in a comforting voice. Easy now. When she saw Richard finally mount up, Nietzsche turned her dappled mare and started off once more. The late afternoon light cast long, clawed shadows of the rib bones toward him, as if reaching out, calling him back to the ghost of some terrible end. He glanced back over his shoulder at the length of the skeletal remains stretched out in the middle of an empty, gently rolling grassland before urging his stallion into a trot to catch up with Nietzsche. His horse needed little encouragement to be away from the dying place and happily sprang into his easy, loping gallop instead. In the month or so Richard had spent with the horse, the two of them had become used to each other. The horse was willing enough, but never really friendly. Richard wasn't interested enough to go to the effort of doing more. Making friends with a horse was just about the last of his concerns. 
Nietzsche hadn't known if the horses had names and didn't seem interested in naming animals, so Richard simply called the black stallion boy and Nietzsche's dapple gray mare girl and left it at that. Nietzsche seemed neither pleased or displeased about him naming the horses. She simply went along with his convention. Do you actually believe it's the remains of a dragon? Nietzsche asked when he caught up with her. The stallion slowed and, glad to be back in the herd, gave the mare's flanks a nuzzle. Girl merely turned her closest ear toward him in recognition. It's about the right size as I remember. Nietzsche tossed her head to flick her hair back over her shoulder. You're serious, aren't you? Richard frowned his puzzlement. You saw it. What else could it possibly be? She conceded with a sigh. I just thought it was the bones of some long extinct beast. With flies still buzzing around it? It still had a few bits of sinew dried to the bones. It's not some ancient thing. It couldn't be much older than six months, possibly much less. She was watching him from the corner of her eye again. So they really do have dragons in the New World? In the Midlands, anyway. Where I grew up, there were none. Dragons, as I understand it, have magic. There was no magic in Westland. When I came here, I saw a red dragon. From what I heard, they're very rare. And now there was at least one less. Nietzsche was little concerned about the remains of an animal, even if it was a dragon. Richard had long ago decided that, as much as he lusted to crush her skull, he would have a better chance of figuring a way out of his situation if he didn't antagonize her. Battling another person sapped your own strength, making it more difficult to reason your way out of the trouble. He kept his mind focused on what was most important to him. He couldn't force himself to pretend to befriend Nietzsche, but he tried to give her no cause to become angry enough to hurt Kalin. So far, it had been successful. Nietzsche didn't seem easily inclined to anger anyway. When she became displeased, she submerged back into an indifference which seemed to smother her distant rancor. They finally reached the road from where they had spotted the white speck that had turned out to be the remains of the dragon. What was it like growing up in a place with no magic? Richard shrugged. I don't know. That's just the way it was. It was normal. And you were happy? Growing up without magic, I mean. Yes, very happy. The frown returned to his face. Why? And yet, you fight to keep magic in the world, so other children will have to grow up with it. Am I right? Yes. The Order wishes to rid the world of magic so that people can grow up happy without the poisonous fog of magic always outside their door. She glanced over at him. They want children to grow up much like you did, and yet you fight this. It was not a question, so Richard chose not to turn it into one for her. What the Order chose to do was not his concern. He turned his thoughts to other things. They were traveling east-southeast on a road traversed by the odd trader. They had smiled and nodded at two that day. The road, as it took the easiest route across the rolling hills, had that afternoon begun to turn more to the south. As they crested a rise, Richard spotted a flock of sheep in the far distance. Not far ahead, they had been told, was a town where they could pick up some needed provisions. The horses could use some grain, too. Over his left shoulder to the northeast, snow-capped mountains, turning pink in the late sunlight, rose up out of the foothills. To his right, the ground rolled off into the wilds. Beyond the town, it wouldn't be too far until they crossed the Kern River. They were not far at all from what used to be the wasteland where the Great Barrier had stood. They were close to cutting south into the old world. Even though there was no longer a barrier to prevent his return once they crossed over, he felt downhearted about leaving the new world. It was like leaving Kalin's world, like leaving her by one more degree. As fiercely as he loved her, he could feel her slipping farther and farther into the distance. Nietzsche's blonde hair fluttered in the breeze as she turned toward him. It said... They used to have dragons in the old world, too. Richard brought himself out of his brooding. But no more, he asked. She shook her head. How long ago was that? Long ago. No one living has ever seen one. And that includes sisters living at the palace. He thought about it as he rode, listening to the rhythmic clop of hooves. Nietzsche had proven forthcoming, so he asked, Do you know why not? I can only tell you what was taught to me, if you would like to hear it. When Richard nodded, she went on. 
During the Great War, at the time when the barrier between the old and new worlds was raised, the wizards in the old world worked toward revoking magic from the world. Dragons could not exist without magic, so they went extinct. But they still existed here. On the other side of the barrier, it may be that the old wizards' suppression of magic on their side had only a local or even temporary effect. After all, magic still exists. So obviously they failed to achieve their ends. Richard was getting an uneasy feeling as he considered both Nietzsche's words and the bones he had seen. Nietzsche, may I ask you a question, a serious question, about magic? She gazed over at him as she slowed her horse to an easy walk. What is it you wish to know? How long do you think a dragon could exist without magic? Nietzsche considered his question for a moment, but in the end let out a sigh. I only know about the history of the dragons in the old world as it was taught. As you know, words written that long ago are not always dependable. It would only be an educated guess. I would say it could be mere moments, possibly days, or even longer, but not a great deal longer. It's a much simplified version of asking how long a fish could live out of water. Why do you ask? Richard raked his fingers back through his hair. When the chimes were here, in this world, they drew away magic. All of the magic, or nearly all anyway, was withdrawn from the world of life for a time. She turned her eyes back to the road. My estimation is that the withdrawal was total for a time at least. That was what he had feared. Richard considered her words along with what he knew. Not all creatures of magic depend on it. Us, for example. We are, in a way, creatures of magic but we can live without it, too. I'm wondering if creatures that depended on magic for their very existence might not have made it through until the chimes were banished and magic was restored to the world of life. Magic was not restored. Richard pulled his horse up short. What? Not in the way you are thinking about it. Nietzsche circled around to face him. Richard, while I have no direct knowledge with precisely what happened, such an event could not be without consequence. Tell me what you know. She frowned in curiosity. Why do you look so concerned? Nietzsche, please, just tell me what you know. She folded her wrists over the horn of her saddle. Richard, magic is a complex matter, so there can be no certainty. She held up a hand to forestall his cascade of questions. This much, though, is certain. The world doesn't stay the same. It changes continuously. Magic is not merely part of this world. Magic is the conduit between worlds. Do you understand? He thought he might. I accidentally used magic to call forth the spirit of my father from the underworld. I banished him back to the underworld with the use of magic. The mud people, for example, use magic to communicate with their spirit ancestors beyond the veil in the underworld. I had to go to the Temple of the Winds in another world when Jagang sent a sister there to start a plague, which she brought back from that world. And what do all of those things have in common? They used magic to bridge the gap between worlds. Yes, but there is more. Those worlds exist, but they are dependent on this one to define them, are they not? You mean like life is created into this world, and after death souls are taken by the keeper to the underworld? Yes, but more. Do you see the connection? Richard was getting lost. He hadn't grown up knowing anything about magic. We're caught between the two realms? No, not exactly. Her blue eyes flashed with intensity. She waited until his gaze steadied on hers. Then she held up a finger to mark the importance of her words. Magic is a conduit between worlds. As magic diminishes, those other worlds are not just more distant to us. But the power of those worlds in this world diminishes. Do you see? Richard was getting goosebumps. You mean the other worlds have less influence, like... like a child who has grown and his parents have less influence over him? Yes. In the fading light, her eyes seemed more blue than usual. As the worlds grow more separate, it is something like a child growing and leaving home. But there is more to it yet. She leaned forward ever so slightly in her saddle. You see, those other worlds can be said to exist only by their relationship to life, to this world. At that moment, 
she seemed like nothing to him so much as what she really was, a 180-year-old sorceress. It might even be said, she whispered in a voice that sounded like the shadows speaking, that without magic to link those other worlds to this, those other worlds cease to exist. Richard swallowed. You mean just as the child grows and leaves home, the parents become less important to his existence. When they eventually grow old and die, even though they were once vital and strongly linked to him, when they now cease to exist, he lives on without them. Exactly, she hissed. The world changes, he said almost to himself. The world doesn't stay the same. That's what Jagang wants. He wants magic and those other worlds to cease to exist so that he will have this one all for himself. No, she said in a soft voice. He wishes it not for himself, but for mankind. Richard started to argue, but she cut him off. I know, Jagang. I'm telling you what he believes. He may enjoy the spoils, but in his heart he believes he is doing this for mankind, not himself. Richard didn't really believe her, but he didn't see any point in quarreling with her. Either way, because of the changes taking place, such creatures as dragons might have already become extinct. Those white bones could very well have been the remains of the last red dragon. Because of events like the chimes, the world may already have irrevocably changed to a point where creatures of magic have died out, she said, as she stared out over the empty twilight. In an evolving world such as I describe, magic, even such as ours, would soon die out, too. Do you see now? Without that conduit to other worlds, worlds that may no longer exist, magic would not come into existence when offspring of the gifted are born. One thing was sure. When the time came, he was going to make Nietzsche extinct. As they rode on, Richard gazed back over his shoulder at bones he could no longer see. It was well after dark when they rode into the town. When Richard inquired of a passerby, he was told that the town, Ripley, was named after the rippling foothills. It was a quiet place, often a nearly forgotten corner of the Midlands, it's back to what used to be the wasteland, from where no one ever returned. Many of the people grew wheat and raised sheep to provide themselves with trade goods while keeping small animals and gardens for themselves. There was a road coming in from the southwest, from Renwald, and other roads going off to the north. Ripley was a crossroads for trade between Renwald, the people of the wilds who traded at that outpost city, and villages to the north and east. Now, of course, Renwald was gone. The Imperial Order had sacked the city. Now, with only ghosts inhabiting the streets of Renwald, the people of the wilds who traded their goods there would suffer. The people from the towns and villages who came to Ripley would suffer, too. Ripley was falling on hard times. Richard and Nietzsche created a small sensation. Strangers traveling through had become a sporadic event, what with Renwald gone. The two of them were tired, and there was an inn, but raucous drinking was going on there, and Richard didn't want to have to deal with that kind of trouble. There was a well-kept stable at the other end of town from the inn, and the man who owned it offered to let them stay in the hayloft for a silver penny each. The night was cold, and it would be warmer in the hayloft out of the wind, so Richard paid the man the penny each for themselves and three more for the horses to be cared for and fed. The taciturn stable owner was so pleased with the extra money for the horses that he told Richard he would tend their shoes while he had them. When Richard thanked him and told them they were tired, the man smiled for the first time and said, I'll be seeing to your horses, then. I hope you and your wife sleep well. Good night, then. Richard followed Nietzsche up the rough wooden ladder at the back of the barn. They had a cold dinner sitting in the hay as they listened to the stable owner fetching grain and water for their horses. Richard and Nietzsche had only the bare bones of necessary conversation before they rolled themselves up in their cloaks and went to sleep. When they woke a little after dawn, they discovered a small gathering of skinny children and hollow-cheeked adults come to see the rich folks traveling through. Apparently their horses, better than any that had boarded the stable in a long time, had been the source of gossip and speculation. When Richard greeted the people, he got back only vacant looks. When he and Nietzsche walked to the supply store, not far away past a few drab buildings, the people all followed as if it were a king and queen come to town, and they all wanted to see what such high-born people did with their day. 
Goats and chickens wandering Ripley's main street scattered before the procession. A milk cow cropping brown grass behind the leather shop paused for a look. A rooster atop a stump flapped his wings in annoyance. When the bolder children asked who they were, Nietzsche told them that they were only travelers, husband and wife, looking for work. Such news was greeted with skeptical tittering. In her fine black dress, the people took Nietzsche for a queen looking for a kingdom. They thought only a little less of Richard. When an older boy asked where they were going to look for work, as there was little to be found in Ripley, Nietzsche told them that they were going to the old world. Some of the adults snatched up children and hurried away, yet more remained close on Richard and Nietzsche's heels. An older man who owned the supply store gently shooed the people away from his door when Richard went in. Once Richard had gone inside, he watched the people grow bolder and begin pawing at Nietzsche, begging for money, for medicine, for food. Nietzsche stayed outside with the people, asking them about their troubles and their needs. She moved through the crowd, inspecting the children. She had that blank look on her face that Richard didn't like. What can I get you? the proprietor asked. Ah, uh, what about those people? Richard asked instead. He glanced out the sparkling, clean little window to see Nietzsche standing in the middle of the ragged group, talking about the Creator's love for them. They all listened as if she were a good spirit come to comfort them. Well, there are all sorts, the shop owner said. Most wandered in from the old world after the barrier came down. Some are just no good locals, drunks and such, who'd just as soon beg or steal as work. When strangers from the old world came in, some of the people here joined their ways. We get traders through here and men like that with goods to protect. Find they have less trouble if they're generous with that sort. Some of them out there are folks who've had trouble, widows with children who can't find a husband, things like that. A few of them will work for me when I have work, but most won't. Richard was about to give the man a list of their needs when Nietzsche glided in the door. Richard, I need some money. Rather than argue with her, he passed her the saddlebag with the money. She reached in and pulled out a handful of gold and silver. The shop owner's eyes went wide when he saw how much she had in her fist. She paid him no heed. Richard stood slack-jawed as he watched Nietzsche back out with the crowd, giving away all the money. Arms waved and reached for her. People cried out all the louder. A few ran off with what she had given them. Richard pulled open the saddlebag, peering in to see how much they had left. It wasn't much. He could hardly believe what Nietzsche had just done. It made no sense. How about some barley flour, some oatmeal, some rice, some bacon, lentils, dried biscuits, and salt? He asked the waiting proprietor. No oatmeal, but I've got the rest. How much do you want? Richard was running calculations through his head. They had a long journey, and Nietzsche had just given away most of their money. They'd used up the better portion of the supplies they had. He laid six silver pennies on the counter. Just what that will buy us. He pulled his pack off his back and set it on the counter beside the money. The man scooped up the coins and sighed at the money he had almost made. He began pulling the items down from a shelf and placing them in the pack. As he worked... Richard requested a few other small things he remembered as the man was going about getting the order. He parted with another penny. Richard had only a few silver pennies, two silver crowns, and no gold left. Nietzsche had handed out more money than most of those people had ever seen in their entire lifetimes. Worried about what they were going to do for supplies in the future, Richard slung his pack onto his back when the shop proprietor had finished and rushed out to see if he couldn't slow Nietzsche down. She was lecturing on the Creator's love of every man and asking the people to forgive the cruelty of heartless and uncaring people as she handed the last gold coin to an unshaven man without teeth. He grinned his thanks and then licked his parched lips. Richard knew how he would wet them. There were yet more pleading hands thrusting toward her. Worried, Richard seized Nietzsche's arm and pulled her back. She turned toward him. We have to get back to the stables, she said. That's what I'm thinking, Richard said, holding his anger in check. Let's hope the stable man is done with them by now so we can get out of here. No, she said with a look of grim finality in her eye. We need to sell the horses. What? Richard blinked in angry astonishment. May I at least ask why? To share what we have with those who have nothing. Richard was beyond words. He just stared at her. How are they going to travel? He considered the question briefly 
and decided that he didn't really care how soon they got to wherever it was she was taking him. But they would have to carry everything. He was a woods guide and used to walking with a pack, so he guessed he could walk. He let out his breath and turned toward the stables. We need to sell the horses, Richard told the stable owner. The man frowned, looked at the horses standing in their stalls, and then back at Richard. He looked thunderstruck. Those are mighty fine horses, mister. We don't have horses like this around here. You do now, Nietzsche said. He glanced uneasily at her. Most people were uneasy gazing at Nietzsche, either because of her startling beauty or because of her cool, often denunciative presence. I can't pay what horses like this are worth. We didn't ask you to, Nietzsche said in a dull voice. We only ask to sell them to you. We need to sell them. We'll take what you can give us. The man's eyes shifted from Richard's to Nietzsche's and back. Richard could tell the man was uneasy about cheating them in such a way, but he couldn't seem to figure out how to turn down such an offer. All I can pay is four silver marks for the both of them. Richard knew they were worth ten times that much. And the tack, Nietzsche said. The man scratched his cheek. I guess I could throw in another silver, but that's all I got to my name. I'm sorry. I know they're worth more. But if you're bound and determined for me to buy them off you, that's all I got. Is there anyone else in town who might buy them for more? Richard asked. I don't believe so, but to tell you the truth, son, it wouldn't be hurting my feelings if you were to go ask around. I don't like swindling folks. And I know you couldn't call five silver marks for the horses and tack anything else but a swindle. The man kept glancing at Nietzsche, seeming to suspect that this transaction was beyond Richard's ability to control. Her steady blue eyes could make any man fidget. We accept your offer, Nietzsche said without any hesitation or uncertainty. I'm sure it's quite fair. The man sighed unhappily at his windfall. I don't have that much money on me. I'll go in the house. He lifted a thumb over his shoulder. Out back of the barn and get it, if you'd be so good as to wait a minute. Nietzsche nodded, and he hurried on his way, not so much eager to consummate the deal, Richard thought, as he was eager to be out from under Nietzsche's gaze. Richard turned to her, feeling his face heating. What's this all about? He saw through the partly open stable doors that the crowd of people who had followed them were still out there. She ignored his question. Get your things, whatever you can carry. As soon as he comes back, it's time we were on our way. Richard pulled his glare from her. He stalked over to his gear, sitting outside Boy's stall, and began stuffing everything he could into his pack. He strapped the water skins around his waist and flipped the saddlebags over his shoulder. He was sure the stable owner wouldn't complain about not having the saddlebags with the rest of the tack. Richard thought that when they reached a more prosperous town, he could at least sell the saddlebags. While he worked, Nietzsche put her belongings into a pack she could carry. When the man came back with the money, he offered it to Richard. Nietzsche held out her hand. I'll take it, she said. He glanced to Richard's eyes once and then handed Nietzsche the money. I threw in the silver pennies you paid me last night. That's all I have, I swear. Thank you, Nietzsche said. That was very generous of you to share what you have. That is the Creator's way. Without another word, Nietzsche turned and strode through the dimly lit stable and out the door. It's my way, the man muttered under his breath to her back. Creator had no say in it. Outside in the sunlight, Nietzsche began doling out the money she had just gotten for the horses. The people vied for her favor as she walked among them, speaking to them, asking questions, until she was out of sight past the edge of the barn door. Richard gave Boy a quick rub on the blaze of his forehead, hoisted his saddlebags onto his shoulder, and turned to the dumbfounded expression on the stable owner's face. He and Richard shared a helpless look. I hope she's a good wife to you, the man finally said. Richard wanted to say that Nietzsche was a sister of the dark and that he was her prisoner, but in the end he decided that it could serve no purpose. Nietzsche had made it clear to him that he was Richard Cipher, her husband, and she was Nietzsche Cipher, his wife. She had told him to stick to that story, for Kalin's sake. She's just generous, Richard said. That's why I married her. She's good to people. Richard heard a woman's cry and shouting. He bolted for the partly open door and ran out into the bright morning sunlight. He didn't see anyone. He raced around to the side of the barn to where he heard scuffling. 
A half dozen men had Nietzsche down on the ground, some swinging at her with their fists as she tried to fend them off with her bare hands. Others pawed at her, searching for a money pouch. They were fighting over the unearned before it was even out of her hands. A crowd of women, children, and other men stood around the scene in the circle, vultures waiting to pick the bones. Richard crashed through the ring of people, seized the closest man by the back of his collar, and heaved him back. He was skinny and flew through the air, crashing into the wall of the barn. The whole building shook. Richard kicked another in the ribs, tumbling him off Nietzsche and through the dirt. A third man spun and took a mighty swing at Richard. Richard caught the fist and bent it down until he felt a snap as the man cried out. At that, the men all scattered in every direction. Richard started after one of them, but Nietzsche suddenly flew at him, restraining him. Richard, no! In his rage to get at the man, Richard nearly smashed her face, but when he realized it was her, lowered his fists to his side as he glared at the crowd. Please, my lord, please, my lady, one of the women wailed. Have mercy on us, woeful folk. We's just the creator's miserable wretches. Have mercy on us. You're a bunch of thieves, Richard yelled, thieving from someone who was trying to help you. He made an effort to go after the lot of them, but Nietzsche held his wrists down. Richard, no! The people vanished like mice before a hissing cat. Nietzsche let Richard's fists drop. He saw then that she had blood on her mouth. What's the matter with you? Giving money to people who would rather rob you than wait for you to hand it to them willingly? Why would you give money to such vermin? That's enough. I'll not stand here and listen to you insult the Creator's children. Who are you to judge? Who are you with a full belly to say what's right? You have no idea what those poor people have been through, and yet you are quick to judge. Richard took a purging breath. He reminded himself yet again of what he had to keep uppermost in his mind. It was not really Nietzsche he had been protecting. He pulled a shirt sleeve from the corner of his pack, wet it with water from a water skin hanging around his waist, and carefully wiped her bloody mouth and chin. She winced as he worked, but without protest let him inspect her injury. It's not bad, he told her, just a cut in the corner of your mouth. Hold still now. She stood quietly as he held her head in one hand while he cleaned the blood off the rest of her face with the other. Thank you, Richard. She hesitated. I was sure one of them was going to cut my throat. Why didn't you use your Han to protect yourself? Have you forgotten? To do that, I would have to take power from the link keeping Kalin alive. He looked into her blue eyes. I guess I forgot. In that case, thank you for restraining yourself. Nietzsche said nothing as they walked out of the town of Ripley, carrying everything they owned on their backs. As cold as the day was, it wasn't long before his brow was dotted with sweat. Finally, he could stand it no longer. Do you mind telling me what that was all about? Her brow twitched. Those people were needy. Richard pinched the bridge of his nose, pausing in an effort to remain civil to her. And so you gave them all our money? Are you so selfish that you would not share what you have? Are you so selfish that you would ask the hungry to starve, the unclothed to freeze, the sick to die? Does money mean more to you than people's lives? Richard bit the inside of his cheek to check his temper. And the horses? You virtually gave them away. It was all we could get. Those people were in need. Under the circumstances, it was the best we could do. We acted with the most noble of intentions. It was our duty to not be selfish and to joyfully give these people what they needed. There was no road going their way as they walked on into what had not long ago been the wasteland from which no one returned. We needed what we had, he said. Nietzsche glanced up into his eyes. There are things you need to learn, Richard. Is that right? You have been lucky in life. You have had opportunities ordinary people never have. I want you to see how ordinary people must live, how they must struggle just to survive. When you live like them, you will understand why the order is so necessary, why the order is the only hope for mankind. When we get to where we're going, we will have nothing. We will be just like all the other miserable people of this wretched world, with little chance to make it on our own. You don't have any idea what that's like. I want you to learn how the compassion of the order helps ordinary people live with the dignity they are entitled to. Richard returned his gaze to the empty land stretching out before them. A sister of the dark who couldn't use her power 
and a wizard who was forbidden from using his. He guessed they couldn't get any more ordinary than that. I thought it was you who wanted to learn, he said. I am also your teacher. Teachers sometimes learn more than their students. Chapter 31 Zed lifted his head when he heard the distant horns. He struggled to regain his senses. He was well past dread into a world of little more than numb awareness. The horns were those meant to signal the approach of friendly forces, probably some of the scouting patrols, or perhaps yet more wounded being brought in. Zed realized he was slumped on the ground. His legs sprawled out to the side. He saw that he had been sleeping with his head on the burly chest of a cold corpse. In despair, he recalled that he had been trying everything he knew to heal the horribly wounded man. In mournful revulsion, he pushed away from the cold body and sat up. He rubbed his eyes against the darkness from within as well as the night. He was beyond aching. Acrid smoke hung thick as fog. The air reeked with a heavy, throat-clenching stink of blood. From various places around him he could see the drifting haze illuminated around glowing orange fists of firelight. The moans of the wounded lifted from the blood-soaked ground to drift through the frigid night air. In the distance men cried out in pain. When Zed wiped a hand across his brow, he realized he wore gloves of crusted blood from those he had been trying to heal. It was an endless task. Not far away, the ground was littered with shattered tree trunks, blasted asunder by the enemy gifted. Men lay sprawled, torn apart or impaled by huge splintered sections of those trees. It had been two of Jagang's sisters who had done it just before dark as the Daharan forces were all collecting into the valley, thinking the battle had ended. Zed and Warren had ended it by taking those two sisters down with wizard's fire. By the dull ache in his head, Zed knew he hadn't been asleep for more than a couple of hours at most. It had to be the middle of the night. People passing by had let him sleep, or maybe they thought him one of the dead. The first day had gone as well as could be expected. The battle had dragged on sporadically throughout the first night with relatively minor skirmishes and then had erupted with full force at dawn of the second day. As night had fallen on the second day, the fighting had finally ended. Looking around, Zed thought it seemed to be over, at least for the time being. They had made the valley and succeeded in drawing the order after them away from other gateways up into the Midlands, but at a terrible price. They had little choice, if they were to engage the enemy with any chance of success, rather than allow them unhindered access into the Midlands. For the moment, anyway, the order was stalled. Zed didn't know how long that would last. Unfortunately, the order had gotten the better of the battle, by far. Zed peered about. It was not so much a camp as simply a place where everyone had dropped in exhaustion. Here and there, arrows and spears stuck up from the ground. They had fallen like rain as Zed had worked throughout the night, the night before, trying to heal wounded soldiers. During the day in the battles, he had unleashed everything he had. What had started out as skillful, calculated, focused use of his ability had in the end degenerated into the magic equivalent of a brawl. Zed staggered to his feet, worried about the distant thunder of horses. Horns closer into camp repeated the warning to hold arrows and spears that it was friendly forces. It sounded like too many horses for any patrol they had out. In the back of his mind, Zed tried to recall if he felt the twinge of magic that would tell him the horns were genuine. In the fog of fatigue, he had forgotten to pay attention. That was how people ended up dead, he knew, in attention to such details. Men were rushing all about, carrying supplies, water, and linen for bandages, or messages and reports. Here and there, Zed saw a sister working at healing. Other men struggled with repairs to wagons and gear in case they had to depart in a hurry. Some men sat staring at nothing. A few wandered as if in a daze. It was difficult to see in the poor light, but Zed was able to see well enough to tell that the ground was littered with the dead, the wounded, or the simply spent. Fires, both the common orange and yellow flames of burning wagons and the unnatural green blazes that were the remnants of magic, were left to burn out on their own. Horses as well as men lay everywhere, still and lifeless, torn open by ghastly wounds. The battlefields changed, but battle didn't. Now was a time of helpless shock. 
He remembered from his youth the stench of blood and death mingled with greasy smoke. It was still the same. He remembered in battles past, thinking the world had gone mad. It still felt the same. The rumble of horses was getting closer. He could hear quite a commotion, but he couldn't tell what sort of ruckus it was. Off to his right, he spotted a stooped woman shuffling toward him. He recognized Addie's familiar limp. A woman more distant, catching up to Addie from behind, was probably Verna. A little farther off, Zed saw Captain Meifert being lectured to by General Lydon. Both men turned to look toward the clatter of hooves. Zed squinted into the murk and saw in the distance soldiers scattering before a mass of approaching riders. Men waved their arms as if in greeting. A few offered weak cheers. Many pointed in Zed's direction, funneling the horsemen his way. As first wizard, he had become a focal point for everyone. The Daharans, in Richard's absence, relied on Zed to be their magic against magic. The sisters relied on his experience in the nasty art of magic in warfare. In the wavering glow of fire still burning out of control, Zed watched the column of horsemen coming relentlessly onward, points of light glinting off row upon row of armor and weapons, shimmering off chain mail and polished boots as they each in turn passed the burning wagons and barricades. The thundering column slowed for nothing, expecting men to get out of its way. At their fore, long pennons flew atop perfectly upright lances, standards and flags flapped in the cold night air. The ground thundered with thousands of horses charging over the blood-soaked ground. They rolled onward like a ghost company riding out of a grave. Orange and green smoke, lit from behind by the eerie light of fires, curled away to each side as the column of riders charged through the middle of the camp at an easy gallop. Zed saw then who was leading them. Dear spirits, he whispered aloud. Sitting tall atop a huge horse at the head of the column was a woman in leather armor with fur billowing out behind her like an angry pennant. It was Kalen. Even at that distance, Zed could see, sticking up behind her left shoulder, the gleam of light off the silver and gold hilt of the Sword of Truth. His flesh went cold with tingling dread. He felt a hand on his arm and turned to see Addie, her completely white eyes transfixed by the sight she beheld through her gift alone. Verna was still weaving her way through the wounded. Captain Meifert and General Lydon rushed to follow in Verna's footsteps. The column stretched out behind Kalin as far as Zed could see. They charged onward, collecting cheering men as they came. Zed waved his arms as they all bore down on him so that Kalin would notice him, but it seemed as if she had had her eyes on him the whole time. The horses skidded to a halt before him, snorting and stamping, tossing their armored heads. Plumes of steam rose from their nostrils when they blew great hot breaths in the icy air. Powerful muscles flexed beneath glossy hides as they pawed the ground. The eager beasts stood at the ready, their tails lashing side to side, slapping their flanks like whips. Kalin swept the scene with a careful gaze. Men were rushing up from all directions. Those gathering around stared in wonder. The horsemen were Galeans. Kalin had provisionally taken the place of her half-sister Cyrilla as Queen of Galia until Cyrilla was well again, if that ever happened. Kalin's half-brother, Harold, was the commander of the Galean army and didn't want the crown, feeling himself more fit to serve his land in the soldier's life. Kalin had Galean blood in her veins, though to a confessor matters of blood were irrelevant. They were not so irrelevant to Galeans. Kalin swung her right leg forward over the horse's neck and dropped to the ground. Her boots resounded like a hammer strike announcing the mother confessor's arrival. Kara, in her red leather and similarly cloaked in a fur mantle, likewise jumped down off her horse. Battle-weary men all around stood in rapt silence. This was not merely the mother confessor. This was Lord Rawl's wife. For just an instant, as Zed stared into her green eyes, he thought she might run into his arms and break down in helpless tears. He was wrong. Kalin pulled off her gloves. Report! She wore stealth black light leather armor, a royal Galean sword at her left hip, and a long knife at her right. Her thick fall of hair cascaded boldly over the wolf's fur mantle, topping a black wool cloak. In the Midlands, the length of a woman's hair denoted rank and social standing. No Midlands woman wore hair as long as Kalin's, but it was the hilt of the sword sticking up behind her shoulder that held Zed's gaze. Kalin, he whispered as she stepped closer, where's Richard?
Whatever pain he had seen for that instant was gone. She swept a brief glare Verna's way as the young prelate still hurried toward them between the wounded, then met Zed's gaze with eyes like green fire. The enemy has him. Report. The enemy? What enemy? Again her glare slid to Verna. Its power straightened Verna's back and slowed her approach. Kalin returned her attention to Zed. Her eyes softened with a vestige of sympathy for the anguish she must have seen on his face. A sister of the dark took him, Zed. The respite of warmth in her voice and eyes faded as her countenance returned to the cold, empty mask of a confessor. I would like a report, please. Took him? But is he... is he all right? You mean she took him as prisoner? Do they want ransom? He's still all right? She touched the side of her mouth, and Zed saw then that she had a swollen cut. He's all right as far as I know. Well, what's going on? Zed threw up his skinny arms. What's this about? What does she intend? Verna finally made it up to Zed's left side. Captain Meifert and General Lydon ran up to the other side of Addy on his right. What sister? Verna asked, still getting her breath back. You said a sister took him? What sister? Nietzsche. Nietzsche? Captain Meifert gasped. Death's mistress? Kalin met his gaze. That's the one. Now, is someone going to give me a report? There was no mistaking the command or the rage in her voice. Captain Myford lifted an arm to the south. Mother Confessor, the Imperial Order of Forces, all of them, finally moved up from Andorith. He rubbed his brow as he tried to think. Yesterday morning, I guess it was. We wanted to pull them up here into the valley country, Zed put in. Our idea was to get them out of the grassland where we couldn't contain them, up into country where we had a better chance to do so. We knew, Captain Myford went on, that it would be a fatal mistake to let them get by us and stream into the Midlands unopposed. We had to draw them into action to prevent them from unleashing their might against the populace. We had to engage them and bog them down. The only way to do that was to taunt them into following us out of the open, where they had the advantage, into terrain that helped even the odds. Kalin nodded as she scanned the dismal scene. How many men did we lose? I'd guess maybe 15,000, Captain Myford said. But that's just a guess. It may be more. They flanked you, didn't they? It didn't sound like a question. That's right, Mother Confessor. What went wrong? The Galean troops behind her formed a grim wall of leather, chainmail, and steel. Officers with incisive eyes watched and listened. What didn't, Zed growled. Somehow, the captain explained, they knew what we planned. Although I guess it wouldn't be all that hard to figure out, since anyone would know it was our only chance against their numbers. They were confident they could defeat us regardless, so they obliged our plan. Like I asked, what went wrong? What went wrong? General Lydon interrupted heatedly. We were outnumbered beyond all hope. That's what went wrong. Kalin settled her cool gaze on the man. He seemed to catch himself and fell to one knee. My queen he added in formal address before falling silent. Kalin's gaze lost some of its edge as it moved back to Captain Myford. Zed noticed the captain's fists tightening as he went on with his report. Somehow, Mother Confessor, near as we can tell, they managed to get a division across the river. We're pretty sure they didn't use the open ground to the east. We had preparations should they try that, as we feared they might. So, Kalin said, they reasoned you would think it impossible. So they sent a division across the river, probably a great deal more, willing to bear their losses in the crossing, went north through the mountains, unsuspected, unseen, and undetected, and crossed back to this side of the river. When you got here, they were waiting for you, holding the ground you had planned to hold. With the order hot on your heels, you had nowhere else to go. The order intended to crush you between that division holding this defendable ground and their army on your tail. That's the gist of it. Captain Myford confirmed. What happened to the division waiting here, she asked. We wiped them out, the captain said with a cool rage of his own. Once we realized what had happened, we knew it was our only chance. Kalin gave him a nod. She knew full well what a mighty effort his simple words conveyed. They cut us to pieces from behind as we did so. General Lydon's temper was getting frayed around the edges. We had no chance. Apparently you did, she answered. You gained the valley. What of it? We can't fight a force their size. It was insane to throw men into that meat grinder. What for? We gained this valley, but at a terrible price. 
We won't be able to hold a force that huge. They had their way with us from the first until the last. We didn't stop them. They just got tired of hacking us to pieces for the night. Some men looked away. Some stared at the ground. Only the crackle of fires and the moans of the wounded filled the frigid night air. Kalin glanced around again. What are you doing sitting here now? Zed's brow went up along with his own anger. We've been at it for two days, Kalin. Fine, but I don't allow the enemy to go to bed with victory. Is that clear? Captain Myford clapped a fist to his heart in salute. Clear, Mother Confessor. He glanced over his shoulders. Fists of attentive men near and far likewise went to their hearts. Mother Confessor, General Lydon said, dropping her title of queen. The men have been up for two days now. I understand, Kalin said. We have been riding without pause for three days now. Neither changes what must be done. In the harsh reflection of firelight, the creases in General Lydon's face looked like angry gashes. He pressed his lips together and bowed to his queen, but when he came up, he spoke again. My queen, Mother Confessor, you can't seriously be expecting us to carry out a night attack. There's no moon, and clouds mostly hide the stars. In the dark, such an attack would be a disaster. It's lunacy. Kalin finally withdrew her cold glare from the Celtish general and passed a gaze among those assembled around her. Where is General Rybish? Zed swallowed. I'm afraid that's him. She looked where Zed pointed, at the corpse he had fallen asleep atop while trying to heal. The rust-colored beard was matted with dried blood. The grayish-green eyes stared without seeing, no longer showing pain. It had been a fool's task, Zed knew, but he couldn't help trying to heal what could not be healed, giving it everything he had left. It hadn't been enough. Who is next in command? Kalin asked. That would be me, my queen, General Lydon said as he took a stride forward. But as the ranking officer, I can't allow my men to... Kalin lifted a hand. That will be all, Lieutenant Lydon. He cleared his throat. General Lydon, my queen. She fixed him with an implacable stare. To question me once is a simple mistake, Lieutenant. Twice is treason. We execute traitors. Kara's Zajil spun up into her fist. Step aside, Lieutenant. Even in the haunting orange and green light of fire, Zed could see the man's pale face. He took a step back and wisely, if belatedly, fell silent. Who is next in command? The mother confessor asked again. Kalen, Zed said, I'm afraid the order used their gifted to single out men of rank. Despite our best efforts, I believe we lost all our senior officers. It cost them dearly, at least. Then who is next in command? Captain Myford looked around and finally lifted his hand. I'm not positive, Mother Confessor, but I believe that would be me. Very well, General Myford. He inclined his head. Mother Confessor, he said in a quiet, confidential voice. That isn't necessary. No one said it was, General. The new general softly struck a fist to his heart. Zed saw Kara smile in grim approval. Of the thousands of faces watching... That was the only smile. It wasn't that the men disapproved, but rather that they were relieved to have someone so firmly in command. De Harans respect iron authority. If they couldn't have Lord Rawl, they would take his wife, and an iron one at that. They might not have smiled, but Zed knew they would be pleased. As I said, I don't allow the enemy to go to bed with victory. Kalin scanned the faces watching her. I want a cavalry raid ready to go within the hour. And who do you intend to send on such an attack, my queen? Everyone knew what the former General Lydon meant by the question. He was asking who she was sending to their death. There will be two wings, one to make their way unseen around the Order's camp so as to come in from their south, where they will least expect it, and another wing to hold back until the first is in place and then come in from this side, from the north. I intend to have us spill some of their blood before bed. She looked back to the new Lieutenant Lydon's eyes and answered his question. I will be leading the southern wing. Everyone except the new general began voicing objections. Lydon spoke up louder. My queen, why would you want us to get our men together for a cavalry raid? He pointed to the wall of men all on horses behind her, all Galeans, traditional adversaries of the Keltons, Lydon's homeland. When we have these... 
These men will be helping get this army back together, relieving those on duty to get needed rest, helping dig defensive ditches and filling in wherever they are needed. The men who were bloodied are the ones who need to go to bed with the sweet taste of vengeance. I would not dare to deny to Harans that to which they are so entitled. A cheer went up. Zed thought that if war was madness, madness had just found its mistress. General Myfert took a step closer to her. I'll have my best men ready within the hour, Mother Confessor. Everyone will want to go. I'll have to disappoint a lot of volunteers. Kalin's face softened when she nodded. Pick your man for the northern wing, then, General. I will be leading the northern wing, Mother Confessor. Kalin smiled. Very well. She ordered the Galean troops off to their duties. With a sweep of her finger, she dismissed everyone but the immediate group and called that inner circle closer. What about Richard's admonition not to directly attack the order? Verna asked. I remember well what Richard said. I'm not going to directly attack their main force. Zed supposed she did remember it well. She had been there with Richard. They hadn't. Zed brought up a touchy issue. The main force will be in the center, well protected. At their edges, where you attack, will be defenses, of course. But mostly the camp followers will be at the tail end of the Order's camp. The fringe to the south, mostly. I don't really care, she said with cold fury. If they're with the Order, then they are the enemy. There will be no mercy. She was looking at her new general as she spoke her orders. I don't care if we kill their whores or their generals. I want every baker and cook dead as much as I want every officer and archer dead. Every camp follower we kill will deprive them of the comforts they enjoy. I want to strip them of everything, including their lives. Is that understood? General Myfert gave his nod. No mercy. You'll get no argument from us, Mother Confessor. That is the Daharan Code of Warfare. Zed knew that in war, Kalin's way was usually the only way to prevail. The enemy would grant no mercy and would need none themselves had they not invaded. Every whore and hawker chose to be a part of that invasion, to make what they could off the blood and plunder spilled at the Order's feet. Verna spoke up. Mother Confessor, Anne was going to see you and Richard. We last heard from her over a month ago. Have you seen her? Yes. Verna licked her lips in caution at the steely look in Kalin's eyes. Was she all right? The last I saw her, she was. Would you know why she hasn't sent any word to us? I threw her journey book in the fire. Verna stepped forward, making to snatch Kalin by the shoulder. Kara's Aegeel came up like lightning, barring her way. No one touches the mother confessor. Kara's cold blue eyes were as deadly as her words. Is that clear? No one. You have one Mord Sith and one Mother Confessor here, both in very bad moods, Kalin said in a level voice. I would suggest you not give us an excuse to lose our temper, or we may never find it again in your lifetime. Zed's fingers found Verna's arm and gently urged her back. We're all tired, he said. We have enough troubles with the Order. He shot Kalin a scowl. No matter how tired or distraught we are, though, let's remember we're all on the same side here. Kalin's eyes told him she challenged that statement, but she said nothing. Verna changed the subject. I will get together some of the gifted to escort you on the raid. Thank you, but we will be taking no gifted. But you will at least need them to help you find your way in the dark. We will have the enemy campfires to show us our way. Kalin, Zed said, hoping to interject some reason... The Order will have gifted, including Sisters of the Dark. You will need protection from them. No, I don't want any gifted with us. They are expecting any attack to be accompanied by our gifted. Their gifted will be watching for shields of magic. Any riders they do see without detecting magic, they will be more likely to discount. We'll be able to get in deeper and draw more blood without gifted along. Verna sighed at such foolishness, but didn't argue. General Myford liked her plan. Zed knew she was right about getting in deeper, but he knew, too, that getting back out would be more difficult once the enemy was onto them. Zed, I would like one bit of magic. He scratched his brow in resignation. What would you like me to do? Kalin gestured at the ground. Make that dust glow. I want it to show up in the dark, and I want it sticky. For how long? 
She shrugged. The rest of the night would be enough. After Zed had spun a web over the dusty patch of ground, giving it a green glow, Kaylin bent and rubbed her hand in it. She walked around back of her horse and slapped the hand on each flank, leaving a glowing green handprint on each hindquarter. What are you doing? Zed asked. It's dark. I want them to be able to see me. They can't come after me if they can't find me in the dark. Zed sighed at the madness. General Myford squatted and rubbed his hand in the glowing dust. I'd also hate for them to miss me in the dark. Be sure to wash your hand clean before we go, she said. After she had explained her plan to the new general, Kalen, Kara, and General Myford started off to their tasks. Before they could get far, Zed halted Kalen with a softly spoken question. Kalen, do you have any idea how we can get Richard back? She gazed boldly into his eyes. Yes, I have a plan. Would you mind sharing it with me? It's simple. I plan on killing every Imperial Order man, woman, and child until I get to the very last one left alive, and then if she doesn't give him back, I'm going to kill her too. Chapter 32 Kalen focused past the black void to the glowing points of the fire as she leaned forward over the withers of her galloping horse, urging him onward faster and faster. The muscles in her thighs strained as she pressed her weight against the stirrups and squeezed her legs against the feverish warmth of the massive body, rhythmically, incessantly, frantically, flexing and stretching, feeling its every pounding strike against the ground. Her eyes were filled with the hammering of her own heart and the thunder of yet more hooves behind her. She was distantly aware of the weight of the sword of truth sheathed in its scabbard an ever-present reminder of Richard. She gripped the reins in one fist. With her other, she lifted her royal Galean sword high. The lights were coming. Unexpectedly, the first came out of nowhere and exploded into her vision. Racing past what looked to be the light of a single candle, she was there at last. Crying out with the sudden power of emotions that could no longer be stifled, she slammed her sword down against the dark shape of a man. The impact of the blade against bone jarred her wrist. The hilt stung against her palm. On their way by, the men behind her unleashed their fury against the remaining sentries at the outpost. Kalen held tight, knowing the greater unleashing of her need was yet to come. She would not be denied now. The fires of the outer fringes of the camp flew toward her. Her muscles were rigid with expectation. She felt at the brink of control. And then she was upon them. At last she was there. She met them with all her strength. Her blade came down again and again, lashing against their bodies, slashing anyone within her reach. The outer fires shot past the sides of her horse with dizzying speed. She gasped for breath. Laying the reins over, Kalen pulled her big war horse around in a tight circle. He was not as agile as she would have preferred, but he was well trained, and for this job he would do. He bellowed with the excitement of battle begun. Tents and wagons were scattered everywhere with little apparent order. Kalen could hear the merry laughter of those not yet aware of the enemy in their midst. She had brought a small attack force, keeping them tight and close on the way in so it wouldn't raise the kind of alarm a broad attack would. It had worked. She saw men around fires tipping up bottles or eating meat off skewers. She saw men sleeping with their feet sticking out of tents. She saw a man walking with his arm around the waist of a woman. In the dim light, she saw men in tents between the legs of other women. The couple, arm in arm, undoubtedly at a price, was close. The man was on the far side of the woman as Kalen raced up behind them, so with a mighty swing she took off the woman's head instead. The stupefied man clutched the headless body as it began to fall. The cavalryman right behind Kalen took the startled man down. Kalen dug in her heels and charged her big war horse over a haphazard row of tents with men and women inside. She could feel the huge hooves crushing bone. Screams rose around her and her mount. A soldier with a pike stood with his legs spread in a stance of sudden alarm. On her way past, Kalen snatched the pike from his grip, stabbed it into a small tent, twisting it, getting the canvas tangled up on its barbs, and then backed her horse, hauling the tent off a man and woman. Her men, following behind, stabbed the exposed couple as Kalen pulled the remnants of the tent through a fire. 
As soon as it lit, she dragged the flaming canvas to a wagon, setting that wagon's tarp afire, and then threw the blazing remains in another wagon full of supplies. With a backhanded swing of her sword, Kalin smashed the face of a burly man who ran up to pull her off her horse. She had to yank the blade free of his skull. Before more men could snatch at her, she dug in her heels again and charged off toward another fire, where men were just jumping to their feet. The horse knocked down several, and her sword cut another. By now, the shrieks of women sent up an effective alarm, and men were rushing out of tents and wagons with weapons in their fists. The whole scene was one of erupting pandemonium. Kalin wheeled her mount, stabbing anyone within reach. Many were not soldiers. Her sword felled leather workers and wagon masters, whores and soldiers. High-stepping at her command, her horse trampled down a line of big tents where wounded were being cared for. Beside a lamp, Kalin spotted a surgeon with needle and thread working on a man's leg. She drove her horse around to trample the surgeon and the man he was sewing up. The surgeon held his arms up before his face, but his arms were no good at warding the weight of a huge war horse. Kalin signaled her men in. Army surgeons were valuable. The Daharans killed every one they saw. She knew that killing each was as good as killing untold numbers of enemy soldiers. Kalin and her men wreaked havoc through the whore's tents, toppled cook wagons, cut down soldiers and civilians alike. When her men saw lamps, they leaped off their horses and snatched them up to use to start fires. Kalin hacked at an enraged cook who came at her with a butcher knife. It took three rapid cuts to dispatch him. To her left, Kara's horse cut off a man about to throw a spear. Kara coolly went about killing him and anyone else within her reach. A twist of her aegeal usually seized up their hearts, and if not, Kalin could at least hear bones snap. Their cries of death and pain seemed frightful enough to send a shiver up the spines of the dead, and did add to the general confusion and panic. It was glorious music to Kalin's ears. The aegeal would only function through the bond to the Lord Rawl. Because it worked, she and Kara knew Richard was alive. That alone gave Kalin heart. It was almost as if he were there with her. His sword strapped to her back was like his hand touching her, encouraging her to throw herself into the fight, telling her to cut. The indiscriminate nature of the killing in among the camp followers confused the enemy soldiers and terrorized the people who commonly believed themselves impervious to the violence they ultimately fed off of. Now, rather than being the vultures picking at the carcasses, they were the hapless prey. Life in the Imperial Order's camp would never be the same. Kalin would see to that. No more would the enemy soldiers enjoy the comforts provided by these people. They would now know that they were no less targets than officers. They would know the price of their participation. The price was a merciless death, and payment had come due. Slashing her way through the running crowds of screaming people, Kalin kept an eye on a large group of the Imperial Order's horses, stabled not far off, watching as soldiers threw saddles on their mounts. She drove her horse over men and tents, getting closer, until she was sure she was within earshot of those cavalrymen saddling their horses. Kalin stood in her stirrups, waving her sword high in the air. Men paused to stare. I am the Mother Confessor! For the crime of invading the Midlands, I condemn you all to death, every one of you. The hundred men with her sent up a cheer. Their voices joined in a chant. Death to the order! Death to the order! Death to the order! Kalin and her men charged their horses around in an ever-widening circle, trampling anyone they could, hacking anyone within reach, stabbing anyone who rushed them, setting fire to anything that would burn. These Daharan soldiers were the best at what they did, and they did it with brilliant effectiveness. When they found a wagon with oil, they broke the barrels open and tossed on flaming logs they plucked up with lances from fires. Night whooshed into day. Everyone could plainly see Kaelin now as she charged through their midst, screaming her pronouncement of death. Kalin saw the Order's cavalry mounting up, pulling their lances from racks, drawing their swords. She reared her horse, holding her sword high. You are all cowards. You will never catch me or best me. You will all die like the cowards you are at the hands of the Mother Confessor. When her horse came down, she thumped its ribs with her boots. 
The horse charged off at a dead run, Kara right at her side, her hundred men at her heels, a few thousand infuriated Imperial Order cavalry right behind them, with more mounting up all the time. Being at the edge of the Order's camp, they wouldn't have much ground to cover before they were out of the camp again and into the open countryside. As they raced away, Kalin took the opportunity to kill anyone who presented themselves. It was too dark to tell if they were men or women, and it didn't matter anyway. She wanted them all dead. Each time her sword made contact, slashing muscle or breaking bone, was a delicious release. Running at full speed past the last of the campfires, they plunged suddenly into the black void of night. Kalin leaned forward over her horse's muscular neck as they ran west, hoping there were no holes in the ground. If they hit one, it would be all over, not just for her horse, but most likely for her as well. She knew this land well enough, the gentle hills, the bluffs ahead. She knew where she was, even in the dark, and she knew where she was going. She was counting on the enemy not knowing. In the disorienting sweep of darkness, they would fixate on following the glowing handprints on her horse's rump, thinking one of their gifted had gotten close enough to mark her horse for them. They would be gleeful with the blinding anticipation of having her naked to their swords. Kalin used the flat of her own sword to smack her horse's flanks, urging him on, whipping him into a wild state. They were away from the excitement of battle now, and out in the lonely openness of the countryside. Horses dreaded predators nipping at their flanks, especially in the dark. She encouraged him to think teeth were snapping at his hindquarters. Her men were right behind her, but as instructed, rode to each side so there was a gap, allowing the enemy to see the glowing marks on her horse. When Kalin feared she was as close as they dared get, she signaled with a whistle. Over her shoulders, she watched her men, her protection, peeling away off into the night. She would not see them again until she returned to the Daharan camp. With her advantage of the distant fires of the Order's camp in back of them, Kalin was able to see the silhouette of the enemy cavalry close behind, coming at full charge, their hungry gazes no doubt fixed on the glowing handprints on her horse's flanks, the only thing they could see out in the wide open countryside on a moonless night. How far? Kara called over from close beside her. Should be... Kalin's words cut off when she suddenly spotted briefly what was right there before her. Now, Kara! Kalin pulled her leg up just in time as Kara rammed her horse over. The two huge animals jostled dangerously. Kalin threw her arm around Kara's shoulders. Kara's arm seized Kalin's waist and yanked her over off her horse. Kalin gave her horse one last smack with the flat of her sword. The horse snorted in panic as it charged onward at full speed into the blackness. Kalin threw her leg over the rump of Kara's horse, sheathed her sword, and then held tight to Kara's waist as the moored Sith pulled her horse's head hard to the left, forcing it at a full gallop to turn away just in time. For an instant, through a break in the clouds, Kalin spied the dull slur of starlight reflecting off the churning icy waters of the Drun River below. She felt a pang of sorrow for her startled, bewildered, terrified horse as it sailed out over the bluff. It was giving its life to take many more with it. The beast would probably never know what had happened. Neither would the Imperial Order cavalry as they followed the glowing handprints on into the dark. This was her Midlands. Kalin knew what was there. They were invaders and did not. Even if they did see it coming in the last twinkling of their lives, at a full charge into pitch blackness, they would never have a chance to avert their doom. She hoped, though that those men did realize what was happening just before they gasped in the frigid dark waters or before their lungs burst with the need of air as the merciless river dragged them down into its inky embrace. She hoped every one of those men suffered a horrifying death in the dark depths of those treacherous currents. Kalin turned her thoughts away from the heat of battle. The forces of the Daharan Empire could sleep now with a victory over their enemy and with the sweet taste of vengeance. Kalin found that it did little, though, to quell the fires of her raging anger. After a brief time, Kara's horse slowed to a canter and then a walk. They heard no hoofbeats behind them, only a winter's vast silence. After the crush of people, the noise and the turbulence of the Imperial Order's camp, the isolation of the empty grasslands seemed somehow oppressive. Kalin felt as if she were a speck of nothing in the middle of nowhere. Cold and exhausted, Kalin pulled her fur mantle around her shoulders. 
Her legs trembled from the effort finally finished. She felt as if everything had been washed out of her. Her head slumped forward to rest against Kara's back. Kalin was aware of the weight of Richard's sword lying against her own back. Well, Kara said over her shoulder as they had ridden for a time through the hushed expanse of countryside, we do this every night for a year or two, and that should just about wipe them all out. For the first time in what seemed an eternity, Kalin almost laughed. Almost. Chapter 33 By the time Kalin and Kara rode in among the wounded, the exhausted, and the sleeping Daharan troops, it was only a few hours from dawn. Kalin had thought they might have to find a safe place out in the grasslands to sleep and wait for daylight in order to find their way back, but they had been fortunate. A break in the cloud cover had allowed the stars to show them the way. In the shimmering sweep of stars alone, they had been able to see the black drape of mountains at the horizon. With that visual guide, they were able to make their way far out into the empty country so that they could safely get around the Imperial Order and then head back north to their own troops. A reception party awaited them. Men rushed up to form cheering rows as they passed into camp. Kalin felt a distant sense of pride as she had given these men what they needed most right then, a measure of retribution. From the back of Kara's horse, Kalin lifted a hand to wave at the men she passed. She smiled for them alone. Near the area where the horses were picketed, General Myfert, having heard the cheering, was waiting impatiently. He trotted over to meet them. Beside the gate of the temporary corral, one of the soldiers took the reins to the horse as Kalin and then Kara jumped down. Kalin winced at the ache in her muscles from the recent days of hard riding and the night of fighting. Her right arm socket throbbed from the blows she had landed. She mused to herself that her sword arm never hurt like that in her mock battles with Richard. For the benefit of anyone watching, she forced herself to walk as if she had just had a three-day rest. General Myfert, looking no worse for the battle he had seen that night, clapped a fist to his heart. Mother Confessor, you can't imagine how relieved I am to see you. And I you, General. He leaned forward. Please, Mother Confessor, you aren't going to do anything that foolhardy again, are you? It wasn't foolhardy, Kara said. I was with her, watching out for her. He frowned over at Kara, but didn't argue with her. Kalin wondered how one could fight a war without doing anything foolhardy. The entire thing was foolhardy. How many men did we lose? Kalin asked instead. General Myford's face split with a grin. None, Mother Confessor. Can you believe it? With the Creator's help, they all came back. I don't recall the Creator wielding a sword with us, Kara said. Kalin was dumbfounded. That's the best news I could have, General. Mother Confessor, I can't tell you what a boost that was to the men. But please, you won't do anything like that again, will you? I'm not here to smile and wave and look pretty for the men, General. I'm here to help them send those murderous bastards into the eternal arms of the Keeper. He sighed in resignation. We have a tent for you. I'm sure you're tired. Kalin nodded and let the General lead her and Kara through the now quiet camp. Men not sleeping stood and silently saluted with fists to their hearts. Kalin tried to smile for them. She could see in their eyes how much they appreciated what she had done to turn the tide of the grim battle back a little in their favor. They probably thought she had done it for them. That was only partly true. Arriving at a well-guarded group of a half-dozen tents, General Myfert gestured to the one in the center. That was General Rybish's tent, Mother Confessor. I had your things put inside. I thought you should have the best tent. If it bothers you to sleep in his tent, though, I'll have your belongings moved to anywhere you wish. It will be fine, General. Kalin took stock of the man's young face, seeing the shadow of sorrow. She reminded herself that he was about the same age as she. We all miss him. His expression showed only some of the pain she thought he must feel. I can't replace a man like that, Mother Confessor. He was not just a great general, but a great man, too. He taught me a lot and honored me with his trust. He was the best man I ever served under. I don't want you to have any illusions about my replacing him. I know I can't. No one asked you to. Your best effort is all we expect and will serve us well, I'm sure. He smiled at her generosity. You'll have that, Mother Confessor. I promise you, you'll have that. 
He turned to Kara and changed the subject. I had your things put in this tent here, Mistress Kara. It was the one right beside Kalin's tent. Kara scanned the scene, taking note of the patrolling guards. When Kalin told her that she was going to go right to bed and that she should get some sleep too, Kara agreed and bade the two of them a good night before disappearing into her tent. I appreciated your help tonight, General. You should get some sleep too. He bowed his head, turned to leave, but then turned back. You know, I always hoped to someday become a general. Ever since I was a boy, I've dreamed of it. I imagined... He looked away from Kalin's eyes. I guess I imagined it would make me proud and happy. He hooked his thumbs in his pockets and gazed out over the dark camp, perhaps seeing all those dreams from his past, or maybe seeing all his new duties. It didn't make me feel happy at all, he finally said. I know, she answered in sincere sympathy. This wasn't the way any good man would want to gain rank. But sometimes challenges arise and we must face them. She let out a silent sigh and tried to envision how he must feel. Someday, General, the pride and satisfaction will come. It comes from doing the job well and knowing that you are making a difference. He nodded. I know it felt pretty good tonight, Mother Confessor, when I saw you on the back of Kara's horse returning safely to camp. I look forward to the day when I see Lord Rahl ride into camp, too. He started away. Sleep well. Dawn is in a couple of hours. Then we'll find out what the new day will bring. I'll have reports ready for you. Inside her tent, Zed was sitting alone, waiting. Kaelin groaned inwardly. She was dead tired and didn't want to face the old wizard's questioning. Sometimes, especially if you were tired, his nettling questions could become irksome. She knew he meant well, but she was in no mood for it. She didn't think she could even be civil to him if he started down his road of a thousand questions. It was so late and she was so tired, she simply wished he would let her be. She stood just inside, saying nothing, watching him as he rose to his feet. His wavy white hair was more disorderly than usual. His heavy robes were filthy and spattered with blood. Around his knees, the robes were dark with dried blood. He gave her a long look and then enclosed her in his skinny arms. She just wanted to sleep. He silently held her head to his shoulder. Maybe he thought she might be about to start crying, but there seemed no tears left. She felt numb. She supposed it was the constant rage, but she just couldn't cry anymore. She seemed only able to feel anger. Zed finally held her out at arm's length, squeezing her shoulders in his surprisingly strong fingers. I just wanted to wait until you were back and safe before I went to bed. I wanted to let my eyes take you in. He smiled in a sad way. I'm so very relieved you're safe. Sleep well, Kalen. Her bedroll, still tied up with its leather thongs, lay atop a pallet with a straw-filled mattress. Saddlebags were draped over her pack, sitting in the corner. Opposite the bed, there was a small folding table and chair. Beside them, a basket with rolls of maps. Another little folding table held a ewer and basin. A clean towel was draped over the table leg's stretcher bar. The tent was spacious by army standards, but it was still cramped. The canvas looked heavy enough to keep out most any weather. Lamps, hanging at each end of the tent from a rod forming the peak of the roof, cast a warm glow inside the snug tent. Kalin tried to imagine the burly General Rybish pacing in such a small space, tugging his rust-colored beard, worrying over the problems of an army bigger than many cities. Zed looked exhausted. Creases etched an inner anguish on his bony face. She reminded herself that he had only just learned that his grandson, the only family he had left in the world, was in the cruel hands of the enemy. Besides that, Zed had been fighting for two days and healing soldiers at night. She had seen him when she arrived, staggering to his feet beside the corpse of what turned out to be General Rybish. She knew that if Zed couldn't save the man, he was beyond saving. With her fingers, Kalin combed back her hair and then gestured to the chair. You could sit for a minute, Zed, couldn't you? He looked at the chair, then at her bedroll. For a minute, I suppose, while you get your bed ready. You need some rest. Kalin couldn't argue with that. She realized her head was throbbing. 
the passions of battle masked little things like a pounding headache. The straw-filled mattress looked as good as a feather bed to her right then. She tossed her wolf fur mantle and her cloak on the bed. They would keep her warm. Without comment, Zed watched as she unstrapped the sword of truth and pulled it off her back. He had given the weapon to Richard. Kalen had been there and begged Zed not to do it, but he said he had no choice, that Richard was the one. Zed had been right. Richard was indeed the one. She felt her face flush when, just before she laid the sword down, she kissed the top of the hilt, where Richard's hand had so often rested. Zed, if he even noticed, said nothing, and she laid the gleaming scabbard and sword to rest beside her mattress. In the awkward quiet, Kaylin took off her royal Galean sword. She saw then that there was blood running down the scabbard. She unstrapped and removed the layer of light leather armor and laid it beside her pack. When she leaned the royal sword and scabbard against the plates of leather armor, she saw then that they were splattered with blood. She noticed, too, that the leather leg armor had bloody handprints here and there on it, and there were long gouges in the leather from men's fingernails. She remembered men grabbing for her, trying to unhorse her, but she didn't recall their hands actually clawing at her. The images that started flooding back threatened to make her nauseated, so she directed her mind to other things. Kara and I crossed over the Rangshada Mountains, north of Agaden Reach, and came down through Galia, she said into the uncomfortable silence. I gathered, he said. She gestured vaguely to suggest the surrounding camp. I thought I'd better bring some troops with me. We can use them. Kalin glanced up at his hazel eyes. I brought all I could without waiting. I didn't want to wait. Zed nodded. That was wise. Prince Harold wanted to come, but I asked him to gather together a larger force and then bring them down. If we're to defend the Midlands, we'll need more troops. He thought that was a good idea. Sounds so. Prince Harold will be here to help just as soon as he can gather his army from their defensive positions. Zed only nodded. She cleared her throat. I wish we could have gotten here sooner. Zed shrugged. You came as fast as possible. You're here now. Kaylin turned away to the bedroll. She sank down to her knees and bent to the work of undoing the leather thongs holding the bedding all rolled up together. For some reason, the knots looked blurry. She guessed it was because she was so tired. She glanced over her shoulder briefly in the dim lamplight and then went back to picking at the knot. I suppose you'd like to know how the Sister of the Dark managed to capture Richard. He was silent for a moment. His voice finally came, soft and gentle, there's time enough for that later, Kalen. There's no need tonight. As she picked at the stubborn knot, her hair fell forward over her shoulder. She had to push it back in order to see what she was doing. The stupid leather thong was tightly knotted. She wanted to yell at the person who had tied it, but she had done it up herself and had no one else to blame. She used a maternity spell on me. It links us. She said she could... She could kill me if Richard didn't do as she said and go with her. At the news, Zed only let out a desolate sigh. Richard can't kill her, or I die too. She waited for his voice behind her. It finally came. I've only read about such spells, but from what I know, it sounds as if she told you the truth of it. I have a cut on my mouth. I didn't do it. It happened to me the other day through that link. What happens to her happens to me. I hope Richard struck her. It was worth it. I don't think Richard would do that. She knew he wouldn't. It was only a wish. One of the little lamps was flickering, making shadows waver. The other was hissing softly. Kalin wiped her nose on her sleeve. Richard gave up his freedom to keep me alive. I wish I could die to free him, but he made me promise I wouldn't do that. Kalin felt a comforting hand on her shoulder. Zed said nothing. It was the greatest kindness he could have given her at that moment, not burying her heart under an avalanche of questions. Enjoying the calming effect of his hand, Kalin finally managed to get the knot undone. Zed sat back in his chair as she unfurled her bedding. The carving of spirit was rolled up inside for safekeeping. Its height was just right to fit crosswise in her bedroll. 
Kaylin lifted it out and held it to her heart a moment. She turned then and set spirit on the little table. Zed slowly rose to his feet. He was a collection of bony angles under his maroon robes. With one arm crooked to point while he gaped at spirit standing proudly atop the small table, his lanky body looked as stiff as a spindly tree in winter. Where else did you stop on your way here? He cast a suspicious look in her direction. Have you been looting treasures from palaces? She realized then that the look wasn't so much meant to be suspicious as teasing. Kaylin ran a finger down Spirit's flowing robes, letting her gaze follow the strength in the lines of the woman's strong pose. Something felt so right about the way her head was thrown back with her fists at her sides and her back arched, standing against the invisible power trying to subdue her. No, Kaylin swallowed. Richard carved it for me. Zed's brow drew lower. He stared at the carving for a time before reaching out a stick-like finger to touch it, as if it were some priceless antiquity. Dear spirits, Kalin pretended to smile. Almost. It's called spirit, he said. Richard carved it for me when I was feeling like I would never get better. It helped me. In the awful silence, Zed finally turned from the woman with her fists at her sides and her head thrown back to peer into Kalin's eyes. He frowned in the oddest way. It's you, he said half to himself. Dear spirits, the boy carved a statue of your spirit. I recognize it. It's as plain as day. Zed was not only Richard's grandfather. He was now hers, too. He was not merely the first wizard. He was also the man who had helped raise Richard. Zed had no family left save Richard. Other than a half-sister and brother who were strangers but for blood, neither did she. She was as alone in the world as was Zed. Now, through Richard, Zed was her family. But even if he wasn't, she realized he could mean no less to her. We'll get him back, dear one, he whispered in tender compassion. His stick-like hand reverently cupped her face. We'll get him back. Everything seemed to be swimming. Kalin fell into his protective arms and dissolved into tears. Chapter 34 Warren carefully pulled the snow-laden pine bough aside for her. Kalin peered through the gap. There, he said in a low voice. You see? Kalin nodded as she squinted off into the narrow valley far below. The scene was frosted white. White trees, white rocks, white meadows. Enemy troops moving up the distant valley floor looked like a dark line of ants marching across powdered sugar. I don't think you need to whisper, Warren, Kara said from behind Kalin's other shoulder. They can't hear you, not from this far. Warren's blue eyes turned to the moored Sith. Kara's red leather would have stood out like a beacon were she not sheathed in wolf fur that made her melt into the background of snow-dusted brush. Kalin's own fur mantle was soft and warm against the sides of her face. Sometimes, since Richard had made it for her, the feel against her skin was evocative of his gentle caress, protecting her and keeping her warm. Oh, but their gifted can hear us, Kara, even from this distance, if we are too vociferous. Kara's nose wrinkled. What's that mean? Loud, Kalin whispered in a way as if to suggest Kara should use a little more caution and be more quiet. Kara's face distorted with her displeasure at the thought of magic. She shifted her weight to her other foot, went back to watching the line of troops slowly flowing up the valley, and kept silent. After she'd seen enough, Kalin gestured, and the three of them started back through the ankle-deep snow. At their elevation in the mountains, they were right at the base of oppressive gray clouds, making it feel as if they were looking down from another world. She didn't like the world she had seen. They trudged up the slope, dense with pine and naked aspen, to the thickly wooded top of the ridge, where the backbone of rock broke through the snow here and there like half-buried bones. Their horses waited a good distance back down off the rocky slope. Farther back down the mountain, where Warren and Kalin were sure they would not be detected by any gifted who might be protecting the order troops, waited an escort of Daharan guards General Myford had hand-picked to protect Kalin and the two with her, who were also protecting her. So you see, Warren asked in little more than a whisper, they're still at it. 
moving more and more men up this way, trying to get around us without us being aware of it. Kaylin held up the fur to shelter her face as a light breeze dragged a curtain of snow past them. At least it wasn't snowing again yet. I don't think so, Warren. His questioning, handsome face turned her way. Then what? I think they want it to look like they're sending troops past us, so we will send men way out here after them. A diversion? I think so. It's just close enough to us to be likely we would discover them, yet far enough away and through difficult enough terrain that it would require us to split our forces in order to do anything about it. Besides, every one of our scouts came back. Isn't that good? Sure it is. But what if they have gifted with them as you believe? How is it that not one of our scouts failed to make it back to report these massive troop movements? Warren thought that over a moment as the three of them carefully made it over a high spot, sliding on their bottoms down the far side of the slippery, sloping rock. I think they're fishing, Kara said, as her boots thumped down on solid ground behind them. They're gifted don't try to net the small fry, hoping to draw bigger fish close. Kaylin brushed the snow from her backside. Like us. Warren looked skeptical. You think this is all just some sort of elaborate trap to snare officers or gifted? Well, no, Kalin said. That would only be a bonus for them. I think their main intent is to spur us into splitting our forces to deal with what they want us to believe is this threat. Warren scratched his head of curly blonde hair. His blue eyes twitched back in the direction the three of them had come down off the ridge, as if trying to look again at what he could not see. But if they're sending great numbers of troops north, even if it is to draw away some of our forces, shouldn't that concern us? Of course it should, Kalin said, if it were true. Warren glanced over at her as they struggled through deeper snow, drifted under crags they passed beneath on their way up a steep little rise. Her legs were weary with the effort. Warren held out his hand to help her up a high step. He did the same for Kara. Kara gestured that she didn't need the hand, but she didn't level a scowl at him either. Kalin was always pleased to see evidence that Kara was learning that offers of modest aid were simply a courtesy and not necessarily accusations of weakness. Then I'm confused, Warren said as he panted. Kalin came to a halt to let them all catch their breath. She lifted an arm back toward the enemy troops off beyond the ridge. Yes, if it were true that great numbers of troops were going out around us and heading north, that would concern us, but I don't believe they are. Warren swiped a blonde lock off his forehead. You don't think all those men are heading north? Where, then? Nowhere, Kalin said. That many men? You've got to be joking. She smiled at the look on his face. I believe it's a trick. I think it's only a small number of men. But the scouts have been reporting mass numbers of men moving north for three days now. Hush, Kara warned, getting even with an air of mock scolding. Warren covered his mouth with both hands when he realized he'd shouted. They had their breath back, so Kalin started out again, taking them over the top of the little rise onto flatter ground, following their footsteps back the way they had come. Remember what the scouts said yesterday? she asked him. They tried to go over to the mountains on the other side to have a look at the lay of the land beyond and the enemy troops moving north through it, but the passes were too heavily guarded. I remember. I think I've just figured out why. She gestured by looping her hand around as she went on. I think what we're seeing is a relatively small group of the same men just going around in a big circle. We're only seeing them at the point where they pass up this valley. We see troops marching by continuously for days, and we assume they're moving a lot of men, but I think it's just a circle of the same ones going round and round. Warren stopped to stare at her. His face turned grave at the implications. So if we're tricked into thinking they're moving an army up this way then we will split our army in response and send part of them out after this phantom force. We are already outnumbered, Kara said as she nodded to herself. But we have the advantage of defending terrain that suits our purpose. However, if they could reduce our numbers substantially simply by getting us to send a large percentage off on some mission first, their entire army might finally be able to overrun a smaller number of remaining defenders. Makes sense. Warren stroked his chin in thought, looking back at the ridge. What if you're wrong? Kalin turned to look back toward the ridge, too. Well, if I'm wrong, then... 
Kaylin frowned at a fat old maple tree not ten feet away. She thought she saw the bark move. The dusting of snow on the scaly gray furrowed bark began disappearing, melting away in an ever-widening area, like dross floating on the surface of a boiling cauldron. The bark moved. Kaylin gasped as Warren seized her and Kara by the collar and flung them both down on their backs. The wind knocked from their lungs. Kaylin tried to sit up, but Warren dived to the ground between them, pinning them both down. Before Kaylin had a chance to get her breath or ask what was wrong, blinding light flashed in the still woods. A deafening boom rent the air and jolted the ground beneath her. Splintered wood from toothpick-sized fragments to fence-post-sized sections howled past inches above her face. Huge sections of wood thunked as they rebounded off rocks. Others spun, caroming off tree trunks. Pieces tumbling along the ground, kicking up snow, peppered with frozen chunks of dirt. The air went white as the shock from the blast blew a wall of snow up into the air. If any of them had been standing, they would have been torn to shreds. As soon as the last pieces of timber, trailing smoke, thudded to the ground, Warren rolled toward her. Gifted, he whispered. Kalen frowned at him. What? Gifted, he whispered again. They focused their power to boil the frozen tree inside and make it explode. That's how we lost so many men when we gathered back in that valley during the first battle, back just before you came to us. They surprised us. Kalen nodded. She peeked up but saw no one. She glanced over to see if Kara was all right. Where's Kara? she asked in an urgent whisper. Warren cautiously peered off, searching the empty scene. Kaylin lifted herself a little on an elbow and saw only the disturbed snow where Kara had been. Dear creator, Warren said, you don't suppose they've snatched her, do you? Kaylin saw tracks where there had been none before leading off to the side. I think... A scream that would have made a brave man blanch reverberated through the trees. It trailed off in an agonizing echo. Kara, Warren asked. I don't think so. Kalin carefully sat up and saw that a hole had been torn open in the crowded growth of the forest crown, letting harsh light penetrate the shaded woodland sanctuary below. The ground all around was littered with splintered wood, broken branches, huge limbs fallen to ground, and boughs ripped from other trees. Gouges down through the white layer of snow into the dark forest floor radiated from a ragged bowl-shaped depression where the tree had been. Fragments of wood and root lay on the ground everywhere and were even caught up in the surrounding trees. Warren put a hand to her shoulder, urging Kalen to stay down as he rolled into a crouch. She flipped over onto her stomach and cautiously rose up onto her hands and knees. Kalen jumped up and pointed. There. Through the trees, she saw Kara returning. The moored Sith was herding a small man in obvious pain along before her. Each time he stumbled and fell, she kicked him in the ribs, rolling him through the snow before her. He cried out, his words coming as a whining cry that Kalen couldn't make out because of the distance. The words weren't hard to imagine, though. Kara had captured one of the gifted. It was for tasks such as this that Mord Sith had been created. For someone with the gift, trying to use magic against a Mord Sith was a mistake that cost them their control over their own ability. Kalen stood, brushing snow from herself. Warren, his violet robes crusted with snow, rose beside her, transfixed by the sight. This was one of the wizards responsible for killing so many men when the Daharans had gathered in the valley after the order began moving north. This was the vicious animal who did Jagang's bidding. He didn't seem like a vicious animal now, as he wept and begged before the implacable captor driving him on before her. He was a bundle of rags flinging out around him as he rolled through the snow with a final mighty kick that deposited him at Kalen and Warren's feet. He lay face down, whimpering like a child. Kara bent, seized him by his tangled mat of dark hair, and yanked him to his feet. It was a child. Lyle? Warren stared incredulously. Lyle? It was you? Tears ran from wintry eyes. He wiped his nose on the back of a tattered sleeve as he glared at Warren. Young Lyle looked to be a boy of perhaps ten or twelve years, but since Warren knew him... Kalin realized he was probably from the Palace of the Prophets, too. Lyle was a young wizard. 
Warren reached out to cup the boy's bloody chin. Kalen snatched Warren's wrist. The boy lunged to bite Warren's hand. Kara was quicker. She snatched him back by the hair as she rammed her Aegeal into his back. Shrieking in pain, he crumpled to the ground. She kicked the injured lad in the ribs. Warren held his hands out, imploring, Kara, don't! Her icy blue eyes turned up to challenge him. He tried to kill us. He tried to kill the mother confessor. She ground her teeth, and while looking Warren in the eye, kicked the whimpering boy again. Warren licked his lips. I know, but... But what? He's so young, it isn't right. And so it would be better if we just let him kill us? Would that make it right for you? Kalin knew Kara was right. As difficult as it was to witness, Kara was right. If they died, how many men, women, and children would the Imperial Order go on to slaughter? Child though he was, he was a tool of the Order. Nonetheless, Kalin gestured Kara that that was enough. When Kalin signaled, Kara again seized his tangled mat of dirty hair in her fist and hauled him to his feet. With Kara's thighs at his back, he stood shivering, blood running down his face, pulling short, ragged breaths. As Kalen stared down at the terrified, tear-filled brown eyes, she put on her confessor's face, the face her mother had taught her when she was but a little girl, the face that masked her inner tumult. I know you're there, Jagang, she said in a quiet voice devoid of emotion. The boy's bloody mouth turned up in a smile that was not his own. You made a mistake, Jagang. We'll have an army soon on its way to stop them. The boy smiled a vacant, bloody smile, but said nothing. Lyle, Warren said, his voice brittle with anguish. You can be free of the Dreamwalker. You must only swear loyalty to Richard and you will be free. Believe me, Lyle. Try. I know what it's like. Try, Lyle, and I swear I'll help you. Kalin thought that with Warren there, a man he knew, he might throw himself toward the unexpected light coming from the open dungeon door. The boy behind the smile that was not his own watched Warren with longing that slowly curdled to loathing. This was a child who had seen the struggle for freedom bring horror and death and knew that servile obedience brought rewards and life. He was not old enough to understand what more there was to it. With a gentle touch of her fingers, Kalin urged Warren to back away. He reluctantly complied. This isn't the first of Jagang's wizards we've captured, she said offhandedly to Warren. Her words, though, were not meant for Warren. Kalin looked up into Kara's stern blue eyes and then glanced off to the side, hoping the moored Sith understood the instruction. Marlin Pickard, Kalin said, as if recalling the name for Warren, but her words were still meant for Kara. He was grown, and even with this pompous pretend emperor directing him, Marlin still wasn't able to give us much trouble. Marlin had, in fact, given them a great deal of trouble. He had nearly killed Kara and Kalin both. Kalin hoped Kara remembered how tenuous was her control over someone possessed by the Dreamwalker. The mood in the quiet woods was still intense as the boy glared up at Kalin. We discovered your scheme in time, Jagang. You made a mistake thinking you could get by our scouts. I hope you're with those men so that when we wipe them out, we can cut your throat. The bloody grin widened. A woman like you is wasted on the side of the weak, the boy said in the menacing voice of a man. You'd have a much better time serving strength than the order. I'm afraid my husband likes me right where I am. And where is your husband, darling? I was hoping to say hello. He's around. Kalin said in the same dispassionate voice. She saw Warren, when she had spoken the words, move in a way that was a little too much like surprise. Is he now? The boy's eyes turned from Warren back to Kalin. Why is it I don't believe you? She wanted to kick the boy's teeth in as she watched his cruel grin. Kalin's mind raced, trying to figure out what Jagang could possibly know and what he was trying to discover. You'll see him soon enough when we get this poor child back to camp. I'm sure Richard Rawl will want to laugh in your cowardly face when I tell him how we discovered the great Emperor's plan to sneak troops north. He'll want to personally tell you what a fool you are. The boy tried to take a step toward her, but Kara's fist in his hair restrained him. 
He was a cougar on a leash, still testing its chains. The bloody smile remained, but it was not as self-satisfied as it had been. In the brown eyes, Kalin thought she saw hesitation. Ah, but I don't believe you, he said, as if losing interest. We both know he's not there at all, don't we, darling? Kalin resolved to take a risk. You'll see him for yourself soon enough. She made to look as if she were going to turn away, but turned back to him instead. Kalin let a sarcastic smile taint her lips. Oh, you must mean Nietzsche. The smile vanished from the boy's face. The brow drew down, but he managed to keep any anger out of his voice. Nietzsche. I don't know what you're talking about, darling. Sister of the dark, shapely, blonde hair, blue eyes, black dress. Surely you would remember a woman that hauntingly beautiful. Or besides your other shortcomings, are you also a eunuch? The eyes watched, and in them, Kalin could see careful calculations weighing her every word. But it was Nietzsche's words about Jagang that Kalin was remembering. I know who Nietzsche is. I know every private inch of her. One day I will come to know you as intimately as I know Nietzsche. Such an obscene threat was somehow more chilling coming as it did from the mouth of a boy. It made her sick to her stomach to hear a child express Jagang's vile thoughts. The boy's arm gestured for his master. One of my beauties, and quite the lethal lady besides. Kalin thought she detected in Jagang's gravelly growl a hint of the false bravado of a bluff. Almost in afterthought, he added, You haven't really seen her. Kalin heard in the assertion the ghost of a question he dared not ask, and knew by it that there was something more to this. She wished she knew what. She shrugged again. Lethal? I wouldn't know. He licked the blood from his lips. That's what I thought. I wouldn't know because she didn't seem all that lethal. She didn't manage to harm any of us. The grin returned. You lie, darling. If you really saw Nietzsche, she would have killed at least some of you, even if she didn't manage to kill you all. You couldn't best that one without her scratching someone's eyes out first. Really? So sure, are we? The boy let out a belly laugh. Darling, I know Nietzsche, I am sure. Kalin smiled her contempt into the boy's brown eyes. You know I'm telling the truth. Really, he said, still chuckling. How's that? You know it's the truth because she's one of your slaves, so you should be able to enter her mind. You can't, though. I know why you can't. Even though you aren't too bright, I don't suppose you'll need to think too long to imagine why not. Fierce rage fired the boy's eyes. I don't believe you. Kalin shrugged. Suit yourself. If you saw her, then where is she now? As she turned her back on him, Kalin told him the brutal, bitter truth and let him interpret it his own way. Last I saw her, she was on her way into oblivion. Kalin heard the bellow behind her. She spun back to see Kara trying to stop him with her Aegeel. Kalin heard the bone in his arm snap. It didn't even slow him. The boy, in a wild rage, his hands clawed, his teeth bared, lunged for Kalin. Half turned back to him, Kalin lifted her hand against the full weight of the boy crashing toward her as he leaped for her throat. His small chest contacted her hand. His feet were clear of the ground. It felt not as if he were throwing himself at her, but no more than dandelion fluff, floating to her on a breath of air. Time was hers. It was not necessary for Kalin to invoke her birthright, but merely to withdraw her restraint of it. Her feelings could provide her no safe haven. Only the truth would serve her now. This was not a small boy, hurt, alone, afraid. This was the enemy. The inner violence of her power's cold, coiled force slipping its bounds was breathtaking. It surged up from that deep, dark core within, obediently inundating every fiber of her being. She could count each small rib under her fingers. She contained no hate, no rage, no horror, no sorrow. In that infinitesimal spark of time, her mind was in a void where there was no emotion, only the all-consuming rush of time suspended. He had no chance. He was hers. 
Kaylin did not hesitate. She unleashed her power. From an ethereal state as part of her innermost essence, that power became all. Thunder without sound jolted the air, exquisite, violent, and for that pristine instant, sovereign. The boy's face was twisted by the hate of the man who had controlled him. In that singular moment, if she was the absence of emotion, then he was the embodiment of it. Kalin stared back into that lost child's face, knowing that he saw only her merciless eyes. His mind, who he was, who he had been, was already gone. Trees all around shook from the force of the concussion. Snow dropped from branches and boughs. The terrible shock to the air lifted a ring of snow that grew around the two of them in an ever-expanding circle. Kalin had known that Jagang could slip into and out of a person's mind between thought when time itself did not exist. She had no choice but to do as she had done. She could not afford to hesitate. With Jagang in a person's mind, even Kara could not control them. Jagang had burned his bridges behind him as he fled the young mind. The boy fell dead at Kalin's feet. Chapter 35 Kalin swayed on her feet as she stood over the crumbled body of the boy, feeling her emotions flood back in. As always happened, using her confessor's power left her drained and exhausted, in the aftermath, the forest sat in silent judgment. Here and there, the virgin snow around the small body exhibited its red evidence. Only then did Kalin even pause to consider if she might have killed Kara, too. A moored Sith would not live long after the touch of a confessor. There had been no choice. She had done her best to warn Kara, to let her know to get clear. But in the end, Kalin couldn't allow her decision to be influenced by any consideration other than what had to be done. Hesitation could have meant disaster. Now that it was over, though, dread roiled through. Kalin looked around and to the right saw Kara sprawled in the snow. If she had been touching the boy when Kalin unleashed her power... Kara groaned. Kalin staggered to her and dropped to a knee. She clutched the fur at Kara's shoulder and with a mighty effort pulled her over. Kara, are you all right? Kara squinted up with a look of disgust working its way to the surface of pain. Well, of course I'm all right. You didn't think I would be foolish enough to hang on to him, did you? Kalin smiled in thankful relief. No, of course not. I only thought you might have broken your neck jumping away. Kara spat snow and dirt. Nearly did. Warren helped them both to their feet. Grimacing, he rubbed his shoulders and then his elbows. From what Kalin had often been told, being too close to a confessor unleashing her power was a painful experience, sending a shock of agony through every joint. Fortunately, it did no real damage, and the suffering faded quickly. As Warren glanced over at the dead boy, she knew that there was other pain that would not leave so quickly. Dear Creator, Warren whispered to himself. He looked back at Kalin and Kara. He was just a boy. Was it really necessary? Yes, Kalin said in a forceful voice. I'm positive. Kara and I have encountered this situation before, with Marlin. But Marlin was grown. Lyle was so small, so young. What real harm... Warren, don't start down the path of what might have been. Jagang controlled his mind just as he controlled Marlin's mind. We know about this. He was a deadly threat. If I couldn't hold him, Kara said, nothing could. Warren sighed in misery. He sank to his knees at the boy's side. Warren whispered a prayer as his fingers stroked the boy's temple. I guess the blame rightly lies at Jagang's feet. Warren stood and brushed the snow from his knees. Ultimately, Jagang is the one who brought this about. Kalin could see the distant figures of their men rushing up the hillside to rescue her. She started down toward them. If it pleases you to think so. Kara stayed right with her. Warren struggled through the snow to catch up. He snatched Kalin's arm and pulled her to a stop. You mean Anne, don't you? Kalin schooled her anger as she studied Warren's blue eyes. Warren, you were a victim of that woman, too. You were taken to the Palace of the Prophets when you were young, weren't you? I guess so, but... but nothing. They came and took you. They came and took that poor dead child back there. Kalin's fingernails dug into her palms. They came and took Richard. Warren pressed his hand gently to the side of Kalin's arm. 
I know how it seems. Prophecy is often... There, Kalin angrily pointed back at the corpse. There is prophecy. Death and misery. All in the sacred name of prophecy. Warren didn't try to answer her rage. Kalin forced control into her voice. If not the emotion behind it. How many are going to die needlessly in a perverted devotion to seeing prophecy carried out. Had Anne not sent Verna here for Richard, none of this would be happening. How do you know that, Kalen? I can understand how you feel, but how can you be sure? The barrier stood for 3,000 years. It could only be brought down by a wizard born with both sides of the gift. There had been none until Richard. Anne sent Verna to get him. Had she not, the barrier would still be there. Jagang and the Order would be on the other side, the Midlands would be safe, that boy would be playing ball somewhere. Kalen, it's not so simple as you make it seem. Warren opened his hands in an expression of frustration. I don't want to argue this with you, but I want you to understand that prophecy gets fulfilled in many ways. It often seeks its own solution. It could be that had Anne not sent for Richard, he would have for some other reason ventured down there and brought down the barrier. Who is to know the reason? Don't you see? It could be that it was bound to happen, and Anne was simply the means, if not her, then another. Kalin pulled angry breaths through gritted teeth. How much blood, how many corpses, how much grief will it take before you see the harm prophecy has inflicted upon the world? Warren smiled sadly. I am a prophet. I've always wanted to be a prophet in order to help people. I wouldn't put my faith in it if I truly thought it was the cause of harm. He smiled more brightly with a memory. Don't forget, without prophecy you would never have come to meet Richard. Aren't you better off having had him come into your life? I know I am. Kalin's look of cold fury took the warm smile from his face. I would rather have been condemned to a lonely life without love than to know that harm has come to him because he came into my life. I would rather never have met him than to have come to know his value and know that that value is being dashed on the rocks of this mad faith in prophecy. Warren stuck his hands in the opposite sleeves of his purple robes as his gaze sank to the ground. I understand how you can feel that way. Please, Kalin, talk to Verna. Why? She's the one who carried out Anne's orders. Just talk to her. I almost lost Verna because she felt the same way as you do now. Verna? Warren nodded. She came to believe she had been used maliciously by Anne. For twenty years she was on a fruitless search for Richard, when all the while Anne knew right where he was. Can you imagine how Verna felt when she discovered that? There were other things, too. Anne tricked us into believing she was dead. She maneuvered Verna into being prelate. Warren pulled a hand from his sleeve and held his first finger and thumb an inch apart. She was once this close to throwing her journey book into a fire. She should have. Warren's sad smile returned. I'm just saying it might make you feel better to talk to her. She will understand how you feel. What good is that going to do? Warren shrugged. Even if you're right, so what? What's done is done. We can't undo it. Nietzsche has Richard. The Imperial Order is here in the New World. Whatever caused the events, they are upon us, and we must now deal with that reality. Kalin appraised his sparkling blue eyes. You learned this, studying prophecy? His smile widened into a grin. No, that was what Richard taught me. And a pretty smart woman I know just told me not to start down the path of what might have been. And much as she was of a mind to hold on to it, Kalin felt her anger slipping away. I'm not so sure how smart she is. Warren waved down at the troops charging up the hill with their swords drawn, signaling the all-clear. The men slowed to a fast walk, but didn't sheathe their weapons. Well, Warren said, she was smart enough to figure out Jagang's plan, and in the middle of being attacked by his gifted minion to keep her wits about her and to trick him into thinking she had fallen for his scheme. Kalin drew her face into a peevish scowl. How old are you, Warren? He looked surprised by the question. I turned 158 not long ago. That explains it, Kara griped, starting off down the hill. Stop looking so young and innocent all the time, Warren. It's just plain irritating.
By the time Kalen, Kara, Warren, and their escort of guard troops arrived back in camp several hours later, it was a scene of furious activity. Wagons were being loaded, horses hitched, and weapons readied. Tents were not yet being taken down, but soldiers in their leather and chainmail armor, and still eating the remnants of their dinners, were gathered around officers, listening to instructions for when the order was given to send a force out to intercept the enemy moving north. Other officers in tents Kalen passed were bent over maps. The aroma of stew drifting through the afternoon air reminded her how hungry she was. Winter darkness came early, and the overcast made it feel like it was already evening. The endless cloudy days were getting to be depressing. There was little chance to see much of the sun. Soon, heavier snow would make it down this far south. Kalen dismounted and let a young soldier take her horse. She no longer rode a big war horse. She and most of the cavalry had switched to smaller, more agile mounts. For a clash between large units, big war horses added weight to a charge, but since the Daharan Empire forces were so outnumbered, they had decided it would be best to trade weight for speed and maneuverability. By changing tactics in such a way, not just with the cavalry, but with their entire army, Kalin and General Myford had been able to keep the order off balance for weeks. They let the enemy put a huge effort into a crushing attack and then dodged it, just enough to save themselves while letting the order, being tantalizingly close, wear themselves out. When the order tired from the effort of such massive attacks and paused to rest, General Myford sent in glancing attacks to step on their toes and make them dance. Once the order dug in for the expected attack, Kalin withdrew their forces to a more distant spot, rendering useless the order's effort at building defenses. If the order tried the same thing again, the Daharans continued to harry them day and night, buzzing around them like angry hornets, but staying out of reach of a heavy swat. If the Imperial Order, tired of not being able to sink their teeth into their enemy and turn their forces to go after population centers, then Kalin had her men jump on their tails and put arrows in their backs as they struggled to get free. Eventually, they would have to forget their thoughts of plunder and turn back toward the threat. The Imperial Order was maddened by the Daharans' constant badgering attacks. Jagang's men were insulted by that kind of fighting. They believed real men met face to face in the field of battle and exchanged blow for blow. Of course, it didn't trouble their dignity that they greatly outnumbered the Daharans. Kalin knew such a meeting would be bloody and only to the Order's advantage. She didn't care what they thought, only that they died. The more angry and frustrating the Imperial Order became, the more recklessly they behaved, launching impetuous attacks into well-ordered defenses or heedlessly pressing men into doomed attacks, trying to take ground they couldn't possibly take in such a fashion. It sometimes stunned Kalin to watch so many of the men march into range below their archers, fall dead, only to have yet more men march right in behind them, continuously adding corpses to a battlefield already choked with the dead and dying. It was insanity. The Daharans had suffered several thousand dead or seriously wounded. On the other hand, Kalin and General Myfert estimated that they had killed or wounded in excess of 50,000 of the enemy. It was the equivalent of stepping on one ant as the colony poured out of its anthill. She could think of nothing else to do but to keep at it. They had no choice. Kalin, with Kara at her side, crossed a river of men to get to the command tents, sporting blue cloth strips. Unless you knew the day's color code, finding the command tents would be nearly impossible. Because of the fear of an infiltrator, or an enemy gifted finding and being able to kill a group of senior officers gathered together, they met in nondescript tents. Colored cloth strips marked many of the tents. The men used them as a system of finding their units when they had to move on short notice, and so often. So Kalin got the idea of using the same system to identify the command tents. They changed the color code often so no one color would become known as the officer's colors. Inside the cramped tent, General Myfert looked up from where he bent over a table with a map unfurled at a cockeyed angle. Lieutenant Lydon of Kelton was there along with Captain Abernathy, the commander of the Galean forces Kalin had brought down with her weeks before. Addie was sitting quietly in the corner as the representative of the gifted, watching the goings-on with her completely white eyes. Blinded as a young woman, Addie had learned to see using her gift. She was a remarkably talented sorceress. Addie was quite proficient at using that talent to do the enemy harm. Now she was there to help coordinate the sisters' abilities with the needs of the army. When Kalin inquired, Addie told her, 
Zed be down at the southern lines, checking on details. Kaylin nodded her thanks. Warren went down there to help, too. Kaylin scrunched up her freezing toes in her boots, trying to bring feeling back to them. She blew warm air into her cupped hands and then turned her attention to the waiting general. We need to get together a good-sized force, maybe 20,000 men. General Meifert sighed his frustration. So they are moving an army up past us. No, she said, it's a trick. The three officers frowned their puzzlement as they waited for an explanation. I ran into Jagang. You what? General Meifert shouted in unbridled panic. Kalin waved a hand, allaying his fears. Not like you're thinking. It was through the body of one of his slaves. She stuck her hands under her arms to warm them. The important thing is that I played along with Jagang's scheme so that he would think we were falling for his plan. Kalin explained how Jagang's ruse of troop movements was meant to work and how its true design was to draw away a good-sized force so as to leave those remaining behind weaker. The men listened as she laid it all out while pointing to the locations on the map. If we were to send that many men out, Lieutenant Lydon asked, wouldn't that be just what Emperor Jagang wanted? It would be, she told him, but that's not what we're going to do. I want those men to ride out of camp and make it look as if we were doing what he expected. She leaned over the map, using a piece of charcoal to sketch in some of the nearby mountains she had just traveled through, and showed them a lowland pass around several. Captain Abernathy spoke up. We have my Galean troops. They're close to the number you need to serve as the decoy. That's what I was thinking, General Myford said. Done, Kalen said. She pointed at the map again. Circle around these mountains here, Captain, so that when the order attacks our camp, thinking to roll over us, your men can stick them in their soft side right here, where they won't expect it. Captain Abernathy, a trim man with a graying, bushy mustache that matched his eyebrows, nodded as he watched Kalen pointing out the route on the map. Don't worry, Mother Confessor. The order will believe we're gone. But we'll be standing ready to drive right into their ribs when they come for you. Kalen turned her attention back to the general. We'll also need to secretly trickle another force out of camp to wait at the opposite side of the valley from Captain Abernathy, so that when the order comes up the valley in the middle, we can drive into their ribs from both sides at once. They won't want to let us cut off the trap part of their force, so they'll turn tail. Then our main force can drive steel into their vulnerable backs. The three officers considered her plan in silence, while outside the confusion of noise went on. Horses galloped past, wagons creaked and bounced along, snow underfoot crunched as soldiers shuffled past and men called out orders. Lieutenant Lydon's eyes turned up toward Kalen. Mother Confessor, my Keltons could be that other force. They've all served together a long time and work well in our own units under my command. We could begin slipping out of the camp at once and gather down there to wait for the attack. You could send a sister with us to verify a prearranged signal, and then I could take my men in when Captain Abernathy attacks from the opposite side. Kalen knew the man wanted to redeem himself in her eyes. He was also looking to establish for Kelton a measure of autonomy within the Daharan Empire. That will be a dangerous spot, Lieutenant. If anything goes wrong, we can't come to your aid. He nodded. But my men are familiar with the area, and we're used to traversing mountainous country in the winter. The Imperial Order is from a warmer land. We have the advantage of weather and terrain. We can do the job, Mother Confessor. Kalen straightened, letting out a breath as she appraised the man. General Myford, she knew, would like the idea. Captain Abernathy would, too. Galia and Kelton were traditional rivals, so the two would just as soon fight their own way and separately. Richard had brought the lands together so that they would all come to feel they were one now. That was vital if they were to survive. She supposed that they were fighting for the same goal, so in that way they were working together. They would have to coordinate their attacks. Lieutenant Lydon did make sense, too. His troops were mountain fighters. All right, Lieutenant. Thank you, Mother Confessor. Kalen thought to add some insurance. If you acquit yourself well in this, Lieutenant, it could move you up in command. Lieutenant Lydon clapped a fist to his heart in salute. My men will make their queen proud. Kalen acknowledged his pledge with the nod of the mother confessor. She addressed them all. We had better get underway. General Myford grunted his agreement. This will be a good opportunity to knock down their numbers. If it goes even half right, this time we'll bleed them good. 
He turned to the other two officers. Let's get started. We need to have your men moving at once to give them enough time to be in position by morning. There's no telling how long they might wait to attack, but if it comes as soon as dawn, I want you in position and ready. The order of favors attacking at dawn, Captain Abernathy said. We can be on our way within the hour. We'll be in place and ready by dawn, should they come in early. As can we, Lieutenant Lydon agreed. The two officers bowed and started to leave. Captain, Kalin called. The men turned back. Mother Confessor, do you have any idea what could be keeping Prince Harold and the rest of your army? He should have been here long ago. We could really use the rest of your men. Captain Abernathy's thumb twiddled a bone button on the front of his dark coat. I'm sorry, Mother Confessor. I, too, thought they should have been here by now. I can't imagine what could be keeping the prince. He should have been here by now, she repeated under her breath to herself. She looked up at the captain. Weather? Perhaps, Mother Confessor. If there are storms, that could have delayed him. That is probably the reason, and in that case I don't imagine he should be much longer. Our men train in the mountains in such conditions. Kalin sighed. Let's hope he's here soon, then. Captain Abernathy confidently met her gaze. I know for a fact that the prince was eager to collect his men and get down here to help. Gallia spans the Calisidron Valley. The prince personally told me that it was to our own best interest to halt the imperial order down here, rather than letting them advance further up into the Midlands, where our lands and our families would come under the terror of the enemy. Kalin could see in Lieutenant Lydon's eyes that he was thinking that if Prince Harold instead decided to make a stand in the Calisidron Valley in order to selfishly protect his homeland of Galia, such an obstacle very well could force the order to instead bear toward the northeast in their advance, around the intervening mountains and over into the Kern Plain, right toward Lydon's homeland of Kelton. If Lieutenant Lydon was imagining such treachery, he had the wisdom not to voice it. I know the weather was bad when I came down, Kalin said. It is winter, after all. I'm sure Prince Harold will soon be here to help his queen and the fellow people of the Daharan Empire. Kalin offered them a smile to soften the subtle threat. Thank you, gentlemen. You'd best get to your tasks. May the good spirits watch your backs. After the men had saluted and hurried off to their work, Addie put her hands to her knees and levered herself to her feet. If you do not need me, I must see to informing the sisters Zed and Warren of our plans. Kalin nodded wearily. Thank you, Addie. Addie, her eyes completely white, saw with the aid of her gift. Kalin could feel that gifted gaze on her. You have used your power, the old sorceress said. I be able to see it in your face. You must rest. I know, Kalin said, but there are things needing to be done. They will not get done if you fall ill or worse, which could happen. Addie's thin fingers gripped Kara's arm. See to it that the mother confessor be left alone for a while, so she can at least rest her head on the table if nothing else. Kara swung the folding chair around and set it behind the table. She pointed at it while leveling a stern look at Kalin. Sit, I will stand watch. Kalin was exhausted. Using her confessor's ability sapped her strength. She needed time to recover. The hard ride back had only made matters worse. She went around the table and sat down heavily in the folding chair. She opened her fur mantle and set it back on her shoulders. Richard's sword was still strapped to her back, its hilt jutting up above her shoulder. She didn't bother to remove the sword. Addie, at seeing Kalin comply without complaint, smiled to herself and went on her way. Kara took up guard at the entrance as Kalin's head sank down into her pillowed arms. Trying not to let the terrible events of the day overwhelm her, she instead thought of Richard, remembering his handsome smile, his penetrating gray eyes, his gentle touch. Her own eyes closed. In her weariness, the chair and table felt as if they were spinning her around. In moments, though, as she held her thoughts of Richard in her mind's eye, she felt herself sliding into sleep. Chapter 36 Mother Confessor? Kalin squinted up at a dark shape above her. She blinked, clearing her vision, and saw that it was Verna. The gold sunburst ring of the prelate of the Sisters of the Light reflected a glimmer of lamplight. Behind her, twilight tainted the tent canvas with a rusty glow. Kalin rubbed the sleep from her eyes. Verna wore a long gray wool dress and a dark brown cloak. At her throat, the dress had a bit of white lace that softened the austerity of the outfit. 
Verna's brown hair had a carefree wave and spring to it, but her brown eyes held a troubled look. What is it, Verna? If you have a moment, I would like to talk to you. No doubt Verna had been talking to Warren. Whenever Kaylin saw them together, the shared intimate glances, the chance furtive touch reminded her of the way she and Richard felt about each other. It softened Kaylin's feelings about Verna's stern exterior to know she was in love, knowing for that matter that she was capable of tenderness. Kaylin knew that she too must be regarded with the same sort of curiosity, if not amazement, where tender feelings were concerned. She sighed, wondering if this was going to be a talk about Anne and prophecy. Kaylin wasn't in the mood. Kara, how long have I been asleep? A couple of hours. It will soon be dark. As tight and sore as Kaylin's shoulders and neck were from sleeping with her head on the table, the lateness of the hour didn't come as a surprise. She stretched to the side and then saw the frail-looking sorceress sitting on a short bench. She had a dark blanket over her lap. How do you feel? Addie asked. I'm fine. Kaylin could see her breath in the frigid air. The men we sent out? Both groups be on their way more than an hour ago, Addie said. The first group, the Galeans, all left together in big columns. The Keltons dribbled out in small groups, not as likely to be noticed by any spies watching. Kalen yawned. Good. She knew they had to fear an attack by the Imperial Order as soon as morning. At least that should give their men enough time to travel to their positions and be ready. Waiting for an attack made her stomach feel queasy. She knew the men, too, would be on edge and likely get little sleep. Addie idly ran a thin finger back and forth along the red and yellow beads at the neckline of her modest robes. I came back after the Galeans left to help Kara keep people away so you would not be disturbed while you rested. Kaylin nodded her thanks. Apparently, either Addie thought Kaylin had rested enough or she thought Verna's visit was important. What is it then, Verna? We have discovered something. Not so much discovered it as had an idea. Who is we? Verna cleared her throat. Under her breath, she beseeched the Creator's forgiveness before she went on. Actually, Mother Confessor, I thought of it. Some of my sisters helped me with it, but I'm the one who thought it up. The blame falls to me. Kaylin thought that was an odd way of putting it. She didn't think Verna looked at all pleased by her own idea, whatever it was. Kaylin waited silently for her to go on. Well, you see, we have a problem getting things past the enemy's gifted. They have sisters of the light, but also dark, and we don't have their power. When we try to send things... Send things? Verna pursed her lips. Weapons. When Kalen's brow twitched with a questioning look, Verna bent and gathered something from the ground. She held out her open hand, showing Kalen a collection of small pebbles. Zed showed us how to turn simple things into devastating weapons. We can use our power to fling them, or even with our breath, blow on some small thing like these pebbles, and use our magic to send them out faster than any arrow, even an arrow from a crossbow. The pebbles we flung out in this way cut down waves of advancing soldiers. The pebbles traveled so swiftly that sometimes each would pierce the bodies of half a dozen men. I remember those reports, Kalen said, but that stopped working because their gifted caught on to the artifice and now defend against such things. Kalen recognized the weary look of the weight of responsibility in Verna's brown eyes. That's right. The Order learned how to look for things of magic or even things propelled by magic. Most of our conjuring that is in any way similar has become useless. That's what Zed told me. That in war, magic is most often unseen, that each side manages only to balance the other. Verna nodded. It is so. We do the same against them. Things they used at first, we now know how to counter, so we can protect our men. Our warning horns, for example, we learned that we must code them with a trace of magic to know they are genuine. Kaylin drew her fur mantle up around her neck. She was chilled to the bone and couldn't seem to get warm. Not surprising, seeing as how she was spending all of her time outdoors. It was insanity to be carrying on a war in such conditions. She guessed that war in fine weather was no more sane. Still, she ached to be inside, beside a cozy fire. So what is this thing you thought up? As if reminded of the cold, Verna pulled her cloak tighter around her shoulders. Well, I got the notion that if the enemy gifted are, in a sense, filtering for anything magic, or even anything being propelled by magic, then what we need is something 
not magic. Kalin gave Verna a grim smile. We do. They're called soldiers. Verna didn't smile. No, I meant something the gift it could do to disable enemy troops without risk to our own men. Addie shuffled forward to stand behind Kalin's left shoulder as Verna reached into her cloak and pulled out a small leather pouch closed with a drawstring. She tossed it on the table before Kalin, then set a piece of paper beside it. Pour a little on the paper, please. Verna was holding her stomach as if she were having indigestion. But be careful not to touch it with your finger or get it on your skin. And whatever you do, don't blow on it. Be careful not to even breathe on it. Addie leaned in to watch as Kalin carefully poured a small quantity of a sparkling dust from the pouch onto the square of paper. She pushed at the little pile with the corner of the pouch. There were hints of pallid colors, but it was mostly a pale, glimmering greenish-gray. What is it? Some kind of magic dust? Glass. Kalin's eyes turned up. Glass? You thought up glass? Verna let out a tisk at herself for how foolish she must have sounded. No, Mother Confessor, I thought of breaking it. You see, this is just simple glass that has been broken and crushed into fine pieces, almost dust. But we used our Han to aid us when we crushed the glass with a mortar and pestle. By using our gift, we were able to break the glass into very tiny fragments, but in a special way. Verna leaned over, her finger hovering above the little greenish-gray mound. Kara leaned in beside her in order to look down at the dangerous thing on the piece of paper. This glass, every piece, is sharp and jagged, even though each piece is very tiny. Each piece is hardly bigger than dust, so it weighs nothing, almost like dust. Dear spirits, Addie said before whispering a prayer in her own language. Kalin cleared her throat. I don't understand. Mother Confessor, we can't get our magic past the defenses of the orders gifted. They are prepared for magic, even if it's a simple pebble but uses magic to hurl it at their troops. This glass, however, even though we used magic to break it, has no magic properties, none at all. It's just inert material, the same as the dust kicked up by their feet. They can't detect it as magic because it isn't magic. Through their gift, they will sense this as simple as dust or mist or possibly fog depending on atmospheric conditions at the time. But we sent dust clouds at them before, Kalin said. Dust to make them sick and such. They mostly countered it. Verna held up a finger to note her point as she smiled a grim smile. But those were dust clouds containing magic. Mother Confessor, this does not. Don't you see? It's so light it floats in the air for a long time. We could use simple magic to cast it up into the air and then withdraw the magic. Or we could simply fling it up into the breeze, for that matter. Either way, we have only to let their troops run through it. All right. Kalin scratched an eyebrow. But what will it do to them? It will get in their eyes, Addie said in her raspy voice from behind Kalin's shoulder. That's right, Verna said. It gets in their eyes, just as any dust would. At first, it will feel like dust in their eyes, and they will try to blink it away. However, since the fragments are all still jagged and razor-sharp, they will instead embed themselves in the body's tissue. It will stick in their eyes and build up under their eyelids, where it will make thousands of tiny cuts across their eyes with each blink. The more they blink, the more it eats away at their delicate eyes. Verna straightened and pulled her cloak together. It will blind them. Kalin sat in numb disbelief at the madness of it all. Are you sure? Kara said. Might it just irritate them like gritty dust? We know for sure, Verna said. We had an accident and know all too well what it does. It may do more damage when it gets in the throat, the lungs, and the gut. We don't know about that yet. But we do know for sure that such special glass, if we grind it to just the right size particles, will float in the air, and people passing through the cloud will be blinded in remarkably short order. As long as we can blind a man, he can't fight. It may not kill them, but as long as they are blind, they can't kill us, or fight back as we kill them. Kara, usually gleeful at the prospect of killing the enemy, did not seem so now. We would have but to line them up and butcher them. Kaylin put her head in her hands, covering her eyes. You want me to approve its use, 
don't you? That's why you're here. Verna said nothing. Kalin looked up at last. That's what you want, isn't it? Mother Confessor, I need not tell you that the Sisters of the Light abhor harming people. However, this is a war for our very existence. For the very existence of free people. We know it must be done. If Richard were here, I just thought that you would want to be made aware of this and be the one to give such orders. Kalin stared at the woman, understanding then why she was holding her hand over a pain in her stomach. Do you know, Prelate, Kalin said in a near whisper, that I killed a child today, not by accident, but on purpose. I would do it again without hesitation, but that won't make me sleep any better. A child? It was truly necessary to kill a child? His name was Lyle. I believe you know him. He was another one of the victims of Anne's Sisters of the Light. Verna, her face gone ashen, closed her eyes against the news. I guess if I can kill a child, Kalin said, I can easily enough give the orders for you to use your special glass against the monsters who would use a child as a weapon. I have sworn no mercy, and I meant it. Addie laid a gnarled hand on Kalin's shoulder. Kalin, Verna said in a gentle voice, I can understand how you feel. Anne used me too, and I didn't understand why. I thought she used everyone for her own selfish purposes. For a time I thought her a despicable person. You have every reason to believe as you do. But I would be wrong, Verna? Is that what you were going to add? I'd not be so sure were I you. You didn't have to kill a little boy today. Verna nodded in sympathy, but didn't argue. Addie, Kalin asked, do you think there would be anything you might be able to do for the woman who was accidentally blinded? Perhaps you could help her? Addie nodded. That'd be a good idea. Verna, take me to her, and let me see what I can do. Kalin cocked her head as the two women moved toward the tent opening. Did you hear that? The horn? Verna asked. Yes. It sounds like alarm horns. Verna squinted in concentration. She turned her head to the side, listening attentively. Yes, it does sound like alarm horns, she finally declared. But it doesn't have the right trace of magic through it. The enemy does that often. Tries to get us to act based on false alarms. We've been having more and more lately. Kalin frowned. We have? Why? Why what? Kalin stood. If we know they're false alarms and they don't work, then why would the order increase the attempts? That makes no sense. Verna's gaze roved about as if searching in vain for an answer. Well, I don't know. I can't imagine. I'm no expert in the tactics of warfare. Kara turned to go have a look. Maybe it's just some scouts coming back in. Kalin turned her head, listening. She heard horses running, but that wasn't so rare. It could be, as Kara suggested, scouts returning with reports, but by the sound of the hooves, the horses sounded big. She heard men yelling. The clash of steel rang out, along with cries of pain. Kalin drew her Galean royal sword as she started around the table. Before any of them could get more than a step, the tent shuddered violently as something crashed against its walls. For an instant, the whole thing tipped at an impossible angle, then steel-tipped lances burst through the canvas. With a rush of wind, the tent collapsed around them. The heavy canvas drove Kalin to the ground as it caved in. She couldn't get a grip on anything solid as the tent rolled her over and began dragging her along. Hooves thundered past, pounding the ground right beside her head. She could smell lamp oil as it sloshed across the canvas. With a whoosh, the oil in the tent ignited. Kalin coughed on the smoke. She could hear the crackle of flames. She could see nothing. She was trapped, rolled up in the bucking tent as it slid across the ground. Chapter 37 Tightly shrouded in stiff canvas, Kalin couldn't see anything. She choked and gagged on the thick, acrid smoke burning her lungs. She pulled frantically at the canvas, trying to disentangle herself, but as she bounced and tumbled along the ground, she couldn't make any headway, gaining her liberty. The heat of flames close to her face ignited in her a sense of panic, her weariness forgotten. She kicked and struggled madly as she gasped for air. Where are you? It was Kara's voice. It sounded close, as if she too was being dragged along and strenuously engaged in her own fight for life. Car was smart enough not to shout Kalin's name or title when surrounded by the enemy. Hopefully, Verna knew better as well. Here! Kalin shouted in answer to Kara. 
Kaylin's sword was trapped, pressed to her legs by the rolled canvas. She managed to wiggle her left hand up onto the knife at her belt. She yanked it free. She had to turn her face to try to keep away from the heat of the oily flames. The smothering, smoky blindness was terrifying. With angry resolve, Kaylin stabbed at the canvas, punching her knife through. Just then, the tent hit something, and they were bounced into the air. The hard landing knocked the wind from her lungs. A gasp pulled in suffocating smoke. Again, Kaylin plunged her knife into the heavy canvas and slashed an opening as her entire shroud erupted into flame. She yelled again to Kara. I can't get... The tent hit something solid. Her shoulder whacked hard into what felt like a tree stump, and she was flipped up and over the top of it. Had she not been wearing her stiff leather armor, the blow surely would have broken her shoulder. Crashing down on the other side, Kaylin tumbled free and across the snow. She spread her arms to stop herself from rolling. Kaylin saw General Meifert reach up, seize a fistful of chain mail, and unhorse the man who had been dragging her tent. The man's eyes gleamed from behind long, curly, greasy hair. His stout body was covered with hides and furs over chain mail and leather armor. He was missing his upper teeth. As he lunged at the general, he lost his head, too. Yet more order troops wheeled their big war horses, striking down at the Daharans, scrambling both to escape the blows and to mount a defense. One of the war horses charged Kalin's way, its rider leaning out, swinging a flail. Kalin sheathed both her knife and sword. She snatched up the lance of the man who had been dragging the tent. She brought the long weapon up and spun around just in time to plant the butt end in a frozen rut and let the charging war horse take the steel-tipped point in his chest. As the grinning order soldier with the flail leaped from the staggering horse, he drew his sword with his free hand. Kalin didn't wait. As he was still alighting on his feet, she spun while drawing her own sword and landed a solid backhanded blow across the left side of his face. Without pause, she dove under the legs of another horse to dodge a blade when the horse's rider slashed down at her. She sprang up on the other side and hacked the rider's leg open to the bone twice before turning just in time to ram her sword up to its hilt into the chest of another horse sidling in, trying to crush her against the first. As the animal reared with a wild scream, Kalin yanked her sword free and tumbled away just before the big horse crashed to the ground. The rider's leg was trapped, and he was at an awkward angle to defend himself. Kalin made the best of the opportunity. For the moment, the immediate area was clear, enabling her to scramble over to the tent where the general was on his knees, yanking at the snarled mess of canvas and rope. More order cavalry were thundering past, threatening to trample Verna, Addy, and Kara, still trapped in the tangle of tent. At least the burning section had pulled away. Kalin worked beside General Meifert to tug and cut the canvas. At last, they ripped open the heavy material, freeing Addie and Verna. The two women were rolled up together, nearly in each other's arms. Addie's head was bleeding, but she pushed away Kalin's concerned hands. Verna emerged from the cocoon and stumbled to her feet, still dizzy from the wild ride. Kalin helped Addie up. The scrape on her brow didn't look too serious. General Meifert pulled frantically at the canvas. Kara was still inside somewhere, but they no longer heard her. Kalin seized Verna by the arm. I thought they were false alarms. They were, Verna insisted. Obviously they tricked us. All around, soldiers were engaged in pitched battle with Imperial Order cavalry. Men shouted in fury as they threw themselves into battle. Some screamed as they were wounded or killed. Others called out orders, commanding a defense, while the men on horseback ordered in their attack. Some of the cavalry were setting fire to wagons, tents, and supplies. Others charged past, trampling men and tents. Pairs of riders teamed up to single out soldiers and take them down, then charged after another victim. They were using the same tactics the Daharans had used. They were doing what Kalin had taught them to do. When a soldier draped in filthy fur and weapons cried out in bravado as he rushed at her wielding a raised mace studded with glistening bloody spikes, Kalin took his hand off with a lightning-swift blow. He staggered to a stop and stared at her in surprise. Without missing a beat, she drove her sword into his gut and gave it a wrenching twist before pulling it free. She turned her attention elsewhere as he crashed down atop a fire. His screams melted in with all the others. Kalin fell to her knees once more to help General Meifert free Kara. He had found her amid the snare of rope and folds of canvas. From time to time, one of them had to turn to fight off sporadic attackers. Kalin could see Kara's red boots sticking out from under the canvas, but they were still. Tent line was tangled around Kara's legs. 
With Kalin and the general working together, they cut through the mire of rope and were finally able to unroll Kara. She held her head as she moaned. She wasn't unconscious, but she was groggy and unable to get her bearings. Kalin found a lump in her hair at the right side of her head, but it wasn't bleeding. Kara tried to sit up. Kalin pressed her down on her back. Stay there. You were hit on the head. I don't want you to get up just yet. Kalin looked over her shoulder and saw Verna nearby, singling out Imperial Order troops, each twitch of her hands casting a fiery spell to blast them from their horses, or a focused edge of air as sharp as any blade, yet more swift and sure, to slice them down. Without the gift themselves, or one of the gifted to protect them, the enemy's simple armor was no defense. Kalin caught Verna's attention and motioned for her help. Seizing the woman's cloak at her shoulder, Kalin pulled Verna close to speak into her ear so as to be heard above the noise of battle. See how she is, will you? Help her. Verna nodded and then huddled at Kara's side as Kalin and the general turned to a fresh charge of cavalry. As one man galloped in close, wielding his lance around, General Myford dodged the strike and then leaped up onto the side of the horse, catching hold of the saddle's horn. With a grunt of angry effort, he drove his sword through the rider. The surprised man clawed at the blade in his soft middle. The general yanked his sword free, then grabbed the man by the hair and dragged him out of the saddle. As the dying man fell away, General Myford sprang up into the saddle in his place. Kalin snatched up the fallen cavalryman's lance. The big Daharan general wheeled the huge horse into the way of charging enemy cavalry, protecting Verna and Kara. Kalin sheathed her sword and used the lance to good effect against the war horses. Horses, even well-trained war horses, didn't appreciate being stabbed in the chest. Many people considered them just dumb beasts, but horses were smart enough to understand that driving themselves onto a pointed lance was not what they wanted to do and reacted accordingly. As horses bucked and reared when Kalin stabbed them with her lance, many of their riders fell. Some were injured from the fall onto scattered equipment or the frozen ground, but most came under the swarming attack of the Daharans. From atop his Imperial Order warhorse, General Myford commanded his men to form a defensive line. After directing them into place, he charged off, roaring a string of orders as he went. He didn't tell his men who to protect so as not to betray Kalin to the enemy, but they quickly saw what it was he intended them to do. Daharans grabbed up the enemy lances or came running with their own pikes, and soon there was a bristling line of steel-tipped pole weapons presenting a deadly obstacle to any approaching cavalry. Kalin called out orders to men on either side, and as she joined the line, commanded them into position to block an Imperial Order cavalry unit of about 200 who were trying to make good their escape. The enemy might have been emulating the raids the Daharan cavalry had made on the Imperial Order's camp, but Kalin wasn't about to allow them to succeed at it. She intended them to fail. The enemy's horses balked when they encountered a solid line of advancing pikes brandished by men shouting battle cries. Soldiers coming from behind the Order cavalry rained down arrows. Daharans dragged trapped riders from their saddles down into the bloody hand-to-hand -hand fighting on the ground. I don't want one of them escaping camp alive, she yelled to her men. No mercy! No mercy, every Daharan within earshot called out in answer. The enemy, so confident and arrogant as they had charged in, relishing the prospect of spilling Daharan blood, were now nothing more than pathetic men in the ungainly grip of despair as the Daharans hacked them to death. Kalin left the soldiers with the lances and pikes, now that a defensive line had been established and the enemy was trapped, and ran back through the fires and choking smoke to find Verna, Addy, and Kara. She had to dodge wounded soldiers of both armies on the ground. The fallen attackers, who still had fight in them, snatched at her ankles. She had to stab several who tried to rise up to grab her. Others afoot who suddenly appeared, she had to cut down. The enemy knew who she was, or at least they were pretty sure. Jagang had seen her, and no doubt had described the mother confessor to his men. Kalin was sure to have a heavy price on her head. There seemed to be Imperial Order men scattered throughout the camp. She doubted there had been an attack by foot soldiers. They were probably cavalrymen who had lost their mounts. Horses were often easier moving targets to hit with arrows and spears than were men. In the gathering darkness, it was hard to make out enemy soldiers. They were able to sneak through the camp undiscovered as they hunted targets of value such as officers, or maybe even the mother confessor. When the lurking enemy spotted Kalin making her way through the chaos, they came out of their hiding places to go after her with wild abandon. Others she came upon and surprised. Remembering not only her father's training but Richard's admonition, 
Kaylin cut fiercely into the enemy soldiers. She gave them no opening, no chance, no mercy. Her training under her father had been a good foundation for the esoteric tactical precepts that Richard had taught her when she was recovering from her wounds back in Heartland. Richard's way had seemed so strange then. Now it seemed so natural. In much the same way a lighter horse could outmaneuver a big war horse, her lighter weight became her edge. She didn't need the weight because she simply didn't clash with the enemy in the traditional manner as they expected. She was a hummingbird, floating out of their reach, swooping in between their ponderous moves to efficiently deliver death. Such moves were not at odds with the manner of fighting that her father had taught, but complemented it in a way that fit her. Richard had trained her not with a sword, but with a willow switch, a mischievous smile, and a dangerous glint in his eyes. Now Richard's sword, strapped over the back of her shoulder, was an ever-present reminder of those playful lessons that had been not only unrelenting, but deadly serious. She finally found Verna, bent over Kara, but didn't see the generals anywhere. Kalin snatched Verna's sleeve. How is she? She threw up, but that seemed to have helped once it passed. She will probably be woozy for a while, but I think she's otherwise all right. She has a thick skull, Addie said. It not be cracked, but she should lie still for a time, at least until she recovers her balance. Kara's hands groped as if having trouble finding the ground beneath her. Despite her obvious dizziness, she was cursing the prelate and trying to sit up. Kalin, squatting beside Kara, pressed her shoulder to the ground. Kara, I'm right here. I'm fine. Lie still for a few minutes. I want at them! Later, Kalin said. Don't worry, you'll get your chance. She saw that the blood was clean from Addie's head. Addie, how are you? How is your head? The old sorceress gestured dismissively. Bah, I be fine. My head be thicker than Kara's. Soldiers had gathered, forming a protective wall of steel. Verna, Addie, and Kalin crouched over Kara, keeping an eye on the surrounding area, but the fighting immediately around them seemed to have ended. Even if pockets of battle remained, with the large number of Daharan soldiers who had protectively closed ranks, the four women were safe for the time being. General Myford finally returned, charging through the line of Daharan defenders as they parted for him. He leaped from his enemy warhorse. The horse tossed his head at the indignity of being ridden by the enemy and ran off. The young Daharan general crouched down on the opposite side of Kara. Winded, he started talking anyway. I've been down checking with the front lines. This is a raid, much like what we've been doing to them. It looked bigger than it really was. When they spotted the Mother Confessor, they called their men into this area, so the damage was mostly focused in this section. Why didn't we know? Kalin asked. What went wrong with the alarm? Not sure. He was shaking his head, still getting his breath. Zed thinks that they learned our codes and that when we blew the alarm, they must have used subtractive magic to alter the magic woven into the sound that tells our gifted that it's a real attack. Kalin let out an angry breath. It was all starting to make sense to her. That's why there have been so many false alarms. They were numbing us to them so that when they attacked, we would be unconcerned, falsely believing our own alarms were just another enemy false alarm. I guess you're right. He flexed his fist in frustration. He looked down then and noticed Kara scowling up at him. Kara, are you all right? I was so... I mean, we thought you might be badly hurt. No, she said, casting a cool glare at Verna and Kalin, each of whom used a hand to hold her shoulders down. She casually crossed her ankles. I just thought you could handle it, so I decided to take a nap. General Myford gave her a quick smile and then turned a serious face to Kalin. It gets worse. This cavalry attack was a diversion. They hoped it might get you, I'm sure, but it was meant to make us believe it was just a raid. Kalin felt her flesh go cold with dread. They're coming, aren't they? He nodded. The entire force. They're still a distance out, but you're right, they're coming. This was just to throw us into confusion and keep us distracted. Kalin stared, dumbfounded. The order had never attacked at sunset before. The prospect of the onslaught of hundreds of thousands upon hundreds of thousands of Imperial Order troops storming in from the darkness was blood-curdling. They've changed their tactics, Kalin whispered to herself. He's a quick study. I thought I'd tricked him, but I was the one who was taken in. What are you mumbling about, Kara asked, her fingers locked together over her stomach. Jagang. He counted on me not being fooled by those troops going around in a circle. He wanted me to think I had outsmarted him. He played me for a fool. Kara made a face. What? 
Kaylin felt sick at the implications. She pressed a hand to her forehead as the awful truth inundated her. Jagang wanted me to think I had his scheme figured out so we would pretend to play along and send out our troops. He probably figured they wouldn't be sent after his decoy but would be used instead against his real plan of attack. He didn't care about that, though. All along he was planning on changing his tactics. He was waiting only until those troops left so that he could attack before they were in place and while our numbers were reduced. You mean, Kara asked, that whole time you were talking to him, pretending to believe he was moving troops north, he knew you were pretending? I'm afraid so. He outsmarted me. Maybe, maybe not, General Myford said. He hasn't succeeded yet. We don't have to let him have it his way. We can move our forces before he can pounce. Can't we call back the men we sent out? Verna asked. Their numbers would help. They're hours away, Captain Myford said, traveling through backcountry on the way to their assigned locations. They would never get back here in time to help us tonight. Rather than dwell on how gullible she had been, Kalin put her mind to the immediate problem. We need to move fast. The general nodded his agreement. We could fall back on our other plans, about breaking up and scattering into the mountains. He ran his fingers back through his blonde hair. The gesture of frustration unexpectedly reminded Kalin of Richard. But if we do that, we would have to abandon most of our supplies. In winter, without supplies, a number of our men wouldn't last long. Either way, killed in battle or dying of hunger and cold, you're just as dead. Broken up like that, we would be easy pickings, Kalin agreed. That's a last resort. It may work later, but not now. For now, we need to keep the army together if we're to survive the winter. And if we're to keep the order distracted from its designs at conquest, we dare not allow them to go uncontested into a city. It would not only be a bloodbath, but if they picked the right city, we would face a near impossible task of dislodging them. The general shook his head. It could end up being the end of our hopes of driving them back to the old world. Kalin gestured over her shoulder. What about that valley we talked about back there? The high pass is narrow. It can be defended on this side by two men and a dog, if need be. That's what I was thinking, he said. It keeps the army together and keeps the order having to contend with us rather than being able to turn their attention on any cities. If they try to move around us up into the Midlands, there are easy northern routes out of the valley from which we can strike. We have more men on the way and we can send for others. We need to stay together and maintain our engagement with the Order's army until those forces arrive. Then what are we waiting for? Verna asked. Let's get moving. He gave her a worried look. The problem right now is that if we're to make it into that valley before the Order can pounce on us, we're going to need more time to do it. The pass is too narrow for wagons. The horses can make it, but not the wagons. They'll have to be dismantled. Most of our equipment is designed to be knocked down so the parts can be portaged, if need be. We'll have to leave a few that aren't. It won't take long to get started. But we're going to need time to funnel all the men and supplies over that narrow pass, especially in the dark. Torches will work well enough with a steady line of men, Addie said. They must only follow the one in front. And even if the light be bad, they can do it. Kalin remembered the handprint made of glowing dust. The gifted could lay down a glowing track to guide the men. That would help, the general said. We're still left with our basic problem, though. While our men are trying to break down and move all our equipment and supplies and waiting their turn to go over the pass, the order will arrive. We'll find ourselves in a pitched battle trying to defend ourselves while withdrawing at the same time. A withdrawal requires the ability to move faster than the enemy or at least keep him at bay while pulling back. The pass doesn't provide that. We've kept ahead of them before, Verna said. This isn't the first attack. You're right, he pointed to his left. We could try to withdraw up this valley instead, but in the dark and with the order attacking, I think that would be a mistake. Darkness is the problem this time. They're going to keep coming. In daylight, we could establish defenses and hold them off, not at night. We already have defenses set up here, Kara said. We could stand where we are and fight them head on. General Myford chewed his lower lip. That was my first thought, Kara, and still an option. But I don't like our chances in a head-on direct confrontation like this, not at night, when they can sneak great numbers of men in close. We couldn't use our archers to advantage in the dark. 
We can't see their numbers or movements accurately, so we wouldn't be able to position our men properly. It's a problem of numbers. Theirs are almost unlimited. Ours aren't. We don't have enough gifted to cover every possibility, and in war it's always what you don't cover that gets hit. The enemy could pour through a gap, get in behind us in the dark, without us even realizing it, and then we're finished. Everyone was silent as the implications truly sank in. I agree, Kalin said. The pass is the only chance we have to keep from losing a major battle tonight, along with a huge number of our men. The risk without real benefit of standing and fighting is a poor choice. The general appraised her eyes. That still leaves us with the problem of how we're going to get over that pass before they annihilate us. Kalin turned to Verna. We need you to slow the enemy down to give us the time we need to get our army over that pass. What do you wish me to do? Use your special glass. The general screwed up his face. Her what? A weapon of magic, Kara said, to blind the enemy troops. Verna looked thunderstruck. But I'm not ready. We only made up a small batch. I'm not ready. Kalin turned back to the general. What did the scout say about how much time we have until the order is upon us? The order could be here within an hour at the soonest, two at the latest. If we don't slow them down, we'll never make it out of this valley with our men and supplies. If we can't find a way to delay them, we can only run through the hills or stand in fight. Neither is a choice I would make except in desperation. If we just run for the hills, Addy said, we be as good as dead. Together we be alive and at least be a threat to the enemy. If we scatter... The Order will take the opportunity to attack and capture cities. If our only choice is to scatter or stand our ground and fight, then we can only choose to stand and fight. Better to try than to die one at a time out in the mountains. Kalin rubbed her fingers across her brow as she tried to think. Jagang had changed his tactics and decided to engage them in a night battle. He had never done that before because it would be so costly for him, but with his numbers he apparently wasn't concerned about that. Jagang held life in little regard. If we have to fight him in a full battle, here, now, Kalin said in resignation, we will probably lose the war by dawn. I agree, the general finally said. As far as I see it, we have no choice. We have to act quickly and get as many of our men over the pass as we can. We'll lose all those who don't get over before the order arrives, but we'll manage to preserve some. The four of them were silent a moment, each considering the horror of that reality, of who would remain behind to die. Furious activity continued around them. Men were rushing around, putting out fires, collecting panicked horses, tending to wounded, and battling the few remaining invaders they had trapped. The Order's soldiers were greatly outnumbered. Not for long, though. Kalin's mind raced. She couldn't help being furious with herself at being gulled. Richard's words echoed through her mind. Think of the solution, not the problem. The solution was the only thing that mattered now. Kalin looked again to Verna. We have an hour before they're upon us. You have to try, Verna. Do you think you have any chance of making your special glass and then deploying it before the enemy is upon us? I will do my best. You have my word on that. I wish I could promise more. Verna scrambled to her feet. I'll need the sisters who are tending the wounded, of course. What about the ones working at the front lines? the ones countering enemy magic. Can I have any of them? Take them all, Kalin said. If this doesn't work, nothing else is going to matter. I'll take them all then, every one, Verna said. It's the only chance we have. You'll get started, Addie told Verna. Go down near the front lines on this side of the valley where you will be upwind from the attack. I will begin collecting the sisters and get them down there to help you. We need glass, Verna said to the general. Any kind, at least a few barrels full. I'll have my men down there with the first barrel right away. Can we at least help to break it up for you? No. It won't matter if what you throw in the barrels breaks. But beyond that, it must be done by the gifted. Just bring whatever glass you can collect. That will be all you can do. The general promised her he would see to it. Holding her hem up out of her way, Verna ran off to the task. Addie was close on her heels. I'll get the men moving now, the general told Kalin as he scrambled to his feet. The scouts can mark the trail, then we can start moving the heavier supplies first. If it worked, they would slip out of Jagang's grasp. Kalin knew that if Verna failed, they could all very well lose their lives and the war by morning.
General Myford paused with one last hesitant look, one last chance for her to change her mind. Do it, she said to the general. Kara, we have work. Chapter 38 Kaylin pulled her horse up short. She felt the heat of blood rushing to her face. What are you doing? Kara asked as Kaylin threw her leg over the horse's neck and leaped to the ground. The moon lit a layer of lacy clouds scudding past, giving a faint serene illumination to the surrounding countryside. The thin layer of snow gathered the muted light of the moon to make it more luminous than it otherwise would be. Kaylin pointed in the direction of the small figure she could just make out in the dim light. The skinny girl, surely not much past ten years, was standing at a barrel, ramming a metal rod down inside to smash the glass in the bottom. Kaylin handed the reins to Kara as soon as she had dismounted. Kaylin stalked over to the sisters, working on the snowy ground. Running off in a haphazard line to keep the wind at their backs were over a hundred of the women, all focused intently on the work before them. Many had their cloaks tented around themselves and their work. Not far down that line, Kaylin bent, put a hand under the prelate's arm, and lifted her to her feet. Mindful of the serious nature of the work going on, Kaylin at least kept her voice quiet, since she wasn't able to make it congenial. Verna, what is Holly doing down here? Verna glanced over the heads of a dozen intervening sisters kneeling before a long board, breeze at their backs, carefully grinding glass chips with pestles in mortars. There being not nearly enough pestles and mortars, many of the women to the other side were using dished rocks and round stones to carefully crunch the glass chips. The concentration showed on each woman's face. The accident that had blinded a sister had happened when the wind had changed, and a gust had blown her work back up in her face. The same thing could happen again at any time, although, as darkness had settled in, the wind had at least died down to a steady breeze. Holly was bundled in an oversized cloak, she had a determined grimace as she lifted the rod and then let it drop down in the barrel set away from the sister's dangerous work. Kaylin saw that the rod had a faint greenish glow to it. She's helping, Mother Confessor. She's a child! Verna pointed off into the darkness to what Kaylin hadn't seen. So are Helen and Valerie. Kaylin pinched the bridge of her nose between her first finger and thumb and took a purging breath. What madness would possess you to have children down here near the front helping to, to blind people? Verna glanced at the women working nearby. She took Kalen's arm by the elbow and led her out of earshot of the others. Alone, where they were less likely to be heard, she folded her hands before herself as she assumed the stern visage that came so naturally to her. Kalen, Holly may be a child, but she is a gifted child, and she is far from stupid besides. That goes for Helen and Valerie as well. Holly has seen more in her young life than any child should see. She knows what's going on tonight with that attack, and with the attack that's coming. She was terrified. All the children were. So you bring her to the front? To the greatest danger? What would you have me do? Send her back somewhere to be watched over by soldiers? Do you wish me to force her to be alone at a time like this so she could only tremble in terror? But this is... She's gifted. Despite how horrific it seems, this is better for her, as it is for the others. She's with the sisters, who understand her and her ability as other people can't. Don't you recall the comfort you derived from being with older confessors who knew the way you felt about things? Kalin did, but said nothing. The sisters are the only family she and the other novices have now. Holly is not alone and afraid. She may still be afraid, but she's doing something to help us, so that her fear is channeled into something that will assist in overcoming the cause of her fear. Kalen's brow was still set in a glare. Verna, she's a child. And you had to kill a child today. I understand. But don't let that terrible event make it harder on Holly. Yes, this is an awful thing she is helping to do, but this is the reality of the way things are. She could die tonight, along with the rest of us. Can you even imagine what those brutes would do to her first? At least that much is beyond the imagination of her young mind. What she can comprehend, though, is fear enough. If she wanted to hide somewhere, I would have let her. But she has a right, if she so chooses, to contribute to saving herself. She is gifted and can use her power to do the simple part of what needs doing. She begged me to give her the chance to help. In anguish, Kaylin gathered her fur mantle at her throat as she glanced back over her shoulder at the little girl, using both her spindly arms to lift the heavy steel rod and drop it again to break the glass in the bottom of the barrel. 
Holly's features were drawn tight as she concentrated on using her gift while at the same time lifting the weight of the rod. Dear spirits, Kaelin whispered to herself, this is madness. Kara impatiently shifted her weight to her other foot. It wasn't indifference to the situation, but a matter of priorities. Madness or not, there was little time left, and as Verna said, they could all die before the night was finished. As cruel as it sounded, there were more important matters than the life of one child, or for that matter, three. How is the work going? Are you going to be ready? Verna's bold expression finally faltered. I don't know. She lifted a hand hesitantly, motioning out over the dark valley before them. The wind is right, but the valley approach to our forces is quite broad. It's not that we won't have some, it's that we need to have enough so that when the enemy gets close we can release the glass dust to float across the span of the entire field of battle. But you have some. Surely what you have will do damage to the enemy. If there isn't enough, then they may skirt it or it may not be concentrated enough to do the damage necessary to bring their forces to a halt. Their attack will not be turned back by a small number of casualties. Verna squeezed one fist in her other hand. If the Creator will just slow the Imperial Order enough to grant us another hour, at the least, then I believe we may have enough. Kaelin wiped a hand across her face. That was asking a lot. But with the darkness... She thought that it just might be possible that the Order would have to go slow enough to give Verna and her sisters the time they needed. And you're sure we can't help? There is nothing any but the gifted can do to assist you? Verna's mask of authority again emerged in the moonlight. Well, yes, there is one thing. What is it, then? You could leave me alone so I can work. Kalin sighed. Just promise me one thing. Verna raised an eyebrow as if willing to listen prudently. When the attack comes and you have to use this special glass, get the children out of here first. Get them to the rear where they can be taken over the pass to safety. Verna smiled with relief. We are of like minds in that, Mother Confessor. As Verna hurried back to her work, Kaelin and Kara returned along the line of sisters, past the end to where Holly was preparing glass to supply those gifted women. Kaelin couldn't help but to stop for a word. Holly, how are you getting along? When the girl rested the rod against the side of the barrel, Kara, absent any fondness for magic, aimed a suspicious frown at the faintly glowing metal. As Holly took her small hands from the metal, the greenish glow faded, as if a magical wick had been turned down. I'm fine, Mother Confessor, except I'm cold. I'm getting terribly tired of being cold. Kaelin smiled warmly as she ran a gentle hand down the back of Holly's fine hair. As are we all. Kaelin crouched down beside the girl. When we get over into another valley, you can get warm by a nice fire. That would be splendid. She cast a furtive glance at her steel rod. I have to get back to work, Mother Confessor. Kaelin couldn't resist pulling the girl close and kissing her frigid cheek. Hesitant at first, the thin little arms surrendered to desperately encircle Kaelin's neck. I'm so scared, Holly whispered. Me too, Kaelin whispered back as she squeezed the girl tight. Me too. Holly straightened. Really? You get scared, too? That those awful men will murder us? Kaelin nodded. I get frightened, but I know we have a lot of good people who will keep us safe. Like you, they work as hard as they can, so that we can all someday be safe and not have to be scared anymore. The girl stuck her hands under her cloak to warm them. Her gaze sank to the ground at her feet. I miss Anne, too. She looked up again. Is Anne safe? Kaelin groped for words of comfort. I saw Anne not long ago, and she was fine. I don't think you need worry for her. She saved me. I love her and miss her so. Will she be with us soon? Kaelin cupped the girl's cheek. I don't know, Holly. She had important business she was taking care of. I'm sure, though, that we'll see her again. Pleased with that news, and seemingly relieved to know that she was not alone in her fears, Holly turned back to her work with renewed determination. As Kaelin and Kara collected their horses, they heard a horse approaching at a gallop. Before she recognized the rider, Kaelin saw and recognized the black splotch on its rump. When he saw her waving, Zed trotted Spider around to her. He slid down off the animal's bare back. They're coming, the wizard announced without preamble. Verna rushed up, having seen Zed ride in. It's too soon, 
They weren't supposed to be here this soon. He gaped at her in astonishment. Bags, woman, shall I tell them that it would be rather inconvenient for them to attack right now and to please come back to kill us later? You know what I mean, she snapped. We don't have enough yet. How long till they get here? Kalen asked. Ten minutes. That thin sliver of time was the only bulwark between them and catastrophe. Kalen felt as if her heart rose into her throat, recalling suddenly the forsaken feeling of being mobbed and beaten to death. Verna sputtered in wordless frustration, anger, and dread. Do you have any ready? Zed asked, as calmly as if he were inquiring about dinner. Yes, of course, she said. But if they will be here that soon, we've not enough. Dear Creator, we don't have nearly what we'll need in order to drift it out all across the front. Too little is as good as none. We've no choice now, Zed gazed off into the darkness, perhaps seeing what only a wizard could see. His jaw was set in bitter disappointment. He spoke in a disembodied voice, a man going through the motions when he knew he had come to the end of his options, perhaps even his faith. Start releasing what you have. We'll just have to hope for the best. I have messengers with me. I'll send word of the situation back to General Myford. He will need to know. To see Zed seemly relinquish hope cast their fate in the most frightening light possible. Zed was always the one who kept them focused and gave them courage, conviction, and confidence. He gathered up Spider's reins in one hand and gripped her mane with the other. Wait, Kalin said. He paused and looked back at her. His eyes were a window into an inner weariness. She couldn't imagine all the struggles he had faced in his life, or even in the last few weeks. Kalin ran through seemingly a thousand thoughts as she searched frantically for some way of turning away their grim fate. Kalin couldn't let Zed down. He had so often carried them. Now he needed another shoulder to help endure the weight. She presented him a look of fierce determination before she turned to the prelate. Verna, what if we didn't release it in the way we planned? What if we didn't simply let it drift out, hoping for the breeze to carry it where we need it? Verna opened her hands in a bewildered gesture. What do you mean? Won't it take more of the glass the amount you say you need, simply so that there is enough to let it drift all the way across the valley and yet have enough to hang in the air, too? Well, yes, of course, but what if, Kalin asked, we released it in a line along the face at the front, right where it was needed? Then it would take less, wouldn't it? Well, I suppose, Verna threw up her hands, but I told you we can't use magic to help us or they will detect our conjuring and then they will shield for the glass as fast as we release it. It will be useless. Better to release what we have and hope for the best. Kalin glanced out over the empty plain faintly lit by the placid clouds veiling the moon. There was nothing to be seen out in the valley. Soon there would be. Soon the virgin snow would be trampled by the boots of over a million men. Only the sound of glass being crushed on stone and the thump of the steel rods in the barrels disturbed the quiet darkness. Soon blood-curdling battle cries would inundate the hush of the night. Kalin felt the suffocating dread she had felt when she first realized that all those men had caught her alone. She felt the anger, too. Collect what you've made so far, she said. Let me have it. They all stared at her. Zed's brow drew together in a wrinkled knot. Just what are you thinking? Kalin pulled her hair back from her face as she rapidly pieced together her plan, so that it was whole in her own mind first. The enemy is attacking into the wind. Not directly, but close enough for our purpose. I'm thinking that if I ride along the front of our line, right in front of the advancing enemy troops, and I release the glass dust, letting it dribble out as I go, then it will flow out in the wind behind me right into the faces of the enemy. Delivering it right where it's needed, it won't take as much as it would were we to let it drift out from here, hoping to spread it all across the valley. She looked from one startled face to another. Do you see what I'm saying? Closer to the enemy, wouldn't it take much less to do the job? Dear Creator, Verna protested, do you have any idea how dangerous that would be? Yes, Kalin answered in grim resolve, a lot less dangerous than facing a direct attack by their entire force. Now, would that work? Wouldn't it take considerably less if I were to ride along the front, trickling it out as I went, than letting it drift out to them from here? 
Well, we're running out of time. You're right. It wouldn't take nearly as much. Verna touched her lip as she stared off into the darkness while considering, it's better than the way we were going to do it, that much is sure. Kalen started pushing her. Get it together, now, hurry. Verna abandoned her protests and ran off to collect what they had. Kara was about to unleash a tirade of objections when Zed lifted a hand as if to ask she let him do the objecting instead. Kalen, it sounds like you might have something here, but someone else can do this. It's foolish to risk. I'll be needing a diversion, she said, cutting him off. Something to distract their attention. I'll be riding by in the dark, so they probably won't notice me. But it would be best if there were something to occupy their attention, just in case. Something to make them look elsewhere for the last time. As I was saying, someone else can... No, she said in quiet finality. I'll not ask someone else to do this. It was my idea. I'm doing it. I won't allow someone to take my place. Kalen deemed herself responsible for the peril they were in. It was she who had blundered and fallen for Jagang's trick. It was she who had come up with the plan and ordered the troops out. It was she who made Jagang's night attack possible. Kalen knew all too well the terror everyone felt waiting for the attack. She felt it herself. She thought of Holly, fearful of being murdered by the marauding beasts coming out of the night for her. The fear was all too real. It would be Kalen who had lost the war for them this very night if they didn't get their army back across the pass to safety. I'm doing this myself, she repeated. That's the way it's going to be. Standing here arguing about it can only cost us our chance. Now, I need a diversion, and I need one quickly. Zed let out an angry breath. The fire was back in his eyes. He flicked out his hand, pointing. Warren is back there waiting for me. The two of us will move to separate locations and give you your diversion. What will you do? At last, Zed surrendered to a grim, cunning grin. Nothing fancy this time. No clever, devious tricks like they no doubt expect. This time we'll give them a good, old-fashioned firefight. Kalen gave a sharp tug to the strap at her ribs, holding her leather armor on her shoulders, chest, and back, cinching it down tight. She nodded once to seal the pact. Wizard's fire it is, then. Keep an eye to your right, to our side, as you ride. I don't want you to get in the way of what I mean for the enemy. You must also watch for what their gifted send back at me. As she secured her cloak, she nodded assent to Zed's brief instructions. She checked the straps on her leg armor, making sure they were tight, remembering how the enemy's strong fingers had clawed at her legs, trying to unhorse her. Verna came rushing back, a big bucket at the end of each arm pulled down straight by the weight. Some of the sisters were scurrying along beside her. All right, the winded prelate said. Let's go. Kalen reached for the buckets. I'll take Verna yanked them back. How do you propose to ride and sprinkle this out? It's too much. Besides, you don't know its properties. Verna, I'm not letting you. Stop acting like an obstinate child. Let's go. Kara snatched one of the buckets. Verna is right, Mother Confessor. You can't hold on to your horse, release the glass dust, and carry both buckets all at the same time. You two take that one, I'll take this one. The willowy Sister Philippa rushed to Kara's side and lifted the bucket. Mistress Kara is right, Prelate. You and the Mother Confessor can't do both buckets. You two take one, Mistress Kara and I will take the other. There was no time to argue with the three determined women. Kaylin knew that no one would be able to talk her out of what she had to do, and they probably felt the same. Besides, they had a valid point. All right, Kaylin said as she pulled on her gloves. She lashed tight the fur mantle she wore over the top of the wool cloak. She didn't want anything flapping in the wind. The hilt of her sword was covered, but she figured she wouldn't be needing it. The hilt of Richard's sword stuck up behind her shoulder, her ever-present reminder of him, as if she needed one. She quickly tied her hair back with a leather thong. Verna tossed a handful of the fluffy snow, checking the wind. It had held its direction and was light, but steady. At least that much was in their favor. You two go first, Kalen said to Kara. Verna and I will wait maybe five minutes to let what you release drift in toward the enemy so that we won't ride through it. Then we'll follow you across the valley. That way we'll be sure to overlap what you release with ours so as not to have any gaps. We need to make sure there's no safe place for the order to get through. 
we need the ruin and panic to be as uniform and widespread as possible. Sister Philippa, noting what Kalin had done, fastened her cloak securely at her neck and waist. That makes sense. It would be more effective doubled like that, Verna agreed. I guess there's no time to argue this foolishness, Zed grumbled as he seized Spider's mane and pulled himself up, laying across the horse's back on his belly. He swung a leg over Spider's rump and sat up. Let me have a minute or two to get ahead of you and let Warren know. Then we'll start showing the Imperial Order some real wizard work. He pulled his horse around and smiled. It was heartening to see it again. After all this work, someone had better have some dinner waiting for me on the other side of that pass back there. If I have to cook it for you myself, Kalin promised. The wizard gave them a jaunty wave and galloped off into the darkness. Chapter 39 Kaelin stuffed a boot in the stirrup, grabbed the saddle horn, and sprang up into her seat. The cold leather creaked as she leaned over and held a hand down in order to help Verna up. Once the prelate squirmed in close behind Kaelin, two sisters carefully handed the heavy wooden bucket up to her. Kara and Sister Philippa were on their horse and ready, the sister balancing her bucket on her thigh. Get the children back across the pass, Verna ordered. Sister Dulcinea bobbed her head of gray hair. I will see to it, prelate. Whatever more of the glass you can have ready by the time the mother confessor and I ride out, you should release into the wind for good measure, then get yourselves spread out behind our lines to help if the order breaks through. If we fail, the sisters must do their best to hold the enemy off while as many as possible make it across the pass to safety. Sister Dulcinea again promised to carry out the prelate's orders. They all waited a few minutes in silence while giving Zed the head start he needed to reach Warren with instructions. There seemed nothing else to say. Kalin concentrated on what she had to do rather than worrying whether or not it would work. In the back of her mind, though, she was aware of how notoriously imperfect were such last-minute battle plans. Judging that they had waited as long as they dared, Kalin motioned with her arm, signaling Kara to start out. The two of them shared a last look. Kara offered a brief smile, good luck, then raced away. Sister Philippa holding tight to the moored sit's waist with one hand and balancing the bucket on her thigh with the help of her other hand. As the sound of hoofbeats from Kara's horse faded into the night, Kalin for the first time realized that, in the distance, she could hear the collective yells of hundreds of thousands of Imperial Order troops. The countless voices fused into one continuous roar as their attack drew ever closer. It almost sounded like the moan of an ill wind through a canyon's rocky fangs. Her horse snorted and pawed the frozen ground. The awful drone made Kalin's pulse race even faster. She wanted to race away before the men got too close, but she had to wait to give the glass dust Kara and Sister Philippa released time to drift out of the way. I wish we could use magic to protect ourselves, Verna said in a quiet voice almost as if in answer to what Kalin was thinking. We can't, of course, or they would detect it. Kalin nodded, hardly hearing the woman. Vernon was just saying anything that came to mind so as not to have to sit and listen to the enemy coming for them. The bitter cold long forgotten, her heart beat throbbing in her ears, Kalin sat still as death, staring out into the empty night, trying to envision every aspect of the task at hand, trying to go through it all in her mind first, so she wouldn't be surprised by anything that might happen and then have to decide what to do. Better to anticipate, if you could, than to react. As she quietly sat her horse, she let her anger build, too. Anger made a better warrior than fear. Kalin fed that anger with images of all the terrible things she had seen the Imperial Order do to the people of the Midlands. She let the memories of all the bodies she had seen pass through her mind as if they came before the Mother Confessor to plead with stilled tongues for vengeance. She remembered the women she had seen wailing over murdered children, husbands, sisters, brothers, mothers, and fathers. She remembered strong men in helpless anguish over the senseless slaughter of their friends and loved ones. In her mind's eye, she saw those men, women, and children suffering at the hands of a people to whom they had done no harm. The Imperial Order was but a gang of killers without empathy. They merited no pity. They would get none. She thought about Richard in the hands of that enemy. She savored her promise to kill every one of them, if she had to, until she got Richard back. It's time, Kalin said through gritted teeth. 
Without looking back over her shoulder, she asked, Are you ready? Ready. Don't slow for anything, or we will end up its victims, too. Our only chance is to keep fresh air streaming over us, to carry the glass dust all away from our bodies. When we get to the opposite side, after I've dumped it all, then we'll be safe. By that time, the order should be in a state of mass confusion, if not complete panic. Kalin nodded. Hold tight. Here we go. The horse, already in an excited state, probably from the approaching cries, sprang away too fast, nearly dumping Verna off the back. Her arm jerked tight around Kalin's middle. At the same time, Kalin reached back and caught Verna's sleeve, holding her on. As they raced away and Verna fought to regain her balance, the bucket lurched, but Verna was able to steady it. Fortunately, it didn't spill. Even as the muscular gelding was obeying her command and racing away, his ears were turned to the approaching clamor. He was skittish carrying the unfamiliar burden of two riders. He was well-trained and had seen battle often enough, so he probably was also edgy because he knew what the war cries signified. Kalin knew he was strong and quick. For what she had to do, speed was life. Kalin's heart galloped as fast as the horse as they thundered through the blackness of the valley. The enemy was much closer now than they had been when Kara passed through not long before. The horse's hoofbeats partly drowned out the battle cries of countless enemy soldiers to their left. Terrifying bits of memories of fists and boots flashed unbidden into her mind as she heard men coming toward her in the dark, screaming for blood. She felt her vulnerability as never before. Kalin turned those memories from fear to anger at the outrage of these brutes coming into her midlands and murdering her people. She wanted every one of them to suffer, and every one of them dead. There was no telling precisely how far the enemy had already advanced, or, with the moonlight behind her, even her own exact direction. Kalin worried that she might have sliced it too close to the bone, and that they could unexpectedly encounter a wall of bloodthirsty men. She wanted to be close, though, to deliver the blinding dust right in their faces, to be sure it had the best chance to work, to turn back the attack. She resisted the urge to guide her horse to the right, away from the enemy. The night suddenly ignited with harsh yellow light. The clouds went from gray to bright yellow-orange. White snow blazed with garish color. An awful droning sound vibrated deep under her ribs. A hundred feet in front of her and maybe ten feet above the ground, tumbling liquid yellow and blue light roared headlong across her root, dripping honeyed fire, trailing billowing black smoke. The seething sphere of wizard's fire vividly illuminated the ground beneath it as it shot past. Even though not directed at her, the sound alone was enough to make Kalin ache to cringe away in dread. She knew enough about wizard's fire, how it clung tenaciously to the skin, to be more than wary of it. Once that living fire touched you, it couldn't be dislodged. Even a single droplet of wizard's fire would often eat through flesh down to bone. There was no one either brave or foolish enough not to fear it. Few people touched by such conjured flame lived to recount the horror of the experience. For those who did, revenge became a lifelong obsession. Then, in the light of that bright flame streaking across the valley floor, Kalin caught sight of the horde, all with swords, maces, flails, axes, pikes, and lances raised in the air as they yelled their battle cries. The men, grim, daunting, fierce, were all in the grip of a wild lust for the fight as they ran headlong out of the night. In the moonlight, Kalin could see for the first time since she had joined up with the army the full extent of the enemy forces. The reports had told the story, but could not fully convey the reality of the sight. The numbers were so far removed from her experience as to defy comprehension. Eyes wide, jaw hanging open, she gasped in awe. Kalin realized with alarm that the enemy was much closer than she had expected. Throughout the ocean of men, torches meant to be used to set fires sparkled like moonlight off the vast sea flooding into the valley. At the horizon, that moonlight gleaming off uncountable weapons blurred into a flat line, over which she almost expected to see ships sailing. The undulating leading edge, bristling shields and spears, threatened to close off her path. Kalin used her right heel, back against her horse's flank, to guide him a little to the right so as to clear the wave of soldiers. After she had corrected his course, she thumped her heels against the animal's ribs, urging him on. 
And then she realized, as arrows zipped past and spears plunged to the ground just in front of her, that in the light of the wizard's fire, the enemy could see her too. The ball of wizard's fire that had revealed her to the enemy wailed off into the darkness, leaving her in shadow and lighting tens of thousands of men at a time as it passed over their heads. Far in the distance, behind the advancing horde, the fire finally crashed to the ground, igniting a conflagration in the midst of the cavalry. Horsemen were often held back, ready to charge forth when their men encountered the Daharan lines. The distant mortal screams of man and beast rose into the night. An arrow skipped off her leather leg armor. More zipped past. One stuck in the saddle, just below her stomach, as she leaned forward over the galloping horse's withers. Apparently, in the moonlight, they could still spot her and Verna racing past. Why aren't they blind? Kalin called over her shoulder. She could see a cloud billowing out behind them. It looked little different than the dust the horse raised as it galloped, except Kalin saw that it was coming from the bucket Verna rested against her thigh as she tipped it toward the enemy lines, a little more, a little less, controlling the amount that poured out, keeping it in a steady stream. Kara had already been passed, yet the men showed no ill effect. It takes a little while to work, Vernus said in Kalin's ear. They have to blink a bit. Fire raced past right behind them. Fiery droplets splashed down onto the snow, splattering when they hit, hissing like rain on hot stones round a fire. The horse snorted as he raced onward in near panic. As she leaned over his withers, Kalin stroked his neck reassuringly, reminding him that he wasn't alone. Kalin let her gaze sweep along the advancing enemy line as she raced before them. She saw that the men were doing little blinking. Their eyes were wide in their fervor for the coming battle. The wizard's fire that had so spooked the horse from behind exploded through the enemy ranks. Liquid flames spilled across the mass of soldiers, touching off a shrill roar of ghastly cries. When burning men crashed into soldiers around them, Fire splashed onto them, too, spreading the horror. Around the fire, the advancing line buckled. Yet other men, running headlong through the night, trampled those on the ground only to lose their own footing and topple. Another sphere of wizard's fire droned past to crash down, spilling its flame like water from a burst dam. So massive was the eruption that the surge swept men away, carrying them off in a flaming current. A huge knot of fire erupted out of the enemy line not far in front of Kalin, heading toward the Daharan lines. Immediately, a small sphere of blue flame roared in from her right, meeting the ponderous globe of yellow flame in midair. The collision sent a shower of fire raining down around her as she rode past. Kalin gasped and yanked the reins left as a fat gob of the plummeting fire crashed to the ground right before them, splattering flame everywhere. They missed the fire by inches, but she now found herself closing with the enemy soldiers at an alarming rate. Kalin could read some of the obscene oaths on their lips. She spurred the terrified horse to the right. He turned a little, but not enough to divert them from angling in toward the enemy lines. Glowing bits of fire rained down on the men as well as the open ground. The horse was running in a panic, too frightened to take direction from Kalin. The stench of burning leather was adding fuel to the horse's fear. She glanced down and saw a bit of fire burning on the leather armor protecting her thigh. The small but fierce flame fluttered wildly in the wind. She dared not try to brush the glowing spot off lest it then stick to her hand. She feared to imagine what it would feel like when it finally burned through the leather. She would have to endure the pain when it did. She had no choice. Verna didn't realize what was happening. She was twisted sideways, still releasing the glass dust. Kalin could see the plume of it carried away behind them, the long trail curved, carried by the breeze into the enemy, past the front lines, back through the ranks of soldiers, off into the blackness. Farther back in the order's ranks, the torches lit the cloud as it mingled with the dust churned up from the frozen ground. An arrow nicked the horse's shoulder and skipped up into the air. A surge of men seeing her coming ran with wild abandon in an effort to block her way. Kalin yanked on the reins, trying to haul the powerful horse's head to the right. In the grip of terror, the horse galloped on. She felt helpless as she tried to get it to turn. It was doing no good. They were headed right toward a wall of men.
We're getting too close, Verna yelled in her ear. Kalen was too busy to answer. Her arm was shaking with the effort of pulling on the right rein, trying to turn the horse's head over and to the right, but the horse had the bit in his teeth and was stronger than she by far. Sweat trickled down her neck. She stretched her right leg back and dug her heel into the horse's right flank to turn him. The men before them brought their pikes and swords around to bear. Fighting was one thing, but not having any control and just watching her fate come at her was different. Kalen, what are you doing? With the pressure of her heel in front of his right rear leg, she was finally forcing the horse to turn. It wasn't enough. She wasn't going to be able to divert the runaway horse. The enemy looked like a steel porcupine rushing at them. Three strides away, the horse lowered his head. Good boy, she cried. Maybe they had a chance to clear the pikes. Kalen took her weight off the saddle and angled forward, flattening her back. She bent her arms, giving the reins slack with her hands to either side of the horse's neck. She kept pressure on him with her lower legs, but let him have the freedom he needed. She didn't know if it would work with the extra weight. If only the pikes were shorter. Kalen screamed for Verna to hold on. Wizard's fire suddenly streamed past in front of him, coming in low. The men who had rushed ahead in a line to block Kalen's way dove to the ground. The entire line before them collapsed. The fire wailed past just over top of them, finally touching down off to Kalen's left. The cries of a thousand men filled her ears. The horse stretched his lowered head, getting his hocks underneath his body. At the last instant, his neck shortened, and his head came up as he sprang upward, using his powerful hindquarters to launch himself. His back rounded as they sailed over the leading edge of men. Verna cried out, her arm like a hook around Kalen's middle. They came down beyond the soldiers who had dropped flat. With her weight on the stirrups, Kalen used her legs to absorb the shock. Verna couldn't. With the extra load, the horse nearly stumbled as it landed, but kept his balance and continued running. They were at last clear of the order soldiers. What's the matter with you? Verna yelled. Don't do that or I won't be able to let it out evenly. Sorry, Kalen called over her shoulder. Despite the cold wind in her face, sweat ran from her scalp. The order soldiers seemed to fall away to their rear quarter. Giddy relief washed over her as she realized that they had made it past the bulge in the Imperial Order's front lines. In the distance behind them, a storm of fire lit the night. Zed and Warren were showing them a good old-fashioned firefight, as Zed had put it. It was a terrifying demonstration, if insufficient to stop an enemy as large as the Order. As the Order's gifted raced to the scene and threw up shields, it limited the death and devastation. The two wizards had bought Kalen and Verna the time they had needed. Kalen heard Kara calling, Whoa! as she galloped up close. This time, with Kara's horse heading them off, the lathered mount rapidly came to a halt. The horse was exhausted, as was Kalen. As they dismounted beside Kara and Sister Philippa, Verna tossed the empty bucket to the ground. Kalen was glad it was dark, so that the others couldn't see her legs trembling. She was relieved to see that the spot of fire had expended itself before burning through. The four of them watched as the night went mad with flame, most exploding against shields of magic, yet still doing damage to anyone too close. Zed and Warren sent forth one tumbling sphere of fiery death after another. The cries of men could be heard all along the line. The fire was being returned, reaping death in the Daharan lines, but the sisters were throwing up their own shields. Still, the vast enemy army advanced. At most, the deadly flames only slowed them and disrupted their orderly attack. As the gifted on both sides gained control, they managed to nullify each other's fiery attacks. Kalen knew that the forward Daharan lines had no hope of holding the onrushing flood of the order. They had no hope of even slowing them. In the moonlight, she could see them beginning to abandon their positions. Why isn't it working? Kalen whispered half to herself. She leaned toward Verna. Are you sure it was made properly? Watching the enemy's headlong rush and in the din of battle cries, Verna didn't seem to hear the question. Kalen checked her sword. She realized how futile it would be to try to fight. She felt Richard's sword on her back and considered drawing it, but decided that it would be better to run. She pushed Verna, urging her to their spent horse. Kara did the same with Sister Philippa. Before she stepped into the stirrup, Kalen noticed the order slowing. She saw men stumbling. Some groped with outstretched arms. Others fell. Verna pointed. Look! 
An endless moan of frightened agony began rising up into the night, growing in intensity. Staggering men fell over one another. Some swung their swords at an invisible enemy, hacking instead their blinded fellow soldiers. The progress of the men at the front slowed to a crawl. Soldiers kept coming, colliding with the stalled front line. Cavalry horses panicked, bucking off riders. Spooked horses ran off in every direction, oblivious of the men they trampled. Racing wagons overturned. Confusion swept the enemy's ranks. The advance buckled. The Imperial Order ground to a halt. Zed and Warren rode up and dismounted, both sweating despite the frigid night air. Kalin gave Zed's bony hand a squeeze. You two saved our necks at the end there. Zed gestured to Warren. Him, not me. Warren shrugged. I saw your predicament. They all stared in wonder, watching the army gone blind. You did it, Verna, Kalin said. You and your glass saved us. At last, she and Verna threw their arms around each other, tears of relief coursing down their cheeks. Chapter 40 Kalin was one of the last to cross over the pass. The valley beyond was well protected by towering rock walls around the southern half. It was a long and difficult route around those mountains if the Order had any thoughts of attacking them here. While the troops of the Daharan Empire had no intention of letting themselves get trapped in that valley, for the time being it was a safe place. Big old spruces filled the lap of the surrounding mountains, so they were somewhat protected from the wind as well. Tents carpeted the forest floor. It was good to see all the campfires and smell the wood smoke, a sign that they were safe enough for the men to have fires. The aroma of cooking filled the late night air, too. It had been a lot of work moving the army and their equipment over the pass, and the men were hungry. General Myfert looked as pleased as any general would when the army he feared lost was at last safe, at least for the time being. He guided Kalin and Kara through the darkness dotted by thousands of campfires to tents he had set up for them. Along the way, he filled them in on how everything with the army had gone and ran through a list of what few things they had had to leave behind. It's going to be a cold night, General Myford said when they had reached the tents he had set aside for them between two towering spruce. I had the sack of pebbles heated by a fire for you, Mother Confessor. You too, Mistress Kara. Kalin thanked him before he left to see to his duties. Kara went off to go get something to eat. Kalin told her to go ahead, that she just wanted to sleep. Inside her tent, Kalin found Spirit standing on a little table, the lamp hanging from the ridge pole, lighting her proud pose. She paused to trace a finger down the flowing robes. Kalin, her teeth chattering, could hardly wait to crawl into bed and pull that sack of heated pebbles under the fur mantle with her. She thought about how cold she was, and then instead of climbing into her bed, went back outside and searched through the dark camp until she found a sister. After following the sister's directions, going between tents until she reached the area with the thick young trees, Kalin found the small lean-to shelter set among the boughs for protection from the wind and weather. She squatted down, peering inside at the bundle of blankets she could just make out in the light coming from nearby campfires. Holly, are you in there? A little head poked out. Mother confessor? The girl was shivering. What is it? Do you need me? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Come with me, please. Holly climbed out, swaddled in a blanket. Kalin took her little hand and walked her back to her tent in silence. Holly's eyes grew big and round as Kalin ushered her inside. Before the small table, the girl paused to stand still as a stump while she stared in wonder at spirit. Like it? Kalin asked. Trembling with the cold, Holly reverently ran her frail fingers down Spirit's arm. Where ever did you get something so beautiful? Richard carved it for me. Holly finally pulled her gaze from the statue and looked up at Kalin. I miss Richard. Kalin could see Holly's breath in the motionless air of the tent. He was always nice to me. A lot of people were mean, but Richard was always nice. Kalin felt an unexpected stab of anguish. She hadn't expected the subject to turn to Richard. What was it you needed, Mother Confessor? Kalin turned her thoughts away from her sorrow and smiled. I was proud of the work you did to help save us today. I promised you that you would be warm. Tonight you will be. The girl's teeth were chattering. Really? 
Kaylin laid the sword of truth on the far side of the bed. She stripped off some of her heavier clothing, doused the lamp, and then sat down on the straw-filled pallet. Light from nearby campfires lent a soft glow to the tent's walls. Come, climb into bed with me. It's going to be very cold tonight. I need you to keep me warm. Holly only had to consider for a second. As Kaylin lay down on her side, she pulled Holly's back against her stomach and then drew the sack of heated pebbles up against the girl's front. Holly hugged the sack and moaned with the thrill of warmth. The satisfied moan made Kaylin smile. For a long time she smiled, enjoying the simple pleasure of seeing Holly warm and safe. Having the girl there, holding her close, helped Kaylin to forget all the terrible things she had seen that day. Far up in the mountains, a single wolf sang out in a long, lonely call. The cry echoed through the valley, trailing off, to be renewed again and again with forlorn persistence. With his sword at her back, Kaylin's thoughts turned to Richard. Thinking about him, wondering where he was and if he was safe, she silently wept herself to sleep. The next day, snow moved down from the higher mountains to rampage across the southern regions of the Midlands. The storms raged for two days. The second night of the blizzard, Kaylin shared her tent with Holly, Valerie, and Helen. They sat under blankets, ate camp stew, sang songs, told stories of princes and princesses, and slept together to keep warm. When the snowstorm finally ended in a bleak golden sunrise, most of the taller tents had snow drifted to their eaves on their downwind side. The smaller ones were completely covered over. The men dug themselves out, looking like so many woodchucks come up out of their burrows for a peek. Over the next several weeks, the storms continued to roll past, dumping more snow. In such weather, fighting or even moving an army very far was difficult. Scouts reported that the Imperial Order had withdrawn a week's march back to the south. It would be a burden to care for blinded men. Within a day's walk all around the place where the special glass had been released, the Daharan scouts reported that they had seen well over 60,000 frozen corpses now drifted over with the snow, blind men unable to care for themselves in the harsh conditions. The Imperial Order had probably abandoned them to their fate. A few dozen of the blind had managed to make it over the pass, looking for help, begging for mercy. Kalin had ordered them executed. It was hard telling the exact number blinded by Verna's special glass. It could be that there were many who did, in fact, retreat with the Imperial Order, brought along to perform menial tasks. It was likely, though, that the corpses reported by the scouts were the bulk of those blinded. Kalin could imagine that Jagang might not want them in his camp, using food and supplies, reminding his men of their stinging retreat. She knew, though, that for Jagang, retreat was but a momentary setback and not a reappraisal of his objectives. The order had men enough to shrug off the loss of the hundred thousand killed since the fighting had started. For the time being, the weather prevented Jagang from striking back. Kalin didn't intend to sit and wait for him. A month later, when the representative from Herzbourg arrived, she met with him immediately in the small trapper's lodge they had found up in the trees to the west side of the valley. The lodge sat under the protection of towering ancient pines, away from the open areas where the tents were congregated. The lodge had become Kalin's frequent quarters, and often also served as their command center. It greatly relieved General Myfert when Kalin would stay in the lodge rather than a tent. It made him feel as if the army was doing something about providing better accommodations for the mother confessor, the wife of Lord Rawl. Kaylin and Kara did appreciate the nights they slept in the lodge, but Kaylin didn't want anyone to think she wasn't up to the conditions the rest of them had to endure. Sometimes she would instead have the girls sleep in the lodge along with some of the sisters, and sometimes she insisted Verna sleep there with Holly, Valerie, and Helen. It didn't take a great deal of effort to persuade the prelate. Kalin greeted Representative Theriot from the land of Herzbourg, inviting him into the cozy lodge. He was accompanied by a small guard unit who waited outside. Herzbourg was a small country. Their contribution to the war effort was in the area of their only product, wool. Kalin had need of the man. After Representative Theriot knelt before the mother confessor, receiving the traditional greeting, he had at last stood and pushed his heavy hood back on his shoulders. He broke into a broad grin. Mother Confessor, 
So good to see you well, she returned a sincere smile. And you, Representative Theriot, here, come over by the fire and warm yourself. By the stone fireplace, he pulled off his gloves and held his hands before the crackling flames. He glanced to the gleaming hilt of the sword sticking up behind her shoulder. His eye was caught by spirit, standing proudly on the mantel. He stared in wonder, as did everyone who saw the proud figure. We heard about Lord Raal being captured, he finally said. Has there been any word? Kalin shook her head. We know they haven't harmed him, but that's about all. I know my husband. He's resourceful. I expect he will find a way to get back to help us. The man nodded, his brow furrowed as he listened earnestly. Kara, standing beside the table, reminded of her Lord Rawl by Kalin's words, idly rolled her aegeel in her fingers. Kalin could tell by the look in Kara's blue eyes and by the way she casually let the weapon dangle once more by the small gold chain around her wrist that the aegeel, being linked to the living Lord Rawl, still possessed its power. As long as it worked, they knew Richard was alive. That was all they knew. The man opened his heavy traveling cloak. How goes the war? Everyone anxiously awaits word. As near as we can figure, we've managed to kill over a hundred thousand of their troops. The man gasped. Such numbers were staggering to someone from a place as small as his homeland of Herzbourg. Then they must be defeated. As they run back to the old world? Rather than meet his gaze, Kalin stared at the logs checkering in the wavering glow of the flames. I'm afraid that losing that many men is hardly crippling to the Imperial Order. We're taking their numbers down, but they have an army of well over ten times that many. They remain a threat, a week's march to the south of here. Kalin looked up to see him staring at her. She could tell by the look in his eyes that he was having difficulty trying to imagine that many people. His wind-reddened face had paled considerably. Dear spirits, he whispered, we've heard rumors, but to learn they are true. With a despondent look, he shook his head. How is it ever going to be possible to defeat a foe of that size? Seems that I remember, a number of years back, you were in Adendril to see the council, and you had a bit of trouble after a grand dinner. That big man from Kelton, I forget his name, was boasting and speaking ill of your small land. He called you some name. Do you remember that night, what he called you? Representative Theriot's eyes sparkled as he smiled. Puny. Puny, that was it. I guess he felt that because he was twice your size that made him your better. I recall men clearing off a table and the two of you arm wrestling. Ah, well, I was younger back then, and I had a few glasses of wine with dinner besides. You won, he laughed softly. Not by strength. He was cocky. I was clever, perhaps, and quick. That's all. You won. That was the result. Those hundred thousand order troops aren't any less dead because they outnumbered us. The smile left his lips. Point taken. I guess the Imperial Order ought to quit now while they have men left. I recall how those five thousand Galean recruits you led went after that force of fifty thousand and eliminated them. He leaned an arm on the rough-hewn mantle. Anyway, I see your point. When you are facing superior strengths, you must use your wits. I need your help, Kalin told the man. His big brown eyes reflected the firelight as they turned toward her. Anything, Mother Confessor. If it be in my power to do, anything. Kalin bent and shoved another log onto the fire. Sparks swirled around before ascending the chimney. We need wool cloaks, hooded cloaks, for the men. He considered only briefly. Just tell me the numbers and I will see to it. I'm sure it can be arranged. I'll need at least a hundred thousand. Our entire force down here at present. We're expecting more men any time. So if you could add half again that number, it would go a long way to helping destroy the order. As he went through mental calculations, Kalin used the poker to set the new log to the back of the fire. I know I'm not asking for something easy. He scratched his scalp through his thick gray hair. You've no need of hearing how difficult it will be. That won't help you win. So let me just say that you will have them. Representative Terrio's word was a pledge as sound as gold and as valuable.
She stood and faced him. And I want them made from bleached wool. He lifted an eyebrow in curiosity. Bleached wool? We need to be clever, as you can understand. The Imperial Order comes from far to the south. Richard was down there once and told me about how the weather is very different than it is up here in the New World. Their winters are nothing like we have. If I don't miss my bet, the Order is not familiar with winter, nor is it used to surviving, much less fighting in such weather. Winter conditions may be difficult, but this puts it to our advantage. Kalin made a fist before him. I want to harry them mercilessly. I want to use the winter weather to make them suffer. I want to draw them out, make them have to fight, in conditions they don't understand as well as we do. I want the hooded cloaks to help disguise our men. I want to be able to use the conditions to get in close on raids and then disappear right before their eyes. They don't have gifted? Yes, but they're not going to have a sorceress telling every archer where to aim his arrow. He stroked his chin. Yes, I see your point. He slapped the mantle as if to seal his promise. I'll have our people begin at once. Your men will need warm mittens, too. Kalin smiled appreciatively. They will be grateful. Have your people start sending the cloaks down to us as soon as they have some made. Don't wait for them all. We can start our raids with any number and add to them as you deliver more. Representative Terrio pulled his hood up and fastened his heavy wool cloak. Winter has just set in. The more time you have to whittle them down while you have the advantage of weather, the better. I had best be on my way at once. Kalin clasped arms with the man, not something the mother confessor typically did, but something anyone else might do in sincere appreciation of aid. As she and Kara stood outside the door, watching the representative and his guards trudging off through the snow, Kalin hoped the supply of white cloaks would start arriving soon, and that they would be as effective as she hoped. Do you really think we can press the war effectively in winter? Kara asked. Kalin turned back to the door. We have to. Before she went back inside, Kalin caught sight of a procession coming up through the trees. When they were a little closer, she saw that it was General Myfert on foot leading. She was able to pick out Addy, Verna, Warren, and Zed, all walking along beside four riders. The midday sun sparkled off the hilt of the lead rider's sword. Kalin gasped when she saw who it was. Without bothering to go back inside to get her cloak or fur mantle, she raced down through the snow to greet him. Kara was right on Kalin's heels. Harold, she called out as she got closer. Oh, Harold, are we ever glad to see you? It was her half-brother, come from Galia. Kalin then saw some of the other men riding behind him and gasped again in surprise. Captain Bradley Ryan, commander of the Galean recruits she had fought with, was there, and his lieutenant, Flynn Hobson. She thought she recognized Sergeant Frost in the rear. Her face hurt from grinning as she ran up to them through the deep snow. Kalin wanted to pull her half-brother off his horse and hug him. In a Galean field officer uniform far more muted than their dress uniform, he looked grand on his well-bred mount. She only now fully realized how worried she had been over his late arrival. Carrying himself like the prince he was, Harold tipped his head to her as he bowed in his saddle. He offered only a small private smile. Mother Confessor, I'm gratified to find you well. Captain Ryan was grinning, even if Prince Harold wasn't. Kalin had fond memories of Bradley and Flynn, of their bravery, courage, and heart. The fighting had been horrifying, but the company of those fine soldiers, fine young men all, was a cherished memory. They had done the impossible before, and had come to help do it again. Standing beside his horse, Kalin reached up for Harold's hand. Come inside. We've a good fire going. She motioned to the captain, the lieutenant, and the sergeant. You too, come inside and get warm. Kalin turned to the others, who didn't look nearly as happy as Kalin thought they should. We'll all fit. Come inside. Prince Harold stepped down out of the stirrup. Mother Confessor, I... Kalin couldn't resist. She threw her arms around her half-brother. He was a big bear of a man, much like their father, King Wyborn. Harold, I'm so relieved to see you. How's Cyrilla? Cyrilla, Harold's sister and Kalin's half-sister, was a dozen years older than Kalin. Cyrilla had been ill for ages, it seemed. 
When she had been captured by the order, she had been thrown into the pit with a gang of murderers and rapists. Harold had rescued her, but the abuse she suffered had left her in an incoherent state, oblivious of those around her. She regained her senses only infrequently. When she came awake, she more often than not screamed and cried uncontrollably. One of the times when she was lucid, she had asked Kaelin to promise to be the Queen of Galia and keep her people safe. Harold, wishing to remain commander of the Galean army, refused the crown. Kaelin reluctantly had acceded to his wish. Harold's eyes shifted to the others briefly. Mother Confessor, we need to have a talk. Chapter 41 at Prince Harold's instructions, Captain Ryan and his two men went to see to their troops and horses, while the rest of them crowded into the small trapper's lodge. Zed and Warren sat on a bench made of a board laid atop two log rounds. Verna and Addie sat against the opposite wall on another bench. Kara gazed out the small window. Standing near Kara, General Myfert watched as the prince ran a finger back and forth along the front edge of the table. Kalin folded her hands on the table before her. So, she began, fearing the worst, how is Cyrilla? Harold smoothed the front of his coat. The queen has recovered. Queen? Kaelin rose out of her chair. Cyrilla has recovered? Harold, that's wonderful news. And she has at last taken her crown back? Even better. Kaelin was delighted to be relieved of the role of queen to Galia. As Mother Confessor, it was an awkward duty better served by Cyrilla. More than that, though, she was relieved to learn that her half-sister had finally recovered. While the two of them were never close, they shared a mutual respect. More than her cheer at Cyrilla's recovery, though, Kalin felt a sense of deliverance that Harold had at last brought his troops down to join with them. She hoped he had been able to raise the hundred thousand they had previously discussed. It would be a good beginning for the army Kalin needed to raise. Harold licked his weather-cracked lips. By the slump in his shoulders, she was sure that the task of collecting his army had been trying and the journey arduous. She had never seen his face looking so worn. He had a vague, empty look that reminded her of her father. Kalin smiled exuberantly, determined to show her appreciation. How many troops did you bring? We could certainly use the whole hundred thousand. That would just about double what we have down here so far. The spirits know we need them. No one was saying anything. As she looked from one person to the next, no one would meet her gaze. Kalin's sense of relief was sloughing away. Harold, how many troops did you bring? He ran his meaty fingers back through his long, thick, dark hair. About a thousand. She stared dumbly, sinking back into her chair. A thousand? He nodded, still not meeting her eyes. Captain Bradley and his men... The ones you led and fought beside before. Kalin could feel her face heating. We need all your troops. Harold, what's going on? He at last met her gaze. Queen Cyrilla refused my plan to take our troops south. Shortly after you were there and visited her, she came out of her illness. She was herself again, full of ambition and fire. You know what she was like. She was always tireless in her advocacy for Galia. His fingers idly tapped the table. But I'm afraid she has been changed by her infirmity. She fears the Imperial Order. So do I, Kalin said with quiet, bottled rage. She could feel Richard's sword pressed against the back of her shoulder. She saw Harold's eyes take it in. Everyone in the Midlands fears the Order. That is why we need those troops. He was nodding as she spoke. I told her all that. I did. She said that she is Queen of Galia, and as such she must put our land first. Galia has joined the Daharan Empire. He opened his hands in a helpless gesture. When she was ill, she was unaware of that event taking place. She said she only gave you the crown for the safekeeping of her people, not to surrender their sovereignty. His hands dropped to his sides. She claims you never had any such authority and refuses to abide by the agreement. Kalin glanced at the others in the room, sitting mute like a panel of grim judges. Harold, you and I have discussed all this in the past. The Midlands is under threat. She swept her arm out. The entire new world is threatened. 
we must turn back that threat, not take to defending one land at a time, or have each land try to fend for itself. If we do that, we will all fall one at a time. We must stand together. I agree with you in principle, Mother Confessor. Queen Cyrilla does not. Then Cyrilla is not recovered, Harold. She is still sick. That may be, but it is not for me to say. Elbow on the table, Kaylin rested her forehead against her fingertips. Thoughts were screaming around inside her head, demanding that this not be happening. What about Jebra? Zed asked from the side of the room. Kaylin was relieved to hear his voice, as if reason were returning to the lunacy of what she was hearing, as if the weight of another voice would set things straight. We left the seer there to help care for Cyrilla and to advise you. Surely Jebra must have advised Cyrilla against such actions. Harold hung his head again. I'm afraid that Queen Cyrilla ordered Jebra thrown into a dungeon. Moreover, the Queen gave orders that if Jebra speaks one word of her blasphemy, as Queen Cyrilla calls it, she is to have her tongue cut out. Kaylin had to tell herself to blink. It was no longer Cyrilla's behavior that so stunned her. Her words came sparse and brittle, the naked bones of dead respect. Harold, why would you follow the orders of a madwoman? His jaw took a set, as if injured by her tone. Mother Confessor, she is not only my sister, but my queen. I am sworn to obey my queen in order to protect the Galean people. All those men of ours out there who have been fighting with your army are also sworn to protect the people of Galea above all else. I have already given them our queen's orders. We must all return to Galea at once. I'm sorry, but that is the way it must be. Kaelin pounded her fist on the table and shot to her feet. Galea stands at the head of the Calisidron Valley. It's a gateway right up to the center of the Midlands. Don't you see what a tempting route it might be for the Imperial Order? Don't you see how they might want to split the Midlands? Of course I do, Mother Confessor. She aimed a stiff arm, pointing at the camp beyond the lodge. So you just expect all those men out there to put their lives between you and the Order? You and Queen Cyrilla callously expect all those men out there to die protecting you while you sit back in Galea, hoping they prevent the Order from ever reaching you? Of course not, Mother Confessor. What's the matter with you? Don't you see that if you fight with us to halt the Order, you are protecting the people of your homeland? Harold licked his lip. Mother Confessor, all you say is probably true. It is also irrelevant. I am commander of the Galean army. My entire life has been devoted to serving the people of Galea and my sovereign. First my mother and father, and then my sister. From the time I was a boy at my father's knee, I was taught to protect Galea above all else. Kaylin did her best to control her voice. Harold, Cyrilla is obviously still sick. If you are honestly interested in protecting your people, you must see that what you're doing is not the way to accomplish it. Mother Confessor, I have been charged by my queen with protecting the people of Galea. I know my duty. Duty? Kaylin wiped a hand across her face. Harold, you can't blindly follow that woman's whim. The route to life and liberty exists only through reason. She may be queen, but reason can be your only true sovereign. To fail to use reason in this, to fail to think, is intellectual anarchy. He looked at her as if she were some poor child who didn't understand the world of adult responsibility. She is my queen. The queen is devoted to the people. Kaylin drummed her fingers on the table. What Cyrilla is, is deluded by ghosts that still haunt her. She is going to bring harm to your people. You are going to aid her in delivering your people into ruin because you wish something to be true even though it is not. You are seeing her as she once was, not as she is now. He shrugged. Mother Confessor, I can understand why you think what you think. But it can change nothing. I must do as my queen commands. Elbows on the table, Kaylin held her face in her hands for a time, trembling with anger at the insanity of what she was hearing. She finally looked up, meeting her half-brother's gaze. Harold, Galia is part of the Daharan Empire. Galia has a queen only at the indulgence of the empire. 
queen though she may be, even if she does not recognize the rule of the Daharan Empire, she is still, as she always has been, subordinate to the mother confessor of the Midlands. As mother confessor, as well as the leader of the Daharan Empire in Lord Rawl's absence, I formally terminate that indulgence. Cyrilla is now without authority and is removed from office. She is no longer the queen of anything, much less Galia. You are ordered to return to Ebenissia, to put Cyrilla under arrest for her own protection, to release Jebra, and to return to this army with the seer and all Galian forces except a home guard for the crown city. Mother Confessor, I'm sorry, but my queen has ordered... Kalin slammed the flat of her hand down on the table. Enough! He fell silent as Kalin rose. With her fingertips pressed to the table, she leaned closer to him. As Mother Confessor, I am commanding you to carry out my orders at once. That is final. I will hear no more. The room seemed gripped by the grave consequence of what was happening. Each forbidding face watched, waiting to see how it was going to go. Harold spoke in a voice that reminded Kalin of her father's. I realize that it may make no sense to you, Mother Confessor, but I must choose my duty to my people above my duty to you. Cyrilla is my sister. King Wyborn always told me to run a good army. An officer must obey his queen. My men down here are ordered by their queen to return at once to protect Galia. I am a man bound by my honor to protect my people, as ordered by my queen. You pompous fool. How dare you speak to me of your honor? You are sacrificing the lives of innocent people to your delusions of honor. Honor is honesty to what is, not blind duty to what you wish to be. You have no honor, Harold. Kalin sank into her chair. She looked past him to the side, staring into the hearth into the flames. I have given you my orders. Do you refuse to obey them? I must refuse, Mother Confessor. Let me say only that it is not out of malice. Harold, she said in a flat tone without looking at him, you are committing treason. I realize that you may see it that way, Mother Confessor. Oh, I do. I do indeed. Treason to your people, treason to the Midlands, treason to our Daharan union against the Imperial Order and treason against the Mother Confessor. What do you suppose I ought to do about it? I would expect that if you feel so strongly, you would have me put to death, Mother Confessor. She looked up at him. If you have enough sense to realize that, then what good will it do for you to stick to the orders of a madwoman? It will only bring your death, and then you will not be able to carry out your queen's orders. Staying to your course can only leave your people without your aid, which is what you claim to put above all else. Why not simply do the right thing and help us to help your people? Since you refuse, you have shown yourself in truth to be without common sense, much less honor. His eyes turned to her, filled with smoldering anger. The knuckles of his fists went white. I will be heard now, Mother Confessor. If I stand by my honor, even if it costs me my life... It will be honoring my family, my sister, my queen, and my homeland. A homeland forged by my father, King Wyborn, and my mother, Queen Bernadine. When I was young, my father, my sovereign king, was taken from my mother, my family, and my homeland of Galia by the confessors. Taken by a confessor's power for their selfish desire of a husband for your mother, for her selfish desire for a strong man to father her a child. You. Now you, Mother Confessor, the daughter of that theft of that beloved man from us when I was but a boy. You would take me from my sister? Take her, too, from our land? Take me from my duty to serve my queen, my land, and above all, my people? The last duty my father charged me with before your mother took him from us and destroyed him for no reason but that he was good and she wanted him was that I should always honor my duty to my sister and my land. I will carry out my father's last charge to me, even if you think it madness. Kalin stared at him in cold shock. I'm sorry you feel that way, Harold. His face had aged and hardened. I know that you are not responsible for all that happened before you came to be, 
and I will always love that part of you that is my father. But I am still the one who must live with it all. Now I must be true to myself, to my own feelings. Your feelings, she repeated. Yes, Mother Confessor. Those are my feelings, and I must put my faith in them. Kaylin swallowed past the painful constriction in her throat. Her fingers, lying limply on the table before her, tingled. Faith and feelings. Harold, you are as mad as your sister. She drew herself up straight and folded her hands. She shared a last look with her half-brother, a man she had never known except in name as she pronounced sentence on him. Beginning at sunrise tomorrow, the Daharan Empire and Galia are at war. After sunrise tomorrow, if you are seen by me or any of our men, you will be put to death for the crime of treason. I will not allow those brave men out there to die for traitors. The Imperial Order will, in all likelihood, turn north up the Calisidran Valley. You will be alone. They will butcher every man in your army, just as they butchered the people of Ebenissia. Jagang will give your sister to his men as a whore. It will be by your doing, Harold, for refusing to use your ability to think and instead following your feelings and faith in what does not exist. Harold, hands clasped behind his back, chin held up, said nothing as Kalin continued. Tell Cyrilla that she had better hope for the fate I have just described, because if the order does not come through Galia, I will. I have promised no mercy to the order. Galia's treason condemns her to the same fate as the order. If the order does not get Cyrilla, then I swear I will. And when I get her, I am going to take her back to Aden Drill, and I'm going to personally throw her back down into that pit from which you rescued her. And I am going to leave her down there with every criminal brute I can find for as long as she lives. Harold's jaw dropped. Mother Confessor, you wouldn't. Kalin's eyes told him otherwise. You be sure to tell Cyrilla what's in store for her. Jebra probably tried to tell her and was thrown in a dungeon for it. Cyrilla is refusing to see the open pit before her, and you are walking into it with her. Worse, you are taking your innocent people with you. Kalin drew her royal Galean sword. She grasped either end in a hand. Gritting her teeth, she pulled the flat of the blade against her knee. The steel bent, then finally snapped with a loud report. She tossed the broken blade on the floor at his feet. Now get out of my sight. He turned to leave, but before he took a step, Zed stood holding out a hand as if to ask him to remain where he was. Mother Confessor, Zed said, choosing his words carefully, I believe you are letting your emotions get in the way. Harold gestured to Kalin, relieved to hear Zed's intercession. Tell her, Wizard Zarander. Tell her. Kalin couldn't believe her ears. She remained where she was, staring into Zed's hazel eyes. Then would you mind explaining my error of emotion, First Wizard? Zed glanced at Harold, and then back to Kalin. Mother Confessor, Queen Cyrilla is obviously deranged. Prince Harold is not only doing her a disservice, but enabling her to bring only the specter of death to her people. If he chose the side of reason, he would be protecting his people and honoring his sister's past admirable service when she was of sound mind. Instead, he has betrayed his duty to his people by embracing what he wishes to be true about her instead of facing what is true. In this way, he is embracing death, and in this case, embracing death for his people too. Prince Harold has been justly found guilty of treason, your emotions for him are interfering with your judgment. Obviously, he is now a danger to our cause, to the lives of our people, and to the lives of his own people. He cannot be allowed to leave. Harold looked thunderstruck. But Zed! Zed's hazel eyes, too, were a terrible pronouncement of guilt. He waited, as if challenging the man to further prove his treason. Harold's mouth moved, but he could offer no words. Does anyone disagree with me? Zed asked. He looked at Addie. She shook her head. Verna likewise shook her head. Warren stared at Harold for a moment, then shook his head. Harold's expression turned indignant. I'm not going to stand for this. The mother confessor has given me until dawn to withdraw. You must honor her sentence. 
He took two strides toward the door, but then paused, clutching his chest, twisting slowly as he started to sink, his eyes rolling up in his head, his legs folded, and he crashed to the floor. Kalin sat stunned. No one moved or said anything. General Myford went down on one knee beside the body, checking Prince Harold for breath or pulse. The general looked up at Kalin and shook his head. She passed her gaze from Zed to Addie to Verna to Warren. None revealed anything in their expression. Kalin spoke and spoke softly. I don't ever want to know which one of you did this. I'm not saying you were wrong. I just don't want to know. The four gifted people nodded. At the door, Kalin stood in the bright sunlight a moment, feeling the cold air on her face, searching until she saw Captain Ryan leaning against a stout young maple tree. He stood at attention as she strode out to him through the snow. Bradley, did Prince Harold tell you why he was coming here? Calling him by his given name rather than his rank changed the nature of the question. His rigid posture slackened. Yes, Mother Confessor. He said he had to tell you that he had been ordered back by his queen to defend Galia, and that he was further ordered to bring his men serving with you back to Galia with him. Then what are you doing here? Why did you and your men come along, if he was to take everyone back? He lifted his square jaw and looked at her with clear blue eyes. Because we deserted, Mother Confessor. You what? Prince Harold gave me his orders as I just reported them. I told him that it was wrong and could only harm our people. He said it was not for me to decide such things. He said it was not for me to think but to follow orders. I've fought with you, Mother Confessor. I believe I know you better than Prince Harold does. I know you are devoted to protecting the lives of the people of the Midlands. I told him that what Cyrilla was doing was wrong. He was angry and said it was my duty to follow my orders. I told him that in that case I was deserting the Galean army and was going to stand with you instead. I thought he was going to have me put to death for disobeying him, but he would have had to put all thousand of us to death because all the men felt the same way. A good many came forward to tell him so. The fire seemed to go out of him then, and he let us ride down here with him. I hope you aren't angry with us, Mother Confessor. Kalin couldn't force herself to be the Mother Confessor at that moment. She put her arms around him. Thank you, Bradley. She gripped his shoulders and smiled at him through her watery vision. You used your head. I couldn't be angry with that. You told us once we were a badger trying to swallow an ox whole. Looks to me you've taken to trying to do the same thing. If there ever was a badger who could swallow an ox whole, it would be you, Mother Confessor. But I guess we wouldn't want you to try it without us to help you do it. They turned then and saw General Myford directing some of his men. They were carrying Prince Harold's limp body out of the lodge, holding him by the shoulders and feet. His hands dragged through the snow. I figured this wasn't going to come to any good end, the young captain said. Ever since Cyrilla was hurt, Prince Harold just never seemed himself. I always loved the man. It hurt me to have to desert him. But he just wasn't making sense anymore. Kalin put a comforting hand on his shoulder as they watched the body being carried away. I'm sorry, Bradley. Like you, I always thought highly of him. I guess seeing his sister and his queen so long held in the grip of that kind of sickness just brought him to his wit's end. Try to keep your good memories of him. I will, Mother Confessor. Kalin changed the subject. I'll need one of your men to take a message to Cyrilla. I was going to have Harold take it, but now we'll need a messenger. I will see to it, Mother Confessor. She only then realized how cold it was outside and that she didn't have a cloak. As the captain went to get his men quartered and to pick out a man to act as a messenger, Kalin went back inside the lodge. Kara was putting more wood on the hearth. Verna and Addie had gone. Warren was selecting a rolled map from the basket of maps and diagrams in the corner. As he was leaving, Kalin caught Warren's arm. She looked into the wizard's blue eyes, knowing they were much older than they appeared. Richard had always said that Warren was one of the smartest people he had ever met. Besides that, Warren's true talent was said to lie in the area of prophecy. Warren, are we all going to die in this mad war? His face softened with a shy but impish grin. I thought you didn't believe in prophecy, Kalin. She released his arm. I guess I don't. Never mind. Kara, leaving to find some more firewood, followed Warren out. 
Kaelin warmed herself before the hearth as she stared at Spirit, standing on the mantel. Zed rested a comforting hand on her shoulder. What you had to say to Harold about using your mind, about reason, was very wise, Kaelin. You were right. Her fingers touched the buttery smooth walnut robes of Spirit. It was what Richard said when he was telling me what he had finally come to understand about what he had to do. He said the only sovereign he could allow to rule him was reason. Richard said that? Those were his very words? Kalin nodded as she gazed at Spirit. He said the first law of reason is that what exists, exists. What is, is. And that from this irreducible bedrock principle all knowledge is built. He said that was the foundation from which life is embraced. He said thinking is a choice, and that wishes and whims are not facts, nor are they a means to discover them. I guess Harold proved the point. Richard said reason is our only way of grasping reality, that it's our basic tool of survival. We are free to evade the effort of thinking, to reject reason, but we are not free to avoid the penalty of the abyss we refuse to see. She listened to the fire crackling at her feet as she let her gaze wander over the lines of the figure he had carved for her. When she heard nothing from Zed, she looked over her shoulder. He was staring into the flames, a tear running down his cheek. Zed, what's wrong? The boy figured it out himself. The old wizard's voice was the uneasy sum of loneliness and quiet pride. He understands it. He interpreted it perfectly. He even came to it on his own, by applying it. Came to what? The most important rule there is, the wizard's sixth rule. The only sovereign you can allow to rule you is reason. Reflections of the firelight danced in his hazel eyes. The sixth rule is the hub upon which all rules turn. It is not only the most important rule, but the simplest. Nonetheless, it is the one most often ignored and violated and by far the most despised. It must be wielded in spite of the ceaseless howling protests of the wicked. Misery, iniquity, and utter destruction lurk in the shadows outside its full light, where half-truths snare the faithful disciples, the deeply feeling believers, the selfless followers. Faith and feelings are the warm marrow of evil. Unlike reason, faith and feelings provide no boundary to limit any delusion, any whim. They are a virulent poison, giving the numbing illusion of moral sanction to every depravity ever hatched. Faith and feelings are the darkness to reason's light. Reason is the very substance of truth itself. The glory that is life is wholly embraced through reason, through this rule. In rejecting it, in rejecting reason, one embraces death. By the next morning, about half of the Galean force had vanished, returning to their homeland and queen, as ordered by Prince Harold before his death. The rest, like Captain Ryan and his young soldiers, remained loyal to the Daharan Empire. Lieutenant Lydon, the former general, and his entire force of Celtish troops had also departed by morning. He left Caelan a letter, in it saying that with Galia choosing to break with the Daharan Empire, he had to return to help protect Kelton, as surely the selfish actions of the Galeans meant the order would be more likely to come up the Kern River Valley and threaten Kelton. He wrote that he hoped the Mother Confessor would realize how grave was the danger to Kelton, and understand that it was not his intention to desert her or the Daharan Empire, but simply to help protect his people. Kalin knew of the men leaving. General Myfert and Warren had come to tell her. She had expected it, and had been watching. She told General Myfert to allow them to leave if they wished. War in their camp could come to no good end. The morale of the remaining men was boosted by a sense of being on the right side and of doing the right thing. That afternoon, as she was drafting an urgent letter to General Baldwin, commander of all Celtish forces, General Myfert and Captain Ryan came to see her. After listening to their plan, she granted Captain Ryan permission to go with a like number of General Myford's hand-picked Daharan Special Forces to conduct raids on the Imperial Order Force. Warren and six sisters were sent to accompany them. With the Imperial Order having moved so far back to the south, Kalin needed information on what they were doing and what shape their force was in. 
More than that, though, with the foul weather in their favor, she wanted to keep pressure on the enemy. Captain Bradley Ryan and his band of nearly a thousand were experienced mountain fighters and had grown up in just such harsh conditions. Kalin had fought beside the captain and his young Galean soldiers and had helped train them in the ways of fighting a vastly superior force. If only the enemy force did not number over a million. General Meifert's special forces, which until Kalin had promoted him he had ably commanded, were now led by Captain Zimmer, a young, square-jawed, bull-necked Daharan with an infectious smile. They were everything Captain Ryan's young men were, tripled. Experienced, business-like under stress, tireless, fearless, and coolly efficient at killing. What made most soldiers blanch made them grin. They preferred fighting just such as this, where they were free of massive battlefield tactics and could instead use their special skills. They treasured being let off the leash to do what they did best. Rather than check them, Kalin gave them a free hand. Each of those Daharans collected enemy ears. They felt a great fidelity to Kalin, in part because she didn't try to rein them in and integrate them into the larger army, and perhaps more so because when they returned from missions, she always asked to see their strings of ears. They relished being appreciated. Kalin intended to later send them to collect Galean ears. Chapter 42 Kalin glanced over her shoulder at the prelate bent over the map basket in the corner. It had been almost a full phase of the moon since Warren had left on the mission with Captains Ryan and Zimmer. Although it was difficult to judge accurately just how long such missions would last, they should have been back by now. Kalin knew all too well the kind of worry that had to be churning beneath the woman's no-nonsense exterior. Verna. Kalin asked as she rubbed her arms. On your way past, could you throw some more wood on the fire, please? Kara hopped down off her stool where she was perched, watching over Kalin's shoulder. I'll do it. Verna pulled a map free and on her way back to the table thanked Kara. Here it is, Zed. I think this better shows the area you're talking about. Zed unfurled the new map over the top of the one already laid out on the table before Kalin. It was a larger scale giving a more detailed look at the southern regions of the Midlands. Yes, Zed drawled as he peered at the new map. See here, he tapped the Drun River. See how narrow the lowlands are down south through here? That's what I was talking about. Rough country with cliffs in places hemming the river. That's why I don't think they would try to go up the Drun Valley. I suppose you're right, Verna said. Besides, Kalin waggled a finger over the area to the north on the first map. Up this way is mostly only Nicobaris. They are rather isolated, and so a tempting target, but they aren't a wealthy land. The plunder and trade goods would be slim. The Order has much more opportunity for conquest if they stay over here. Besides, can you see how difficult it would be for them to get their army back over the Rangshada Mountains if they went up the Drun? Strategically, it wouldn't make much sense for them to go up that way. Verna idly twiddled with a button on her blue dress as she studied the map. Yes, I see what you mean. But your point is well taken, Kalin said. It wouldn't be a bad idea if you sent a sister or two to watch that area. Just because it doesn't make as much logistic sense, that doesn't mean Jigang wouldn't try it. Come spring, he's bound to move on us. We wouldn't want to be surprised to find the Imperial Order storming in the back door to Aidendrill. Kara answered the knock at the door. It was a head scout named Hayes. Kalin stood when she saw through the open door in nearby trees that Captain Ryan was also making his way toward the lodge. Hayes saluted with a fist to his heart. Glad to see you back, Corporal Hayes, Kalin said. Thank you, Mother Confessor. It's good to be back. He looked like he could use a meal. After Captain Ryan rushed in through the door, Kara pushed it shut against the blowing snow. Hayes stepped to the side, out of the way of the captain. Kalin was relieved to see the young Galean officer. How did everything go, Captain? How is everyone? He pulled off his scarf and wool hat as he caught his breath. Verna looked to be holding hers. Good, the captain said. We did well. The sisters were able to heal some of our wounded. Some needed to be transported for a ways before the sisters could see to them. That slowed us. We had a few losses, but not as many as we feared. Warren was a great help. Where is Warren? Zed asked. As if bidden by his name, Warren came in through the door, escorted by a swirling gust of snow. Kalin squinted at the slash of bright light until the door was pushed shut once more. 
She caught the look on Verna's face and recalled how lighthearted she always felt to see Richard back safely when they had been separated. Warren casually kissed Verna on the cheek with a quick peck. Kalen noticed the look they shared, even if no one else did. She was happy for them, but still the reminder was like a jab at the pain of her helpless heartache and worry over Richard. Did you tell them? Warren asked, unbuttoning his cloak. No, Captain Ryan said. We haven't had a chance yet. Zed's brow drew down. Tell us what? Warren heaved a sigh. Well, Verna's special glass worked better than we thought it had. We captured several men and questioned them at length. The ones we saw dead in the valley were only the ones who died at first. Verna helped Warren shed his heavy snow-crusted cloak. She put it on the floor by the fire, where Captain Ryan had laid his brown coat to dry. It seems, Warren went on, that there were a great many, maybe another sixty, seventy thousand, who didn't go blind, but who lost the sight in one eye or have impaired vision. The order couldn't very well abandon them, because they can still see well enough to stay with the rest. But more important, it's hoped that maybe those men will heal and regain full use of their sight and their ability to fight. Not likely, Verna said. I don't think so either, Warren said but that's what they are thinking anyway. Another goodly number, maybe 25 or 30,000, are sick. Their eyes and noses red and horribly infected. Verna nodded. The glass will do that. Then some more, maybe half that number, are having breathing difficulty. So, Kalin said, with those killed and those injured enough to keep them from being effective fighters, that makes somewhere near 150,000 put out of the way by the glass dust. Quite an accomplishment, Verna. Verna looked as pleased as Kalen. It was worth that horse ride scaring the wits out of me. It wouldn't have worked had you not thought of doing it that way. What kind of success did you have, Captain? Kara asked as she came to stand behind Kalen. Captain Zimmer and I had the kind of success we hoped for. I'd guess we took out maybe 10,000 in the time we were down there. Zed let out a slow whistle. Pretty heavy fighting. Not really. Not the way the Mother Confessor taught us to do it. And not the way Captain Zimmer works, either. Mostly, we eliminate the enemy as efficiently as possible and try to keep from having to fight at all. If you slit a man's throat in his sleep, you can accomplish a lot more. And you're less likely to get hurt yourself. Kalen smiled. I'm glad you were such a good student. Captain Ryan lifted a thumb. Warren and the sisters were a great help at getting us where we needed to be without being discovered. Any word about the white cloaks yet? We could really use them. I can tell you for a fact that they would have enabled us to do more. We just got in our first load the day before yesterday, Kalen told him. More than enough for your men and Captain Zimmer's. We'll have more within a few days. Captain Ryan rubbed his hands, warming his fingers. Captain Zimmer will be pleased. Zed gestured to the south. Did you find out why they withdrew so far back over ground they'd taken? Warren nodded. From the men we questioned, we found out that they have fever going through their camp. Nothing we did, just your regular fever that happens in such crowded camp conditions in the field. But they've lost tens of thousands of men to the fever. They wanted to withdraw to put some distance between us, give themselves some breathing room. They aren't concerned about being able to push us out of their way when they wish. That made sense. With their numbers, it was only natural for them to be confident, even cavalier, about dealing with any opposition. Kalen couldn't understand why Warren and Captain Ryan looked so downhearted. She sensed that, despite their good news, there was something amiss. Dear spirits, Kalen said, trying to give them some cheer. Their numbers are dwindling away like snow beside the hearth. This is better than... Warren held up a hand. I asked Hayes here to come and give you his report firsthand. I think you had better hear him out. Kalen motioned the man to come forward. He stepped smartly up to her table and snapped to attention. Let's hear what you have to report, Corporal Hayes. His face looked chalky, and despite the cold, he was sweating. Mother Confessor, my scout team was down to the southeast, watching the roots in from the wilds and watching, too, in case the order tried to swing wide around us. Well, I guess the short of it is we spotted a column making its way west to resupply and reinforce the order. They're a big army, Kalen said. They would have supplies sent from their homeland to augment what they can't get as spoils. A supply column would have men guarding them. I followed them for a week just to get an accurate count. How many, Kalen asked. Well over a quarter million, Mother Confessor. 
Kalin's flesh tingled as if icy needles were dancing over it. How many? Verna asked. At least 250,000 men-at-arms, plus drivers and civilians with the supplies. Everything they had worked for, all the sacrifices, all the struggle to whittle down the Imperial Order had just been nullified. Worse than nullified, their work had been erased, and nearly that many more had been added to the force the enemy had started with. Dear spirits, Kalin whispered, how many men does the old world have to throw at us? When she met Warren's gaze, she knew that this number even was hardly surprising to him. Warren gestured to the scout. Hayes saw only the first group. The men we captured told us about the reinforcements. We weren't sure they were telling us the truth. We thought they might be trying to spook us, but then we met up with Corporal Hayes on his way back. We did some further questioning and scouting. That's why we were delayed in returning. Another quarter million. Kalin's words trailed off. It all seemed so hopeless. Warren cleared his throat. That is just the first column of fresh troops. More are coming. Kalin went to the hearth and warmed her hands as she stared into the flames. She was standing beneath the statue Richard had carved for her to make her feel better. Kalin wished that at that moment she could recall the defiant feeling spirit portrayed. It felt as if she could only contemplate death. The news of the Imperial Order reinforcements, just as the news of departure of the Galeans and Keltons, spread through the camp faster than a storm wind. Kalin, Zed, Warren, Verna, Addy, General Myfert, and the rest of the officers held nothing back from the men. Those men were risking their lives daily and had a right to the truth. If Kalin was passing through the camp and a soldier was brave enough to ask her, she told him what she knew. She tried to give them confidence, too, but she didn't lie to them. The men, having struggled for so long, were beyond fear. The bleak mood was a palpable pall, smothering the spark of life out of them. They went about their tasks as if numb, accepting their fate which now seemed sealed, resigned to the inevitable. The new world offered no shelter, no safe place, nowhere to hide from the boundless menace of the Imperial Order. Kalin showed the soldiers a determined face. She had no choice. Captain Ryan and his men, having been through such despair before, were less troubled by the news. They couldn't die. They were already dead. Along with Kalin, the young Galeans had long ago taken an oath of the dead and could only be returned to life when the order was destroyed. None of it mattered much to Captain Zimmer and his men. They knew what needed to be done, and they simply kept at it. Each of them now had multiple strings of ears. They began new strings at one hundred. It was a matter of honor to them that they kept only the right ear, so no two ears could be from the same man. Representative Theriot of Hergeborg was as good as his word. The white wool cloaks, hats, and mittens arrived weekly, helping hide the men who regularly went on missions, while the weather was in their favor, to attack the Imperial Order. With the sickness in the Order's camp leaving so many of them weak, along with so many of the enemy having impaired vision, those missions were extraordinarily successful. Troops wearing the concealing cloaks were also sent to lie in wait and intercept any supply trains, hoping to neutralize the reinforcements before they could join with the enemy's main force. Still, the attacks were little more than an annoyance to the order. Kalin, after a meeting with a group just returned, found Zed alone in the lodge looking over the latest information that had been added to the maps. Good fortune, she said when he looked up, watching as she removed her fur mantle. The men who just got in had few casualties, and they caught a large group out on patrol. They were able to cut them off and take them all out, including one of Jigang's sisters. Then why the long face? She could only lift her hands in a forsaken gesture of futility. Try not to be so disheartened, Zed told her. Despair is often war's handmaiden. I can't tell you how many years it was back when I was young that everyone fighting for their lives in that war back then thought that it was only a matter of time until we were crushed. We went on to win. I know, Zed, I know. Kalin rubbed at the chill in her hands. She almost hated to say it, but she finally did. Richard wouldn't come to lead the army because he said that the way things stand now we can't win. He said that whether or not we fight the order, the world will fall under its shadow, and if we fight, it will only result in more death that our side will be destroyed, the Order would still rule the world, 
and any chance for winning in the future would be lost. Zed peered at her with one eye. Then what are you doing here? Richard said we can't win, but dear spirits, I can't let myself believe that. I would rather die fighting to be free, to help keep my people free, than to live the death of a slave. Yet I know I'm violating Richard's wishes, his advice, and his orders. I gave him my word. I feel as if I'm treading the quicksand of betrayal and taking everyone with me. She searched his face for some sign that Richard might have been wrong. You said that he had figured out the wizard's sixth rule on his own, that we must use our minds to see the reality of the way things are. I had hopes. I thought he had to be wrong about the futility of this war. But now... Zed smiled to himself, as if finding fancy in something she saw as only horrifying. This is going to be a long war. It is far from beyond hope, much less decided. This is the agony of leadership in such a struggle. The doubts, the fears, the feelings of hopelessness. Those are feelings, not necessarily reality. Not yet. We have much yet to bring to bear. Richard said what he believed based on the way matters stood at the time he said them. Who is to say that the people are not now prepared to prove themselves to him, prove themselves ready to reject the order? Perhaps what Richard needed in order for him to commit to the battle has already come about. But I know how strongly he warned me against joining this battle. He meant what he said. Still, I don't have Richard's strength, the strength to turn my back and let it happen. Kaylin gestured to her inkstand on the table. I've sent letters asking that more troops be sent down here. He smiled again as if to say that proved it could be done. It will take continual effort to grind down the enemy's numbers. I think we have yet to deal the order a truly serious blow, but we will. The sisters and I will come up with something. You never know in matters of this kind. It could be that we will suddenly do something that will send them reeling. Kalen smiled and rubbed his shoulder. Thanks, Zed. I'm so thankful to have you with us. Her gaze wandered to spirit standing proudly above the hearth. She stepped over to the mantel, as if to an altar that held the sacred carving. Dear spirits, I miss him. It was a question without the words, hoping he would surprise her with something that he had thought of to help get Richard back. I know, dear one, I miss him too. He's alive, that's the most important thing. Kalen could only nod. Zed clapped his hands together as if taken with a gleeful thought. What we need, more than anything, is something to get everyone's mind off the task at hand for a while. Something to give them a reason to cheer together for a while. It would do them more good than anything. Kalen frowned over her shoulder. Like what? You mean some kind of game or something? His face was all screwed up in musing. I don't know. Something happy. Something to show them that the Order can't stop us from living our lives can't stop us from the enjoyment of life, of what life is really all about. He stroked a thumb along the sharp line of his jaw. Any ideas? Well, I can't really think of... Just then, Warren strode in. Just got a report from over in the Drun Valley. Our lucky day. No activity as we expected. He stopped dead in his tracks, his hand still holding the door lever, looking from Kalen to Zed and back again. What's the matter? What's going on? Why are you two looking at me like that? Verna came up behind Warren and gave him a shove into the lodge. Go on, go on, get in there, close the door. What's the matter with you? It's freezing out there. Verna huffed and shut the door herself. When she turned around and saw Zed and Kalen, she backed a step. Verna! Warren! Zed said in a honeyed voice. Come on in, won't you? Verna scowled. What are you two scheming and grinning at? Well, Zed drawled as he winked at Kalen, the Mother Confessor and I were just discussing the big event. Verna's scowl darkened as she leaned in. What big event? I've heard nothing about any big event. Even Warren, rarely given to scowling, was scowling now. That's right. What big event? Your wedding, Zed said. Both Verna and Warren's scowls evaporated as they straightened. They were overcome with surprised, silly, radiant grins. Really? Warren asked. Really? Verna asked. 
Yes, really, Kalin said. Chapter 43 It took more than two weeks to prepare for Verna and Warren's wedding. It wasn't that it couldn't have been done more quickly, but rather, as Ed had explained to Kalin, he wanted to drag out the whole affair. He wanted to give everyone ample time to ponder it, and to dream up lavish doings, time to organize, to make decorations, to cook special foods, to get the camp ready for a grand party, time to have a stretch where everyone could gossip about it as they eagerly looked forward to the big event. The soldiers, at first merely pleased, soon got caught up in the spirit of the occasion. It became a grand diversion. They all liked Warren. He was the sort of man that everyone felt a little sorry for, a bit protective of, the awkward shy type. Most didn't have the foggiest understanding of many of the things he babbled about. They thought that he just wasn't the type who would ever win a woman. That he had, to them seemingly against all odds, gave the men an inner pride that he was one of theirs, and he had done it. He'd won a woman's heart. It gave them hope that they might one day have a wedding, a wife, and a family, even if they were afraid that they too were often awkward and shy. The men even openly expressed happiness for Verna. She was a woman they respected, but had never exactly felt warmly toward. Their bold well-wishes flummoxed her. The entire camp was caught up in the spirit of the event even more than Kalin had hoped. After a brief pause in the beginning while it sank in, the men, so weary not only of fighting against such odds, the loss of friends, and being in the field away from their homes and loved ones for so long, but also the harsh, difficult, dreary weather, took to the diversion with gusto. A large central area was cleared, tents moved, and the area cleaned of snow down to the bare ground. At the head of the cleared area, they built a platform, laid across anchored supply wagons, atop which the wedding was to take place. The platform was needed so that the men would have a better chance to see the ceremony. A dance area was set aside, and those men with musical instruments and not on duty spent night and day practicing. A choir was formed and went off to a secluded ravine to rehearse. Wherever Kalin went, she could hear pipes and drums or the piercing notes of a shawm or the melodic chords of strings. Men came to fear playing off-key more than they feared the imperial order. With over a hundred sisters available, it was suggested that there could be dancing after the ceremony. The sisters liked the idea, until they started doing the math and realized how many men there were to each woman and how much dancing they would be doing. Still, they were titillated at the prospect of having attention lavished on them at a dance, and approved the idea. Women centuries old were blushing like girls again at all the requests from men in their teens and twenties for the promise of a turn with them at the wedding dance. As the wedding approached, the men made streets of sorts in a winding course through the camp so that after the ceremony the wedding party could pass in review through the entire camp. All the men wanted a chance to be a part in greeting the newly married couple and wishing them well. Kalin had the idea that after the wedding Warren and Verna should have the lodge, it was to be her wedding gift to them, so for the most part she kept it a secret. Kalin had Kara direct the public pretense of having a tent set aside and reserved for the newly married couple. Kara moved Verna's things in the tent and freshened it up with herbs and frozen sprigs with wild berries. The diversion worked. Verna believed the tent was to be hers and Warren's and wouldn't let him into it until after they were married. The day of the wedding dawned with sparkling blue skies and wasn't so cold that people were likely to get frostbite. The fresh snow of the day before was quickly cleared out of the central area so that the festivities could take place without the sisters getting snow down their boots as they danced. Some of the sisters came out to inspect the dance floor, sauntering around, giving the men a look at who they might get to have a turn with, if they were lucky. It was all done with much humor and good cheer. While Verna spent the early afternoon in her tent, submitting to having her hair fussed over, her face painted, and her wedding dress tended to by a gaggle of sisters, Kalin was finally able to have the secrecy she needed in order to decorate the lodge. Inside, she secured fragrant feathery balsam boughs to a cord and draped it in swags around the top of every wall. She tied red berries, as that was all she could come by, into the boughs to give them some color. One of the sisters had given Kalin some plain weave fabric that Kalin had made into a curtain for the window. She had worked on it when she retired to the lodge at night, stitching designs to give the simple material a lacy look. She kept it under her bed, so that when they came in to go over battlefield strategy, Verna and Warren wouldn't know what she was doing. 
Kalen was finally able to put the scented candles, donated by different sisters as gifts, all around the room, and at last hang the curtain on a straight limb she stripped of bark. The one thing Kalen wouldn't leave to brighten the lodge for the newly wedded couple was spirit. That she would take to her new tent. As Kalen was making up the bed with fresh bedding, Kara came in with an armload of something blue. Kalen folded the blanket under the foot of the straw-filled mattress as she watched Kara shut the door. What have you got there? You won't believe it, Kara said with a grin. Wide blue silk ribbon. The sisters have Verna tied to a chair while they're fussing over her, and Zed has Warren off doing something, so I thought you and I could use the ribbon to decorate the place a little. Drape it around, make it look pretty, she pointed. Like up there, we could wind it around the balsam you hung to give it a fancy look. Kalen blinked in surprise. What a good idea. She didn't know what was more astonishing, actually seeing Kara with blue silk ribbon or hearing her say, decorate and pretty, in the same breath. She smiled to herself, happy to have heard such a thing. Zed was more of a wizard than he knew. Kalen and Kara each stood on a log round, working their way along the wall as they wove the ribbon through and around the swagged balsam boughs. It was so beautiful seeing the first wall completed that Kalen couldn't stop gazing and grinning. They started in on the second wall, opposite the door, using extra ribbon for best effect, when Verna and Warren first entered and saw their new place. "'Where did you ever get all this ribbon, anyway?' Kalen asked around a mouthful of pins. "'Benjamin got it for me,' Kara chuckled as she threaded the ribbon around the cord. "'Can you believe it? He made me promise not to ask him where he got it from.' Kalen took the pins from her mouth. "'Who?' "'Who what?' Kara mumbled before she stuck her tongue out of the corner of her mouth while wiggling a pin into a tight place. Who, did you say, got you the ribbon? Kara lifted another length of blue silk to the ceiling. General Myfert! I don't have a clue where he... You said Benjamin. Kara lowered the ribbon and stared at Kalen. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. You said Benjamin. I said General Myfert. You only thought I never knew that General Myfert's first name was Benjamin. Well... Is Benjamin General Myford's first name? Had Kara been wearing her red leather, her face would have matched it. As it was, her dark scowl matched the brown leather she had on. You know it is. A smile grew on Kalen's lips. I do now. Kalen wore her white mother confessor's dress. She was a bit surprised to notice that it fit a little loosely, but all things considered, she supposed it was to be expected. Because of the cold, she also wore the wolf fur mantle Richard had made for her, but draped it around her shoulders more like a stole. She stood with her back straight and chin held high, overseeing the ceremony and gazing out at the tens of thousands of quiet faces. Behind her was a rich, verdant wall of woven boughs that enabled distant spectators to more easily pick out the six people up on the platform. An ethereal mist of silent breath lifted in the still, golden late afternoon air. As he conducted the wedding ceremony, Zed's back was to her. Kalen was fascinated to see his wavy white hair, perpetually in disarray, now brushed and smoothed down. He wore his fine maroon robes with black sleeves and cowled shoulders. Silver brocade circled the cuffs, while gold brocade ran around the neck and down the front. A red satin belt with a gold buckle gathered the outfit at his waist. Addie stood beside him, wearing her simple sorceress's robes with their yellow and red beads at the neckline. Somehow the contrast looked as grand. Verna wore a rich violet dress done up with gold stitching at the square neckline. The intricate gold needlework ran down the tight sleeves, showing under slashed sham sleeves tied at the elbow with gold ribbon. The delicate smocking over the midriff, extending in a funnel shape down into a gourd skirt, flaring nearly to the floor. Verna's wavy brown hair was festooned with blue, gold, and crimson flowers the sisters had made from little pieces of silk. With her serene smile, she made a beautiful sorceress bride standing beside the handsome blonde groom in his violet wizard's robes. Everyone seemed to lean in a little as the ceremony reached the climax. Do you, Verna, take this wizard to be your husband for life? Zed went on in a clear tone that carried out over the crowd. Mindful of his gift and duty to it, and swear to both love and honor him without pause for as long as you live? I do, Verna said in a silken voice. 
Do you, Warren, Addie said, her voice all the more raspy in contrast to Verna's. Take this sorceress to be your wife for life, mindful of her gift and duty to it, and swear to both love and honor her without pause for as long as you live? I do, Warren said in a confident tone. Then it being of your free will, I accept you, sorceress, as being agreeable, and give my joyful blessing to this union. Zed raised outstretched arms up into the air. I ask the good spirits to smile on this woman's oath. Then it being of your free will, I accept you, wizard, as being agreeable, and give my joyful blessing to this union. Addie raised outstretched arms up into the air. I ask the good spirits to smile on this man's oath. The four of them crossed their arms and joined hands. With heads bowed, the air in the center of their circle glowed with the living light shining on the Union. The brilliant flare sent a golden ray skyward, as if carrying the oath to the good spirits. Together, Zed and Addie said, From this time forward, you are forever joined as husband and wife, both by oath, by love, and now by gift. The magical light dissolved from the bottom up until it was but a solitary star directly above them in an empty late afternoon sky. In the silent winter air, tens of thousands of spellbound eyes watched a trembling Verna meet Warren's kiss to seal a wedding unlike any they were likely to ever see again, the marriage of a sorceress and a wizard, bound by more than any mere oath, bound also by a covenant of magic. When Verna and Warren parted, both bearing broad smiles, the crowd went wild. Cheers along with hats rose into the air. Both beaming, Verna and Warren joined hands after they turned to the soldiers. They waved with their free arms high in the air. Soldiers cheered, applauded, and whistled as if it were their own sister or best friend who was just married. The voices of the choir then built in an extended note that reverberated through the trees all around. It made Kalin's skin tingle with the quality of its haunting tone. The sound brought a reverent hush to the valley. Kara leaned close to Kalin and whispered in astonishment that the choir was singing an ancient Daharan wedding ceremonial song, the origin of which went back thousands of years. Since the men had gone off to practice alone, Kalin hadn't heard it before the wedding. It was so powerful it swept her emotions away with the rise and fall of the joined voices. Verna and Warren stood on the edge of the platform, likewise gripped by the achingly beautiful song to their union. Flutes joined in, and then drums. The soldiers, mostly Daharan, smiled as they listened to the music they knew well. It struck Kalin then, since she had so long thought of Dahara as an enemy land, that she had never really thought of Daharans as having traditions that could be meaningful or stirring or beloved. Kalin glanced over at Kara, standing beside her smiling distantly as she listened to the music. There was an entire land of Dahara that was largely a mystery to Kalin. She had only seen their soldiers. She knew nothing of their women, other than the Mord Sith, and they were hardly typical, or their children, or their homes, or their customs. She had come to think of them as joined together at last, but she now realized that they were a people she didn't know, a people with their own heritage. It's beautiful, Kalin whispered to Kara. Kara nodded blissfully, carried away on the strains of music that was an old acquaintance to her and an exotic wonder to Kalin. As the choir came to the end of their tribute to the newly wedded couple, Verna reached back and squeezed Kalin's hand. It was an apology of sorts, an acknowledgment of how difficult this ceremony must be for Kalin. Refusing to let that hurt tarnish this joyous event, Kalin beamed at Verna's quick glance. She came forward, standing behind Warren and Verna with an arm around each. The noise of the crowd trailed off so Kalin could speak. These two people belong together. Perhaps they always have. Now they forever shall be. May the good spirits be with them always. With one voice, the entire crowd repeated the prayer. I want to thank Verna and Warren from the bottom of my heart, Kalin said as she gazed out at the tens of thousands of faces watching for reminding us what life is really about. There is no more eloquent demonstration of the simple yet deep meaning of our cause than this wedding today. Heads as far as she could see bobbed in agreement. Now, Kalin called out, who wants to see these two have the first dance? 
The men cheered and hooted as they spread back to open up the central area. Musicians lined up along the benches at the sides. As they waited for Verna and Warren to make their way down to the dance area, Kalen draped an arm over Zed's shoulder and kissed his cheek. This is the best idea you ever had, wizard. He took her in with hazel eyes that seemed to see all the way to a person's soul. Are you all right, dear one? I know this has to be hard. Kalen nodded, holding her grin firmly in place. I'm fine. It has to be hard on you twice over. A smile took him unexpectedly. There you go again, Mother Confessor, worrying about others. Kalen watched a laughing Verna and Warren arm in arm, dancing lightly across the open area, ringed by applauding soldiers. When they're done, Kalen asked, and after you've given your first to Addie, would you dance with me, sir? Stand in for him? I'm sure he would want that. Kalen couldn't bring herself to say his name at that moment, or the spell of the joyful celebration would have been broken. Zed lifted an eyebrow with playful delight. What makes you think I can dance? Kalen laughed. Because there isn't anything you can't do. I be able to name a number of things this skinny old man can't do, Addie said with a smile as she shuffled up behind him. When the dance was done and others began joining in as the newly married couple began the second, Zed and Addie went out in the ring to have a dance and show the young people how it was done. Kalen stood at the edge of the circle with Kara close at her side. General Myfert, laughing and shaking men's hands, slapping others on the back, made his way over. Mother Confessor! He was pushed up close by the press of the crowd. Mother Confessor, this is a wonderful day, isn't it? Have you ever seen the likes of it? Kalen couldn't help but to smile at his delight. No, General Myfert, I don't think I have. He glanced briefly at Kara. He stood awkwardly a moment, then turned to watch the dancing. Despite how well the men had come to know her, Kalen was still a confessor, a woman people feared to be near, much less touch. No one was likely to ask a confessor to dance. Or a moored Sith. General, Kalen asked, tapping him on the back of his shoulder. General, could you do me a great personal favor? Well, of course, Mother Confessor, he stammered. Anything. What is it I can do? Kalen gestured out at the dance area and the soldiers and sisters ringing it. Would you please dance? I know we're supposed to be on guard for any mischief, but I think it would let the men see the true festive nature of this party were their general to go out there and dance. Dance? Yes, please. But I, that is, I don't know who... Oh, do please stop trying to get out of it. Kalen turned as if suddenly struck with the thought. Kara! Would you go out there with him and dance so his men will see that it's all right to join in? Kara's blue eyes shifted between Kalen and the general. Well, I don't see how... Do it for me, please, Kara. Kalen turned back to the general. I believe I heard someone mention that your given name is Benjamin? He scratched his temple. That's right, Mother Confessor. Kalen turned back to Kara. Kara, Benjamin here needs a partner for a dance. How about you, please? Do it for me. Kara cleared her throat. Well, all right. For you, then, Mother Confessor. And don't break his ribs or anything. We have need of his talents. Kara scowled back over her shoulder as a smiling Benjamin led her away. Kalen folded her arms and grinned as she watched the man take Kara in his arms. It was just about a perfect day. Just about. Kalen was watching Benjamin gracefully swirl Carla around and other soldiers pulling suddenly shy sisters out of the line at the edge of the dance area when Captain Ryan stumbled up. He straightened before her. Mother Confessor, uh, well, we've been through a lot together, and if I'm not being too forward, could I ask you to, you know, dance? Kalen blinked in surprise at the tall, young, broad Galean. Why, yes, Bradley, I would love to dance with you. I would love it, but only if you promise me not to hold me like I'm made of glass. I don't want to look foolish out there. He grinned and nodded. All right. She placed one hand in his and laid the other over his shoulder. He put his big hand to the side of her waist under her open fur mantle and twirled her out amid the merrymakers. Kalen smiled and laughed as she endured it. She thought of spirit and willed herself to remember that kind of strength, and she was able to relax and take the party for what it was, 
and not think about what was missing as another man held her in his arms, if timidly. Bradley, you're a wonderful dancer. Pride shined in his eyes. She felt him loosen up and let the music flow more smoothly through his movements. Kalen caught sight of Kara and Benjamin not far away, doing their best to dance and not look at each other. When he whirled her around him, his arms securely holding her waist, Kara's long blonde braid sailed out behind her. Then Kalen actually saw Kara look up into Benjamin's blue eyes and smile. Kalen was relieved when the song ended and Captain Ryan was replaced for the next dance by Zed. She held him close as she moved to a slower tune with him. I'm proud of you, Mother Confessor. You gave a wonderful thing to these men. And what is that? Your heart. He tilted his head. See them watching you? You've given them courage. You've given them a reason to believe in what they're doing. Kalin lifted an eyebrow. You trickster, you. You may fool others, but not me. It is you who has given me heart. Zed only smiled. You know, not since the very first confessor has a man ever again figured out how to love such a woman without her power destroying him. I'm glad it was my grandson who accomplished such an exploit, and that it was for his love of you. I love you as a granddaughter, Kalen, and look forward to the day when you are back with my grandson. Kalen held Zed close, resting her head against his shoulder as they both danced on with their memories. As the dancing went on, the golden setting sun was finally replaced by torches and warm fires. Sisters changed partners after each dance, and still there were jovial men lined up out of sight waiting a turn, and not just with the younger, more attractive sisters. Cook's helpers set out simple fare on food tables, sampling some and joking with the soldiers as they went about their task. Between dances, Warren and Verna tried the variety of food from different tables. Kalen danced once more with Captain Ryan and once more with Zed, but then busied herself speaking to officers and soldiers alike so she wouldn't have to dance with anyone should anyone feel awkward about asking her, yet work up the nerve. She was more able to enjoy the festivities without having to dance. As she was greeting a line of young officers and they were telling her how much they appreciated the party, someone tapped Kalen on the shoulder. She turned to a smiling Warren. Mother Confessor, I would be honored were you to have a dance with me. Kalen noticed Verna dancing with Zed. This was one dance that would be different. Warren, I would love to dance with a handsome groom. He moved smoothly with her, not at all haltingly as she had expected. He seemed to be blissfully at peace and not nervous about the crush of people or the men constantly clapping him on the back or the joking remarks from some of the sisters. Mother Confessor, I just wanted to thank you for making this the best day I've ever had. Kalen smiled up into his young face, his ageless eyes. Warren, thank you for agreeing to this big party. I know it's not the sort of thing that fits you. Oh, but it is. That's just it. People used to call me the mole. They did? Why? Because I used to stay down in the vaults all the time studying the prophecies. It wasn't just that I liked to study the books. I was afraid to come out. But you finally did. He turned her in time with a sweep of music. Richard brought me out. He did? I never knew that. In a way, you've helped add to what he started. Warren smiled distantly. I just wanted to thank you. I know how much I miss him and how much Verna misses him. I know the men miss their Lord Rahl. Kalen was only able to nod. And I know how much you miss your husband. That's why I wanted to thank you for giving us this and the gift of your grace despite your heartache. Everyone here feels it with you. Please know that while you miss him, you are not alone and are among those who love him, too. Kalen smiled and managed to get out a thank you. As they danced across the open area, laughing at the merry tune and the awkward steps of some of the soldiers, the music abruptly trailed off. It was then that she heard the horns. Alarms swept through the assembled soldiers as men ran for their weapons until one of the sentries sprinted in, waving his arm, calling out for everyone to stand down that it was friendly forces. Puzzled, Kalen stretched her neck along with everyone else trying to see. They had no forces out. She had let them all be present to enjoy the wedding party. The crowd parted as horses trotted through the throng. Kalen's eyebrows went up and her jaw dropped. The distinguished General Baldwin 
commander of all Keltish forces, was at the fore, riding a handsome chestnut gelding. He brought the horse to a smart halt. He ran his first finger along the length of his white-flecked dark mustache as he took in the crowd gathered in around him. His graying black hair grew down over his ears and his pate shone through on top. He was a striking figure in his serge cape, fastened on one shoulder with two buttons, allowing it to show the rich green silk lining. His tan surcoat was decorated with a heraldic emblem slashed through with a diagonal black line dividing a yellow and blue shield. The man's high boots were rolled down below his knees, long black gauntlets, their flared cuffs lying over the front, were tucked behind a wide belt set with an ornate buckle. The press of men made way for Kalin to step through. General! He lifted a hand in his noble manner, a smile spreading wide. Mother Confessor, how good to see you! Kalin started to speak, but horses charged through, the crowd falling back for them. They stormed into the dance area like a wind-borne fire, a dozen moored sif in red leather. One of the women leaped from her horse. Rika! Kara called out. The woman's bold glare swept over the gathered people. She finally settled her gaze, taking in Kara. Kara moved out of General Myford's arms. Kara, she said as a way of greeting. She glanced around. Where is Hanya? Kara stepped closer. Hanya, she's not here. The woman pressed her lips together in disappointment. I thought as much. When I never received word back, I feared we had lost her. Still, I was hoping. Kalin stepped forward, a little miffed that the woman saw fit to step in front of General Baldwin. Rika, is it? Ah, Rika said, a knowing smile stealing onto her face. You could be none other than Lord Rao's wife, the mother confessor. I recognize the description. The woman saluted casually with a fist to her heart. Yes, I am Rika. I am glad to have you here and your sisters of the Aegeal. I came from Aidendril as soon as Berdine received your letter. It explained a lot. She and I discussed it and decided I should come with some of my sisters to help in our effort. I left six sister Mord Sith with Berdine to watch over Aidendril and the wizard's keep. I also brought 20,000 troops. She lifted a thumb, pointing with it behind her. We met up with the general here a week back. We can certainly use your help. That was wise of Berdine. I know how eager she was to come herself, but she knows the city and the keep. I'm glad she followed my instructions. Kalin settled her most unsettling mother-confessor gaze on Rika. Now, if you don't mind, you interrupted General Baldwin. Kara shoved Rika, pushing her back out of the way. We need to talk, Rika, before you're up to the task of serving Lord Rawl and his wife, who just happens to be a sister of the Aegeal. Rika lifted an eyebrow in surprise. Really? How could... Later, Kara said with a smile before Rika could get herself into any more trouble, moving the woman and her sister Mord Sith back. Zed, Addy, and Verna eased closer to Kalin. General Baldwin, now off his horse, stepped forward at last and went to a knee in a bow. My queen, Mother Confessor! Rise, my child, Kalin said in formal answer, as the camp looked on with the same rapt attention they had devoted to the wedding. This had important bearing on them, too. The general rose to his feet. I came as soon as I received your letter, Mother Confessor. How many men did you bring? He looked surprised by the question. Why, all of them. One hundred seventy thousand men. When my queen asks for an army, I bring her one. Whispers spread through the men as they passed word back. Kalin was stunned. She no longer even felt the cold. That's wonderful, General. They are sorely needed. We have a real fight on our hands, as I explained in my letter. The Imperial Order is getting reinforcements all the time. We need to cut those lines. I understand. With the Daharans from Aidendril come with us, we can just about triple the size of your force down here. And we can still bring more in from Dahara, General Myford said. Kalin felt the hot spark of faith in their chances swelling within her breast. By spring, for sure, we will need them. She cocked her head at General Baldwin. What about Lieutenant Lydon? Who? Oh, you must mean Sergeant Lydon. He only has a scout patrol now. When a man deserts his queen, he's lucky to keep his head, but he acted to protect her people, so I sent him to guard some remote pass. I hope the man dresses warmly. Kalin wanted to throw her arms around the dashing General Baldwin. 
Instead, she touched her fingers to his arm in a gesture of her gratitude. Thank you, General. We surely need the men. Well, they're up country a little ways, half a day back. Couldn't fit them all in here with your army. That's fine. Kaylin waggled her fingers, calling the Mord Sith forward. I'm very glad to see you, too, Rika. With Mord Sith, we can better handle the enemy gifted. We may even be able to turn the tide. Kara here has helped eliminate some of the gifted already, but I'm afraid that Lord Rahl has her under orders to protect me. She will continue in that capacity. But you will be free to go after their gifted. Rika bowed. Love to. She came up and smiled. Berdine warned me about her, she said under her breath to Kara. You should listen to Berdine, Kara said, clapping her on the back. Come, I'll help you find some quarters. No, Kalin said, stopping them in their tracks. This is a party. The general, Rika, and her sisters are invited. In fact, I insist. Well, Rika said, brightening, as long as we're protecting Lord Rao's wife, we would be only too happy to stay. Kalin took Rika's arm and pulled her close. Rika, we have a lot of men here and few women. This is a dance. Get out there and dance. What? Are you out of your... Kaylin shoved her out into the dance area. She snapped her fingers at the musicians. Shall we resume? She turned to General Baldwin. General, you have come at a wonderful time, a time of celebration. Please, would you dance with me? Mother Confessor! I am your queen also. Generals dance with queens, do they not? He smiled and offered his arm. Of course they do, my queen. Long after it was dark, the wedding procession made its way through the makeshift streets, greeting all the men. Thousands of soldiers congratulated Warren and Verna on their marriage, offered jesting advice, a gentle slap on the back, or just a merry wave. Kalin recalled a time when the Midlands feared these men. Under Dark and Raw, they were a formidable invader, inspiring dread and terror. She was amazed at how civil these men could be, how human when given a chance. It was Richard, really, who had given them that chance. She knew that many of them understood that and appreciated it. When finally they reached the end of the long, winding walk through the sprawling camp, they came at last to the tent Verna and Warren thought was to be theirs. Those following along bid the couple a good night and wandered back to the party, leaving the three of them alone. Rather than let Verna and Warren slow... Kalin stepped between them, took each under an arm, and guided them onto the path among the towering trees. Moonlight through the boughs cast wavering patterns on the snow. Not knowing what she was up to, neither Verna nor Warren protested as Kalin kept them moving. Finally, Kalin spotted the lodge off through the trees. She stopped a little distance away to let them see the candlelight coming from behind the lace-like curtain. The juxtaposition against life in an army camp made it look all the more romantic. This is a long and difficult struggle, Kalin told them. Starting a marriage under these conditions is a harsh burden. I can't tell you how happy I am that you two chose to go forward with it at a time like this. It means a great deal to all of us. We're all very happy for you. More than anything, I would like to thank you both for choosing life in all its glory. We will one day have to move on, as surely the order will move again when spring comes, if not before. But for now... I want this place to be yours. I can give you at least this much, this little piece of a normal life together. Verna unexpectedly burst into tears and buried her face in Kalin's shoulder. Kalin patted the prelate's heaving back, chuckling at how out of character it was for Verna to show such emotion. Not a good idea, Verna, to let your new husband see you cry just as he's about to take you to his bed. That did it, and Verna laughed, too. She gripped Kalin's shoulders as she searched her eyes. I don't know what to say. Kalin kissed her cheek. Love each other, be good to each other, and treasure being together. That's what I would like more than anything. Warren hugged her, whispering his thanks in her ear. Kalin watched as he led Verna the remaining distance to the lodge. At the door, both turned and waved. At the last moment, Warren swept Verna off her feet. Her lilting laugh drifted among the trees as he carried her through the doorway. Alone, Kalin turned back to the camp. Chapter 44 The door opened a crack. One bloodshot eye peered out into the dingy hall. You have a room? My wife and I are looking for a room. Before the man could close the door, Richard quickly added, We were told you had one. What of it? Despite it being self-evident, Richard answered politely, 
We've no place to stay. Why bring your problems to me? Richard could hear angry words going back and forth between a man and woman upstairs. Behind several of the doors in the hall, babies wailed without pause. The heavy odor of rancid oil hung in the dank air. Out the door at the back, standing open to the narrow alley, young children, being chased by older children, squealed as they ran through the cold rain. Richard spoke without expectation into the narrow slit. We need a room. A dog not far up the alleyway barked with monotonous persistence. Lots of people need a room. I only have one. I can't give it to you. Nietzsche eased Richard aside and put her face close to the crack. We have the money for the first week. She shoved her hand against the door when he started to shut it. It's a public room. Your duty is to help the public get rooms. The man shouldered his weight into the door, shutting it in her face. Richard turned away as Nietzsche began knocking. Forget it, he said. Let's go get a loaf of bread. Nietzsche usually followed his lead without admonishment, challenge, or even comment. But this time, instead of minding him, she rapped persistently on the door. Layers of peeling paint, every color from blue to yellow to red, fell from under her knuckles. It's your duty, Nietzsche called to the closed door. You've no right to turn us away. No answer came. We're going to report you. The door opened a crack again. The eye glared out with menace. Has he a job? No, but you go away, the both of you, or I'll report you. For what might I ask? Look, lady, I got a room, but I got to keep it for people at the top of the list. How do you know we're not at the top of the list? Because if you were, you would have said so first off and showed me the approval you got with a seal on it. People at the head of the list have been waiting a long time for a place. You're no better than a thief trying to take the place of a good citizen who's followed the law. Now go away, or I will take down your names for the lodging inspector. The door slammed shut again. The threat of having their names taken down appeared to take some of the fight out of Nietzsche. She huffed a sigh as they walked away, the bowed floor creaking and groaning underfoot. At least they had been able to get in out of the rain for a brief time. We will have to keep looking, she told him. If you had a job first, it would probably help. Maybe tomorrow you can look for a job while I keep looking for a room. Out in the cold rain once more, they crossed the muddy street to the cobbled walkway on the other side. There were yet more places to check, though Richard didn't hold out any hope of getting a room. They'd had doors shut in their faces more times than he could count. Nietzsche wanted a room, though, so they kept looking. The weather was unusually cold for this far south in the old world, Nietzsche had told him. People said the cold spell and rain would soon pass. A few days before, it had been muggy and warm, so Richard had no reason to doubt their judgment. It was disorienting for him to see woods and fields of lush green vegetation in the dead of winter. There were some trees with limbs bare for the season, but most were in full leaf. As far south as they were in the old world, it never got cold enough for water to freeze. People only blinked dumbly when he spoke of snow. When Richard explained snow as flakes of frozen white water that fell from the sky and covered the ground with a cottony blanket, some people turned huffy thinking he was making a joke at their expense. He knew that back home winter would be raging. Despite the turmoil around him, Richard felt an inner tranquility knowing that Kalin was most likely to be warm and snug in the house he had built. In that light, nothing in his new life was of enough importance to distress him. She had food to eat, firewood to keep her warm, and Kara for company. For now, she was safe. Winter was wearing on, and in spring she would be able to leave. But for now, Richard was confident that she was safe. That and his thoughts and memories of her were his only solace. People without rooms huddled in the alleyways, using whatever scrap of solid material they could find to prop up over themselves for a roof. Walls were fashioned from sodden blankets. He supposed that he and Nietzsche could continue to do the same, but he feared Nietzsche falling ill in the cold and wet, feared that then Kalin too would fall ill. Nietzsche checked the paper she carried. These places on this register they gave us are all supposed to be available for people newly arrived, not just for people on a list. They need workers. They should be more diligent in seeing to it that places are available. Do you see, Richard? Do you see how hard it is for ordinary people to get along in life? Richard, hands shoved in his pockets, shoulders hunched against the wind and rain, asked, So, how do we get on a list? We will have to go to a lodging office and request a room. They can put us on a housing list. 
It sounded simple, but matters were proving far more complex than they sounded. If there aren't enough rooms, how will being on a list get us a place to stay? People die all the time. There's work here. That's why we came. That's why everyone else has come. I'll work hard, and then we can afford to pay more. We still have a little money. We just need to find a place that wants to rent a room for the right price, without all this list foolishness. Really, Richard? Are you that inhumane? How would those less fortunate ever get rooms, then? The order sets the prices to stop profiteers. They make sure there is no favoritism. That makes it fair for all. We just need to get on a list for a room, and then everything will be fine. Watching the glistening cobbles before him as he walked, Richard wondered how long they would be without a place until their name worked its way to the top of a list. It looked to him as if a lot of people would need to die before his and Nietzsche's names came up for a room, with more yet waiting in turn for them to die. He stepped first to one side and then the other to avoid bumping into the river of people swirling past, making their way in the opposite direction while trying to stay out of the mud of the street. He considered again staying outside the city. A lot of people did that. But there were outlaws and desperate people aplenty who preyed on those who were forced to stay out in the open where there were no city guards. Were Nietzsche not opposed to the idea, Richard would have found a place farther out and built a shelter, perhaps with some other people, so that they could together discourage trouble. Nietzsche wasn't interested in the idea. Nietzsche wanted to be in the city. Multitudes came to the city looking for a better life. There were lists to get on and lines to wait in to see official people. You had a better chance of doing those things if you had a room in the city, she said. It was getting late in the day. The line at the bakery was out the door and partway down the block. Why are all these people in line, Richard whispered to Nietzsche. It was the same every day when they went to buy bread. She shrugged. I guess there aren't enough bakeries. Seems like with all the customers, more people would want to open bakeries. Nietzsche leaned close, a scolding scowl darkening her brow. The world isn't as simple as you would like it to be, Richard. It used to be that way in the old world. Man's evil nature was allowed to flourish. People set their own prices for goods, with greed being their only interest, not the good of their fellow man. Only the well-to-do could afford to buy bread. Now the order sees to it that everyone gets needed goods for a fair price. The order cares about everyone not just those with unfair advantages. She always seemed so impassioned when she spoke about the evil nature of people. Richard wondered why a sister of the dark would care about evil, but he didn't bother to ask. The line wasn't moving very fast. The woman in front of him, suspicious of their whispering, scowled back over her shoulder. Richard met her glare with a broad smile. Good afternoon, ma'am. Her somber scowl faltered in the light of his beaming grin. We're new in town, he gestured behind. My wife and I, I'm looking for work. We need a room, though. Would you know how a young couple, strangers to the city, could go about getting a room? She half turned, holding her canvas bag in both hands, letting it pull her arms straight as she leaned her shoulders against the wall. Her bag held only a yellow wedge of cheese. Richard's smile and his friendly conversational tone, artificial though they were, were apparently so out of the ordinary that she seemed unable to maintain her gruff demeanor. You have to have a job if you hope to get a room. There aren't enough rooms in the city, what with all the new workers come for the abundance provided by the wisdom of the order. If you're able-bodied, you need to have work. Then they'll put your name on the list. Richard scratched his head and kept smiling as the line slowly shuffled along. I'm eager to work. Easier to get a room if you can't work, the woman confided. But I thought you just said you had to have a job if you were to have any hope of getting a room. That's true if you're able, like you look to be. Those folks with a greater need because they can't do for themselves are rightly entitled to benevolence and to be put higher on the list. Like my husband, the poor man, he's afflicted terrible-like with consumption. I'm so sorry, Richard said. She nodded with the weight of her burden. It's mankind's wretched lot to suffer. Nothing can be done about it. So there's no use trying. Only in the next life will we get our reward. In this life, it's the duty of every person with ability to help those unfortunate souls with needs. In that way, the able earn their reward in the next life. Richard didn't argue. She shook a finger at him. Those who can work owe it to those who can't to do their best for the good of all. 
I can work, Richard assured her. We're from a little place. We're simple folks from farming stock. We don't know much about how to go about things like getting work in the city. The order has brought the people a great abundance of work, a man behind Nietzsche said, drawing Richard's attention. The man's oiled canvas coat was buttoned tight at his throat. His big brown eyes blinked slowly like a cow as it chewed its cud. The way his jaw wobbled sideways as he spoke only added to the impression. The order welcomes all workers to our struggle, but you must be mindful of the needs of others, as the creator himself wishes, and go about getting work in the proper fashion. Richard, his stomach grumbling with hunger, listened as the man explained. You first need to belong to a citizen workers group. They protect the rights of citizens of the order. You'll have to go before a review assembly for approval to join the workers group and a fitness panel to hear from a spokesman from the workers' citizen group who can vouch for you. You must do this before you can go for a job. Why can't I just go to a place and show myself? Why can't they hire me if I fit their needs? Just because you're from the country, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be mindful of contributing toward the greater good of the order. Of course not, Richard said. I've always worked for myself, though, farming to bring food to my fellow man, as is our duty. I don't know how businesses do things. The big brown eyes paused their blinking. The man peered suspiciously for a moment. Then his eyes finally went moony again. His jaw resumed its wobbling as he chewed his words. It's the primary responsibility of business to be sensitive to the needs of the people, to contribute to the public welfare, to be equitable. The review board helps see to this. There is much more involved than the narrow goals of businesses. I see, Richard said. Well, I'd be grateful if you could tell me how to go about it properly. He glanced briefly at Nietzsche. I want to be a good citizen and do things right. By the man's pride in the explanation and the way his big eyes blinked faster as he laid it all out, Richard expected that the man was somehow involved in the labyrinthine process. Richard didn't ask how you got a spokesman from the citizen workers group to vouch for you. The line inched forward as the man explained the finer details of different sorts of work, what each required, and how it was all for the benefit of those living within the order and under the grace of the Creator. As he droned on, delivering his information with smug satisfaction, Nietzsche watched Richard discreetly and without comment as he listened to the procedures. She looked as if she was expecting him to suddenly turn from polite to deadly. Richard knew there could be no point to a battle with this man, so he remained polite. It turned out that the man, named Mr. Gudgeons, seemed to know the most about the quarry workers. Since Richard knew little about quarries, he passed the time as they stood in line by asking a few questions that pleased Mr. Gudgeons to answer, at great length. The store ran out of bread and closed before they got any. The line of people dissolved into the downpour, mumbling to one another as they went about their woeful lot in life. Richard thanked the woman and Mr. Gudgeons before he and Nietzsche moved on. Richard paused at a cross street while Nietzsche studied her paper with the list of rooms. All around the blocky shapes of buildings rose out of the gloom. Red paint on the side of one brick building was so faded that it left the figure painted there looking like a blushing ghost. The faded whitewash of words beneath the vanishing man were no longer legible. Passing men gazed at Nietzsche in her wet, clinging clothes, never seeing her face. Her hair was plastered to her skull, her jaw quivered, and her hands trembled, yet she didn't complain about the cold, as did everyone else. They had been told that they couldn't get another list with any new rooms that might have recently become available until the next day, so Nietzsche was trying to keep this one whole, but in the rain it was a losing battle. Mangy horses slogged through the mud, some of the wagons they pulled squeaking and groaning under the weight of a load. Only the main thoroughfares, like the one they were on, were wide enough to allow teams of horses and full-size wagons to easily pass in both directions. Some streets were only wide enough for wagons to go in one direction. Some of those, with no room to pull aside, were choked off by broken-down wagons. Richard saw a dead horse in one narrow street, the rotting animal attended by a cloud of flies still hitched to its wagon as it awaited someone to come haul it away. The blocked street only added to the congestion of the others. 
Some streets were wide enough only for hand carts. In many of the narrower passageways, only foot traffic could fit. The smell of garbage and the stench of streets that also functioned as open sewers had been enough to gag Richard for the first week until he'd become numb to it. The alleyways where he and Nietzsche had slept were the worst. The rain only served to flush the filth out of every hole and carry it out into the open, but at least as long as he was standing it washed off some of the dirt. All the cities Richard had seen after they'd entered the old world and traveled south from Tanamura were similar to this one, all suffering under grinding poverty and inhuman conditions. Everything seemed caught in a timeless trap, a morass of rot, as if the cities had once been vibrant with life and people striving to fulfill dreams, had once been places of hope and ambition, but somewhere the dreams had disintegrated into a gray pall of stagnation and decay. No one seemed to much care. Everyone seemed in a daze, biding their time, waiting for their lot in life to improve without even having a concept of the shape of that better life or how it might come to be. They existed on disembodied faith, confident only that the afterlife would be perfect. The cities Richard had seen were startlingly similar to what Richard envisioned the future held for the new world, under the yoke of the order. This place, though, was the single largest city Richard had ever seen. He would never have believed the size of it had he not seen it himself. Dilapidated buildings entangled by streets teeming with people sprawled over a sweep of low hills across a broad bottom land for miles along the convergence of two rivers. Squat ramshackle huts built haphazardly of wattle and daub, scraps of wood or salvaged mud and straw bricks beset the city's core to a great distance out into the surrounding land like fetid scum surrounding a rotting log in a stagnant pond. It was the city of Alturang, the namesake of the land which was now the heart of the old world and the imperial order, the home city of Emperor Jagang. When they had first entered the old world on their way south toward Alturang, Richard and Nietzsche had stopped at the northernmost large city in the old world, Tanamura, where the palace of the prophets had once stood. Tanamura, one of the last places in the old world to fall under the rule of the imperial order, was a grand place, with wide boulevards lined with trees and ornate buildings soaring several stories high, faced with columns and arches and windows that let in the light. Tanamura, as large as it was, turned out to be but an outpost of the old world, far enough away that the rot was only now reaching it. For a span of a little over a month, Richard had found work in Tanamura as a mason's tender, one of a dozen hauling stone and mixing mortar for a squat, unattractive building. The masons had simple huts the workers and their families lived in, so Nietzsche had shelter. The master came to trust Richard to keep up with his masons. When one of the stone cutters fell sick, Richard was asked to stand in at squaring the blocks of granite for the masons. He found holding a chisel and mallet in his hands, cutting stone, shaping it to his will, a revelation. In some ways, it was like carving wood, but somehow much more. From time to time, the master stood with fists on his hips, watching Richard chisel square edges into the hard granite. Occasionally, in a gruff voice, he would make minor corrections to Richard's method. After a time, as the master saw that Richard took to the job and could cut a block square and true, he no longer bothered watching. Before long, Richard's blocks were chosen first by the masons as cornerstones. Other stone cutters arrived to do more demanding work, the adornments. When they had first shown up, Richard had been eager to see their work. They cut into the face of blocks, meant to surround the entrance, a large flame representing the light of the Creator. Below that, they carved a crowd of cowering people. Richard had seen a number of stone carvings in the various palaces he had been, from the Confessor's Palace in Adendril to the People's Palace in Dahara, but he had never seen anything like the figures he saw being cut on that building in Tanamura. They were not graceful or grand or inspiring, but just the opposite. They were distorted, thick-limbed, cringing figures, recoiling below the light, Richard was told by one of the artisans that this was the only proper representation of mankind, profane, hideous, sinful. Richard kept his mind on cutting square stones. When the stonework to the order's headquarters building was finished, the job ended. 
the carpenters didn't need any more help. The artisans said they could use some assistance carving the anguish of mankind and offered Richard the work. He declined, telling them that he had no ability for carving. Besides, Nietzsche had been eager to move on. Tanamura had only been a place to earn some money to buy provisions for the long journey ahead of them. Richard was glad to be away from the depressing sight of the carving going on. Along the way southeast to Alturang, in the cities they passed through, Richard saw many carvings on buildings, and many more freestanding in public squares or in front of entrances. They depicted horrors. People being whipped by a grinning keeper of the underworld, people stabbing out their own eyes, suffering people twisted, deformed, and crippled, people like packs of dogs running on all fours attacking women and children, people reduced to walking skeletons or covered in sores, woeful people throwing themselves into graves. In most such scenes, the pitiful people were watched over by the light of the all-perfect creator represented by the flame. The old world was a celebration of misery. Along the way south, they had stopped in a number of cities when Richard could find menial work temporary enough not to require waiting on lists. He and Nietzsche went for stretches eating cabbage soup that was mostly water. Sometimes they had rice or lentils or buckwheat mush, and on occasion the luxury of salt pork. Sometimes Richard was able to catch fish, birds, or the odd hare. Living off the land in the old world, though, was difficult. A lot of other people had the same idea. They both had gotten thinner on their long march. Richard began to understand the carvings of the skeletal people. Nietzsche had set their destination, but dictated little else, leaving most decisions to him, complying without complaint. Week in and week out, they walked, occasionally paying a few copper pennies to ride in wagons headed their way. They crossed rivers straddled by cities large enough to have numbers of stone bridges and went through town after town. There were vast fields of wheat, millet, sunflower, and any number of other crops, though much of the land lay fallow. They saw flocks of sheep and herds of cattle. Farmers sold the travelers goat cheese and milk. Ever since the gift had awakened in him, Richard was able to eat meat only when not doing any fighting. He thought it might be part of the requirement to balance his need to sometimes take life. Since he wasn't doing any fighting, he could eat meat without it making him sick. Unfortunately, they could rarely afford meat. Cheese, which he had once loved, he could hardly stomach since his gift had come to life in him. Unfortunately, it was often eat cheese or starve. But it was the size of the old world, and in particular its population, that most unsettled him. Richard had naively thought that the new and the old worlds must be somewhat alike. They were not. The new world was but a flea on the back of the old. From time to time on their journey south, vast columns of men-at-arms moved past them on their way north to the Midlands. Several times it had taken days for all the soldiers to march past. Whenever he saw the rank upon rank of troops, he felt a wave of relief that Kalin was trapped in their mountain home. He would hate to think of her fighting in an army facing as many men as he saw going to the war. By spring, when she could finally get out of the mountain home, and all those Imperial Order troops could truly begin their siege of the New World, whatever resistance the Daharan Empire put up would be crushed. Richard hoped General Rybish chose not to go up against the Order. He hated to think of all those brave men being slaughtered under the weight of the coming onslaught. At one small city, Nietzsche had gone to a stream to wash their clothes while Richard worked the day mucking out stalls at a large stable. A number of officials had come to town, and there were more horses than the stable master could handle. Richard had been at the right place at the right time to get the job. Not long after the officials arrived and took all the rooms at the inns, a large unit of the Imperial Order troops marched in behind them and set up camp at the city limits. Fortunately, Nietzsche was on the other side of the city doing their washing. Unfortunately, a squad of men passing through the city and doing some drinking decided to accept volunteers. Richard kept his head down as he carried water to the horses, but the sergeant saw him. At the wrong place at the wrong time, Richard was volunteered into the Imperial Order. The new volunteers were quartered in the center of the immense encampment. That night, after it was dark and most of the men were asleep, Richard unvolunteered himself. It took him until three hours before sunrise to extract himself from his service to the Imperial Order. 
Nietzsche had gone to the stable and found out what had happened to him. Richard found her at their camp, pacing in the darkness. They quickly collected their things and marched south for the rest of the night. They went cross-country, since the moon was out, rather than on the roads, in case a patrol came looking for him. From then on, whenever Richard saw soldiers, he did his best to become invisible. In general, though, it wasn't a serious concern. Hordes of youths, lusting after the promise of plunder, were only too eager to join the army. They often had to wait weeks or months to be accepted into training, so many were the numbers joining. Richard had seen crowds of them in the cities, playing games, gambling, drinking, fighting, young men dreaming of the glory of killing the evil foes of the great empire of the order. They enjoyed the adoration of the populace when they joined the army to go off and fight the frightful wickedness and sin that was said to infect the new world. Richard was horrified to see the numbers of people living in the old world because it meant that the order's army already in the new world was hardly a drain on the populace, and only the beginning. He had thought that perhaps the order might lose their enthusiasm for a war conducted so far from their homeland, or that the people of the old world would tire of the hardship necessary to conduct such a war. He now knew that thought had been but a feeble daydream. It didn't take a wizard or a prophet to know that the armies the new world could raise, even given wildly optimistic conditions, had no hope whatsoever of prevailing against the millions upon millions of soldiers Richard had seen pouring north, to say nothing of the ones he hadn't seen who would be taking other routes. The Midlands was doomed. Ever since the people of Andereth chose the order over freedom, he had known in his heart that the new world was going to fall to the order. He felt no satisfaction in realizing how right he had been. Seeing the size of the enemy, he realized that freedom was lost, and resisting the order was but suicide. The course of events seemed irrevocable. The world lost to the order. The future for him and Kalin seemed no less hopeless. By far the strangest place he and Nietzsche had visited in their journey southeast, a place she never spoke of afterward, had been less than a week south of Tanamora. Richard had still been in a dismal mood thinking about the carvings he had seen when Nietzsche took an old, seldom-used track off the main road. It led back toward the hills to a rather small city beside a quiet river. Most of the businesses had been abandoned. The wind at will carried dust through the broken windows of warehouses. Many of the homes had fallen to ruin. Their roofs caved in, weeds and vines doing their best to bring down crooked walls. Only the homes on the outskirts were still occupied, mostly by people raising animals and farming the surrounding land. On the northern side of the city, one small store remained to sell staples to surrounding farmers. There was also a leather shop, a fortune teller, and a lonely inn. In the center of town stood the bones of buildings long since picked clean by scavengers. Several of the buildings still stood, but most had long ago collapsed. Richard and Nietzsche walked through the center of town, watched only by a fitful wind. At the southern edge, they arrived at the remains of what had once been a large brick building. Without a word, Nietzsche turned off the road and marched deliberately into the forlorn site. The wood beams and roof had been consumed by fire. A thick mat of weeds and brush were devouring the wood floor. The brick walls were all that was left, really, and they were mostly fallen to rubble, with only a portion of the east wall still tall enough to contain a low window frame. The wind ruffled Nietzsche's sunlit hair as she looked down the length of the skeletal remains of the building. Her arms languid at her sides, her back not quite as straight as it usually was. She stood vulnerable where once a roof would have sheltered her. For nearly an hour she was lost among the ghosts. Richard stood off to the side, leaning a hip against the charred remains of part of a workbench, one of the only things left inside the brick frame. Do you know this place? he finally asked her. She blinked at his question. She stared into his eyes for a long time as if he too were a ghost. She stepped close to him then, her blue eyes finally looking away to let her fingers reminisce as they glided lightly over the remains of the workbench. I grew up in this town she answered in a distant voice. Oh, Richard gestured around them. And this place? They made armor here, she whispered. He couldn't imagine why she would want to see such a place. Armor? The best armor in all the land, double-proofed standard. Kings and noblemen came here to buy armor. 
Richard gazed around at the ruins of the place, wondering what more there must be to the story. Did you know the man who made the armor? Her blue eyes, seeing ghosts again, she shook her head. No, she whispered. I'm so sorry, but I never knew him. A tear ran down her cheek to drip off her smooth jaw. She seemed very much a child at that moment, alone in the world and frightened. Had he not known what he knew about her, Richard would have put his arms around this forlorn, frail child and comforted her. Chapter 45 Nietzsche was tired, cold, and impatient. She wanted a room. Her purpose in guiding Richard to the center of the empire in all to wrong was to bring him face to face with the righteous cause of the order. She knew Richard to be a man of profound moral integrity, and she wanted to see how he would react when confronted by the undeniable virtue of his enemy's intentions. She wanted Richard to learn how difficult it was for ordinary people to live, to get along in the world. She was curious as to how he would fare in the same circumstances. She wanted to throw him into the fire and see how he reacted to the heat, as it were. She had expected him to be agitated and frustrated by now. He remained cool and unruffled. She thought he would be furious at learning what he had to do to get a job. He was not. He had listened to that Mr. Gudgeon's fellow explaining the near-impossible task that faced anyone wanting work. Nietzsche had expected him to punch the pompous official. Instead, Richard had cheerfully thanked him. It was as if the things he so naively stood for, so selfishly defended when she had known him before, no longer mattered to him. At the Palace of the Prophets, when she had been his teacher, every time she thought she knew how he would react, he did something she would never have anticipated. He did that now, too, but in a subtly different way. What before had been, in a manner of speaking, unorganized youthful rebellion had turned to the dangerous scrutiny of a predator. Only the chains around his heart kept him from turning his claws on her. When Nietzsche had first captured Richard, she had briefly seen, standing in the window of his house, a carving of a proud woman. Nietzsche had known, as sure as she knew night followed day, that Richard had carved it. It betrayed his unique vision, which she recognized. The statue was tangible evidence of a hidden side in his gift. It was a form of balance to his ability for war, yet she detected no magic in it. Knowing that Richard had carved it, Nietzsche expected that he would have been interested in the carving job offered him back in Tanamura. He turned it down. He became moody and hardly spoke for several days afterward. Whenever they went through a new city, she saw him taking in the statues and relief carvings. Since he, too, carved, she expected him to find such creations fascinating. He did not. She couldn't understand it. None were as finely executed as what he had carved, to be sure, but still they were carvings, and she thought he would be at least interested in them. She was baffled by his grim mood whenever he saw them. One time she had taken the two of them out of their way for no reason but to show him a famous city square and the heroic work of art proudly displayed there. It was her thought to bring him a bit of cheer at seeing such a widely heralded work. He was not cheered. Surprised, she had asked him why he appeared to so dislike the sculpture called Tormented Vision. It's death, he had said, with distant revulsion, as he turned away from the widely worshipped work. It was a grand scene of a group of men, some gouging out their eyes after having seen the perfect light of the Creator. Other of the men at the base of the statue, who'd not blinded themselves, were being mauled by underworld beasts. The keeper's minions shrank from the blinded men, wailing at what they had seen before taking their own sight. No, Nietzsche said, trying not to laugh and thereby humiliate him for his unenlightened view. She sought instead to gently rectify his perception of the famous work by explaining it to him. It's a portrayal of the unworthy nature of mankind. It shows men who have just witnessed his perfect light, and in so doing have thus been able to see the hopeless nature of man's depravity. That they would cut out their own eyes shows how perfect the Creator is, that they could no longer bear to look upon themselves. These men in the statue are heroes for showing us that we must not arrogantly endeavor to rise above our corrupt essence, for that would be sinfully comparing ourselves to the Creator. 
It shows that we are but faceless, insignificant parts of a greater whole of mankind, which he created, and thus no single life can hold any importance. This work teaches us that only the society as a whole can be worthwhile. Those at the bottom here who failed to join in with their fellow man and blind themselves are suffering their grim eternal fate at the keeper's hands. Do you see now, it honors mankind as the flawed creature he is in order that we may see that each of us must devote ourselves to the betterment of our fellow man, because that is our only means of doing good and honoring the Creator's creation, us. So you see, it's not about death at all, but about the true nature of life. Nietzsche had been taught that the statue was uplifting for the people, since it confirmed everything they knew to be true. In the whole of her life, no one had ever given her a look that made her feel smaller than the look Richard gave her. Nietzsche swallowed in horror at that look in his eyes. It was the complete opposite of that elusive thing she sought from him. Without saying a word, he had made her want nothing so much at that moment as to crawl under a rock and die. She couldn't fathom how, but he made her feel unworthy to live. In some bewildering way, that look made her feel as blind as the men in the statue. He hadn't said one word, but it was days before she could bring herself to look him in the eye again. Sometimes Richard seemed meek when she expected fierceness and intense when she expected indifference. She was beginning to wonder if she had been mistaken in thinking there was something special about him. Once she had even given in to despair of there really being anything in him worth discovering, watching him sleep, dejected that she had dared hope to uncover some meaning to life beyond what her mother had taught her, she had sadly resolved that the next day, after visiting the place she had grown up, she would end the whole senseless undertaking and return to Jagang. After they went to her father's business, though, she had seen again that quality in his gray eyes and knew beyond doubt that she had not been mistaken. This dance had only begun. As they marched down the dim hallway of a rooming house, she gestured for Richard to stand aside. Nietzsche wanted this room. She wanted to lie down where it was dry and go to sleep. She resolutely wrapped her knuckles on a door that looked as if it might come apart if she wasn't careful. She peered down at the register she had, and then stuffed it in her pack as she waited for the door to be answered. The lodging house, like all the others they had been to, was supposed to let rooms to those new to the city. The emperor needed workers. In her mind, she imagined that this would be the place. She stared at the stain on the sickly green plaster. She imagined seeing the tea-colored stain in the shape of a horse's rump with its tail flicked up every day as she went about her life. She imagined Richard walking past the stain every day when he went to a job and every night when he came home just like everyone else had to do. Richard was watching the stairway beyond the door, where Nietzsche again knocked. The stairs faced away. She couldn't understand why he watched all the things he watched, but she didn't discount his instincts. By the look on his face, he wasn't pleased about the shadowed stairway. Being a sister of the dark, she was hardly frightened by the simple things that frightened other people. She knocked again. A voice inside told them to go away. We need a room, Nietzsche declared to the door in a tone that said she meant to have it. She knocked harder. You're on the register. We want the room. It's a mistake, came the muffled voice from inside. No room. Now look here, Nietzsche called out heatedly. It's getting late. Three youths she hadn't seen sitting on the stairs swaggered around the newel post. The three were without shirts, showing off their muscles as young men were wont to do. All three had knives. Well, well, one of the youths said with a cocky grin as his eyes took her in with lewd intent. What have we here? Two little drowned rats? I like the fancy tail on the little blonde rat, a second chortled. Richard seized her arm and without a word shepherded her out the front door, back out into the rain. Nietzsche dragged her heels, protesting in a whisper the whole way. She couldn't believe that Lord Rawl himself, the seeker of truth and the bringer of death, would be intimidated by three men, boys, really. As they descended the rickety front stoop, Richard lifted an eyebrow at her while tipping her head close. You have no power, remember. We don't want this kind of trouble. I'd not like to get knifed over a room. This fight isn't worth it. Knowing when not to fight is just as important as knowing how. 
Nietzsche wanted the room, but she finally conceded that Richard was probably right. The three sneering youths slouched at the door and watched, laughing, calling Richard names. So far, they weren't interested in going out in the rain. She had seen young men like them before. This latest crop was no different from any of the others, arrogant, aggressive, and often dangerous. At least they made good soldiers for Jagang's army. Richard hurried her along the street. He cut through some of the narrow passageways, taking several turns at random just to be sure they wouldn't be followed. The city of al Rong seemed endless. In the overcast and rain, visibility was limited. The haphazard streets and byways were a confusing maze. It had been many years since she had been here last. With all the order's efforts, the place still had fallen on hard times. She feared to think of what it would have been like had the order not been here to help. When they emerged on a wider street, they found shelter under a small overhanging roof along with a small group of others trying to stay out of the rain. Nietzsche hugged herself against the cold. Richard, along with the others huddled under the roof, watched the occasional wagon making its way past on the muddy street. She didn't know how Richard could keep warm in such weather. She appreciated his warmth, though, when the small crowd pressed her up against him. Richard glanced down at her, seeing her shiver, but he couldn't bring himself to put an arm around her to help keep her warm. She didn't ask. Nietzsche sighed. The old world didn't stay cold for long. In another day or two, it would again be warm and muggy. When she had been at the crumbled remains of her father's business just before they left, Richard had looked as if he almost wanted to put his arms around her and comfort her. As much as he hated her, as much as he wanted to get away from her, he had been moved to sympathy. Standing in the ruins, Nietzsche had let the memories wash through her and had reveled in the exquisite anguish. Richard's eyes were fixed on something. She followed his gaze and saw that a wagon not far down the street was moving with an odd wiggle. Almost as soon as she noticed it, the wheel broke with a loud crack. With the strain imposed by the wagon slipping and being twisted in the ruts, the spokes had snapped under the heavy load. The side of the wagon bed dropped with a splash. People on the walkway were splattered with mud. They cursed the two men in the wagon. The four-horse team struggled to a halt as the uneven load broke the axle, causing the good rear wheel to snap its spokes too. The whole rear of the wagon collapsed into the mud. The two men climbed down to assess the damage. The raw-boned driver cursed and kicked at the broken wheel, lying at a lopsided angle. The other man, shorter and stoutly built, calmly checked the rest of the wagon and its load. With a frown of curiosity, Richard nudged Nietzsche ahead of him as he moved down the street toward the wagon. She went reluctantly, unhappy to be out from under the roof. We have to, the husky man said with calm resolve. It's only a short distance. The other cursed again. It's not my job, Ishak, and you know it. I'll not do it. Then Ishak threw up his hands in a helpless gesture as his headstrong partner went to the front of the wagon and urged the team on, managing to drag the wagon to the side of the road and out of the way of the other wagons that were beginning to back up down the street. Once he had the wagon to the side, he started unhitching the team. The man at the back of the wagon turned and peered around at the people watching. I need some help, Ishak called to the sparse crowd. Doing what? a nearby man asked. I've got to get this load of iron to the warehouse. He stretched his thick neck and pointed. Just there, in the brick building with the faded red paint on the side. How much will you pay? The bystander asked. Ishak was getting frustrated as he glanced over his shoulder and saw his partner leading the horses away. I'm not authorized to pay anything, not without approval, but I'm sure that if you came round tomorrow... The people watching laughed with knowing disgust and went on their way. The man stood in the downpour, ankle deep in mud, alone. He sighed and turned to his wagon, pulling back the tarp to reveal iron bar stock. Richard stepped out into the street. Nietzsche wanted to check some more rooms on the list before it got dark. She snatched at his sleeve, but he only gave her a scolding look. She huffed her displeasure, but followed anyway as he made his way through the mud to the man struggling to pull a long bar from the wagon bed. Ishak, is it? Richard asked. The man turned and gave Richard a nod. That's right. If I help you, Ishak, Richard asked, will I really get paid tomorrow? The truth now. Ishak, a stocky fellow with a curious red hat with a narrow brim all around, finally shook his head in resignation. Well, Richard said, 
If I help you get this load into your warehouse, then would you allow me and my wife to sleep in there where we could get out of the rain for the night? The man scratched his neck. I'm not allowed to let anyone in there. What if something happened? What if things came up missing? I'd be out of work. He snapped his fingers. Quick as that. Just until tomorrow. I only want to get her out of the rain before she comes down sick. I have no use for iron. Besides, I don't rob people. The man scratched his neck again as he gazed back at the wagon over his shoulder. He glanced at Nietzsche. She was shivering, and it was not an act. He peered at Richard. Sleeping in the warehouse for one night is not a fair price for lugging all this in there. It will take hours. If you agree to it, and I agree to it, Richard said over the sound of the rain, then it's a fair price. I asked for no more, and I'm willing to do it for that price. The man stared at Richard as if he might be crazy. He pulled off his red hat and scratched his head of dark hair. He swept his wet hair back and replaced the hat. You would have to clear out when I come first thing in the morning with a new wagon. I could get in trouble. I'll not let you get in trouble over me. If I should get caught, I'll say I broke in. The man thought about it for a moment, looking surprised at the last term Richard had thrown in an effort to close the deal. The man took another look over his shoulder at the load, then nodded his consent. Ishak hoisted a long bar of steel and put his shoulder under it. Richard lifted, too, and extended his arm forward to steady it, resting the heavy steel on the bunched muscles of his shoulder. Come on, he said to Nietzsche. Let's get you inside where you can start to dry out and get warm. She tried to lift a steel bar to help, but it was beyond her strength. There were times when Nietzsche missed her power. She could at least feel it through the link to the mother confessor. It took more effort, but even at this great of a distance, she was still able to maintain the link. She walked beside Richard as they followed the man to the dry room Richard had just won for her. The next day dawned clear. Rainwater still dripped from the eaves, though. The night before, as Richard helped Ishak lug the load into the warehouse, Nietzsche had used a light rope Richard had in his pack, stringing it between racks so she could hang up their wet things. By morning, most of their clothes were reasonably dry. They'd slept on wooden pallets, the only other choice being the dirt. Everything smelled of iron dust and was covered with a fine black film. There was nothing in the warehouse to keep them warm other than a single lantern Ishak had left them, over which Nietzsche could at least warm her hands. They slept as best they could in their wet clothes. By morning, those two were reasonably dry. Much of the night Nietzsche hadn't slept, but by the light of that lantern warming her hands, had watched Richard sleep as she thought about his gray eyes. It had been a shock to see those eyes in her father's business. It brought back a flood of memories. Richard opened the warehouse door just enough to squeeze through and carried their things out into the breaking dawn. The sky over the city looked as if it were rusting. He left her to watch their things while he went back in to lock the door from inside. She could hear him climbing the racks in the warehouse to get up to a window. He had to jump to the ground. When Ishak finally came up the street with a fresh wagon, Richard and Nietzsche were sitting on a short wall on the entrance road to the warehouse doors. When the wagon rolled past them into the yard outside the building and came to a halt before the double doors, Nietzsche saw that the driver who had abandoned Ishak the night before was at the reins. The lanky driver set the brake as he eyed them suspiciously. What's this? he asked Richard. I'm sorry to bother you, Richard said but I just wanted to get here before you opened up so I could inquire if there might be any work available. Ishak glanced at Nietzsche, seeing that she was dried out. He eyed the locked door and realized Richard had kept his word and kept him from the possibility of getting in trouble for letting someone sleep in the warehouse. We can't hire people, the driver said. You have to go to the office and put your name on the list. Richard sighed. I see. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I'll give it a try. A good day to you both. Nietzsche had learned to recognize in Richard's voice when he was up to something. He gazed up the street and then down the street as if he were lost. He was up to something now. He seemed to be giving Ishak an opportunity to offer more than he had paid for the help. Ishak had let Richard carry twice as much of the load the night before. Richard had done so without a word of protest. Ishak cleared his throat. Hold on there. He climbed down from the wagon to unlock the door but paused before Richard. I'm the load master. We need another man. You look to have a strong back. Using the toe of his boot, he drew a little map in the mud. 
You go to the office. He lifted his thumb over his shoulder. Down this street here to the third turn, then right past six more streets. He made an X in the mud. There's the office. You get your name on the list. Richard smiled and bowed his head. I'll do that, sir. Nietzsche knew that Richard remembered Ishak's name, but he was playing like he didn't for the sake of the driver, whom Richard didn't trust, after the man had abandoned his fellow the night before. What Richard didn't understand was that the driver had only done what he was supposed to do. It was not permitted for one man to take the work that belonged to others. That was stealing. The load was the responsibility of the load man, not the driver. You go and list first in the load workers group, Ishak told Richard. Pay your dues. They have an office in the same building. Then you go put your name on the list for the job. I'm in the citizen workers group that goes before the review assembly to consider new applicants. You just sit tight and wait outside. When we meet later on, I'll vouch for you. The driver leaned out and spat over the far side of the wagon. Why do you want to go and do that, Ishak? You don't even know this fellow. Ishak scowled up at the driver. Did you see anyone at the hall who was as big as this fellow? We need another loader for the warehouse. We just lost a man and need a replacement. You want me to get stuck with some skinny old man so as I'll have to do all the work? The driver chuckled. Suppose not. Ishak gestured toward Nietzsche. Besides, look at his young wife. She needs some meat on her bones, don't you think? Looks like a nice young couple. The driver spat over the side of the wagon again. I suppose. Ishak casually flicked a hand at Richard on his way to unlock the door to the warehouse. You be there. I'll be there. Ishak paused and turned back. Almost forgot. What's your name? Richard Cipher. Ishak gave him a nod and turned back to the door. I'm Ishak. See you tonight, Richard Cipher. Don't you let me down, you hear? You turn out to be lazy and let me down, and I'll throw your sorry hide in the river with an iron bar tied around your neck. I won't let you down, Ishak, Richard smiled. I'm a good swimmer, but not that good. As they trudged through the muddy streets on their way to find some food before they went to the offices to get on the list for work, Richard asked, What's wrong? Nietzsche shook her head in disgust. Ordinary people don't have your luck, Richard. Ordinary people suffer and struggle while your luck gets you into a job. If it was luck, Richard asked, then how come my back hurts from lugging that load of iron bars into the warehouse? Chapter 46 when Richard had finished unloading the last wagon of iron, he leaned forward and placed his hands on the pile, hanging his head as he panted. The muscles in his arms and shoulders throbbed. It was always easier having two men to handle the bars, one in the wagon and one on the ground, but the man who was supposed to help with the load had quit several days back, saying he hadn't been treated properly. Richard didn't really miss him all that much. Even when the man got up off his backside, his assistance was more trouble than it was worth. The light coming in the high windows was fading, leaving the sky in the west a deep purple. Sweat ran down his neck, making trails through the black iron dust. He wished he could jump in a cool mountain lake. That thought in and of itself was refreshing. He let his mind go there as he caught his breath. Ishak came down the aisle with the lantern. You work too hard, Richard. I thought I was hired to work. Ishak peered at Richard for a moment, one eye catching the harsh yellow light of the lantern he was holding. Take my advice. You work too hard, it's only going to get you into trouble. Richard had been working at the warehouse for three weeks, unloading wagons and loading others. He'd come to know a number of the other men. He had a good idea of what Ishak meant. But I'm still worried about trying to swim with an iron bar wrapped around my neck. Ishak gave up on his scowl and grunted a laugh. I was just spouting for Jory's sake that day. Jory was the driver who had refused to help unload the wagon when it broke down. Richard yawned. I know, Ishak. This isn't no farm like where you came from. This is different, living under the ways of the order. You got to take the needs of others in mind if you hope to get along. It's just the way the world is. Richard caught the thread of caution in Ishak's voice and the meaning of the gentle warning. You're right, Ishak. Thanks. I'll try to remember. Ishak gestured with his lantern toward the door. Workers' group meeting tonight. Best be on your way. Richard groaned. I don't know. It's late and I'm tired. I'd really rather... You don't want your name to start going around. 
You don't want people to start talking that you're not civic-minded. Richard smirked. I thought the meetings were voluntary. Ishak barked a laugh again. Richard collected his pack from a shelf in the back corner and then ran to the door so Ishak could lock it. Outside in the gathering darkness, Richard could just make out Nietzsche's curvaceous form sitting on the wall at the warehouse entrance. Her curves often put him in mind of nothing so much as a snake. They had no room yet, so she often came by the warehouse after she'd spent much of the day waiting in lines to buy bread and other necessities. They would walk together back to their shelter in a quiet alley about a mile away. Richard had paid a small price to some of the boys there to guard their place and make sure no one else took it. The boys were young enough to be thankful for the small price and old enough to be diligent about their job. Get any bread? Richard asked as he approached. Nietzsche hopped down off the wall. No bread today. They were out. But I got us some cabbage. I'll make us a soup. Richard's stomach was growling. He'd been hoping for bread so he could eat a piece right then. Soup would take time. Where's your pack? And if you bought cabbage, where is it? She smiled and produced something small. She held it out before them as they walked so as to silhouette it against the deep violet of dusk. It was a key. A room? We got a place? I checked the lodging office this afternoon. Our name finally came up. They assigned a room to us. Mr. and Mrs. Cipher. We can sleep inside tonight. Good thing, too. It looks like it will rain tonight. I already put my things in our room. Richard rubbed his sore shoulders. He felt a wave of revulsion at the sham she was putting him through, putting Kalin through. There were times when he felt a hint of something profoundly important about her and what she was doing, but most of the time he was merely overwhelmed by the lunacy of it all. Where is this room? He was hoping it wasn't clear over on the other side of the city. It's one we were at before, not too far from here. The one with the stain on the wall just inside the door. Nietzsche, they all had stains on the walls. The stain that looked like a horse's rear end with its tail flicked up. You'll see it soon. Richard was starving. I have to go to a workers' group meeting again tonight. Oh, Nietzsche said. Workers' group meetings are important. They help keep a person's mind on what's proper and on everyone's duty to his fellow man. The meetings were torture. Nothing worthwhile ever came about at the meetings. They sometimes lasted hours. There were people, though, who lived for the meetings so they could stand up in front of others and talk about the glory of the order. It was their shining hour, their time to be somebody, to be important. Those who didn't show up for the meetings were used as examples of people who weren't properly committed to the cause of the order. If the absent person didn't mend his ways, it was possible he could end up being suspected of subversion. The lack of truth to the suspicion was irrelevant. Stating the charge made some people feel more important in a land where equality was held as the highest ideal. Subversion seemed to be a dark cloud hovering constantly over the old world. It wasn't at all unusual to see the city guard taking people into custody on suspicion of subversion. Torture produced confessions, which proved the veracity of the accuser. The people who spoke at length at the meetings had, by this logic, accurately pointed a finger at a number of insurrectionists, as evidenced by their confessions. The undercurrent of tension in Alturang left many worried over the constant scourge of insurrection coming from the New World, it was said. Officials of the order wasted no time in stamping it out whenever it was discovered. Other people were so consumed by fear that the finger would turn toward them that the speakers at the workers' group meetings were assured of having a large number of zealous supporters. In many a public square, as a constant reminder of what would happen should you fall into the wrong company, the bodies of subversives were left to hang from high poles until the birds picked their bones clean. The running joke, if an incautious person said anything that sounded at all out of line, was... You looking to be buried in the sky? Richard yawned again as they turned down the street toward the meeting hall. I don't remember the stain that looked like a horse's rear end. Rocks crunched beneath their boots as they walked down the side of the dark street. Off ahead of them, in the distance, he could see Ishak's lantern swinging as the man hurried to the meeting. You were paying attention to something else at the time. It's the room where those three live. Three what? A number of other people, some he knew, most he didn't, hastened along the street on their way to the meeting. Richard remembered then. He stopped.
You mean the place where those three bullies live? The three with the knives? He could just barely see her nod in the dim light. That's the place. Great. Richard wiped a hand across his face as they started out again. Did you ask if we could have a different room? New people in the city are fortunate to get rooms. Rooms are assigned as your name comes up. If you turn it down, you go back to the bottom of the list. Did you have to give the landlord any money yet? She shrugged. Just what I had. Richard ground his teeth as he walked. That's all we have for the rest of the week. I can stretch the soup. Richard didn't trust her. She probably somehow saw to it that they got that particular room. He suspected that she wanted to see what he would do about the three young men, now that he was forced into the situation. She was always doing little things, asking odd questions, making bold statements, just to see what his reaction would be, how he would handle matters. He couldn't imagine what it was she wanted from him. He began to worry about the three. He remembered quite clearly how Kara's Ajil had caused Kalin to suffer the same pain as Nietzsche. If those three abused Nietzsche, Kalin would suffer it too. That thought made him go cold and sweaty with worry. At the workers' group meeting, Richard and Nietzsche sat on benches at the rear of a smoky room while people up front spoke about the glory of the order and how it helped all people to live a moral life. Richard's mind drifted to the brook behind the house he had built, to the sunlit summer afternoons watching Kalin dangle her feet in the water. He ached with longing as his mind's eye traced the curve of her legs. There were speeches about every worker's duty to their fellow man. Many of the discourses were given in a droning monotone, having been repeated so often that it was clear that the words were meaningless and that only the act of saying them mattered. Richard recalled Kalin laughing as he caught the fish he'd put in jars for her. Many of the people, the group leaders or a citizen spokesmen, delivered with passion and fire their praise for the ways of the order. A few people stood up and talked about those who weren't there, giving their names, saying what poor attitudes they had toward the welfare of their fellow workers. Whispers passed among the crowd. After the speeches were given, some of the workers' wives stood up and explained that they had extra need of late because they had just had new children, or their husbands were laid up, or the relatives they cared for were ill. After each spoke, there was a show of hands. If you agreed to do the right thing and have the group help them, then you raised your hand. The names of these who didn't raise their hand were noted. Ishak had explained to Richard that you were allowed not to raise your hand if you didn't agree, but if you did it very often, you were put on a watch list. Richard didn't know what a watch list was, but it was easy enough to surmise, and Ishak had told Richard that he didn't want to be on one, and to see to it that he raised his hand more often than not. Richard raised it every time. He didn't really care what happened. He had no interest in taking part, no interest in trying to make things better, and no interest in how well or poorly people's lives went. Most seemed to want the comfort of the order running their lives, relieving them of the burden of thinking on their own, just like Andereth. Nietzsche seemed surprised and occasionally even disappointed to see his hand go up every time, but didn't object or question. He was hardly even aware of his hand going up, he was smiling inwardly as he recalled the wonder in Kalin's expression, the astonishment in her green eyes when she saw spirit for the first time. Richard would have carved a mountain for her just to see her tearful joy in seeing something she admired, something she cherished, something she valued. Another man spoke, complaining about the conditions, how unfair they were, and how he had been forced to quit rather than subject himself to such abuse by the transport company. He was the man who had quit and left Richard to handle the loads by himself. Richard raised his hand along with all the others to grant the man full wages for six months in recompense. After the show of hands and some whispering and scratching on paper, as all the obligations were figured up, the healthy working members were assessed their just share to help those in need. Those who were able, Richard had been told, had a duty to produce with all their effort in order to help those who couldn't. When men's names were called, they stood to hear the share to be taken from their wages the next week. Because he was new, Richard's name was called last. He stood, staring off across the dimly lit room at the people in moth-eaten coats sitting behind the long table made of two old doors. Ishak sat at one end, going along with the others in everything. 
Several of the women still had their heads together. When they finished, they whispered to the chairman, and he nodded. Richard Cipher, being as you are new, you still have some catching up to do on your duty to your workers group. Your next week's wages are assessed as due in aid. Richard stood dumbly for a moment. How am I to eat, to pay my rent? People in the room turned to frown at him. The chairman slapped his hand on the table, calling for silence. You should thank the creator to be blessed with good health, so as you can work, young man. Right now, there are those who are not as fortunate in life as you, those with greater need than you. Suffering and need comes before selfish personal enrichment. Richard sighed. What did it really matter? After all, he was lucky in life. Yes, sir, I see what you mean. I'm happy to volunteer my share toward those with needs. He wished Nietzsche hadn't given away all their money. Well, he said to Nietzsche as they shuffled out into the night, I guess we can ask the landlord for the rent money back. We can stay on where we were staying before until I can work some more and save up some money. They don't give rent money back, she said. The landlord will understand our need and let our debt build until we can start paying on it. Next meeting, you just have to go up before the review board and explain your hardship. If you present it properly, they will give you a hardship charity to pay your rent. Richard was exhausted. He felt like he were having some kind of silly dream. Charity? It's my wages for the work I do. That's a selfish way of looking at it, Richard. The job is at the grace of the workers' group, the company, and the order. He was too tired to argue. Besides, he didn't expect any justice in anything done in the name of the order. He just wanted to go to their new room and get some sleep. When they opened the door, one of the three youths was pawing through Nietzsche's pack. Holding some of her underthings in one hand, he aimed a smirk back over his shoulder at them. Well, well, he said as he stood. He still wore no shirt. Looks like the two drowned rats have found a hole to live in. His leering gaze slid to Nietzsche. He wasn't looking at her face. Nietzsche snatched the pack away first, then her things from his other hand. She stuffed her personal clothes back in the pack while he watched, grinning the whole time. Richard feared she might abandon the link to Kalin in order to use her power, but she only glared at the youth. The room reeked of mold. The low ceiling made Richard feel uncomfortably hemmed in. The ceilings had once been whitewashed, but was now dark with soot from candles and lamps, making the room feel cave-like. A candle sitting on a rusted bracket by the door provided the only light. A wardrobe stood crookedly in the corner in front of dirty walls, spotted with fly blows. The wardrobe was missing a door. Two wooden chairs at a table under one small window on the far wall were the only place to sit, other than the warped and gouged pine floor. The small squares of window glass were opaque under a variety of different colored layers of paint. Through a small triangle in the corner where the glass was broken out, Richard could see the gray wall of the next building. How did you get in here? Nietzsche snapped. Master Key, he waved it like a king's pass. See, my father's the landlord. I was just checking your things for subversive writings. You can read? Nietzsche sniped. I would have to see that to believe it. The defiant grin never left his face. We'd not like to find we have subversives living under our roof. Could endanger everyone else. My father has a duty to report any suspicious activity. Richard stepped aside to let the young man by as he headed for the door, but then caught his arm as the youth picked up the candle. That's our candle, Richard said. Yeah, what makes you think so? Richard tightened his grip on the bare, lean, muscular arm. Looking him in the eye, he gestured with his other hand. Our initials are scratched in the bottom there. Before he thought, the young man instinctively turned the candle to have a look. The hot wax spilled over his hand. He dropped the candle with a yelp. Oh, my, I am sorry, Richard said. He stooped and picked up the candle. You're all right, I hope. You didn't get any of that burning wax in your eyes, did you? Hot wax in your eyes hurts something fierce. Yeah? He swiped his straight dark hair back from his eyes. How would you know that? Back where I came from, I saw it happen to some poor fellow. Richard leaned partway out into the hall, into the light of another candle on a shelf. With his thumbnail, he made a show of carving an R and a C in the bottom of the candle. See here, my initials. 
The youth didn't bother to look. Uh-huh. He swaggered out the door. Richard went with him and lit the candle from the flame of the one in the hall. Before walking away, the young man turned back with a haughty look. How did that fellow manage to be stupid enough to get hot wax in his eyes? Was he a big dumb ox like you? No, Richard said offhandedly. No, not at all. He was a cocky young man who foolishly put his hands on another man's wife. He got the hot wax dripped in his eyes by the husband. Yeah? Well, why didn't the dumb jackass just shut his eyes? Richard gave the lad a deadly smile for the first time. Because his eyelids had been cut off first, so he couldn't close them. You see where I come from. Anyone touching a woman against her wishes isn't treated indulgently. Yeah? Yeah. The young man's eyelids weren't the only thing that got cut off. The young man swiped his black hair back again. You threatening me, Ox? No. There would be nothing I could do to you that would harm you more than what you're already doing to harm yourself. What's that supposed to mean? You are never going to amount to anything. You will always be the worthless muck people scrape from their shoes. You only get one life and you are wasting yours. That's a terrible shame. I doubt you will ever know what it is to be truly happy, to achieve anything of worth, to have genuine pride in yourself. You bring it all on yourself, and I could do no worse to you. I can't help what life deals me. Yes, you can. You create your own life. Yeah? How do you figure? Richard gestured around himself. Look at the pigsty you live in. Your father is the landlord. Why don't you show some pride and fix up the place? He's the landlord, not the owner. The man who owned it was a greedy bastard charging more rent than many could afford. The order took the place over. For his crimes against the people, they tortured the owner to death. My father was given the job of landlord. We just run the place to help out fools like you who don't have a place. We've no money to go around fixing up the building. Money? Richard pointed. It takes money to pick up that garbage left there in the hall? I didn't put it there. And these walls? It doesn't take money to wash the walls. Look at the ceiling in this room. It hasn't been washed in a decade, at least. Hey, I'm no scrub woman. And the front stoop. Someone is going to break their neck on it. Could be you or your father. Why don't you do something worthwhile for a change and fix it? I told you we've no money to fix things. It doesn't take money. You just need to take it apart, clean the joints, and put in some new wedges. You can cut them from any little scrap of wood lying around. The young man wiped his palms on his pants. If you're so smart, then why don't you fix the stairs? Good idea. I will. Yeah? His sneer returned. I don't believe you. Tomorrow, after I get home from work, I will fix the stairs. If you show up, I'll teach you how it's done. I might show up just to see some dupe going to the work of fixing something that isn't even his and for nothing besides. It isn't for nothing. It's because I use the front steps, too, and for the pleasure in the place where I live. I care if my wife falls and breaks her leg. But if you want to come and learn how to fix the steps, you will wear a shirt out of respect for the women in your building. And if I show up and watch you and I don't wear a stupid shirt like some old geezer? Then I wouldn't have enough respect for you to bother teaching you how to fix the stairs. You will learn nothing then. What if I don't want to learn something? Then you will have taught me something about you instead. He rolled his dark eyes. Why should I care about learning to fix some dumb stairs? You shouldn't necessarily care about fixing some stairs. But if you care about yourself, you should care about learning. Even learning simple things. You come to have pride in yourself only by accomplishing things, even from fixing some old stairs. Yeah, I got pride in myself. You intimidate people and then mistake that for respect. Others can't grant you self-respect, even others who care about you. You have to earn self-respect yourself. All you know right now is how to stand around and look stupid. He folded his arms. Who you calling? Richard jabbed a finger against the young man's smooth chest, forcing him back a pace. You only get one life. Is that all you want out of it? Standing around calling names, scaring people with your gang. Is that all you want your one life to mean to you? Anyone who wants more out of life, who wants their life to mean something would care about learning things. Tomorrow I'm going to fix those stairs. Tomorrow we'll see what sort you are. The youth folded his arms again in a defiant stance. Yeah, 
Well, maybe I'd rather spend time with my friends, Richard shrugged. That's why your lot in life isn't fate. I don't have any say in much of my life, but I make whatever choices I can make in my own rational best interest. It's my choice to fix those stairs and make the place I live a little better, instead of whining and waiting and hoping for someone else to do something for me. I have pride that I know how to do that for myself. Fixing stairs isn't going to make you a man, but it's going to make you a little more confident in yourself. If you want, bring your friends and I'll teach you all how to use those knives of yours for something more than just waving in people's faces. We might come to laugh at you working, Ox. Fine. But if you and your pals want to learn anything of worth, then you'd better start out by showing me you mean to learn by showing respect and showing up with shirts. That's the first choice you have. If you make it wrong, then your choices as you go along are only going to become more limited. And my name is Richard. Like I said, you might be good for a laugh, he made a face. Richard, laugh all you want. I know my own worth and don't need to prove it to someone who doesn't know theirs. If you want to learn, you know what you must do. If you ever wave a knife at me again, though, or worse, my wife, then you will be making the last of your many mistakes in life. He chose to ignore the threat with more bravado. What am I ever going to be? Some dupe like you working your tail off for that greedy Ishak and his transport company? What's your name? Camille. Well, Camille, I work in exchange for wages so I can support myself and my wife. I have something of value, myself. Someone values my worth enough to pay me for my time and ability. Right now, choosing to work at loading wagons is one of the few choices I have to make in my life. I chose to fix the steps because it improves my life. Richard narrowed his eyes. And what does Ishak have to do with it anyway? Ishak, he's the one who owns the transport company. Ishak is just the loadmaster. Ishak used to live here back before the order took over the building. My father knew him. Matter of fact, you'll be sleeping in his parlor. Back then, it was his transport company. He chose the path of enlightenment over greed, though, when it was offered him. He let the citizen workers group help him to learn to be a better citizen of the order, learn his place under the creator. Now he knows he's no better than any of the rest of us, even me. Richard glanced at Nietzsche, who was standing in the middle of their room watching the conversation. He'd forgotten all about her. He didn't feel like talking anymore. I'll see you tomorrow evening, whether you come to laugh or to learn. It's your life, Camille, and your choice. Chapter 47 the sun was just coming up. Dusty shafts of light angled into the warehouse through the high windows. When he saw Ishak coming down the aisle to give him the list of iron to be loaded for various wagons, Richard hopped down off the rack where he'd been waiting. Richard hadn't seen the loadmaster for a week. Ishak, are you all right? Where have you been? The burly loadmaster hurried up the aisle. Hello to you, too. I'm sorry, hello. I was worried. Where have you been? He made a face. Meetings, always meetings. Wait in this office, wait in that office. No work, just meetings for this and for that. I had to go see people to try to arrange for loads people need. Sometimes I think no one really wants any goods to move in this city. It would be easier for them if everyone got paid but had to do no work. Then they would not have to sign their name on a piece of paper and worry if maybe someday they will be called to account for having done it. Ishak, is it true that this transport company used to be yours? The man paused to catch his breath. Who tells you these things? What about it? Did the transport company used to be yours? Ishak shrugged. Still is, I guess. What happened? What happened? Nothing happened, except maybe I got smart and figured out it was more work than I needed. What did they threaten you with? Ishak peered at Richard for a time. Where are you from? You don't seem like any farm boy I ever met. Richard smiled. You didn't answer my question, Ishak. The man gestured irritably. What for you want to know about past history? Past is past. A man has to look at the way things are and do the best he can from what life presents him. A choice was put to me and I made it. Things are the way they are. Wishing don't put food before my children. Richard's inquisitive frown suddenly felt cruel on his face. He let it go. 
I understand, Ishak. I really do. I'm sorry. The man shrugged again. Now I work here just like everyone else, much easier. I must follow the same rules or I could lose my job just like everyone else. Everyone is equal now. Praise be to the order. Ishak smiled at Richard's jibe. Richard held out his hand. Let's have the list. The loadmaster handed over the paper. It only had the names of two places on it with some directions for grade, length, and amounts. What's this? Richard asked. We need a loader to go with a wagon to pick up some iron and see it delivered. So I'm working on the wagons now? Why? I thought you needed me in the warehouse. Ishak took off his red hat and scratched his head of dark thinning hair. We had some... complaints. About me? What did I do? You know, I've worked hard. Too hard. Ishak readjusted his hat on his head. Men in the warehouse say you are petty and spiteful. Their words, not mine. They say you make them feel bad by flaunting how young and strong you are. They say you are laughing behind their backs. Many of the men were younger than Richard and strong enough. Ishak, I never... I know, I know, but they feel that you do. Don't make trouble for yourself now. Their feelings are what matter, not what is. Richard let out a frustrated sigh. But I was told by the workers' group that I have the ability to work whereas others don't, and that I was supposed to contribute my full effort in order to help relieve the strain on those less able, those who don't have my ability. They said that I would lose the job if I didn't do my full effort. It's a fine line to walk. And I stepped over the line. They want you dismissed, Richard sighed. So I'm through here? Ishak waggled his hand. Yes and no. You are dismissed from the warehouse for having a bad attitude. I convinced the committee to give you another chance and let you be moved to the wagons. The wagons aren't as much work, because you can only load it. And then when you get to where it's going, you unload it. Can't get in much trouble that way. Richard nodded. Thanks, Ishak. Ishak's gaze sought refuge among the racks of iron and the bins of charcoal and long rows of ore that needed delivery. He scratched his temple. The pay is less. Richard brushed the iron and ore dust from his hands and rear of his pants. What's the difference? They just take it from me anyway and give it out. I'm not really losing any pay. Other people are losing my pay. Ishak chuckled and clapped Richard on the shoulder. You are the only one around here I can count on, Richard. You are different than the others. I feel I can talk to you and it won't drift to other ears. I wouldn't do that to you. I know. That's why I tell you what I don't tell the others. I am expected to be equal and to work like anyone else, but I am also expected to provide jobs. They took my business, but they still expect me to run it for them. Crazy world. You don't know the half of it, Ishak. So what about this wagon loading job? What is it you need done? The blacksmith out at the site is dealing me a fit. Why? He has orders for tools, but he has no iron. Lots of people are waiting on things. He swept a hand out at the rack of iron. Most of this is what was ordered last autumn. Last autumn. It's nearly spring, and it's only now come in. It's all been promised to those who ordered it before. So why did it take so long for it to get here? Ishak slapped his forehead. Maybe you are an ignorant farm boy after all. Where you been, under rocks? You can't just get things because you want them. You gotta wait your turn. Your order must pass before the review board. Why? Why, why, why? Is that all you know? Ishak sighed and said something under his breath about the creator testing his patience. He slapped the back of his fingers to the palm of his other hand as he explained it to Richard. Because you've got to think of others. That's why. You gotta take other people's needs into consideration. You have to consider the good of everyone. If I get all the runs picking up and delivering the iron, then what chance have others who want to do the same? If I have all the business, that's unfair. It would put people out of work. What's available has to be divided up. The Board of Supervision must make sure everything is equal to all. Some people can't handle the orders so fast as I can, or they have trouble, or they can't get workers, or their workers have troubles, so I gotta wait until they can catch up. It's your business. Why can't... Why, why, why? Here, take this order. I don't need to have that blacksmith come all the way down here again and yell at me. He's in trouble with his orders and he needs the iron. Why is he in trouble? 
I thought everyone had to wait their turn. Ishak lifted an eyebrow and lowered his voice. His customer is the retreat. The retreat? What's that? The retreat. Ishak spread his arms, indicating something big. That's the name of the place being built for the emperor. Richard hadn't known the name. The emperor's new palace was the reason for all the workers coming to Alturang. He supposed it was the reason Nietzsche had insisted they come to the city, too. She had some interest in having him be part of the grand project. He assumed it was her grotesque sense of irony. The new palace is going to be huge, Ishak said, waving his arms again. A lot of work for a lot of people. It will be work for years building the retreat. So, when the goods are for the order, then you had better deliver, I take it. Ishak smiled and dipped a deep nod. Now you are starting to understand, Mr. Richard YYY. The blacksmith is working directly from the orders of the builders of the palace who report to the highest people. The builders need tools and things made. They don't want to hear excuses from a lowly blacksmith. The blacksmith doesn't want to hear excuses from me, but I have to go by what the review board says. He doesn't. He goes by what the palace says. I'm in the middle. Ishak paused when one of the other loaders came down the aisle with a piece of paper. Ishak read the paper the man gave him, while the man gave a sidelong look at Richard. Ishak sighed and gave brief directions to the man. After he was gone, Ishak turned back to Richard. I can only transport what the review board allows me to move. That paper just now, it was instructions from the board for me to hold a shipment of timbers to the mines, because the load was going to go to a company that needs the work. You see? I can't put other people out of business by being unfair and delivering more than they do, or else I have trouble, and I get replaced by someone who will not be so unfair to his competitors. Ah, it's not like the old days when I was young and foolish. Richard folded his arms. You mean to say that if you do a good job, you get in trouble, just like I did. Good job. Who's to say what is a good job? Everybody's got to work together for the good of everybody. That is a good job, if you help your fellow man. Richard watched a couple of men off in the distance loading a wagon with charcoal. You don't really believe that mouthful of mush, do you, Ishak? Ishak sighed in a long-suffering manner. Richard, please load the wagon when you get to the foundry and then go with the wagon out to the retreat and unload it at the blacksmith's shop. Please, don't get sick on me or get a bad back or have infirm children in the middle of the run. I don't need to see the blacksmith again, or I will have to go swimming with an iron bar around my neck. Richard grunted a laugh. My back is feeling fine. Good. I'll get a driver over here to drive the wagon. Ishak waggled a cautionary finger. And don't ask the driver to help load or unload. We don't need that kind of grievance brought up at the next meeting. I had to beg Jory not to lodge a complaint after I asked him to help me unload the wagon that day in the rain when the wheels broke. The day you helped me get the load to the warehouse, remember? I remember. Please, don't give Jory any trouble. Don't touch the reins. That's his job. Be a good fellow, then. Get the iron loaded and unloaded so that Blacksmith doesn't come to see me again? Sure, Ishak. I won't make any trouble for you. You can trust me. There's a good fellow. Ishak started away but turned back. Was not so much trouble on a farm, am I right? No, it wasn't. I wish I was back there now. Before he got far, Ishak turned back once more. You be sure to bow and scrape if you see any of those priests, you hear? Priests? What priests? How will I know them? Brown robes and creased caps. Oh, you'll know them. You can't miss them. If you see any, you be on your best manners. If a priest suspects you of having an improper attitude toward the Creator or such, he can have you tortured. The priests are Brother Narev's disciples. Brother Narev? The high priest of the Fellowship of Order. Ishak waved his arms impatiently. I have to get Jory to come with a wagon. Please, Richard, do as I ask. That blacksmith will feed me to his forge if I don't have that iron out there today. Please, Richard, get that load out there, please. Richard gave Ishak a smile in order to put his mind at ease. You have my word, Ishak. The blacksmith will have the iron. Ishak heaved a sigh and hurried off to find his driver. Chapter 48 It was late in the muggy afternoon by the time they made it to the site of the retreat. 
Sitting in the wagon beside Jory as they cleared the top of the final hill, Richard was awestruck by the sight. It was beyond huge. He couldn't imagine how many square miles had been cleared. Gangs of thousands of men, looking like ants spread out below, worked in lines with shovels and baskets, reshaping the contour of the land. Jory was disinterested in the construction and only spat over the side, offering the occasional, I suppose, to some of Richard's questions. The foundation was still being laid in deep trenches, enabling Richard, looking down from the road, to see on the ground the outline of the future structure. It was hard to fathom how enormous the building was going to be. Seeing the specks moving slowly beside it, it was hard to keep in mind that they were men. For sheer size, the structure would rival anything Richard had ever seen. There were miles of grounds and gardens going in. Fountains and other towering structures along entrance roads were beginning to be erected. Sweeping stretches of mazes were being constructed with hedges. Hillsides were dotted with trees that had been planted according to a grand plan. The retreat faced a lake in what was to be that majestic park. The short side of the main building was to run a quarter mile along the river. Stone pilings marched partway out into the river with a series of connecting arches just starting to be constructed. Apparently part of the palace was to extend out over the water with docks for the emperor's pleasure craft. Across the river lay more of the city. On the palace side of the river, too, the city spread all around, though at a great distance from the retreat. Richard couldn't imagine how many buildings and people had been displaced for the construction. This was to be no distant and remote emperor's palace, but rather it was set right in the center of all Tuarang. Roads were being paved with millions of cobbles, giving the multitudes of citizens of the order access to come and see the grand structure. There were already crowds of people standing behind rope barricades watching the construction. Despite the poverty of the old world, it would appear that this grand palace was to be a crown jewel of unsurpassed splendor. Stone of various kinds lay in great piles. In the distance, Richard could see men working at cutting it into the required shapes. The heavy afternoon air rang with the faraway knells of hundreds of hammers and chisels. There were stockpiles of granite and marble in a variety of colors, and massive quantities of limestone blocks. Special quarry wagons waited in serpentine columns to deliver yet more. The long blocks of stone, called lifts, were slung under heavy beams that bridged the front and rear axles. Huts and great open shelters had been built for the stone workers, so they could work no matter the weather. Timber was stickered in row upon row of huge stacks covered with purpose-built roofs. The overflow was covered in canvas. Small mountains of material for mortar were scattered around the foundation, looking like anthills, the illusion aided by all the dark specks of men moving about. Away from the site itself, on a road that snaked its way along the side of a hill, among a small city of new work buildings overlooking the site lay the blacksmith shop. It was quite large, compared with such places Richard had seen before. Of course, Richard had never seen anything on this scale being built. He had seen grand places that already existed. To see one just beginning was a revelation. The sheer scale of everything was disorienting. Jory expertly backed his team, putting the rear of the wagon right at double doors, standing open into blackness. There you be, Jory said. It was a long speech for the lanky driver. He pulled out a loaf of bread and a water skin filled with ale, and climbed down from the wagon to find a place farther down the hill, where he could sit and watch the building while Richard worked at unloading the iron. The blacksmith's shop was dark and stifling hot, even in the outer cluttered stockroom. Like all blacksmith shops, the walls in the workroom were covered in soot. Windows were kept to a minimum, mostly located overhead and covered with shutters, so as to keep it dark in order to more easily judge the nature of the glowing metal. Despite being recently built for the work at the palace, the blacksmith shop already looked a hundred years old. Nearly every spot held some tool or other in a dizzying array and variety. There were rows of tools piles of them. The rafters were hung with tongs and fire pots and crucibles and squares and dividers, and contraptions like huge insects, 
which looked to be used for clamping pieces together. Low benches, seemingly cobbled together in haste, were hung all round with long-handled dies of every sort. Some benches held smaller grindstones. Slots around some tables held hundreds of files and rasps. Some of the low tables were covered in a jumble of hammers in such variety as Richard had never imagined, their handles all sticking out, making the tabletops look like huge pincushions. The floor was choked with clutter, boxes overflowing with parts, bars, rivets, wedges, lengths of iron stock, clippings, pry bars, pole hooks, dented pots, wooden jigs, tin snips, lengths of chain, pulleys, and a variety of special anvil attachments. Everything was covered with soot or dust or metal filings. Broad, short barrels full of liquids sat around the anvils while men hammered on huge iron held in tongs, flattening, stretching, cutting, squaring, clipping. Glowing metal hissed and smoked in protest as it was quenched in the liquid. Other men used the horns of their anvils to bend metal that looked like bits of sunset held captive in tongs. They held up those fascinating bits and matched them to patterns, hammered on the metal some more, and checked it again. Richard could hardly think in all the noise. In the darkness, a man worked a big bellows, putting all his weight on the downstroke. The blast of air made the fire roar. Charcoal overflowed from baskets sitting wherever there had been room to put them. Cubby holes held pipe and odd scraps of metal. Metal hoops leaned against benches and planks. Some of the hoops were for barrels. Bigger ones were for wagon wheels. Tongs and hammers lay here and there on the floor where men had dropped them in the haste of battle with the hot iron. The whole place was as agreeable a clutter as he had ever seen. A man in a leather apron stood not far away at a door to another workroom. He held out a chalkboard covered with a maze of lines as he studied a large contraption of metal bars on the floor in the room beyond. Richard waited, not wanting to interrupt the man's concentration. The sharply defined muscles of his sooty arms glistened with sweat. The man tapped the chalk against his lip as he puzzled, then swiped a line clean on the board and drew it again, moving its connecting points. Richard frowned at the drawing. It looked familiar somehow even though it was no recognizable object. Would you be the master blacksmith? Richard asked when the man paused and looked over his shoulder. The man's brow seemed enduringly fixed in an intimidating scowl. His hair was cropped close to his skull, a good practice around so much fire and white-hot metal, adding to his menacing demeanor. He was of average height and sinewy, but it was his countenance that made him look big enough for any trouble that might come along. By the way the other men moved and glanced at this man, they feared him. Taken by inexplicable compulsion, Richard pointed at the line the man had just drawn. That's wrong. What you just did is wrong. You have the top end right, but the bottom should go here, not where you put it. He didn't so much as blink. Do you even know what this is? Well, not exactly, but I... Then how can you presume to tell me where to put this support? The man looked like he wanted to stuff Richard in the forge and melt him down. Offhand, I don't know exactly. Something just tells me that you had better be the man with the iron. I am, Richard said, glad to change the subject, and wishing he had kept his mouth shut in the first place. He had only been trying to help. Where would... Where have you been all day? I was told it would be here first thing this morning. What did you do, sleep till noon? Ah, uh, no, sir. We went right to the foundry first thing. Ishak sent me right there at dawn, but the man at the foundry was having problems because... I'm not interested. You said you had the iron. It's already late enough. Get it unloaded. Richard looked around. Every spot seemed occupied. Where would you like it? The master blacksmith glared around at the crammed room as if he expected some of the piles to get up and move for him. They didn't. If you'd have been here when you were supposed to be here, you could have put it out there just inside the door in the outer supply room. Now they brought that big rock sled that needs welding, so you will have to put the iron in the back. Next time, get out of bed earlier. Richard was trying to be polite, but he was losing his patience with being castigated because the blacksmith was having a troubled day. Ishak made it quite clear that you were to get iron today, and he sent me to see to it. I have your iron. I don't see anyone else able to deliver on such short notice. The hand with the chalkboard lowered.
the full attention of the man's glower focused on Richard for the first time. Men who had heard Richard's words scurried off to attend to important work farther away. How much iron did you bring? Fifty bars, eight feet. The man let out an angry breath. I ordered a hundred. I don't know why they sent an idiot with a wagon when... Do you want to hear the way it is, or do you want to yell at someone? If you just want to spout off to no point and no useful end, then go right ahead, as I'm not much injured by ranting. But when you finally want to hear the truth of the way things are, just let me know and I'll give it. The blacksmith peered silently for a moment, a bull bewildered by a bumblebee. What's your name? Richard Cipher. So what's the truth of the way things are, Richard Cipher? The foundry wanted to fill the order. They have bar stock stacked to the rafters. They can't get it delivered. They wanted to let me have the whole order, but a transport inspector stationed there wouldn't let us have the whole hundred bars because the other transport companies are supposed to get their equal loads, but their wagons are broken down. So Ishak's wagons aren't allowed to take more than their fair share, and fifty was their allotment. That's right, Richard said. At least until the other companies can move some more goods. The blacksmith nodded. The foundry is dying to sell me all the iron I can use, but I can't get it here. I'm not allowed to transport it, to put transport workers like you out of work. Were it up to me, Richard said, I'd go back for another load today, but they told me they couldn't give me any more until next week at the earliest. I'd suggest you get every transport company you can find to deliver you a wagon load. That way you'll have a better chance to get what you need. The blacksmith smiled for the first time. It was amusement at the foolishness of Richard's idea. Don't you suppose I already thought of that? I've got orders in with them all. Ishak is the only one with equipment at the moment. The rest are all having wagon problems, horse problems, or worker problems. At least I have fifty bars for you. That will only keep me going the rest of the day and for the morning. The blacksmith turned. This way, I'll show you where you can stack it. He led Richard through the congested workshop, among the confusion of work and material. They went through a door and down a short connecting hall. The noise fell away behind. They entered a quiet building in back, attached, but set off on its own. The blacksmith unhooked a line attached at a cleat and let down a trap door covering a window in the roof. Light cascaded down into the center of the large room where stood a huge block of marble. Richard stood staring at the stunning stone heart of a mountain. It seemed completely out of place in a blacksmith's workshop. There were tall doors at the far end where the monolith had been brought in on skids. The rest of the room had space left open all around the towering stone. Chisels of every sort and various size mallets stuck up from slots along the pitch-black walls. You can put the bars here on the side. Be careful when you bring them in. Richard blinked. He had almost forgotten the man was there with him. Still, he stared at the lustrous quality of the stone before him. I'll be careful, he said without looking at the blacksmith. I won't bang it into the stone. As the man started to leave, Richard asked, I told you my name. What's yours? Casella. Is there more to it? Yes, mister. See that you use it all. Richard smiled as he followed the man out. Yes, sir, Mr. Casella. Uh, mind if I ask what this is? The blacksmith slowed to a stop and turned back. He gazed at the marble standing in the light as if it were a woman he loved. This is none of your business. That's what it is. Richard nodded. I only ask because it's a beautiful piece of stone. I've never seen marble before it was a statue or made into something. Mr. Casella watched Richard, watching the stone. There's marble all over this site, thousands of tons of it. This is just one small piece. Now get my shorted order of iron unloaded. By the time Richard was done, he was soaked in sweat and filthy, not only from the iron bars, but from the soot of the blacksmith's shop. He asked if he could use some of the water in a rain barrel that the men were using to wash in as they were getting ready to leave for the day. They told him to go ahead. When he finished... Richard found Mr. Casella back at the chalkboard, alone in the suddenly silent shop, making corrections to the drawing and writing numbers down the side. Mr. Casella, I'm finished. I kept the bars well off to the side, away from the marble. Thank you, he mumbled. Mind if I ask what you will have to pay for that fifty bars of iron? The glare was back. 
What's it to you? From what I heard at the foundry, the man there had been hoping to fill the whole order so he could get 3.5 gold marks. So, since you got half your order, I believe you will be paying 1.75 gold marks for the 50 bars of iron. Am I correct? The glare darkened. Like I said, what's it to you? Richard put his hands in his back pockets. Well, I was wondering if you would be willing to buy another 50 bars for 1.5 gold marks. So you're a thief, too. No, Mr. Casella, I'm not a thief. Then how are you going to sell me iron for a quarter mark less than the foundry is selling it for? You smelting a little iron ore in your room at night, Mr. Richard Cipher? Do you want to hear what I have to say or not? His mouth twisted in annoyance. Talk. The foundry man was furious because he wasn't allowed to transport your whole order. He has more iron than he can sell because he isn't allowed to transport it, and the transport companies are all jammed up so they aren't showing up. He said he would be willing to sell it to me for less. Why? He needs the money. He showed me his cold blast furnaces. He owes wages and needs charcoal and ore and quicksilver, among other things, but hasn't enough money to buy it all. The only thing he has plenty of is smelted metal. His business is strangling because he can't move his product. I asked what price he would be willing to sell me iron for if he didn't have to transport it, if I picked it up myself. He told me that if I came after dark, he would sell me 50 bars for 1.25 gold marks. If you're willing to buy it from me for 1.5, I'll have you another 50 bars by morning when you said you need it. The man gaped as if Richard was a bar of iron that had just come to life before his eyes and started talking. You know I'm willing to pay one and three quarters. Why would you offer to sell it to me for one and a half? Because, Richard explained, I want to sell it for less than you'd have to pay through a transport company so that you'll buy it from me instead. And because I need you to loan me the one and a quarter gold marks first so I can buy the bars in the first place and bring them to you. The foundry will only sell them to me if I pay when I come to take them. What's to keep you from disappearing with my one and a quarter gold marks? My word. The man barked a laugh. Your word? I don't know you. I told you, my name is Richard Cipher. Ishak is scared to death of you, and he trusted me to get you the iron so you won't come wring his neck. Mr. Casella smiled again. I'd not wring Ishak's neck. I like the fellow. He's stuck in a tight spot. But don't you tell him I said that. I'd like to keep him on his toes. Richard shrugged. If you don't want me to, I won't tell him you know how to smile. I know, though, that you're in a tighter spot than Ishak. You have to deliver goods for the order, but you're at the mercy of their methods. He smiled again. So, Richard Cipher, what time will you be here with your wagon? I don't have a wagon, but if you agree... I'll have your 50 iron bars right there, Richard pointed at a spot out the double doors beside where Jory had parked the wagon, in a pile by dawn. Mr. Casella frowned. If you don't have a wagon, how are you going to get the bars here? Walk? That's right. Are you out of your mind? I don't have a wagon, and I want to earn the money. It's not all that far. I figure I can carry five at a time. That only makes ten trips. I can do that by dawn. I'm used to walking. Tell me the rest of it. Why you want to do this. The truth now. My wife isn't getting enough to eat. The workers' group assesses most of my wages, since I'm able to produce, and gives it to those who don't work. Because I can work, I've become a slave to those who can't, or who don't wish to. Their methods encourage people to find an excuse to let others take care of them. I intensely dislike being a slave. I figure I can entice you to go along with the deal by offering you a better price. We each gain a benefit, value for value. If I were to go along, what do you plan to do with all that money? Go live off it for a while, drink it away? I need the money to buy a wagon and a team of horses. The frown knotted tighter. What do you need with a wagon? I need the wagon to deliver you all the iron you're going to buy from me because I can get it for you cheaper and because I can deliver it when you need it. You looking to get buried in the sky? Richard smiled. 
No, I just happen to think that the Emperor wants his palace built. From what I've heard, they have a lot of slave labor down there, people they've captured. But they don't have enough slave labor to do it all for them. They need people like you and the foundries. If the officials of the order want to have the work progress, and not to have to explain to Emperor Jagang why it isn't, they will be inclined to look the other way. In that narrow crack of need, there is opportunity. I expect I'll have to bribe a few officials to get them to be busy elsewhere when I come to pick up loads, but I've already figured that cost into it. I'll be acting on behalf of myself, not an established transport company, so they will be more inclined to see this as a way of accomplishing what they need without suspending their morass of restrictions. You will be getting iron for less than you pay now, and I can deliver. You can't even get what you need at the higher price. You will make more, too. We both benefit. The blacksmith stared for a moment as he tried to find a flaw in Richard's plan. You're either the stupidest crook I ever saw, or the... I don't even know what. But I have Brother Narev breathing down my neck, and that isn't pleasant. Not pleasant at all. I probably shouldn't tell you this. But you know how Ishak sweats over me? I sweat ten times that much when Brother Narev comes to ask why the tools aren't ready. The brothers don't want to hear my troubles. They just want what they want. I understand, Mr. Casella. He let out a sigh. All right, Richard Cipher. One and a half gold marks for fifty bars delivered by dawn tomorrow. But I'll only give you the one and a quarter now. You get the other quarter mark in the morning when my iron is here. Agreed. Who is this Brother Narev, anyway? Brother Narev? He's the high priest. Did I hear someone mention my name? The voice was deep enough to nearly rattle the tools off the walls. Richard and the blacksmith turned to see a man approaching from around the corner of the shop. Here and there, his heavy robes betrayed his large bony frame. His face seemed to pull the gathering darkness into the deep creases of his face. Dark eyes gleamed out from under a hooded brow, overspread with a tangle of graying hairs. Wiry hair above his ears curled up from under the edges of a dark creased cap. The cap sat halfway down his forehead. He looked like a shadow come to life to stalk the world. Mr. Casella bowed. Richard followed his lead. We were just discussing the problem of getting enough iron, Brother Narev. Where are all my new chisels, blacksmith? I have yet to. I have stone sitting down there with no chisels to cut it. I have stone cutters who need more tools. You are holding up my palace. The blacksmith lifted a hand toward Richard. This is Richard Cipher, Brother Narev. He was just telling me how he thought he might be able to get me the iron I need, and the high priest held up his hand for silence. You can get the blacksmith what he needs? Brother Narev snapped at Richard. It can be done. Then do it. Richard bowed his head. By your command, Brother Narev. The shadowed figure turned to the shop. Show me, blacksmith. The blacksmith seemed to know what the high priest wanted and followed behind him, gesturing for Richard to come along. Richard understood. He couldn't get the money to buy the iron until the blacksmith first took care of the important man who had just vanished into the shadows of the shop. When the blacksmith snapped his fingers and pointed at a lamp on his way by, Richard snatched it up. He lit a long splinter in the glowing coals of the forge and then lit the lamp. He held it up behind the two men as they stood just inside the doorway to the room with the complex contraption of metal bars sitting on the floor beyond. Mr. Casella held the chalkboard up in the light. Brother Narev looked at the drawing on the chalkboard, then to the maze of iron lines on the floor, comparing them. Richard felt an icy tingle at the base of his scalp when he suddenly realized what the thing on the floor was. Brother Narev pointed to the drawing, to the line Richard had said was wrong. This line is wrong, Brother Narev growled. The blacksmith wagged his finger over the chalk drawing. But I have to stabilize this mass over here. I told you to add braces. I didn't invite you to ruin the main scheme. You can leave the top of the support where you have it, but the bottom should be attached here. Brother Narev pointed to where Richard had said it should go. Mr. Casella scratched his head of short hair as he stole a glance over his shoulder, just long enough to scowl at Richard. That would work, the blacksmith conceded. It won't be as easy, but it will work. 
I'm not concerned with how easy it is, Brother Narev said with menace. I don't want anything attached to this area here. No, sir. It must be seamless, so none of the joining work shows through when it is covered in gold. Get me those tools made first. Yes, Brother Narev. The high priest turned an uncomfortable scrutiny on Richard. There's something about you. Do I know you? No, Brother Narev. I've never before met you. I would remember. Meeting a great man such as yourself, I mean. I would remember such a thing. He glared askance at Richard. Yes, I suppose you would. You get the blacksmith his iron. I said I would. The brother grunted irritably. So you did. As the tall shadow of a man stared into Richard's eyes, Richard absently reached to lift his sword a little to make sure it was clear in its scabbard. The sword wasn't there. Brother Narev opened his mouth to say something, but his attention was caught by two young men entering the shop. They wore robes like the high priest, but without caps. They had simple hoods pulled up over their heads instead. Brother Narev, one called. What is it, Neil? The book you sent for has arrived. You asked that we come for you at once. Brother Narev nodded to the young disciple, then directed a sour look at Mr. Casella and Richard. Get it done, he said to both. Both Richard and the blacksmith bowed their heads as the high priest swept out of the shop. It felt as if a thundercloud had just departed over the horizon. Come on, Mr. Casella said. I'll get you the gold. Richard followed him into a little room where the master blacksmith pulled out a strong box attached with massive chain to a huge pin in the floor under the plank, serving as his desk. He unlocked the strong box and handed Richard a gold mark. Victor. Richard looked up from the gold mark and frowned. What? Victor. You asked what more there was to my name. He set silver to make up the quarter mark on top of the gold mark resting in Richard's palm. Victor. Chapter 49 After leaving Ishak's place and before going to get the iron for Victor, Richard rushed back to his room. It wasn't dinner he wanted, but to let Nietzsche know that he had to go back to work. She had in the past made it clear that they were husband and wife, and that she would take a dim view of him vanishing. He was to remain in al Turang and work, just like any other normal man. Camille and one of his friends were waiting for him. Both were wearing shirts. Richard stood at the foot of the stairs, looking up at the two. I'm sorry, Camille, but I have to go back to work. Then you're a bigger dupe than I thought, taking work at night, too. You should just stop trying. It's no use trying in life. You just have to take what life gives you. I knew you would have an excuse not to do what you said you would do. You almost had me thinking that you might be different than... I was going to say that I have to go back to work. So we have to do this right away. Camille twisted his mouth, as was his habit to express his displeasure with those older and stupider than he. This is Nabby. He wants to watch your foolish labor, too. Richard nodded, not showing any irritation at Camille's arrogant attitude. Glad to meet you, Nabby. The third young man glared back from the shadows, back by the stairs in the hall. He was the biggest. He wasn't wearing a shirt. To pry the steps apart, Richard used his knife and a rusty metal bar Camille found for him. It wasn't difficult. They were ready to fall apart on their own. As the two youths watched, Richard cleaned the grooves in the stringers. Since they were chewed up from being loose, he deepened their bottoms, showing the two what he was doing and explaining how he would bevel the ends of the treads to lock into the deepened channel. Richard watched Camille and Nobby as they whittled wedges to match the one he made as a pattern for them. They were only too delighted to show him their knife work. Richard was delighted that it helped get the job done sooner. Once they had them back together, Camille and Nabi both ran up and down the repaired steps, apparently surprised that they really were now sturdy underfoot, and pleased that they were partly responsible for the repair. You both did a good job, Richard told them, because they had. They didn't make any smart remarks. They actually smiled. Richard's dinner was watery millet eaten by the light of a burning wick floating in linseed oil. The smell from the simple light went poorly with dinner, which was more water than millet. Nietzsche said she'd already eaten and didn't want any more. She encouraged him to finish it. He didn't give Nietzsche the details of his second job. 
She was insistent only that he work. The work itself was irrelevant to her. She tended to her household chores and expected him to earn them a living. She seemed satisfied that he was learning how ordinary people had to work themselves sick just to make enough to get along in life. The promise of money to buy them more food seemed to spark a longing in her eyes that her lips did not express. He noticed that the black material covering her once full bosom was now slack and half empty. Her elbows and hands had become bony. As he took another spoonful of millet, Nietzsche casually mentioned that the landlord, Camille's father, had come by. Richard looked up from his soup. What did he say? He said that since you have a job, the Area Citizens Building Committee had assessed us extra rent in order to help pay the rent of those in the local buildings who can't work. You see, Richard, how life under the ways of the order cultivates caring in people so that we all work together for the benefit of all? Nearly all of what was not taken by the workers' group was taken by the Area Building Committee or some other committee, and all for the same purpose, for the betterment of the people of the order. Richard and Nietzsche had next to nothing left for food. Richard's clothes were getting looser all the time, but not as loose as Nietzsche's dresses were getting. She seemed smug about the fact that their rent was past due. Foodstuffs, at least, were relatively inexpensive when they were available. People said that it was only by the grace of the Creator and the wisdom of the Order that they could afford any food at all. Richard had heard talk at Ishak's place that more plentiful and varied food could be had for a price. Richard didn't have the price. On his wagon ride with Jory to the foundry and the blacksmith, Richard had spotted distant houses that looked to be quite grand. Well-dressed people walked those streets. Occasionally he saw them in carriages. They were people who neither dirtied their hands or soiled their morals with business. They were men of principle. They were officials of the order who saw to it that those with the ability sacrificed for the cause of the order. Self-sacrifice is the moral duty of all people, she said in challenge to his clenched teeth. Richard could not hold his tongue. Self-sacrifice is the obscene and senseless suicide of slaves. Nietzsche gaped at him. It was as if he had just said that a mother's milk was poison to her newborn. Richard, I do believe that that's the cruelest thing I've ever heard you say. It's cruel to say that I would not happily sacrifice myself for that thug, Gadi, or for some other thug I don't know. It's cruel not to willingly sacrifice what's mine to any greedy wretch who lusts to possess plundered goods, the unearned, even at the cost of their victim's blood. Self-sacrifice for a value held dear, for a life held dear, for freedom and the freedom of those you respect. Self-sacrifice such as mine for Kalin's life is the only rationally valid sacrifice. To be selfless means you are a slave who must surrender your most priceless possession, your life, to any smirking thief who demands it. The suicide of self-sacrifice is but a requirement imposed by masters on slaves. Since there is a knife to my throat, it is not to my good that I am stripped of what I earn by my own hand and mind. It is only to the good of the one with the knife, and those who by weight of numbers but not reason dictate what is the good of all. Those cheering him on so they might lap up any drop of blood their masters miss. Life is precious. That's why sacrifice for freedom is rational. It is for life itself and your ability to live it that you act, since life without freedom is the slow, sure death of self-sacrifice to the good of mankind, who is always someone else. Mankind is just a collection of individuals. Why should everyone's life be more important, more precious, more valuable than yours? Mindless, mandatory self-sacrifice is insane. She stared, not at him, but at the flame dancing on the pool of linseed oil. You don't really mean that, Richard. You're just tired and angry that you have to work at night, too, just to get by. You should realize that all those others you help are there to help society, including you, should you be the one in desperate need. Richard didn't bother to argue with her and said only, I feel sorry for you, Nietzsche. You don't even know the value of your own life. Sacrifice could mean nothing to you. That's not true, Richard, she whispered. I sacrifice for you. 
I saved what millet we had for you that you might have strength. The strength to stand upright when I throw my life away? Why did you sacrifice your dinner, Nietzsche? Because it was the right thing to do. It was for the good of others. He nodded as he peered at her in the dim light. You would endanger your life to starvation for others, for any others? He pointed a thumb back over his shoulder. How about that thug, Gadi? Would you starve to death so he might eat? It might mean something, Nietzsche, if it was a sacrifice for someone you value, but it isn't. It is a sacrifice to some mindless gray ideal of the order. When she didn't answer, Richard pushed the rest of his dinner before her. I don't want your meaningless sacrifice. She stared at the bowl of millet for an eternity. Richard felt sorry for her, for what she couldn't understand as she stared at the bowl. He thought about what would happen to Kalin if Nietzsche were to fall sick from not getting enough to eat. Eat, Nietzsche, he said softly. She finally picked up her spoon and did as he said. When she had finished, she looked up with those blue eyes that seemed so eager for the sight of something he could not make her see. She slid the empty bowl to the center of the table. Thank you, Richard, for the meal. Why thank me? I am a selfless slave expected to sacrifice for any worthless person who presents their need to me. He strode to the door. With his hand on the loose knob, he turned back. I have to go or I will lose my work. Her big blue eyes were brimming with tears as she nodded. Richard made the first trip from the foundry through the dark streets to Victor's shop carrying five bars. From windows along the way, a few people blinked out at the man lugging a load past. They blinked without comprehension at the meaning of what he was doing. He was working for nothing but his own benefit. Bent under the weight... Richard kept telling himself that carrying five bars each time would make it only ten trips, and the less trips the better. He carried five the second trip, and the third. By the fourth time he returned to the foundry, he decided that he would have to make an extra trip in order to give himself a break and only carry four bars for a few of the trips. He lost track of how many times he went back and forth throughout the empty night. The next to last time he struggled to lift but two bars. That left three. He forced himself to carry all three the last time, trading the extra effort for the lesser distance. He got the last three bars to Victor's place before dawn. His shoulders were bruised and painful. He had to walk all the way to his job at Ishak's place, so he couldn't wait for Victor to arrive to complete his payment of the last quarter gold mark. The day of work was a break from the night of exhausting lugging of iron bars. Jory didn't talk unless spoken to, so Richard lay in the wagon bed with a load of charcoal and snatched a few minutes of sleep here and there as the wagon bounced along. He only felt relieved that he had done as he had promised. As he returned home after an interminable day, Richard looked up and saw Camille and Nabi standing at the head of the stairs. They both had on shirts. We've been waiting for you to come home and finish the job, Camille said. Richard swayed on his feet. What job? The stairs. We did that last night. You did only the stairs in the front. You said you intended to fix the stairs. The front is only part of the stairs. The back stairs are twice as long and in worse shape than the front were. You don't want your wife and the other women of the building to fall and break their necks when they go out back to the cooking hearth or the privy, do you? This was their idea of a little test. Richard knew he would lose an opportunity if he put them off. He was so tired he couldn't think straight. Nietzsche stuck her head out the front door. I thought I heard your voice. Come in to dinner. I have soup waiting on you. Got any tea? Nietzsche cast a sidelong glance at the two in shirts. I can make tea. Come on and I'll get it while you have your soup. Please bring it out to the back, Richard said. I promise to fix the stairs. Now? There are still a couple of hours of light. I can eat while we're working. Camille and Nabi asked more questions than the evening before. The third youth, Gadi, passed by occasionally as Richard and the other two worked. Gadi, without his shirt, made a point of looking Nietzsche up and down when she brought Richard his soup and tea. When Richard had finally finished, he went to the room that had once been Ishak's parlor and was now his and Nietzsche's home. He took off his shirt and splashed water on his face from the wash basin. 
His head was throbbing. Wash your hair, Nietzsche said. You're filthy. I don't want lice in here. Rather than argue that he had no lice, Richard dipped his face in the water and scrubbed his head with a cake of coarse soap. It was easier than talking her out of it so he could go to sleep. Nietzsche hated lice. He was thankful, he supposed, that she was at least a clean wife in their fraudulent arrangement. She kept the room bedding and his clothes clean, despite the difficulty of hauling water from the well down the street. She never objected to any work necessary to simulate the lives of normal people. She seemed to want something so badly that she often lost herself in the role to the extent that while he never forgot she was a sister of the dark and his captor, she occasionally did. He dunked his head again, swishing his hair, rinsing out the soap. As a stream of water ran off his chin and back into the basin, he asked, Who is Brother Narev? Nietzsche, sitting on her pallet sewing, paused and looked up. Her sewing suddenly looked out of place, as if her parody of domestic life lost its aura for her. Why do you ask? I met him yesterday, out at the blacksmith's. Out at the site of the project? Richard nodded. I had to deliver iron out there. She bent back to her needlework. Richard watched in the light of the linseed oil lamp sitting beside her as she took a few more stitches in the patch to the knees of a pair of his pants. She finally paused and let her arms, one sheathed in his pant leg, sink to her lap. Brother Narev is the high priest of the Fellowship of Order, an ancient sect devoted to doing the Creator's will in this world. He is the heart and soul of the Order, their moral guide, so to speak. He and his disciples lead the righteous people of the Order in the ways of the everlasting light of the Creator. He is an advisor to Emperor Jagang. Richard was taken aback. He hadn't expected her to be so versed on the subject. His caution, along with the hair at the back of his neck, lifted. What sort of advisor? She took another stitch, pulling the long thread through. Brother Narev was Jagang's pedagogue, his teacher, advisor, and mentor. Brother Narev put the fire in Jagang's belly. He's a wizard, isn't he? It was more statement than question. She looked up from her sewing. He could see in her blue eyes that she was weighing whether or not to tell him, or perhaps how much she wanted to tell him. His steady gaze told her that he was expecting the whole truth. In the language of the street, you could describe him as such. What does that mean? Common people, those who understand little about magic, would describe him as a wizard. Strictly speaking, though, he is not a wizard. Then what is he, strictly speaking? Actually, he is a sorcerer. Richard could only stare at her. He had always assumed that a wizard and a sorcerer were the same thing. When he thought about it, he realized that people who knew about magic spoke exclusively of a male with the gift as a wizard. He had never heard any of those people mention a sorcerer. You mean he's like you? Like a sorceress? Only male? The question stymied her for a moment. I suppose you could think of it that way, but that's not really right. If you want to compare it, then you would have to say he has more in common with a wizard, since both are male. The concept of sorceress introduces irrelevant issues. Richard swiped water from his face. Please, Nietzsche, I've been up all last night working, and I'm dead on my feet. Don't go all abstract and complex on me. Just tell me what it means. She set her sewing aside and gestured to his pallet for him to sit near her in the light. Richard pulled his shirt back on. He yawned as he crossed his legs under himself on his pallet. Brother Narev is a sorcerer, she began. I'm sorry, but the distinction is just not something simply explained. It's a very complex matter. I will try to make it as clear as I can, but you must understand that I can't boil it down too much, or it will lose any real flavor of the truth. Sorcerers are much the same as wizards, but different, in much the way that water and oil are both liquids, you might say. Both pour and can dissolve things, but they don't mix, and they dissolve different things. Neither do the magic of a wizard and a sorcerer mix, nor do they work on the same things. Anything he did against a wizard's gift, or anything a wizard did against his, would not work. While both are the gift, they are different aspects. They don't mix. 
The magic of each nullifies the other, making it just sort of fizzle. You mean like additive and subtractive are opposites? No. While on the surface, that would seem a good way to understand it, it's entirely the wrong way to think of it. She lifted her hands, as if to begin again, but then let them drop back into her lap. It's very hard to explain the difference to one such as you, who has little understanding of how his own gift works. You have no basis in which to ground anything I could tell you. There are no words which are both accurate and which you would understand. This is beyond your understanding. Well, do you mean that much like a wolf and a cougar are both predators, they are not the same sort of creature? That's a little closer to it. How common are these sorcerers? About as common as dream walkers, she said, as she gave him a meaningful look, or war wizards. Even though he couldn't understand it, and she couldn't explain it, Richard, for some reason, found that bit of news troubling. What is it, though, that he does differently? Nietzsche let out a sigh. I'm no expert, and I'm not entirely sure, but I believe he does the same basic sort of things a wizard would do, but just does them with a sorcerer's unique quality of magic. Liquor and ale both get you drunk, but they are different kinds of drink made from different things. One of those is stronger. Not so with wizards and sorcerers. Do you see why words and these kinds of comparisons are so inadequate? The strength of a wizard and a sorcerer's gift is dependent on the individual. It is not influenced by the fundamental nature of his magic. Richard scratched his stubble as he considered her words. In view of the fact that both could do magic, he couldn't come up with any distinction that seemed of any practical importance. Is there anything he can do that a wizard can't? He waited. She didn't look like she was thinking about his question, but more like she was considering whether she wanted to answer it at all. Nietzsche, you told me when you first captured me that you would tell me the truth about things. You said you had no reason to deceive me. She watched his eyes, but finally looked away as she pulled her blonde hair back from her face. The gesture unexpectedly, painfully, reminded him of Kalin. Perhaps. I believe he may have learned how to replicate the spell that surrounded the Palace of the Prophets. It took wizards thousands of years ago with both sides of the gift to create that particular spell. I believe that one of the ways sorcerers are different is that their power is not divisible into its constituent elements, as it is in wizards. So, while his magic works differently, he may have learned enough of how the wizards, who at that time possessed both sides of the gift, as do you, were able to create the spell around the Palace of the Prophets to be able to replicate it in his own fashion. You mean the spell that slowed aging? You think he can cast such a web? Yes. Jagang intimated as much to me. I knew Brother Narev when I was young. He was a grown man then, a visionary, preaching the doctrine of the Order. He spoke pensively about wishing to live long enough to see his vision of the Order come to fruition. When I was taken to live at the palace in Tanamura, I believe that may have given him the idea, as he not long after went there too. The sisters knew nothing of him. They thought him no more than a humble worker. Since his gift is different than that of a wizard, they didn't detect his ability. I now believe that he went there for the express purpose of studying the spell around the Palace of the Prophets, so that he could recreate such a spell for his own benefit. Why didn't he storm the palace, take it over, and then he could have the spell for his purpose? It's possible that in the beginning he thought he might one day take over the palace for his cause, in fact, Emperor Jagang had that exact plan. But it's also possible that he was from the beginning studying the spell because he wanted not simply to recreate it, but to enhance it. Richard rubbed his brow, trying to comfort his aching head. You mean that now maybe he thinks he can create the spell over the retreat, the Emperor's new palace, like that one at the Palace of the Prophets, but better, so that aging will be slowed even more? so that he and his chosen will live even longer? Yes. Don't forget, age is relative. To one who lives to a thousand years, living less than one century would seem all too brief. To a person who lives many thousands of years, though, a lifetime that lasts but a mere one millennium 
would seem fleeting. I suspect that Brother Narev has learned to slow aging to such an extent that it would make him the next best thing to immortal. Jagang had planned on capturing the Palace of the Prophets. It might have been that once they secured the palace, Brother Narev intended to augment its spell to suit his purposes. But I spoiled that plan. Nietzsche nodded. As are all of us who were once at the palace, Brother Narev now grows older just like everyone else. Once away from the spell, it feels like a headlong rush toward the grave. What youth Brother Narev has left, he is no doubt eager to preserve. Remaining relatively young forever has much to be said for it. Remaining old forever would be less attractive. Because you destroyed the Palace of the Prophets, where he could have had ample time to bring his plan to bear, he has been forced to act sooner rather than later. Richard flopped back on his mat. He laid the back of a wrist over his forehead. He has the blacksmith making a spell form in iron. The blacksmith has no idea what it is he's creating. The spell form is to be covered with gold eventually. For purity, it's likely that is merely part of the process. It could even be that the gold-covered spell form is nothing more than a pattern from which the true spell form will be cast in pure gold. Richard squinted in thought. If it is a pattern for casting, that would make it more likely that Narev intends to cast a number of these spell forms, that they will work together. Nietzsche looked up and frowned. Yes, that is a possibility. Will making such a thing harm the blacksmith? No. It is propitious conjuring. Disregarding for the moment the purpose for which it is desired, such a spell is meant to be beneficial. It is to slow aging in order to lengthen life. What about Brother Narev's disciples? Young wizards from the Palace of the Prophets. Alarmed, Richard sat up. I was at the Palace of the Prophets. They will recognize me. No, they were young wizards in training there, but they left to follow Brother Narev before you arrived. If they see you, they will not know you. If they're wizards, won't they recognize that I have magic? A smile of contempt colored her features. They are not that talented. They are but bugs to what you are. Richard found no comfort in the compliment. Won't Brother Narev or his disciples recognize you? Her face turned serious. Oh, they would know me. It sounds as if Brother Narev must be strong in his gift. Won't he be able to recognize that I have the gift? He was looking at me strangely. He asked if he knew me. He sensed something. Why did you think him a wizard? Richard picked at the straw stuffing coming out of the pad over his palate as he considered the question. There was nothing that gave it away for a fact, but I strongly suspected it from a lot of little things. The way he carried himself, the way he looked at people, the way he spoke, everything about him. Only after I surmised that Narev was a wizard did I realize that the thing the blacksmith was making for him looked like some sort of spell form. He would suspect you of being gifted in much the same way. Can you tell the gifted? Yes. I've learned to recognize an ageless look in their eyes. I can in some way see the aura of the gift around those in whom it is powerful. You, for instance. At times the air crackles around you. She stared in fascination. I've never heard of such a thing. It must have something to do with you having both sides. You have both sides. Don't you see it? No, but I acquired the subtractive side in a different manner. She had given her soul to the keeper of the underworld. But you see nothing of the sort in Brother Narev, do you? When Richard shook his head, she went on with her explanation. That is because, as I explained, you have different aspects of the gift. Other than with your faculty of reason, you have no wizardly ability to recognize the gift in him. He has no sorceress ability to recognize the gift in you. Your magic won't work on one another. Only your faculty of reason betrayed his gift to you. Richard realized that, without saying it, she was telling him that if he didn't want Narev to learn that he had the gift, then he had better be careful around the man. There were times when he thought he had her game figured out. There were times like now when it seemed his entire perception of her purpose shifted 
At times, it almost seemed to him as if she threw her beliefs in his face, not because she believed them, but because she was desperately hoping for a reason not to, hoping he would find her in some lost, dark world and show her the way out. Richard sighed inwardly. He had given her his arguments as to why her beliefs were wrong, but rather than sway her, it only angered her, at best, or worse, further entrenched her in her convictions. As tired as he was, he lay in his bed, his eyes but narrow slits, watching Nietzsche, lit by the light of a single wick, bent in concentration over her sewing. One of the most powerful women ever to walk the world, and she appeared perfectly content to sew a patch in the knee of his pants. She accidentally stuck herself with the needle. As she shook her hand and winced with the pain, Richard had the sudden cold recollection of the link between her and Kalin. His beloved would feel that prick. Chapter 50 Richard took the snow-white slice when Victor held it out. What's this? Try it, Victor said as he waved an insistent hand. Eat. Tell me what you think. It's from my homeland. Here, a red onion goes well with it. The white slice was smooth, dense, and rich with salt and herbs. Richard let out a rapturous moan. He rolled his eyes. Victor, this is the best thing I've ever had. What is it? Lardo. They sat on the threshold of the double doors out of the room with the marble monolith, watching dawn break over the site where the walls of the retreat had begun to rise. Only a few people stirred below. Before long, laborers would arrive in great numbers to begin again their work on the retreat. It went on every day without pause, rain or shine. Now that spring was wearing on, the weather was pleasant nearly every day, with afternoon rains every few days, but nothing dreary or oppressive just enough to wash you clean and make you feel refreshed. If not for the ever-present ache of missing Kalin, his worry over the war far to the north, his loathing of being held prisoner, the slave labor at the site, the abuse of people, the people who disappeared or those who confessed under torture, and the grindingly repressive nature of life in all to he might have found the spring quite enjoyable. Day by day, too, his worry grew that Kalin would soon be able to leave their mountain home. He dreaded her getting caught up in such a war, as would soon be roaring into full flame. After he had eaten some of the mild onion, Richard went back to the delightful lardo. He moaned again. Victor, I've never tasted anything like this. What's lardo? Victor held out another thin slice. Richard gladly accepted. After a long night of work, the dense delicacy was really hitting the spot. Victor gestured with his knife to the tin beside him, holding the pure white block. Lardo is paunch fat from the boar. And this tin of it is from your homeland? No, no, I make it myself. I come from far to the south of here, far away near the sea. That is where we make lardo. When I come here, I make it here. I put the paunch fat in tubs I carved myself out of marble as white as the lardo. Victor gestured with his hands as he spoke, working the air as vigorously as he worked iron. The fat is put in the tubs with coarse salt and rosemary and other spices. From time to time, I turn it in the brine. It must rest a year in the stone to cure, to become lardo. A year? Victor nodded emphatically. This we are eating I made last spring. My father taught me to make lardo. Lardo is something only men make. My father was a quarry worker. Lardo gives quarry workers the stamina they need to work long hours sawing blocks of our marble or swinging a pickaxe. For blacksmiths, too, Lardo gives you power to lift a hammer all day. So there are quarries where you lived? He waved his thick hand at the towering block behind them. This, this is Cavatura marble, from my homeland. He pointed out at several of the stock areas below. That there and there is marble from Cavatura, too. That's where you're from, Cavatura? Victor grinned like a wolf as he nodded. The place where all that beautiful marble came from. Our city gets its name from the marble quarries. My family are all carvers or quarry workers. Me? I end up a blacksmith making tools for them. Blacksmiths are sculptors. He grunted a laugh. And you? Where are you from? Me? Far away. They had no marble there, only granite. Richard changed the subject, lest he have to start inventing lies. Besides, it was getting light. So, Victor... When do you need more of that special steel? Tomorrow. Are you up to it? The steel Victor needed was from farther away at a foundry out near the charcoal makers. 
They needed a lot of charcoal to cook with the iron to make high-grade steel, or came in by barge from not far away. It would take most of the night for Richard to get there and back. Sure, I will be sick today and get some sleep. He had become sick quite a lot over the last several months. It fit right in with the way most of the others worked. Work some, be sick, tell the workers group that you were ailing. Some people limped in with a story. It wasn't necessary. The workers group never questioned. The only thing he rarely missed were the meetings where those with bad attitudes were named. People at the meetings were often named, but you were more likely to bring attention if you missed the meetings. Those named were often subsequently arrested and given an opportunity to confess. More than once, a person named at a meeting as having an unsatisfactory attitude killed themselves. One of Brother Narrow's disciples, Neil, came around last evening with some new orders. Victor's voice had taken on a tense edge. What you just brought will last me the day, but I need that steel by tomorrow. You will have it. Are you sure? Have I ever let you down, Victor? Victor's hard face melted into a helpless smile. He passed Richard another slice of lardo. No, Richard, you never have. Not once. I had given up hope of ever meeting another man who kept his word. Well, I'd best be off and take care of my horses. They've had a hard night, and I'll need them rested for tonight. How much steel do you need? Two hundred, half square and half round. Richard performed a pained moan. You're going to make me strong or kill me, Victor. Victor smiled his approval. You want the gold? No, you can pay me when I deliver. Richard no longer needed the money in advance. He had a heavy wagon now and a strong team of horses. He paid Ishak to care for them along with the transport company's teams in the company stables. Ishak helped Richard with any number of the special arrangements that he'd had to make. Ishak knew which officials lived in the nice homes. They couldn't afford those homes with just their pay as officials of the order. You be careful of Neil, Richard said. Why's that? For some reason, he believes I'm in need of lecturing. He truly believes that the order is mankind's savior. He puts the good of the fellowship of order above the good of mankind. Victor sighed as he stood and tied on his leather apron. My thoughts about him, too. As they passed into the building, the sun was just lighting the marble standing there. Richard lingered and put a hand to the cold stone, as he always did whenever he passed it. It almost felt alive to him, alive with potential. Victor, I asked you once what this was. Mind telling me now? The blacksmith paused beside Richard and gazed up at the pure stone before him. He reached out and touched it lightly, letting his fingertips glide over the surface, testing, caressing. This is my statue. What statue? The one I want to carve someday. Many in my family are carvers. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to carve, too. I wanted to be a great sculptor. I wanted to create great works. Instead, I had to work for the master blacksmith at the quarry. My family needed to eat. I was the oldest living son. My father and the blacksmith were friends. My father asked the blacksmith to take me on. He didn't want another son lost to the stone. It's a hard and dangerous life, cutting stone from a mountain. Did you carve other things? I mean, like wood or something? Victor, still staring at his stone, shook his head. I only wanted to carve stone. I bought this block with my savings. I own it. Few men can say they own a part of a mountain, a part as pure and beautiful as this. Richard could understand the sentiments. So, Victor, what will you carve out of it? He squinted, as if trying to peer beyond the surface. I don't know. They say that the stone will speak to you and tell you what it should be. Do you believe that? Victor laughed his deep laugh. No, not really. But the thing is, this is a beautiful piece of stone. There is none finer for statues than Cavatura marble, and few blocks of Cavatura marble with as fine a grain as this piece. I couldn't bear to see it carved up into something ugly, like what they carve nowadays. It used to be, long ago, that only beauty was carved from beauty such as this. No more, he whispered in distant bitterness. Now man must be carved with a twisted nature, as an object of shame. Richard had delivered tools down to the site for Victor, down to where the carving was taking place, and had had the opportunity to get a closer look at the work being done. 
The outside of the stone walls was to be covered with expansive scenes on a scale that was staggering. The walls that would enclose the palace went on for miles. The carvings being produced for the retreat were the same as those Richard had seen everywhere in the old world, but would have no equal in sheer overpowering quantity. The entire palace was to be an epic portrayal of the order's view of the nature of life and of redemption in the afterlife of the underworld. The figures being carved were stilted with limbs that could not possibly function. Those carved in relief were forever bound to the stone from which they only haltingly emerged. The poses reflected a view of man as ineffective, shallow, unsubstantial. The elements of the hated anatomy of man, his muscle, bone, and flesh, were melted together into lifeless limbs, their proportions distorted to strip the figures of their humanity. Expressions were either impassive, if the statue was supposed to portray virtue, or filled with terror, agony, torment, if intended to illustrate the fate of evildoers. Proper men and women, bent under the weight of labor, were always made to look out at the world through the vacant stupor of resignation. Most often, it was difficult to tell male from female. Their worldly bodies, an everlasting source of shame, were hidden by bulky garments, like those the priests of the order wore. Further reflecting the order's teachings, only the sinful were shown naked so that all could see their detestable, cankerous bodies. The carvings represented man as helpless, doomed by the inadequacy of his intellect to suffer every blow of existence. Most of the sculptors, Richard suspected, feared to be questioned or even tortured, and so repeated the view that man was to be carved accepting his vile nature, thus earning his reward only through death. The carvings were meant to assure the masses that this was the only proper goal for which man could hope. Richard knew that a few of the carvers vehemently believed such teachings. He was always careful of what he said around them. Ah, Richard, I wish you could see beautiful statues instead of today's scourge. I have seen statues of great beauty, Richard softly assured the man. Have you? I'm so glad. People should see those things, not this, this... He waved a hand toward the rising walls of the retreat. This evil in the guise of goodness. So you will one day carve such beauty? I don't know, Richard, he finally admitted. The order takes everything. They say that the individual is of no importance except inasmuch as he can contribute to the good of others. They take what art can be, the lifeblood of the soul, and turn it to poison, turn it to death. Victor smiled wistfully. This way, as it is, I can enjoy the beautiful statue inside the stone. I understand, Victor. I really do. The way you describe it, I can see it too. We will both enjoy my statue the way it is, then. Victor took his hand from the stone and pointed to the base. Besides, you see there, there is an imperfection in the stone. It runs all the way through. That is why I could afford this piece of marble, because it has this flaw. Were most anyone to carve this, it would endanger the stone. If not done just right, and with the flaw taken in mind, the entire piece could easily shatter. I have never been able to think of how to carve this stone to take advantage of its beauty, but to also avoid the flaw. Perhaps, someday, it will come to you how to carve the stone, to create a thing of nobility. Nobility... Ah, but wouldn't that be something, the most sublime form of beauty? He shook his head. But I will not do it, not unless the revolt comes. Revolt? Victor's careful gaze swept the hillside through the open door. The revolt. It will come. The order cannot stand. Evil cannot stand. Not forever, anyway. In my homeland, when I was young, there used to be beauty and there used to be freedom. They were shamed into giving up their lives, their freedom, bit by bit, to the cause of fairness to all men. People didn't know what they had and let freedom slip away for nothing but the hollow promise of a better world, a world without effort, without struggle to achieve, without productive work. It was always someone else who would do these things, who would provide, who would make their lives easy. We used to be a land of abundance. Now what food is grown rots while it awaits committees to decide who should have it, who should move it, and what it should cost. Meanwhile, people starve. Insurgents, those disloyal to the order, 
are blamed for all the starvation and strife that slowly destroys us, and so ever more people are arrested and put to death. We are a land of death. The Order continually proclaims its feelings for mankind, but their ways can but cultivate death. On my way here, I have seen corpses by the thousands go uncounted and unburied. The new world is blamed for every ill, every failure, and young men eager to smite their oppressors march off to war. Many people, though, have come to see the truth. They and the children of these people, me and others like me, hunger for freedom, to live our own lives, rather than be slaves to the order and their reign of death. There is unrest in my homeland, as there is here. A revolt is coming. Unrest? Here? I've seen no unrest. Victor smiled a sly smile. Those with revolt in their hearts do not show their true feelings. The Order, always fearful of insurrection, tortures confessions from those they wrongly arrest. Every day more are put to death. Those who want things to change know better than to make themselves targets before the time has come. Someday, Richard, revolt will come. Richard shook his head. I don't know, Victor. Revolt takes resolve. I don't think such real resolve exists. You have seen people who are unhappy with the way things are. Ishak, those at the foundries, my men and me, all those you deal with other than the officials you bribe, hunger for change. Victor lifted an eyebrow at Richard. Not one of them complains to any board or committee about what you do. You may want nothing to do with it, as I believe is your right, but there are those who listen to the whispers of the freedom to the north. Richard tensed. Freedom to the north? Victor nodded solemnly. They speak of a savior, Richard Rawl. He leads them in the fight for freedom. They say that this Richard Rawl will bring us our revolt. Had it not all been so overwhelmingly tragic, Richard would have burst out laughing. How do you know this Rawl character is worth following? Victor fixed Richard with a look that Richard remembered from the first time he met the blacksmith. You can judge a man by his enemies. Richard Rawl is hated by the Emperor and by Brother Nariv and by his disciples as no other man is hated. He is the one. He bears the torch of revolution. Richard could muster only a desolate smile. He is but a man, my friend. Don't worship a man. Worship his cause, but not him. Victor's glare, so full of his emotion, his burning hunger for freedom, turned back to his wolfish grin. Ah, but that is what Richard Rawl would say. That is why he is the one. Richard thought it would be best to change the subject. He saw that it was getting light. Well, I have to get going. I'm sure you'll figure out what to do with the stone, Victor. It will come to you when the time is right. The blacksmith feigned a scowl, but it was a poor spoof of the very real one that had just departed. That is always what I thought, too. Richard scratched his head. Have you ever carved anything, Victor? No, nothing. Are you sure you are able to carve? That you have the ability? Victor tapped his temple as if to dissuade a skeptic. In here I have ability. In here I have beauty. That is all that matters to me. If I never touch steel to this stone, then I will always have the beauty of what it could be. And that, the Order can never take away from me. Chapter 51 Nietzsche wiped the sweat off her brow as she went down the line, checking to see if her clothes were dry. Summer was only around the corner, and it was already hot. Her back hurt from her earlier work at the wash tub and various other chores. The other women were chatting in the warm sunshine. They occasionally giggled over some quirk that one of them, after a round of amiable urging, would divulge about her husband. Everyone in the building, it seemed, had begun coming alive along with the new spring growth. Nietzsche knew that spring had nothing to do with it. That knowledge drew frustration up from her darkest recesses. She couldn't figure out how Richard did it. No matter how hard she tried... She just couldn't unravel the knot he seemed to tie around everything. She was beginning to believe that if she took him down into the deepest cave she could find, the sunlight would make its way into the darkest recesses to shine on him. She would think it was some kind of magical luck, 
except she knew beyond doubt that he had not used any magic whatsoever. The backyard, such an overgrown, tangled place so filthy with piles of scrap and garbage, was now a garden. The men who lived in the building, after they came home from work, had rid the yard of the refuse. Even several of the ones who didn't work had come out of their rooms to help cart away an item or two. After it was cleared out, the women of the building had turned the soil and planted a garden. They were going to have vegetables. Vegetables? There was talk of getting a few chickens. The single latrine off in the back corner, so overused and so foul, was now two privies in good repair. Now there was rarely a wait to use a privy, and there were no more urgent pleas or frayed tempers. Camille and Nabi had helped Richard build them, partly out of scraps of lumber salvaged from the refuse piles in the yard before they were hauled away, and some they collected from other rubbish heaps. Nietzsche had hardly believed her eyes when she had seen Camille and Nabi in shirts digging the holes for the new privies. Everyone thanked them profusely. The two toughs beamed with pride. The outdoor cooking hearth had been repaired so the women could set more pots in it and cook at the same time, requiring less wood to be hauled. Richard and some of the other men of the building built stands for the wash tubs so the wives wouldn't have to bend so far or chafe their knees raw. The men made a simple roof of canvas salvaged from the refuse so that the women could cook and wash without getting wet when it rained. The people in the buildings to either side, at first surly and suspicious of the activity, began asking curt questions. Richard, Camille, and Nobby went over and explained what they had done and how they could put their place in shape, too, and even help them get started. Nietzsche had yelled at Richard for spending his time at other people's places. He said that she was the one who had told him that it was his duty to help others. Nietzsche had no answer. At least, none that made any sense, so as she could say it aloud and not sound a fool. When Richard showed people how to improve their homes, he didn't lecture or teach, but rather somehow, Nietzsche couldn't understand how, managed to infect them with his enthusiasm. He hadn't told them what to do, but rather he'd made them want to figure out for themselves how they could make things better for themselves. Everybody took a liking to Richard. It made her growl under her breath. Nietzsche collected her washing in the woven basket Richard had shown the women of the building how to make from thin strips of wood. Nietzsche had to admit that the basket was easy enough to make and a better way to lug clothes. She climbed the sturdy stairs, stairs that she'd once thought would be the end of her. The hallway inside was spotless. The floors had been washed. Somewhere Richard had come up with ingredients for paint, and the men had a grand time of mixing it up and painting over the stairs.